Hello, everybody. Hello, 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 and welcome back. Welcome back. Oh, you are so welcome. You're so welcome to come back, to be here again, to experience another one of these. That's right, that's right, that's goddamn right. It's another one of these podcasts. Yeah. It's another one. It's another one of these podcasts. The 12 hour ones. This one might not be 12 hours. They're very long. They're very long. They're podcasts. They're very long. And I do them. It's another episode of the Slice of Life podcast. Because you keep coming back for more, probably. I don't know. The last one hasn't even uploaded yet. It's still uploading. It's still, still going. Oh, it's finished. It's finished uploading. Oh, I can turn on monetization. Let's go. Let's do this live. We're doing it live, baby. We're doing it live. Um, it, it doesn't have any any bad things. Hold on. Let me go through this without recording because this is a bad way to enter. Well, the, the last episode is demonetized. God knows why. Who fucking cares? I don't care. Fuck you. Demonetize this one as well, bitch. I'm swearing in the first 10 seconds of the video. Fuck you. Fuck you. Fuck you, bitch. Communism. Communism. Fuck Google, fuck YouTube, demonetize this. Okay, I don't even make any money. Why do you think I would care? It's throwing up a bunch of warnings. Like, oh, are you sure you want to publish this? It's been found to have content unsuitable for advertisers. Are you sure? Are you sure? You need to maximize your revenue potential. Motherfucker, fuck you. I don't want to make money. I, should turn, I shouldn't have turned monetization on on this channel. Terrible mistake. I don't want to maximize my revenue potential. What the what the hell is this? I hate I hate the world. I hate corpo nonsense. Anyway, welcome back to another one of these. Another one of these also available, at least hopefully also available on nothankyou.neocities.org under the sounds tab. Um, although I haven't haven't been able to upload my the the, the previous one yet which is called Mr. Beast Solves World Problems in a Podcast for 12 Hours. Maybe that's why. Maybe it's the thumbnail that is uh, is edgy. I don't know. I don't really care. Um, what was I talking about? Oh, yeah. I haven't been able to upload that one yet because I've been having some problems with hosting the file since the file is quite large. Um, but I will figure that out at some point. Uh, okay, so welcome back to another one of these. Um, we don't have any comments to go through yet because the, the previous video is only only just been posted so it hasn't had enough time to have any comments yet um but i'll get to those of course as they come up as i usually do um but uh for now i want to say just real quick uh some random stuff random thoughts because that's what these are about random thoughts stories and anecdotes um boring slice of life podcast because this is this is how we do it Oh, it looks like Simple Flips just posted a new Mario Party video. Those are always fun to watch. Um, you know, I was watching uh, this Adam and Pals video. This Adam and Pals video. This is YMS, Your Movie Sucks. Uh, good YouTuber. Um, he make a video every every Academy Awards, every time the Oscars are on. He does Adam and Pals and, and they, they watch the 2023 Academy Awards. It's a fun video. It's a fun video. I don't pay attention to the Oscars, so this is how I always end up watching the Oscars, is just watching YMS and his friends, you know, riffing on it. And uh, so if you don't if you don't know about this, uh, they're all furries, right? But when, when they do the video, they, they sort of, they edit it in such a way that they are represented as, like, in a living room, watching the oscars on tv and it will like cut to them except that yms is just like his his angry face which he does in his 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 channel like that's always how he recommends he sorry it's always how he represents himself is this this like picture of him making an angry face that is his channel's profile picture and then his two friends are just jpegs of a dalmatian and a tiger like real real pictures just jpegs of a dalmatian and a tiger and then one of them is just a purple floating cloud um and i find this very amusing because i like to imagine that like this is this is what they actually look like um that like this is this is what the world could be in a a like true full morphological freedom future you would just go to sit down with your friends 
and it would just be you, a totally normal looking human, uh, who who's Adam, and then your friends who are just animals, and then a floating purple cloud of like dust. I I like to imagine that this is the future that humanity is heading towards. You know, Mark Fisher. He says that we don't have Star Trek futures anymore. We can't imagine a world, a, a, a positive world for humanity. Well, I think Adam and Pals from YourMovieSucks.org has solved this problem. I think this is what the future is going to look like. You're going to go into a room to sit down with your friends and watch the Oscars, and it's going to be you, a totally normal human being, and then your friends are going to be like just a tiger, a dog, and a floating purple cloud. Or... Perhaps you will identify more closely with some other form and you will be the the dog or something like this. You know, I think this is the future that we're headed towards and I want to see more of it. Uh, I I don't know what I'm talking about. I just thought that was a funny anecdote because that's what this is. The Slice of Life podcast featuring your boy No Thank You with the funny anecdotes. Yeah, that's why you're here. It's another one of these. Welcome back. It's another one of these. Yeah, another one of these. I said your boy No Thank You. I said your boy No Thank You. What do you mean? It's me. It's your boy No Thank You. You've never said that before. It's your your boy boy, No Thank You. You're not any of your boy. I'm your boy. No, thank you. That's me. Hey. I'm your, it's your boy, no thank you, back for another one of these. What can I tell you? Man, I wish I was you and you were me so I could listen to me and not be me because there is just... I need... I constantly am in the need for more mindless content. I'll tell you, one thing that has in large part helped alleviate this problem for me a lot is Library of Letourneau's uh, Bits and Banter series is of northern lion clips because those are all over an hour long and they come out like insanely regularly i mean that guy works crazy hard uh like shouts out to the librarian doing god's work uh so that's good you know sometimes you get two hours of northern lion it's always good content it's just reliable good shit every day it's not every day but then sometimes like uh semi-recently northern lion went on holiday and it's just like I real, and then I ran out of content for the first time in ages. Um, and like, if you don't have any content, what do you do? I ended up just watching. I mean, if you listen to the end of the last podcast, which very few of you do, but if you happen to be one of those people, don't worry. We're gonna do comments later. I just haven't gotten any yet. Don't worry. You'll be heard. You'll be heard. I mean, I have some comments. I can read out the ones I have, but I want to wait until I have more so I can go through them in the. What I'm saying is, I need. I need someone else to make this. I need these long-ass podcasts. I've always been a long... You know, back in the day, listening to the PCP and RFCK podcasts that were, like, four hours long, I can do it. Like, I'm definitely long-ass content-pilled. Um, I don't know if other people are, but I've ended up watching, like, a lot of these kind of bad long-ass contents. I mean, the Quentin reviews, like, Victorious and iCarly and what I, I don't care about any of those shows. I never watched them growing up. But they're good to put on in the background. And then, as I was saying, if you listen to the end of the last one, I've been listening to Sarah Z videos, but they're not particularly great. Um, no, what I need is this sort of Denper pilled Denper pilled long ass shit, you know? Because most of the podcasts I, I mean, the only podcast I listen to is The Yard, which is pretty funny, I guess, but comes out once a week. And then, like, uh, Zero Books, which is a bit heavy. And uh, 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 Pill Pod, which is also a bit heavy. They're both critical theory and philosophy podcasts. I don't know of any other good ones, because the problem is, you need to be... It's a, it's a very... It's, I don't know. This is a stupid rant. But anyway, this is just me once again prefacing to ask the question that I've asked in like every single episode of the Slice of Life podcast, which is that I know the gimmick is that I do for 12 hours, but but is it actually better if I just split these up into like two six-hour podcasts instead? Like, would you prefer that? Let me know in the comments. Because I can see on my analytics that no one watches the whole... Like, uh, as far as I can tell, people generally watch about 20 minutes in and then drop out, but like you see a big drop off, but then if people make it like an hour in, they tend to like. Let me actually look at my analytics right now. This will be an interesting thing to do. Uh, while I'm doing that, you know, I've decided to watch an anime. It's been a while since I've watched an anime, and I've decided to watch the vending machine isekai. So uh, I guess I'll I'll talk to you about that. Um, 
We have some. Uh, <clears throat> we have some. Com- I'll read out comments that I've got so far. We got Vega Vidya with the the Toho profile picture. What a good way to start a Friday night. I'm glad that you think this. Dash eight five one eight says. You're being facetious at the start, but that is my genuine reaction to seeing these. I'm glad to hear it. I'm glad people enjoy these. Makes me happy to hear that. And uh, Sven CS2EX says, People talk about the connection to Thunderbirds and Mecha often in the comments of Evangelion Super Mario Nation comparison videos. I don't know what that is. <laughs> I, what, what is Super Mario Nation? I don't know what this is. What is this? Am I am I ill informed? Super Mario Nation. Oh, it's not super. It's got nothing to do with Mario. It's literally it's Mario as in this thing from from Thunderbirds. My brain didn't pass it, but now I remembered that that's a thing. Wait, this is a thing. A Evangelion comparisons to to the the Super Mario. Super Mario Nation. Super Jerry Anderson influences in Hideaki Anno's Evangelion. Yeah, I mean this is. Yep, it's definitely real. It's pretty. It's pretty obvious if you've seen Nava and Thunderbirds that it's real. Su- Super Mario movie Evangelion reference. What the fuck? I somehow don't believe that there's an Evangelion reference in the Super Mario movie. This is not an. I mean, maybe you could argue that that's an Ava reference. Come on. Okay, I got a bit distracted there, but that's cool. Shouts out. Oh, I just got another comment from the same person. Also, Patrick Marcius talks about it too. His podcast is full of interesting influences in anime, including like weird 50s Jack Finney's rock and roll copycat bands. Huh, interesting. Cool. Uh, wait, what was I talking about prior to this? Oh yeah, let me know if you want me to cut these up into like 6 hours instead of 12 hours, because that would be interesting. Anyway... This is a this has been a bit of a scrambled segment, but I guess I'm probably going to be talking about vending machine isekai next time you hear from me. So I actually looked at my analytics, and it, it seems like I got a bit confused. I confused the average watch time with, like, the actual graph of when people drop off. The average watch time is, like, around 20 minutes on all of the podcasts. But if you look at the graph of when people stop watching, most people make it about, like, five to seven minutes in before they, they stop listening. But then... About 8% of people who clicked on the video and watched uh, about 8 to 7 minutes, uh, about, about like, 10% of those uh, keep watching, and then about half of that 10% makes it to the end. So about 5% of people actually make it to the end, which is why I think that's the case. Uh, but what I'm saying is maybe maybe I split these up into multiple segments. I don't know. Also, I'm still on episode one, but I'm actually quite liking vending machine Sakai. Bros, I just had some of the best gaming of my life. I don't know what happened. I don't know if I just happened to be on a server where all of the players are worse than me, but I just carried like five games back to back to back insanely. Like I'm talking a 20 to 30 point difference between me and the next highest scoring person. Like I just carried so fucking hard for like five games back to back. It was insane. It was insane. And I was playing combo pyro. I mean, I was playing well, but I don't know. It just felt like I wasn't making any mistakes rather than that I was like being particularly skilled. I mean, I was making some mistakes. You know, I wasn't always hitting my flares. Um, I actually missed some Axe Extinguisher hits on a few people, which is always embarrassing when that happens. Um, but generally speaking, I wasn't playing... That was my Discord ping, by the way, not yours. Um, I was just... I wasn't playing that aggressive. I was just fucking owning, man. I was just tearing through gamers. And, okay, actually, you know what was also... We had a really good medics on our team. This is the difference that good medics makes. I could always reliably retreat, and the medic would just be in the right place at the right time. My Discord, not yours, so I will mute that. Um, Shouts out to those medics. So I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that they were definitely partially responsible for my success. But damn, that feels good after two days of dog shit TF2 experience, just bad matchmaking, bad balance, and not doing very well. Five games in a row where I just fucking dominated. Like holy shit, I just dominated so fucking hard. I, I like when I say I carried, I mean like 
aside from me, there was no significant difference in the amount of points and damage that the two teams had. It was just me making the difference, and I was right at the top. I'm bragging now. I'm just bragging. But man, my positioning was on point, okay? My fucking spy checking... Spies don't mean any. That all of the spies were completely ineffectual. I was spy checking like a schizo. Okay, these guys they had no chance. I even took down multiple sentries as pyro, as pyro, corner peeking them bitches. I I pulled off multiple flare combos, extinguisher combos. I I air blast comboed a, a fucking heavy. He wasn't on full health, but I I fucking I got him. It was killing a heavy as pyro is difficult. I, I did some very good reflect kills, reflect double kills, reflect triple kill. I mean, come on now. I'm just fucking insane. Let's go. Let's fucking go. I'm a pyro main now. I gotta switch my profile picture to a furry so I can really embody the pyro main attitude. I'm a furry now because I'm a pyro main. That's the meme. The pyro mains are all furries. I don't know if you're, if you're in the TF2 community like I am, which unfortunately I am. Um, but the, the meme is that all pyro mains are furries, so I guess I gotta become a furry now, which is, uh, I wasn't expecting to have to do, but that's okay, I have no problem with furries, so I guess I'll go read Echo. Yeah, I took a break to have some food, that's when I recorded that segment, potatoes, because I'm just so fucking potato-pilled these days, it's insane. Guys, potatoes, I'm telling you, people, they don't eat enough potatoes, they're so versatile, boil them, fry them, put them in a stew, put them in a pot, do whatever you want could do all sorts of crazy things with potatoes man <laughs> mash them up turn them into gnocchi guys i made my own gnocchi the other day it was okay it wasn't worth the effort but i did it if you really just had potatoes and you were bored you could make gnocchi they're very cheap i'll tell you that much they may be not that great but if you want something cheap i guess they're probably not that much cheaper than it's definitely much cheaper to make your own gnocchi than to buy store-bought gnocchi. Much cheaper. But compared to regular pasta, definitely not, I would say. I, maybe. But I think it's probably, like, pretty even. It's kind of like baking your own bread. Like, baking your own bread is not really cheaper than buying store-bought bread. But it is way better. Whereas the homemade gnocchi, at least what I had, were they really that much better than the store-bought ones? I don't think they were. I think they were about the same. And I didn't make them that good, you know, on reflection, I think I put too much flour in the dough, because I was watching this, trying to figure out, by eye, I wasn't measuring anything, and it looked like the dough that this one lady made in, on YouTube had way more flour in it, but then I've watched some other videos about how to make gnocchi, and they seem to use way less flour, so I think I'd probably use too much flour in mine, um... But even still, I mean, it's basically, it's just potatoes, flour, and egg. Like, how good can it taste? <laughs> you know, I don't think it's, it's not going to taste that good no matter what you do to it. Um, so yeah, anyway, that's kind of off topic. What was I going to say? Yeah, I took a, now I'm in the conundrum mode. This is the con, the classic conundrum. You, you had some, some epic gaming sesh, right? Where you popped off, then you went to do something, right? Do you go back to gaming thinking, like, Right now I'm on a high. It's kind of like like the do you re question. Like if you just had the best game of your life, do you queue again? I'm not saying I just had the best game of my life. I didn't, but I did, I did pretty well. But like back in CSGO days, it's like if you pop off, there's definitely like do you re in the hopes that you're going to carry this momentum forwards? Or do you call it quits, quit while you're ahead and leave the day on a high? Leave the, the day of gaming on a high note rather than queuing again? And then having a shit game, and then you're like, well, fuck, I shouldn't have played again. Because honestly, I feel like I was playing well, but I am pretty sure a lot of my luck came from just ha being the only decent player in a lobby full of bad players. I think that's probably what it was, to be honest. Like, I'm, I'm, I don't think I'm, I'm almost at a thousand hours now in the game, but like, my plays weren't insane. I was playing Pyro the way you play, like, I wasn't playing like a particularly fancy pyro or doing anything particularly special. I, I, I mean, I, I was playing well, but not like, you know, crazy well. I think a lot of it can come down to other players being bad. So if I re right now, am I going to get in a lobby with a bunch of other... It's not going to... I mean, the chances are I'm going to be in a shitty match with a bunch of fucking try-hard sniper, man. So, 
you know, a big part of me is like, just watch Vending Machine Isekai instead. Just watch Vending Machine Isekai instead. But then on the other hand, what if it wasn't a fluke? What if I'm just a god at Pyro today? I don't know. So these are my these are my thoughts. I will uh, weigh my options, I guess. Okay, let's do some more comment responses. Comment responses from the previous episode, if you want to be read out here. In this segment of every episode, you can leave a comment on the episode, and I'll get to it in the next episode. That's how episodes work. Uh, Sunset Inn says, If you're looking for something long to read, then check out Detective Conan. It's a thousand chapter long manga, it's a slice of life, episodic murder mystery series. Detective Conan is pretty popular in Japan, not so much in the Anglosphere. There's also a thousand episode long anime, but it's 44% filler, and it doesn't give enough time to guess who done it, so I'd recommend to avoid the anime and stick to the manga. Level 1 Demon Lord and 1 Room Hero is actually not as bad as the title makes it sound. I'm reading the manga, it has rough and amateurish art. To which Anime Sama replied, Conan is super popular, it's in like every library. I agree, Conan is super popular, it, it, it was also in my library growing up when I was a kid, my local library, so I have read a, a tiny bit of Conan. But I also have a friend online who is a massive Conan fan, has read the entire manga, and I'm pretty sure also seen the entire anime. It's not really my thing, just to be honest with you. Like, I respect it, I respect it existing, but it's not not super my thing. Uh, but thanks for the recommendation. I, I might check it out, I don't know, probably not, to be honest with you. Uh, from what I've seen of, of, the, of Conan, not super... <laughs> I don't know, just, just, nothing wrong with it, not that, not that it's bad, but just that it's not my taste. Um, Melo Kyla says, lol, banana discourse, this is a ref, this is a reference to a, a previous comment that Kyla left on the, on the previous, previous episode, which I responded in the last episode, but I didn't know what it was, so Kyla is not going to clarify. Lol, Banana Discourse was a lefty Twitter debate about degrowth supply chain stuff, which you ended up talking about a fair amount anyways. Pro-growth socialism should involve giving as many people access to as many luxuries as possible and slash or the ecological impact of farming and transporting tropical fruit is not that significant versus degrowth, the daily availability of tropical fruit in the global north is predicated on the exploitation of the global south and slash or is ecological and sustainable. Um, I don't... I don't like... Okay, can I just be frank? This might be a bit too early in the morning for me to explain this idea, but I don't like the dichotomy of pro-growth versus degrowth. I, I think it's a nonsense dichotomy, because there's... I, I don't think degrowth is a thing. <laughs> I don't think degrowth is possible. I think it's... I mean, maybe degrowthers know this, but it's really just growth in a different, better direction. Uh... You're still growing. You're always growing. You're just growing in a different direction. Like, for example, if you want to do more local farming rather than this ecologically unsustainable and exploitative international farming trade, you still have to grow, i.e. you have to build new infrastructures to support that change, right? It's smaller scale infrastructure and more locally based, but it's still change and it's still making things new, right? It's kind of like how technological progress doesn't necessarily mean fitting more transistors on a chip. It can also mean making better use of fewer resources, doing more with less. That's also progress. It's just progress in a different direction. So I don't like the I don't like the the word degrowth. I've, I'm I'm not a fan of it. However, I think I'm. You're probably already guessed but i'm on the uh i'm definitely on the the tropical fruit in the global north is is probably not super ecologically sustainable side of things um it's actually yeah it's pretty pretty unsustainable so i'm, I'm on that that end of things um, okay source mv says he's back with a bunch of exclamation marks i'm back it's me um mellow kyla says once again I think you misunderstand Marxism a bit. For Marx, the bourgeoisie are not stealing surplus value from the proletariat. Rather, the worker sells their labor power to a capitalist. The value of labor power is determined by the socially necessary labor time required for its production and reproduction. Labor power is the source of labor. 
Labour is the value-creating substance and is the source of all value, importantly not wealth. And so the capitalist is able to profit from exchanging his commodity, money, equally for the worker's commodity, labour power, no stimulus required. From Chapter 6 of Capital, in order to be able to extract value from the consumption of a commodity, our friend money bags must be so lucky as to find within the sphere of circulation in the market a commodity whose use value possesses the peculiar property of being a source of value whose actual consumption therefore is itself an embodiment of labor and consequently a creation of value the possessor of money does find on the market such a special commodity in capacity for labor or labor power the value of labor power is determined as in the case of every other commodity by the labor time necessary for production and consequently also the reproduction of this special article the sphere that we are deserting within whose boundaries the sale and purchase of labor power goes on is in fact a very eden of the innate rights of man they their alone rule freedom equality property and bentham equality because each enters into relation with each other with the other as with the simple owner of commodities and they exchange equivalent for equivalent that was those are all marked quotes I also think you should benefit from reading Critique of the Growth Program, where Marx distinguishes himself from other common misunderstandings. Okay, so I've read Critique of the Growth Program. Um, I don't know what you're talking about, Kylo. I, I don't think I've misunderstood Marxism. Uh, that is literally... I mean, maybe I'm... I guess there's a possibility that I'm correct. As I understand it, according to the labor theory of value, um, when, when a worker goes to work for... A, like, the reason capitalism is bad or well, one one reason uh when when a when a i said stolen in the video that's probably not correct like it's probably an, a loose term exploited would be a better word right like when a worker is, is laboring under a capitalist they're producing more value than they're getting paid and that surplus value is being extracted and taken by the capitalist in the form of profit Am I, I don't I don't think I'm wrong here. I think I, I think that is what Marx says. No, I, may, I, I, I I guess no. I'm pretty sure that's Marx. That's Marx. I'm pretty sure that's what Marx says. When you when you when you go to because because a capitalist isn't doing any labor, but he's somehow making all the money, and that money has to be coming. That value has to be coming from somewhere. That and that it's coming from extracted surplus value from the worker, from from the laborer. So, I guess you could say, since the labor was never paid in the first place, it wasn't stolen. But the idea is, he should be getting more, he or she, or they, should be getting more than they are getting. So it's like in, so they're being exploited, because they're not, they're not being, they're not being compensated their full worth. A bunch of that, what, that value is being extracted by a capital. Is that not how Marx works? I'm pretty sure that's how Marx works. I'm, I don't think I'm wrong, no. Also, about your comments about horizontally organized and worker-owned firms, there's a lot of good left-com and value-critic theory about the stuff that are, agrees that these don't really do anything, and they have a much subtler understanding of capitalism than the vulgar second internal version that's become so dominant, and where I think most of your disagreements in Marxism come from, to be honest. The difference is they would say that these firms have not actually escaped capitalism at all because it's still governed by the law of value, worker ownership of the means of production is irrelevant um i don't know enough about uh left comms and i don't even know what value critic is so i i don't know if i can really comment on that uh but i think i've, I've been going back to marx a little more recently i think um the really valuable part of marx for me is the critique of the commodity form now, like now that I've been going back to it, I think this is like really important. Like the the way I, th I think I think it's like alienation and the commodity form are like the big important things in in my opinion. The big the more valuable things that are most relevant. Like the idea, for example, of like uh, I I don't know the proper Marxist terms for this. It's been a while, but uh, like. Like when you go and you, you purchase commodities, you're completely disconnected from the process of production. And therefore, you're disconnected from any social relations uh, with other human beings that you might, you might face in that circumstance. Right? You, just, you just see a faceless... Like a, I think this result from Marxism is quite important. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know about this, this 
uh, stuff about um, where was it? Firms, firms not escaping capitalism, still governed by the law of value. Um, I don't really understand that. I, I would need to do more reading. Okay, well that's enough Marxism for for these comments. Uh, Source MV says Super Mario Nation, and Element of Naivety says. Finally, now I got something to fill the void in my head for 12 hours. Epic. Well, those are all the comments I have so far. I'll get... I, I, if there are more comments, I suspect... I, I talked a, a lot about uh, capitalism in that video, so maybe Kyla will comment more about my misunderstandings of Marx. Uh, but, yeah, that's that's what we got so far. You know, here's a, here's a little bit of a... <clears throat> Well, I don't know. Bit of no thank you law. You might know. You may or may not know, depending on how deep you are in no thank you law, that the movie National Treasure 2 Book of Secrets holds a very special place in my heart. Um, the reason is, uh, well, there's, there's a, the, it, it's a confluence of two reasons. The main reason is that uh, I'm a, a bit of a, a boomer, a bit old. Uh, from the times when DVDs mattered, this is not an experience that kids growing up these days will ever have, and honestly good for them, because it's not a great experience. So movies used to be on these things called DVDs, and my mom just didn't have very many DVDs. We only had about four or five movies. I think I can probably list all of them. We had... Um, also, a lot of these were scratched and like did un- unwatchable. Like we had the entire Indiana Jones trilogy at the time before Crystal Skull came out, and the new one, obviously. But the, the Indiana Jones trilogy, but it was very scratched up and wouldn't really play. Uh, we had all of the Star Wars original trilogy, um, and the last one didn't play. The first two played, but the last one didn't play, uh, or it like got halfway through and broke. I don't really remember. So those two didn't really work. Then we had um, uh, The Mummy 1 and 2, which I watched quite a few times, but we didn't get those until a little later. Um, <clears throat> yeah, but The Mummy... Actually, we might have even had all three of The Mummy movies. I don't remember. Maybe we had all three. Uh, yeah, we did have all three, because the third one's in China, right? Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, there were, we had all three Mummy movies. Um, and then... I'm trying to remember what else. Uh, I I had the Harry Potter one and two, the first two Harry Potter films, but I didn't watch them. I like for some reason didn't watch them. Oh, because they were on VHS and we didn't have a VHS player. That's why. I um. But to get to the point here, um, one of the movies we had. Oh, so we had uh, a double feature of Hot Fuzz and Shaun of the Dead which I was far too young to be really watching, but I watched those to death, particularly Hot Fuzz. I think I watched it a million times when I was a kid. And then the other movie that I watched a million times that we had on DVD for some God knows why reason was National Treasure 2 Book of Secrets. I watched that movie just many, many, many times because it was one of the few films we had on DVD. So that's the first reason. And then later on, or, you know, almost at at a similar kind of time, my friend Young Sai, friend of the channel, who's been on, been on the channel before many times, but Young Sai introduces me to a a uh, YouTube channel. Although actually at the time it wasn't even on YouTube, it was on some I don't even know what website it was on. It was like bleep bleepy. <laughs> it had some really stupid name. I don't remember what website it was on at the time. It was some other video streaming platform um, with a really dumb name that probably doesn't exist anymore. But this guy called the Nostalgia Critic who you may have heard of. And I was a massive, we were both, me and Young Sai, were both massive Nostalgia Critic fans as kids. We were super into Nostalgia Critic. And I don't know if you know this about Nostalgia Critic, but just like everyone else in the 2000s, uh, he was obsessed with Nicolas Cage movies because they were funny. They were a meme, and they still continue to be a meme. So... Nostalgia Critic got me into Let's Laugh at Nicolas Cage movies because he's a funny guy. And the only Nicolas Cage movie I happen to own as a kid, which I've seen a million times, is National Treasure 2 Book of Secrets. And so those two things combined have just made it a special childhood movie for me. Now, here's a fun fact about National Treasure 2 Book of Secrets. National Treasure 1 is also a pretty good movie, by the way. Firstly, my first opinion is that National Treasure 1 and 2 are both actually kind of good films. That's my first take. I think they're actually kind of good movies. They're not, like, amazing, but they're good. Like, you watch them, you'll have fun watching them. Uh, they're, they're pretty clever. They're, like, surprisingly clever. And Nick Cage is great in them. Um, 
So that's my first t- my first opinion. They have some great set pieces, great great action set pieces. Both of the movies, they're good films. But National Treasure Two has a has a always as a kid something struck me that like there was a scene towards the end of the movie that sort of feels too fast. Like I'm, I never really understood what was going on. And I found out later. Uh, so to give you a clue of how young I was, I had the DVD. I didn't know how to watch the special features on the DVD though, because. I've only found out as an adult looking at the special features on the DVD, like the deleted scenes and the bloopers, that <clears throat> there were deleted scenes that make that part of the movie make a lot more sense. Um, those scenes aren't very good. I understand why they were deleted, but they do add a bunch of important exposition that is just missing from the final movie. So that happens. Um, yeah, that's all I wanted to say. Is if you if you like me are a fan of National Treasure Two: Book of Secrets, I recommend going on YouTube and looking up National Treasure Two deleted scenes and watching them, because uh, so one of them is actually pretty important in terms of adding context to the, the end, towards the end of the movie. And then there's a couple other ones that are just pretty cool scenes that that are just interesting to watch. The bloopers are also fun. So yeah, there you go. That's uh that's the thing. Um, oh, the other things I had on DVD was um, Star Trek season Star Trek Next Generation season six and four, I think. Um, so I watched those a bunch as well. Yeah, there you go. Those are things I had. It wasn't until later. Then this is the interesting thing. This is a, another strange thing, right? I didn't, by the way, I didn't stop being into Nostalgia Critic for years. Like, I watched Nostalgia Critic religiously pretty much up until I was like, what? 16, 17, 17, 18, maybe even 8. No, I don't think I was 18. I think 17. Um, like, there was a crossover when I, I had, I, I didn't, wait, actually, I can check. I can check because I happen to know that I had released No Thank You Volume 1. So in 2018, how old would I have been? Or oh, whatever, who cares? I was still into Nostalgia Critic around 2018. Uh, somewhere around that year. And it, 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 then I don't even, I think that that's when the allegations came out about that guy with the glasses and how they were mistreating people. And when that happened, it was like the spark that gave me an excuse to stop following him. Because I think for years I hadn't actually found his stuff funny or interest or interesting, but I just kept watching it out of habit and out of nostalgia, coincidentally, or ironically, I should say. I just sort of kept watching his videos out of nostalgia because they were important to me as a kid, or I watched them a lot as a kid. And so when the allegations came out and it was like, oh, it turns out they're actually bad person, bad company, it was like I had the excuse to be like, okay, I can stop watching this guy now. Um, yeah. So I watched Nostalgia Critic way too, way too long <laughs> in my life. Um, uh, the other thing that I was going to say is a bit later on, when I was in my like early teens, we got another thing on DVD which was like the first like four or five seasons of The Big Bang Theory. And I watched that religiously. I watched so much Big Bang Theory without ever like thinking about how it was bad. Like this is not an experience that I can have these days. This is only something you can do when you're a kid. Like I, or I guess some people can just acknowledge it. Like, actually, no, I know for a fact that it wasn't just me. It's like I watched it and I loved it. I would have told you I was a massive fan of it at the time. And then, I started going online more, and obviously I started seeing people shitting on the Big Bang Theory because it's terrible. And I, the second, and when I saw people start shitting on it, immediately I had a bit of a knee-jerk reaction, like it's not bad. What are you talking about? It's good. But then, after that idea had been incepted into my mind that the show was bad, I went and tried to watch it and realized, like, oh my god, this is so unfunny. How have I been watching this? Like, it's like it clicked a switch in my brain where I was suddenly able to notice what was in front of my eyes the whole time that it was terrible. And then, you know, later, I, my mom was a massive fan of Big Bang Theory, which is why she got the DVD box set. I told her, I was like, try and imagine it without the laugh track and, like, if it's actually funny. And then she did the same thing. She was like, I realized it was actually terribly unfunny. I saw what, like, we had the same experience. So yeah, that's that's something interesting, I guess. Oh, uh, here's a notable thing. I put an album. I made an album, or well, it's an EP, I guess. Um, you can go go on my uh, go on my my Bandcamp or my YouTube. I should probably put it out on 
on on distro kit so it's on spotify and stuff as well i haven't gotten around to that yet i should probably do that uh the album is called kwa w said drift gi fujiko lp um which is uh the, the origin of the name is that you you know if, you, if you're you're an English English speaking internet user and you want to give the aesthetic of a keyboard smash you type as the fugujukukul just the whole line of that keyboard right you know what I mean as the fugujukul that's the the English version of keyboard smash uh, that title is the Japanese version of keyboard smash uh, it's like alternating the top and second rows of the keyboard. Like the QWERTY roll and the ASDF roll, row. Oh, it's like alternating, going along. It types that out on a Japanese keyboard. So it's the Japanese internet equivalent of the the ASDF. Yeah. I thought it was a funny title. I drew an anime girl on it. Don't tell anyone, but the uh, the coloring for the anime girl was done by an AI. Spooky, oh, spooky, scary, but not a, not, not a... Not 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 the type of spooky, scary AIs that people are spooky and scared about these days. It was, I mean, maybe it is, but it's just the one that's built into Ibis Paint X. Because, let's be honest, I can't be bothered to color. I can't be bothered to color that in. I ain't doing it. I simply ain't doing it. So I just got the automatic AI to paint it in. Well, I mean, I guided it. I told it what colors to put, but yeah. I don't know how I'm, if I'm happy with how the drawing came out, but it looks okay, I guess. And that photo is just a place in Estonia that I went on a walk and took a picture of. That's some train tracks near a forest. But yeah, I think this album I've had, I've been sitting on this album for like a year. It's not even an album, it's an EP. Let's call it an EP. I've been sitting on this EP for like a year. I've, I made these tracks well, maybe like six months ago. Maybe not a year. Um, and I've just been sitting on it because I was like wondering if I was going to make more stuff in that style and then maybe compile it into a full-length album. But as the time's gone by, I realized that I'm, like, just not going to be it. Because, I mean, I made all these tracks in, the, like, like one a day. I made them four days apart from each other. In in literally the order that you I, that you see them in the album is the order in which I made them. I just, I just was, like, for some reason, I'm going to make, like, a weird indie rock kind of album. And every day a new riff would come into my mind and I would be able to make indie rock. And on the fifth day, I sat down to do the same thing I'd been doing for the previous four days and everything I tried to make turned out, like, terrible. And I was like, oh, that sucks. I guess I'll come back tomorrow. And I tried again the next day and, again, every riff idea I had, like, no matter how I tried to workshop it, just turned out terrible. And then I just sort of gave up and was like, okay, I guess I need to take a break. And then the break just lasted forever because I could never come up with more indie rock guitar riffs, so it just kind of became this short EP. But you already know one of the tracks, because I released Victoria Line earlier. Um, and if you were one of the five people, I mean, I, I guarantee you not a single person who's listening to this um, podcast was there, uh, but there's a, the, I, 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 I was doing a set for a online festival called Jest Fest. And I actually put Pessimistic Blues in the set before, like, it was, that was like a few months ago. Um, yeah, go listen to the album if you haven't already. It's, it's pretty good. Okay, I'm gonna give a bit more of a rigorous critique or response, rather, to Kyla's comment about Marxism on my previous video. Because I want to say a couple of things. Firstly, this is like, this sort of scientific Marxist labor theory value stuff is the stuff that I dislike most about Marxism. It's the stuff that I disagree with. I don't think the labor theory of value is actually uh, a rigorous theory of value. And and, and now's not the time to go into why, but I do not think it's a rigorous theory of value. Scientifically rigorous theory of value, right? Um, But, so I've not read that much into it because... I don't agree with it. <laughs> so, you know, I've read enough to understand it and not agree with it. However, I, I think I'm correct in my um, understanding of surplus value and extraction. So, so Kyla says, they're not stealing surplus value from the proletariat. The worker sells their labor power to a capitalist. The labor power, blah, 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 blah. Labor power is the source of labor. It's value creating. Yep. Um, so the capitalist is required. Basically, um, Expenditure of labor power produces more value than it takes to reproduce itself, and surplus value is created. Correct. However, 
No, 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 no. I, I, I'm, I don't know about this. I don't know about this. The capitalist is able to profit from exchanging his commodity money equally for the workers' commodity, labor power. Uh, yes. However, however, the, once the labor power is used, it generates surplus value, right? And ultimately, that didn't come from the capitalist. That came from the, the worker. That came from the proletariat, which is the whole point, isn't? Is it not? And so there is value in the in terms of profit, which should be going back to the worker, right? I I don't I'm confused about this. This doesn't seem to make any sense to me. You're saying that the capitalist is buying the labor power from the laborer at its at its value at its stated value, right? Like at the correct value. It is correct that like at the amount of value that it's worth. However, because it generates more value than it's worth, that's that extra value. That like this, I feel like I'm kind of talking in circles here. That's the surplus value, right? Which came from the worker, but isn't returned to the worker in terms of a wage. Therefore, it's being expropriated. The worker is being exploited. I don't see framing that as theft as particularly problematic. That seems like a reasonable way to frame that. It's a bit of a roundabout manner of theft, but it still sounds kind of like theft to me, because that profit is coming from somewhere, and it's not coming from the capital, at least, you know, according to Marx. Am I wrong about this? I'm pretty sure I'm not. I feel like I, I'm... Yes, labor power is sold to the capitalist according to its value, as defined by the amount of socially necessary labor time required for its production. And labor power possesses possesses the peculiar property of being a source of value. Hold on, let me read more about this. Here, I'm just going to read this this whole thing. This is Surplus Value by Vitaly Vygotsky from the Great Soviet Encyclopedia. Um, okay, so... Absolute surplus value is the result of lengthening the workday beyond necessary labor time or the time in which the worker can reproduce the value of his labor power. The actual length of the workday depends on the relation of class forces. Motivated by an avid desire to increase surplus value, the capitalists do their utmost to prolong the workday. However, as its level of organization improves, the working class, through stubborn struggle, gains legislation limiting the work the workday. Absolute surplus value also increases as a result of increasing the intensity of labor, even if the length of the workday remains the same or is shortened. Um, th- wait, I thought there was more. I thought there was more here. Uh, okay. The production of surplus value may be increased by reducing the necessary labor time and making a corresponding increase in surplus labor time without changing the length of the workday. This approach is associated with relative surplus value. The reduction in necessary labor time is primarily connected with raising the productivity of labor in branches of industry that produce the means of subsistence for workers, because in the final analysis, this leads to a decline in the value of labor power. This, in turn, brings about a reduction in necessary labor time and a corresponding increase in surplus labor time in all branches of the cap- of capitalist industry. What this guy is basically saying is that in order to extract surplus value, as much surplus as possible, which is the goal of the capitalist, uh, you know, whether it's relative or absolute, they're going to find ways to, in- you know, increase that extraction as much as possible. And all of the senses in which that extraction is increased are born of worker exploitation, as you just heard, in one way or another. There are other ways not mentioned here, but yes. Um, Once again, that sounds like a type of theft to me. No? Again, the worker's still getting paid the same amount, but more value is being extracted. More surplus value is being... Right? Am I crazy here? Am I crazy here? I think... I don't think I've misunderstood this. I think I'm I think I'm fine. I think I'm good. It's tough. This stuff goes over my head a little bit, but I'm pretty sure I'm on the right track here. You know what? I will do a, a, a brief brief critic critique of the labor theory of value. And it basically boils down to the the, the very classic mud pies argument. Um so the and don't click away. 
Marxists because I it's not just the Mottifies argument, but so the the classic this this has been known since before Marx because remember labor theory of value was a popular theory of value even before Marx ever wrote about it or was born right like it was it's this is just a thing that used to be popular in economics so the the Mottifies argument is like well if value comes from labor you can put in a whole bunch of labor to sit there all day making mud pies but uh, those mud pies clearly don't have any value because they're not useful anymore. So explain that, idiots. And so they get around this by saying, ah, but it has to be socially useful labor, socially necessary labor, or something like this. This is also a counter to like, oh, what if someone just works really slow to do something? Uh, they, they, they say, aha, we put a little stipulation that says socially necessary, socially necessary labor time. Um, I just don't believe that this is a rigorous enough concept to do the weightlifting that it's doing. I don't, I've never heard it justified well enough how one determines what is socially necessary and what is not. Uh, it sounds like a way of just saying it produces use value except when it doesn't. When people decide it isn't useful, then it's not actually producing any use value. But hold on a second. That sounds like the subjective theory of value. <laughs> that sounds like you're saying what people decide is valuable is valuable, rather than value comes from labor time. That sounds a lot like that's what you're saying to me. Um, you know, unless there's some better example of how you determine what is socially necessary or socially useful, um, this is always like a big flaw in the argument. There's also circular reasoning built into it um, in terms of like determining that such a thing as a quantifiable use value even exists because um, in terms of exchange value like, we can all pretty much agree that markets exist and they give things numbers in terms of how much value those things have now of course uh, the same item made in the same shop by the same same factory by the same workers working the same hours can sell for completely different prices in London versus Kent or something in the countryside right like obviously that's a bit weird but Marx does say something about that I don't remember exactly what he says but he tries to cover it I don't know it seems a bit sus to me um, but so that's one thing but more importantly fuck what was I going to say I don't remember my brain shut off at some point during this boring ass boringness use value doesn't make any sense as a concept I actually quite dislike it it's very enlightenment we can use science and maths to do everything about humans I, I don't like it it, 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 it doesn't, doesn't sit well with me it's like I guess we, we shall quantify and categorize the human experience in every manner, and uh, somehow this will turn out well. I don't agree with it. I think it turns out pretty badly most of the time. I think it's enough, this is just another, another example where it's like, you've got someone sitting there determining if your value is socially necessary. <laughs> socially useful, I don't know. Seems, seems like nonsense. Like, uh, the second that someone comes around and is like, I'm a mud pie collector. I love mud pies. Suddenly, those mud pies have value, or at least they have exchange value. But maybe that person's just a collector. But co what does Mark say about collectors? Has, does he ever talk about this? Because collectors make like a lot of the systems of value like break down, right? Because people are buying things for much more than most people would think they were worth, but not because they have any particular practical use, just to, for the sake of collecting them. And collecting has been around for much longer than capitalism, right? It's, I mean, it's been around since... There's, there's evidence of, of coin collectors in the Roman era. So, you know, that's an interesting thing. Anyway, I'm going to stop talking about this now because it's fucking boring. I'll be honest with you, I don't understand Spy in Team Fortress 2. I don't understand the, the cultural attitude towards Spy. Why has everyone deemed Spy acceptable? Or beyond that, not just acceptable, why do people think Spy is cool? Like, why do people think that, like, trick stab compilations are cool and epic? They are the most boring type of Team Fortress 2 compilation. Trick stabs, you know, 
are they th- uh, skillful? Sure, you have to learn how to do them, but they don't. I think people who don't understand how trick stabs work, they think they rely on like human psychology, but they don't rely on human psychology. They just rely on like limitations of like mouse space and stuff like this. They 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 just rely on getting right up in your face and then having a faster movement speed than the enemy, so you can move faster than them. It's not very difficult. Like a matador doesn't really rely on human psychology. It's just you look like you're going one way, but then you go the other way, and you're close enough that the other person can't track you. It's not that impressive. And what makes it particularly unimpressive to me is the fact that you're doing this while you're using the fucking dead ringer and the kunai. So not only do you literally have more health than a soldier, you also have a magic get out of jail free card by just pressing fucking left click. Takes zero skill. Like, look, there are cool stabs. Surf stabs, everyone agrees, are the coolest type of stab. And they're cool. I agree. Surf stabs, very cool. But every other, like, a SIG chain stab compilation, right? You you get a cool chain stab. It's not that impressive. Because every time you get a stab, you reset your health. You don't have to be, be good at surviving. You're, you're getting infinite health when you get stabs. And even if you fuck up, you just dead ring them away. It's not even... You, you get a free second life, right? Compare, like, a cool chain stab to a really cool market garden... I know the market garden is much fucking sicker every day. If we're talking about the scale of sickness in TF2, swag and sickness, a, a market, a, a fucking crazy ass market garden is better than a cool chain stab any day of the fucking week. A crazy ass like uh, air shot, air shot, double air shot, Mr. Beast combo, way more impressive than a market than a, a chain chain stabbing. Dead Ring a Kunai spy any fucking day of the week. That it's it, there's no this is why spy is my second least played class. Because it's so unappealing. You don't have to like have movement skill and positioning to get behind the enemy like you would as, you know, other pick classes, assassin type classes. I can see a dead ring a kunai spy on Dot Smite's screen right now. They're everywhere. They're following me everywhere. What the fuck? What they're 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 coming after me. I leave the game, they follow me out of the game. What is happening? Um you know, getting behind the enemy with, with creative positioning and skillful movement as another pick class and a, an ambush type class like flank pyro or, or demo knight or um I don't know, some sort of soldier playing in the back lines or a scout. That that requires skill. As spy, you just press a button to go invisible and press a button to disguise. It doesn't... Th- there's no skill. Like, blending in with the enemy... It, I'm sorry, there's no... Oh, shit. I just dropped my water bottle. There's... It, I, I've played Spy. You don't... It, I think these people think they're, like, some crazy psychological geniuses. This is how you make a believable disguise of Spy. You just walk backwards. You just fucking run, run backwards and don't make direct eye contact with all your teammates. It's, like, two rules, and you will never get... I mean, even if you do get spy checked, it doesn't really matter. Because I will spy check everyone. A good pyro should, should do that. But, like, assuming the other team doesn't have good pyros. Yeah. You just disguise. It doesn't even just take any fucking... There's no nothing. There's no movement skill ability. You just cheat by disguising. I mean, it's not cheating, but it feels cheap to me. That's why I don't like it. And then getting the kill, you know, it's not like the back burner. The back burner, you have only a 45 degree angle to actually get crits right it's actually pretty difficult to to hit the the back hitbox with the back burner you have to be pretty precise it really relies on catching enemies off guard and using good positioning uh, and so on right good movement good positioning and catching enemies you know all the stuff that you would want a spy to do but it doesn't matter if you're a spy because a spy has like more than a 180 degree back hitbox that hence why side stabs are a thing not to mention that most spies are abusing CL interp anyway, and face stabbing the shit out of you because the game is broken. Like t- just today, I was playing Trollger on High Tower, and I got face stabbed so fucking hard that the spy was in front of me. Actually, you know, I I wasn't using no no no, I wasn't Trollger. I was playing demo on High Tower, and I was memeing. I was memeing, jumping around, market gardening with with the pan. 
right? Just hoping to get crits, just to have some a little bit of it's called it's called having a little bit of fun in a video game. So I was market gardening with a pan as demo with the sticky jumper, and I jumped onto the tower. There's a spy in front of me. He's in front of me. There's no there's no confusion here. He's in front of me. It's impossible for him to have been behind me. I hit him with the pan. It makes the sound of I hit him with the pan while he was in front of me, and somehow I get backstabbed. And that doesn't make any sense. That doesn't make any goddamn sense. Games busted. Spies don't make any sense in the game. Look, I'm not saying clearly I'm molding because I've been tri- I've been I've been killed by spies one too many times today. Okay, clearly I'm molding. However, I'm I'm not saying like oh spies are evil blah blah blah. It's whatever. Especially if you don't play Dead Ring Kunai, it's fine. It's it's kind of chill. It's like it's it's whatever. I don't even mind. And there are trick stabs that require skill. As I said, you know, surf stabbing it requires a lot of skill. Um, and certain types of like stair stab type things where you jump use the environment creatively, I respect it. But the stuff you see in spy montages, the the chain stabbing dead ring kunai archetype, is never been impressive to me. And what I'm mad about is people who think this is sick. It's okay to think that this is like you know I don't know just to to I would rather you didn't because it's not really very fun to to play against, but. It's I, I I'm tired of it being rated high in the sickness <coughs> TF2 sickness scale. There are like com- okay compare like you know the standard arc- arsenal of of chain stabbing trick stabbing kunai dead ringer spies, which is just have too much health and too many resistances and a free uh, fucking totem of undying to get out of any situation. Versus Skechek style pyro combos. I mean, I know which one's sicker in my book. Okay, I know which one's fucking cooler in my book. It's the it, hint. It's the pyro. It's the pyro every goddamn time. Like I've played games against really good like puff and sting pyros. That shit's annoying to deal with, but you gotta respect it because hitting flares that reliably is not very easy. And also, like it's arguable how much combo pyro is even like that much more effective than just wm1 but so people who play that way are doing it out of out of swag they're doing it out of desire for swag rather than just like pure uh you know gaming optimization and i always respect that i respect people who nerf themselves out of a desire for swag if you're playing dead ring or kunai you're doing the opposite you're buffing yourself to create the illusion of swag but there's no swag there, to me. That this is this is what I'm trying to sh- to say. I, I'm I don't think it's fun to play against. But if you if you really want to play Dead Ringer Kunai, like it's in the game, sure. But it should be treated like playing Flog Pyro. This is my opinion because it's like a gimmick that is like technically you should be able to deal with it if you're a coordinated team. But let's be honest, you're not a coordinated team, so it's like just annoying it's it's annoying in the same way flog pyro is annoying where it's like you can i guess you can play like that and i'm not gonna say it takes zero skill because being effective as flog pyro takes skill being effective as dead ring kunai spy takes skill right i'm not gonna say it doesn't take skill but it is annoying it's it's a purposefully and knowingly annoying play style where you have a bunch of like it's, it, it, it feels a little unfair to play against, right? It's not actually unfair, unless... I mean, sometimes it's unfair to play against a pocketed Flog Pyro. But Flog Pyro on its own is not unfair, right? It's balanced, as much as people deny this fact. Um, but it can feel unfair. It's a bit cheap. That's all I'm saying. It's a bit cheap. It, it's not swag. It's the opposite. It's, it's, it's cheap. This is my opinion, Okay. That's my opinion. And hey, look, everyone's entitled to their own opinion, and that's mine. I think Dead Ring Kunai is a is a bit of it's it's a bit of a cheap playstyle. Because like you just have too much health <laughs> and you move too fast. It's kinda like playing against a a, a four head eyelander demo knight just terrorizing your back lines. Like the only real thing you can do is just ignore them, right? You just have to ignore them, which is just not really a fun way to it's it's not very fun. It's like, okay, well, I don't stand a chance against that guy, so I'm just going to ignore him. Moves too fast, has too much health and too many resistances. It's the same situation with a, a, a dead ring of kunai. 
You just have to get one kill, and then suddenly you're fucking Superman with infinite health and uh, a totem of undying. It's a bit cheap in my eyes. It's, again, like, I, I'm trying to get across this, like, kind of nuanced opinion. It's not that it's bad. It's not that I want it removed from the game. It's just that it it's viewed by the community as, like, a swaggy, stylish playstyle. But in my opinion, it is the opposite of that. It is a bit of a cheap playstyle. Okay, that's all I have to say. Vinny Contiello says, I feel like this is not the time we've told a story about getting banned from something for calling mods slash admins a state actor. It's not the first time I've told that story. I, I That those words specifically are what I said on or whatever. I've probably said similar things in the past. Um... <clears throat> they also say, I heavily agree with your take on Spider-Verse, but I think the specific ca- criticism of quippy Marvel dialogue is somewhat misplaced because Spider-Man as a character has been well known for quips and taunting his enemies since the inception of the character. Even if we didn't live in a post whedon Hollywood landscape, I think this movie probably would have still had that tone. I think there's something appreciable about that aspect of Peter's personality rubbing off on Miles as he mentors him. I agree. Um, I th- my favorite part of the Andrew Garfield uh, Spider-Man movies, uh, probably the only good part of those movies, is when he's like fighting that carjacker, car thief or whatever, in a parking lot, and he's doing doing all the quips. Like that's how Spider-Man is, and I agree with that. That that's a part of the character and, and should be kept. I think I don't remember exactly what I said in this video. Um, but I think I was more so talking about how, like, every character talks like that. And to be fair, every character is a type of Spider-Man, so I guess, like, maybe they just sort of should talk like that. But, yeah, I kind of... I, like, I think it's fine to have the cocky guy be cocky. That's cool. But having every character in the movie be the cocky guy is a bit overwhelming. Um, and it kind of... it loses impact. Like, Part of the reason why it's cool that Spider-Man is like that is because, like, he's confident for a reason, because he's fucking Spider-Man, you know? Like, he can be cocky to a thief that he's catching, because he knows the thief can't fucking do anything to him. Or, like, even uh, more so, if he's, you know, fighting a big bad, and he's being cocky, it's kind of like a psychological game, and it's also kind of an insight into his personality. You know, it's cool. But if everyone's just doing it all the time, it doesn't do anything. It loses all meaning. It just becomes, that's how the writers wanted to write it. it, it and that's how I feel, at least. Like, it just kind of, it stops being characterization and starts just being, oh, this is like, it pulls me out of it. And I start thinking about, like, oh, the the, the script, you know, rather than a character. But I, I think you're right. Like, it, it, which is a bit of a challenge in the modern media landscape given yeah as you said like the prevalence of the post whedon marvel dialogue shit um so like yeah it's it's a bit of a challenge making it come off as unique and not just stereotyped marvel dialogue um yeah i don't know if i have anything to add to that i agree like spider-man should talk like that but not everyone should talk like that there was a segment we're continuing this the tf2 spy discourse i i said before in a segment in one of these podcasts, like, how does anyone ever get trick-stabbed, right? And I think the reason that I said that is because every time I get trick-stabbed, I always don't count it for some reason. Like, for some some reason, it doesn't count in my brain as a trick-stab. So, like, either I was distracted and they just snuck up on me and I didn't even think about it, so it doesn't count, or, uh, like, well, yeah, I guess it was technically a trick-stab, but it wasn't really a trick-stab because they had a billion health from the kunai and I was trying to kill them and eventually they just stabbed me because that's just going to happen. Like, I can't do anything about it except try and run away. Um, but technically, from the, from the perspective of the spy, both of those look like trick stabs. From the perspective of me, I'm like, you're just tanking damage in order to get behind me. That's not really a trick stab. That's just walking. <laughs> um, it's just holding W. Uh, but but it looks like a trick stab from the spy's perspective. So maybe I should be counting. Maybe I, maybe I am getting trick stab more than I think I am. Uh, I'm just not counting those things. So maybe trick stabs do work. But only if you... Uh, when, I, when I'm when i thinking of trick stabs, I'm talking about, like, raw. 
you don't have resistances. You're just a, a, an actual fair one v one, like like a circle. I mean, I've been like I've been legit trick stabbed many times, right? Like circle strafed, matadored. I don't really get corner stabbed these days because I, you know, I'm, I know that it exists, so I always take corners wide when I'm fighting a spy, um, or just don't follow them around the corner in the first place. So I don't really get corner stabbed. Um, but like, yeah, I've, I've I've been stair stabbed, I've been and like you know slope stabbed or whatever the fuck, quite a few times. I've been matted all a few times, and I've definitely been circle strafed a few times. Um, so that, yeah, these things, these things are things. They're things. It happens. Those ones that are, when it's legit, I I feel like fair enough, you know, when it happens. But when it happens, because I don't know, I'm gonna stop complaining. So I love it when YouTube recommends me a video from a a small guy. Because it makes me feel hope that one day my videos will get recommended. <laughs> I don't know. I, I like it. It makes it, it makes me happy. I like it. I like it when a guy with 1.4k subscribers makes a video that pops off and is also good. And the video I'm talking about right now is called I Mained Pyro for an entire month by Rawnir. Uh It was a great video. I recommend watching it. Um, pretty relatable because Gamo Main, who decides to main Pyro, that's literally me. Uh, however, I, I, here's my, my, my question about the video, okay? Here's my question about the video. It, the, the loadout he ends up going with at the end of the chat, but like by the end of the challenge is degreaser, panic attack, home wrecker, which is a, a pretty odd. He experiments with the combo pyro loadout, degreaser, flare gun, extinguisher, but can't get it to work. So switches back to degreaser, panic attack, and then homewrecker is an interesting choice. Homewrecker is an interesting choice because if, look, oh, here's what I'm saying, okay? Here's what I'm gonna say. That is the opt, aside from the homewrecker, which is, I guess, just a matter of personal preference and playstyle. If you're hanging around your engineers a lot, it makes sense. If, you're, if your goal is to bully spies, then, you know, it makes sense. Not my choice, but it makes sense. Um, and the thing is, if you have the panic attack and you're good with it, your damage output is already high enough that you don't really need the extinguisher. And if you're hanging around your engineers, you, you don't need, like, the back scratcher because you already have good, um, survivability. Because you're going to be hanging around dispensers anyway. And you're, you're mad on the back line. So you're fully fine. It's, it's not a terrible choice. Like, it's, it's a good utility tool. If you have, if you already have the high damage output of the, the panic attack, if you can hit your meat shots. Um, I can't hit my meat shots, but here's my contention. Okay, so he says he's never liked Pyro because WM1, you don't have to aim, and it feels low skill and mo and boring. Like, this is the thing, one of the, the, the things he talks about in the video is, like, how he sees WM, he's always played with the Dragon's Fury if he plays Pyro, because the, the WM1 with the flame particles is a really boring way to play. <laughs> Now, here's my contention, okay? Here's my contention. I think it takes more skill to be good WM1 pyro than a degreaser panic attack pyro. Now, hear me out here. The reason is because once you actually play pyro for a while, you will realize that just holding down mouse one and using the flame particles to kill people is actually not a very good weapon. It actually doesn't do very much DPS. It's it's actually pretty shit on purpose. It's it's not great. It's good for dealing with spies, but it's it takes a long time to to kill anyone except you know very low health enemies or whatever. Uh, it's it's actually not a very effective tactic. So, which is why most good pyros have some you know they they combo or have some gimmick. Um, it's not necessarily a gimmick, but they have some supplementary play style to allow them to do more damage. Either they're using the Dragon's Fury to be more powerful, or they're using combos, flare punches, or extinguisher combos, or they're using a shotgun to deal damage in between um, flame damage, or they're using the back burner to get crits. Right, all of every pyro loadout relies on using some extra thing to be able to actually do damage. Because w, just holding down mouse one doesn't really do much damage. It's not really effective. Um, and that's why it takes more skill, in my opinion. Because it relies not on aiming skill, but on uh, really good positioning and smart 
game sense and smart play styles and flanking and so on. I think it's actually really difficult to to play like that and be effective. Uh, it's it's not that difficult to get some kills, but to be really good with just WM1, I think is actually quite difficult. I think it's it's actually one of the harder things to do. You have to you have to have like excellent about like positioning um, and the ability to catch enemies off guard and uh, air blast them into a corner to to you know wear them down and so on. So that's my contention. I, I if you want to say it's boring, I mean that's 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 arguable. I think you you might be right about that. But I, I I think it is surprisingly skillful to to actually get like the problem is it has a really low skill floor. Like you can be you can do okay with it very easily. But to be a god tier WM1 pyro is actually really difficult. That's that's what I'm going to say. The second thing is, in my opinion, this is again just my opinion. This is just my opinion. Hey, this is just my opinion. This is just my. It's just. It's just, it's just don't don't attack me. Don't come after me. It's just my opinion. I think playing with a shotgun is way more boring than WM1. That's just my opinion. But the shotgun is like too optimal to the point where it's just boring. Just play scout or or or, or um uh, engineer if you just want to hit them meat shots. This uh I think if you're not playing with some sort of a uh, Pyro is swag. Pyro, in my in my mind, is about swag combos. And the shotgun, also, especially the way he's using it in the video, is very effective. Which is, I guess, he's more of a competitive gamer, right? We we got different. We got different. Me and me and Ron here, we, we have different brains. He needs to be doing well, um, in order to feel good. He needs to be playing as optimally as possible. Well, not necessarily as optimally as possible, but he, you know, he. I'm, this, this is, I'm psychoanalyzing this guy after watching one fucking video of him, but th- th- this is just a normal type of gamer. Like, people, he wants to min-max, right? Many people want to do this. Um, yeah, he, he wants to, to be, to, to f- find the most effective playstyle, to, to get as many kills as possible and help his team win as possible, which is perfectly normal. But for me, and for a lot of TF2 players, the one of the great things about the game is that you don't have to do that. You can find a playstyle that rather than just being super effective is like fun and swaggy even if it's less effective which is why i like the, i like the extinguisher combos frankly i need to be a bit more ballsy with my my extinguisher combos i i'm not ballsy enough i'm not doing the big sketch x style jump ex, jumping flap uh fucking death jumping extinguisher shit i might you know what today i'm gonna do i'm gonna go on tr walkway practice some of my extinguisher combos and then uh, hop in some games and see if I can get them to work. That's what I'm going to do today. But there's a great video. We just have different approaches to Pyro, which I think is pretty interesting. Like, the reason I like playing demo is because of the swag. The, the satisfaction of hitting air shots and trimping and dicky jumping and so on. Like, the, 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 the showy movement stuff and the, the cool combos, air shot combos and so on. Not, not really, like, the utility focused uh, as in being useful to your team destroying sentry nests and uh outputting crazy damage with your with stickies uh that's that's not the part of demo that i enjoy so it's just interesting it's interesting is what i'm saying that that we have different approaches to the game it's cool good video you should check it out i'm now caught up on vending machine isekai which at time of recording means episode eight i'm sure i'll finish it before the end of this surely i'll finish it before the end of this podcast um it's it's pretty good it's in terms of like animation quality it's pretty bad uh voice acting is fine it's whatever but like you know we're beyond all of that at this depth at this depth of otaku we're beyond all that or any of that nonsense it's actually a pretty interesting twist on the isekai genre to be honest with you it's i mean it's unique i'll give it that much it's very it's it's much more interesting like a lot of isekai for example slime isekai start with a character or kumodeska nanika like a character who is transformed into some other form and has to like deal with their newfound abilities and inabilities um but being a vending machine is like way more limiting than being a slime or a, a, a weird spider i'm trying to think of there's others there's probably others but um it's a it's a very particular it's a it's a more i mean just the fact that he can't move makes makes it more interesting and also like you learn about different vending machine types it's cool 
I like that. It's neat. It's in, it's like a it's it's pretty interesting. That's all I'll say. It's it's like which is rare for a generic isekai. Like it's like the, a way for the writers to force themselves. Or I guess it's just based on a light novel written by one guy. So the writer to force himself to like be more creative, even though the setting is like a pretty generic isekai setting. The fact that the character has these particular limitations and particular powers that are very unusual um, makes the writing like more creative. Like the solutions to problems aren't just I'm the strongest and so I hit it with my powerful attack, um, which is most isekai. You know, there's some level of creative solutions, even if the main character's never really in any danger. What are you complaining about, dog? I think he wants to go outside, but it's raining. I went through my currently watching on Mal, and apparently I, I watched episode one of this show called Isekai de Cheat Skill. Oh my god, this is a long title. I got a cheat skill in another world and became unrivaled in the real world too. So apparently I'd watched the first episode of this, and I do remember watching it. I'm pretty sure I watched... I don't know why why or when, but probably one of my watching every anime ever season things. And I never dropped it, so I was like, huh. So I'm, I've watched four episodes now, and like, god damn, is this show terrible. Holy shit. <laughs> Like, it's almost so bad it's good. Like, it's almost entertainingly bad. And I can't... It's, like, right on the edge of, like, bad in an entertaining way and bad in just a bad way. Um, this is basically, like... I think this is, like, the most wish... Like, absurd wish fulfillment show that I've seen. Like, I normally don't knock wish fulfillment. I think it's good. I think it's a, it's fine and a cool thing to have in a show if you want. But this takes it to just an absurd degree. Like, every woman instantly falls in love with the main character. And there are, sometimes people say that, but they're exaggerating to just mean, like, he has a harem. No, no. Literally every single woman who sees him instantly falls in love with him. He's so ridiculously strong, nothing could possibly threaten him any in any way. He's rich, He's ridiculously handsome, and, it, like, everything in his life is just constantly lucky. He just constantly runs into people giving him, like, opportunities. It's insane. It's just an insane level. Like, he's just always doing the coolest guy stuff to the point of, like, supernatural ability, but no one ever questions it. Like, no one's like, oh, that's fucking weird. How did you just jump out of a fourth-story window and be fine? They're just like, that was cool. He jumped out. Wow, you're so gakoi. You're so gakoi. Wow. Like, what? No one questions how he can just, like, instantly move at, like, superhuman speeds and be a superhero. Like, this is this should be a superhero anime. But there's a reason superheroes have to hide their power. I don't know. This is just... It's it's insane. I don't think I can... I don't think I can deal with this. It's a bit too... Like, sometimes it's funny. But it's also, like, extremely ugly. The show is extremely ugly. Which kind of makes it, like, worse. Like, I can kind of deal with a terrible show if it looks good. But no, this this show is just extremely ugly. Do not... I don't know if I can... It, it's almost worth watching just for the comedy of it. But not quite. Oh, look... You remember how I've been complaining about Mal's review section for ages? They've fucking done something about it. I never expected this to happen. They've actually fixed, or at least made it significantly better, the review section. Now, on every show, they show a positive review, a mixed feelings review, and a not recommended review. So you get a, a, a balanced account of people who like and don't like the anime. And it shows you, at the top, a bar of how many people recommend the show, have mixed feelings, or not recommend it. They've, they've been, I consider this to be an excellent change. It's not as good as a proper downvote, but, like, it's pretty good. I mean, personally, I still think the way that the confusing tag works is, is, is bad and wrong. Uh, but, yeah, other than that, I think it's a pretty good, pretty good change. Also, I'm watching, um, Kenja no Mago, and personally, I'm quite enjoying it. I'm quite enjoying it. It's okay. It's not amazing. <laughs> of course, it's not amazing. But it's exactly what you want from a mid-tier isekai. It's very mid-tier 
and Isekai, which is what I wanted to watch right now. So, epic. Listen, I'm an Isekai defender, okay? I'm a Nat OK defender. I, I kind of want to make a video about um, being, being a, an Isekai defender uh, and a Nat OK defender. I'm not sure what I would say. But I kind of I've been I've been wanting to make this video in defense of mid anime for a long time. But I've I d I don't quite like it's more of a vibes based thing than something I can really articulate very well. I kind of did this in um oh fuck. I made the I made a video at one point. Which one was it? Which fucking video was it? Hold on. There's a video where I explain something. What is a normie? It's that one, right? It's it's the what is a normie video I think, um, where I say like um, that the the thing that makes you an otaku is not just being a nerd but specifically liking the bad parts. It's it's like yeah, <laughs> I don't know how to explain it. I didn't fucking sleep. My sleep has been so fucked up recently, man. I, like, fucking slept for ten hours two nights in a row, and then last night slept for six hours. And then woke up feeling really dizzy. Um, anyway, sorry, that's not relevant. But, yeah, the, the, let me see if I can just find the section from this video. Uh, is it this? Oh, YouTube fan films about my hero. Indeed, I would say that being an anime fan in some capacity is considered normal right now. In London, there are sometimes big movie posters in the tube for upcoming anime films. I saw posters for Koe no Katachi, Kimi no Nawa, and even a film called Hanabi, which I never saw. Where is the line between casual fan and otaku? Is it purely in the raw amount of anime you've watched? It's tempting to leave it at that, but I think it's a little more complicated. I propose that the defining feature of otakudom is liking the bad parts. Any average person is likely to have some passing interest in science. Doing a fun experiment as a kid, seeing footage of another planet, watching a video by Veritasium or Smarter Every Day. But a truly passionate scientist, as science otaku, they like not only the good bits, they like repeating the same experiment multiple times to verify their results. They like studying previous literature. They get a kick out of data analysis. Enjoyment may be too much of a strong word, they may still find it boring or tedious in the moment. It's something different, a form of catharsis, some feeling of completeness. The average person might enjoy playing football with their mates, but an athlete gets something out of practicing drills and boring training routines. In the same sense, an anime fan may love Cowboy Bebop and Kill la Kill, but an otaku will watch 50 harem shows and, well, they won't like it. We're not retarded, but there is just something there which makes you say to yourself, anime is trash, and I wouldn't want it any other way. I'm not quite sure how to put this emotion into words, but the way I see it, there are two kinds of bad. I'm a huge fan of Star Trek The Next Generation. It's my favorite TV show. Every Star Trek fan knows that the show doesn't really get good until Riker grows a beard after season one. And yet, TNG is still amazing, even with the bad episodes, because the highs are so high. No one would necessarily recommend season one to a new fan. It's general practice to recommend that new fans watch the two or three season one episodes that are important for continuity and then skip to season two. However, fans of Star Trek don't necessarily skip season one on a rewatch. People don't hate it. You know what we do hate? Star Trek Discovery. And yet, it's certified fresh on Rotten Tomatoes. And it's really popular. The three most popular anime, according to my anime list, are Death Note, Attack on Titan, and Sword Art Online. All three of which are derided by otaku in general. So the general populace says they're good, but otaku don't like them. Then, when you go to the shows with a rating in the sixes, you'll find something like Netoge no Yome wa Onna no Ko Janai to Omota, which is for sure complete trash, but it's otaku trash. It's about a guy who begrudgingly marries a girl on an MMO because he thinks she's a guy pretending to be a girl, only to find out that she's actually a real girl who goes to his school and is totally cute. And she really wants to bang him, of course. And the main guy has no personality at all and yet is somehow surrounded by a harem of attractive women who are all also obsessed by MMOs. By all metrics, this is shit. <laughs> I certainly wouldn't recommend it to anyone. And yet, 
I finished it. I couldn't finish Attack on Titan. I have no desire to watch Death Note, and SAO is trash. What's going on here? Well, the fact is, Netoke no Yomei wa Onnoko Janai Tomota is trash in a way that only anime can be. At no point were the views of normies considered when making this show. The creators set out to make wish fulfillment for otaku, otaku like anime, so of course there's trashy anime bullshit in it, because that is what we came for. Yeah, okay, that's basically the point. I don't think I made a good... I don't... I have problems with the anime is trash mentality. It's not... It's not a, like that. It's more like anime is pulp. This is the thing. This is like the key factor. Like a lot of the stuff that I see Normans complain about in terms of anime is like basically the stuff that is unique about anime. You know, like they want it to be a smoothed off, rounded out, more sterile, sexless, uh, broader appeal but also simultaneously uh, more artistically... How do I put it? It's, uh, they, 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 I think, I think to, be, to be honest with you, I think it's about class. I think they want it... They, they don't like watching anime that feel low class. They don't like, you know, shows that are wish fulfillment for otaku or shows with a lot of fan service. Or shows with sexual immorality in them. Um, shows with, with taboo or, you know, any of these sorts of things. Because those are the sorts of things that the upper classes are supposed to deride. You look at high art in museums and um, the way in which it transgresses is very purposeful. You know, when, when you see uh, contemporary art that has some sort of transgressive feature to it, uh, it's always in service of some sort of higher philosophical message. There's very rarely transgression for the sake of transgression. And if there is, that's that's also a higher philosophical message. You don't normally see transgression for, like, because, I guess, like, because it's fun, uh, right? Like, you're not supposed to enjoy it. Uh, or, like, you need some excuse to enjoy it, some sort of transgressive media in the eyes of the the uh the upper classes like if you're going to uh it, it needs to justify itself it needs to be nabokov right it needs to be lolita where it's like oh yeah the work is transgressive but you know it's it's justified because it's this masterpiece of literature and it's making all of these uh thematic points and and so on right or say i don't know fountain by michel duchamp right like yes, it's it's a it's a it's toilet humor. However, like it's also making a broader point about uh, art, uh, like what the nature of art is and the nature of museums, uh, you know, what their position in society and and so on. So it's like yeah, it's transgressive, but there's this element of intellectualism where you're allowed to enjoy the the taboo subject, toilets or. Uh, taboo sex acts and stuff like this um because oh no no i'm there's a layer of separation i'm enjoying it but i'm not enjoying it for its own sake i'm enjoying it for its intellectual merits um there there are many examples of this right i mean you can go to an art museum and there's a reason why modern art is very uh, abstracted from uh the forms of like maybe realism or impressionism or so on right you go to an art museum now at a modern art museum and you see blocks of color uh or or abstract sculptures um you know these sorts of things right and then they have a little plaque next to them that just that tells you why you're why you're allowed to enjoy it but um sometimes you know and this is not knocking that okay i love modern art i go to i i actually go to art museums occasionally um there are there are some great free Art, m- modern art museums in London that I have visited on a regular occurrence, okay? There's, I'm, I'm a fan of it, and I, I don't just like, you know, there's, to me, there's there's some forms of modern art where it's like, it just looks good. So, for, I, I think a lot of the, uh, uh, fuck, this is kind of beyond the subject of what we're talking about, so I, I'll just not talk about that, because it's kind of a whole, it's just a tangent. The point is, when when art is, it's very abstracted because there's a tendency 
and it's the same in philosophy as well of like more radical more you got to be more radical than the next guy to get noticed right but uh like what counts as radical you have to be very careful so for example in 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 leftist political academia you know at first it goes from like maybe you know marx he says oh uh you know there's the there's this relationship between the 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 bourgeoisie and the proletariat that's exploitative or whatever and then you know after may 68 or even before i mean you get the that they're like oh the world it, it is constructed with these social relations and economic relations that are inherently exploitative uh and then you get into like the situationists and they're like oh no no not only is uh that rela- that that the case but also i'm actually going to go further we actually live in a society of the spectacle where um you know our, our our ordinary world has been replaced with one of of images um right so it's like we don't even access reality even that reality like i'm going even more radical and then you get foucault he's like no no not only is society that but also it's literally a prison like look at all these institutions actually they they're literally prisons like it, or they they're very similar to prisons right look how radical i'm being and then you get um you know you can sort of keep going like this uh through all of those french theorists right like they're all kind of trying to one up each other and being more radical deleuze is like not only is you know certain institutions certain disciplinary institutions like prisons but actually the ones that aren't are actually even worse because because they operate by controlling our very desire like some sort of mind control cia mk ultra experiment uh you know they they so even the things that aren't prisons it doesn't matter because our own brains and our own our own uh ability for desire uh is up for grabs you know it's even more radical and then this kind of goes even to like some of the the later 80s 90s uh baudrillard stuff where baudrillard says like becomes even more uh um uh, of a doomer sort of where he's he he goes like uh, uh you know the masses they actually know what they want they're a, they're a force of inertia they don't actually want change uh such you know the the saying that the masses are a driving force of political change is actually the historical inaccuracy the masses don't really want political change they they want to stay, you know like uh, it's all doomed like you you can just go like this and then you get into like maybe the more outside of that political field you go from like anarcho syndicalism like let's build a you know the state and capitalism are, are bad so let's build a society made of syndicates and so on and then you go to the 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 actually it's not just that it's also uh you know um maybe egoism or oh industrial society like we haven't even talked about how you, you won't really solve the problems unless you abolish industrial society actually you need to even abolish agriculture and return to some primitivist nonsense or oh actually uh you know we're still trapped in our forms we need to have full morphological freedom and become an arco transhumanist or you know uh actually we're being led to our slaughter big not only you know it's beyond foucault this is a prison it's now blessed is the flame it's actually a concentration camp that's how bad everything is look how radical my theory is um there's this constant game of like i'm more radical i'm more radical than you i'm more radical than you um to get noticed i think it's just sort of a a function of the system right where where the things that get noticed are the things that are in some way exceptional and the easiest way to be exceptional is to be more radical uh, not to say that like that doesn't necessarily mean that these theories are incorrect or not useful but that is a, a definitely a pattern and something that is encouraged by by systems of information and 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 noticing uh which is you know worth keeping in mind when you're reading this stuff and the art world is the same right where you go from like once once the ability of abstraction becomes more recognized as valid it becomes sort of a race to to abstract more and more right and become more radical and then you go to art galleries and you see like conceptual art or or abstract art that is you know more more deconstructed than the previous person you see like this oh your art is like 
uh, um, impressionistic, while well, mine is totally abstract. It's just forms and shapes. Uh, or, or I guess it goes from like impressionism to cubism to like abstract whatever. And then like oh yours you have you have shapes. Well, I just splashed paint on a canvas. You're still using a canvas. I taped a banana to a wall or something like this. And then it goes you know beyond that like oh well not only is my painting abstract but there actually are forms but those forms are forms of the obscene look there's a penis there's a vagina uh there's murder or it's like oh you're still dealing with uh art as if it's separated from the political my art makes an a clear political statement uh you know and that political statement is radical and so on so there's this push where it's of like more radical However, this is the thing that I've been trying to get in, get to it by the end of this run. There's, you're only allowed to be radical, or not necessarily only allowed to, but but the the obvious end result to me of of this push to be more and more radical, and because what I mean by that is really to transgress, right? You take something that was thought of as sacred and you show that it was actually never sacred at all. This is what all of these things do at the end of the day. They take something that was previously uh, deemed to just sort of be the way it is, uh, which is essentially sacred, right? like unquestioned or unquestionable, and they reveal that at the heart of it, it, it had nothing. However, I think what this eventually leads to, and what we've seen it lead to, is, uh, uh, or, or rather, you can you can be very... I'm not saying it necessarily leads to this. What I'm saying is it's something that can happen when you go down this path is you can essentially end up in fascism because uh, eventually you go, well, you know, if all of these other things are are questionable and not sacred, what about, uh, you know, any of these goals about human emancipation or egalitarianism, you know, or these, these sorts of things. Like, well, if, if, if Baudrillard is saying that the masses are actually... Uh, you know, not stupid and need to be awakened, but actually smart and know that they want a king so that they can shift blame off of themselves because they don't want to take power because they don't want to, the responsibility and the blame that that uh, being in charge would give them. It's only, you know, one step further than that to think, and they're right, which is why we need like an absolute monarchy and a return to traditional centralized forms of power. You know, it's it's not that far i mean obviously that's not what Baudrillard is saying at all and i'm not implying that that's what he's saying um but like it's you can see what i mean right like you could definitely make that leap but that's a very scary leap to make most people don't want to do that like you could if you really want to transgress in the art world putting a penis or a vagina in your painting is not very transgressive anymore you're not going to get noticed the thing that would be really transgressive would be to put some sort of fascist symbolism in your artwork but if you put some sort of fascist symbolism without directly critiquing it, that's too edgy. That's way too far, you know. Um, so in reality, because of this need for uh, some level of intellectual separation from the obscene, uh, uh, people who are engaged in this sort of high art or, uh, you know, it's not even necessarily high art, but th- this extends to cinema, it extends to prestige TV and so on, um, uh, as much as it extends to philosophy and and anything else, they need some level of like yes, it's transgressive, but there's a justification for the transgression. When in reality, they just want the, I think they just want the transgression and they can't admit it to themselves. What they really want is just to see all of their symbols shatter because that's a, a cathartic experience. It doesn't achieve anything in the world. It doesn't make any material change because it only affects the world of images. But we live in the world of images, so that's as much as we can do. And so it's very cathartic when you read Foucault say that, oh, these institutions, well, here's the hidden truth, they're actually prisons. That's cathartic because you have this sense of like, aha, I've demolished the sacred. But you can justify it to yourself by set, by intellectualizing it. Um, and it, it's the case, you know, you, you go to the art world, you see, uh, I don't know, some realist painting, you see that concept of realism, which was always, you know, imposed, um, and enforced be demolished and you become you you become you 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 have some sense of catharsis from seeing that but uh or or the idea that oh you shouldn't you shouldn't the obscene or the pornographic or whatever the political shouldn't take a hold in this particular sphere oh that taboo is broken now great like that feels good it feels satisfying to have zones where 
uh, taboos can be broken. That's how taboos work. They need to be broken in certain zones, otherwise they they don't exist. But but I think people they don't it it's a uh, it makes you feel icky. It makes you feel morally icky when you uh, break those taboos without some layer of intellectual separation. And to be clear here, those taboos don't just mean things that are uh, necessarily seen as morally wrong or or like when when I'm saying demolishing the sacred, I'm I'm sort I'm I'm talking about this is the transition that's kind of hard to make. I think it's not just about content; it's about the work itself, the text. So, like, um, let's say th- this is the tr- this is the tricky part to explain. When you make the move over, you know, the course of generations, but when you make the move from. Uh, I, I don't know what to call it. I guess we can just call it realism, right? Realist art, um, drawings that look like things in the world, to abstract art, drawings that look like things that don't exist in the world. Um, you you don't only attack the concept... Like, what what's nice to think about is, oh, we're attacking the concept of, of this particular value. But what's actually happening is, in some way, you're, you're attacking, like what is deemed to be good. Like, if you're coming from a context where, as a lot of people are, because obviously modern art gets trashed all the time. People people hate modern art. A lot of people hate modern art, right? So it's like, why do they hate it? Because it looks bad to them. Like, there's no other... Like, you're, you're taking some essence of aesthetics and you're trampling all over it, purposefully, right? Um, uh, but you need some intellectual people. People need some sort of way to intellectualize why why this is uh, justified and valid. But I don't think that intellectualization is what they want. I think they just want to be free to enjoy something ugly. Uh, but I I don't think they 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 want to admit that to themselves. So to bring this back to isekai anime. <laughs> oh my god! What? <laughs> Wait, what what's going on? So to bring this back to isekai anime. Why are you bringing back the, the how? How are you bringing that back to isekai? So, so I think the reason why isekai, like like trashy isekai, is good, is because it is low art and it's free from this level of intellectualization. It breaks all of these taboos, um, i.e., like what is considered to be in good taste, what is considered to be, uh, you know, good art, and and allows it to just be what we all really want, which is. You know, a harem of beautiful women who will want all want to fuck us, and to be the most powerful guy in the world, who's the coolest guy in the world, right? Like, me- and without needing some level of intellectualization behind it, and it allows us to break these taboos, like oh, s- 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 slavery is bad, or incest is bad, or you know, all That's of these sorts of things. That's not why Isekai is good. That's not why Trash Isekai is good. This is, um, this is, I'm doing a thing here. Okay, you're doing a thing. You're just lying. I'm not lying. Okay. I'm saying it's made specifically. This is the the point of otaku is that when I say enjoying the bad parts is what makes you an otaku, those are the bad parts I'm talking about. The parts that you don't need to intellectualize it. You don't need to have some intellectual separation where there's some justification for breaking taboo. In in and taboo again also can mean what is aesthetically considered to be in good taste. If an if an isekai is poorly animated, you know, on the cheap, it's poorly written. The characters are don't have anything to do with anything. They don't. They they they're terrible one dimensional. There's no originality in terms of ideas, right? You know, it's just a copy paste of every other Shosetsu Kaminado story that's ever been written for the past ten years. Uh, you know, it deals with all sorts of themes in ways that are politically abhorrent, right? It, it, it has terrible political messaging that it clearly hasn't put any conscious thought into. Like, uh, you know, uh, uh, my good slave owner, or, uh, you know, a lot of isekai flirt a lot with, like, fascist or monarchist ideas, where it's like, oh, the, the, the ultimate hero is going to come, and with his strong leadership you know, an iron fist, take out all the bad guys and do public works projects. Sometimes it's very on the nose, like Realist Hero is. Um, You know, you have all of this stuff, but there's no space within the the text or the context to intellectualize it. There's no justification. No one came along and said, oh, it's okay that I do this because I'm trying to make a point about this. There's no point. 
it's pure masturbation. And frankly, it's not true. It's true. No, like the the part what makes trash is a okay, good, right? Isn't because it's like fucking. Oh, this is me having my power fantasy. Because no, Isaka is actually a power fantasy other than like the five ones who didn't get the message. The point of an Isakai is some guy spent ten years looking at fucking Dragon Quest spreadsheets and was like, if I was in this world, I I wanna be free from the constraints, right? It's it's important to contextualize Isakai within like JRPGs. Because within JRPGs, right, the systems are obtuse, you can min-max the hell out of them, but the game basically kind of prevents you from doing that through, like, arbitrary means. So, like, the desire for an isekai is the desire to just play an RPG, essentially. But it's to be able to, like, actually play an RPG like a sandbox. Like, that's an important facet of why, why isekai is good, is because RPGs are good, and that, that's, like, the point. Yeah, but I, I think you're accidentally agreeing with me. Yeah? Because you're still saying... You're, what you're doing with that fan- power fantasy is breaking the uh, the the, the taboo. Gamer taboo. The, the t- I, uh, yes. Yeah. The taboo of cheating. Yeah. Right. Because what really isekai overpowered cheat protagonists are doing is installing hacks. Right. No, they're, they're, they're just, just maxing an existing system that the game prevents they're, from. They're not though, because they come in with some stupid advantage that doesn't make any sense. I mean, that's right. That's kind of fall enough to. No, well, I'm talking about the ones that exist. That th- those are the ones that I've been watching recently. So oh, I mean, like the recent about. trash isekai is like you have a power that lets you ignore one system basically. Yeah, but so that's always a... the most important system secret. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So. Like, like the, the age of isekai that's, that goes like you have a power that makes you a god like those are done no those but what I'm saying is the, the, that's like saying oh well aimbot it lets you ignore the system of aiming in the game yeah but that's the most important system in the game it's yeah, always yeah. like that yeah what I'm saying is like the, e- even when the character looks nerfed like yeah. like like vending machine isekai right yeah. he looks nerfed he can't move on his yeah. own he's a fucking vending machine he can't <laughs> talk right but actually, he has access to infinite items. Yeah. Right. Which means he can do anything because you have infinite items. Yeah. You can be. Well, the point is that people people aren't actually interested in being like the cheat hero with infinite. No mana. one wants to be that guy. Yeah, really, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. This is why you watch it is to find out that you don't want to be that guy in reality. No, the, like the that's point... the point of wish fulfillment. This is another thing that I've yeah. been saying. Wish fulfillment isn't about. Um, achieving your desire, right? No one actually. It's about. It's about not. It's about the gap where you know that you don't actually want this. Yeah. That's what I think. Wish for like. It's like no one would actually play an RPG if you didn't have to grind levels, right? Yeah. That, the, that's the, the point. The point, like, that's the reason, like, why every Isekai these days, right? Has the character grind levels at some point, basically? Normally off screen. <laughs> Normally off screen, but they still do it. Yeah, but that's that's just a, a, a some sort of sublimation to th- this ideal. Right? It's, has, it's not a sublimation to the ideal. The point of grinding for levels is that you want to do it. You just the, the, no, you you don't. This is the thing. I you don't want to do it. You want to have done it. You want to be in a world where people do it. You you want to you what you want right in a, in in the isekai power fantasy yeah. is to have all the power and also have it be justified. Yeah. Right. You most people don't just want to be a god gamer or to you yeah. know, to have the god power, but it to be unearned. Yeah. And then everyone can look at them and. You know, so so what I'm saying. But is... what I'm saying is those those earning it stages yeah. in isekai they never really earn it because sometimes they, they do. grind slimes for three thousand years off screen before the first yeah. episode starts and right? there, there's this isekai that's like a fucking um some stupid name it has sub in it because it's a sub character and like the character in there just like fucking farms an item for ridiculous drop rate and i'm like that's just like how i played the mmorpg hit game from scape old yeah. school right <laughs> And it's like fucking... Yeah, it, but this is the point. It's still a power fantasy that's taboo. Yeah, but the point is, it's like... It's, it's a power fantasy from a specific context because it relates to people who live a specific context. I, I agree. Right. So it's not, it's not a unilateral power fantasy. It's fucking no game, no life, right? The power fantasy isn't that they're gods. The power fantasy is that the specific thing they're good at is the thing that matters. The power fantasy is that the main guy has a little sister who wants to fuck him. I mean, the power fantasy in no game, no life... It's half that, but half that they're just living in a world where their skill set is useful. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, but so, but the the key is that a, a high art version of No Game No Life would have to have some critique of why that's not okay. Yeah. But No Game No Life doesn't want to have that critique because it's yeah. good. 
Yeah, what, what I'm saying is it is the power of fantasy isn't the fantasy of having power. It's the fantasy of actualizing your existing power if you know realm where it's relevant. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. But but so in in that because, sense because but in reality your existing power doesn't exist. Being able to grind levels in an MMO doesn't make you special or smart. I mean, really. it kind of makes me special. Yeah, yeah, in the world of the MMO, but not in like I mean, obviously everything is arbitrary. Yeah. But like it doesn't it doesn't generally it 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 challenges the idea of like value itself, yeah. right? Like what is actually valuable? Yeah. And it's like you know the the play is what if there was a world where value was judged differently? Yeah. I think like no. So game... that's di- that's different than what you were saying. It's it's all about... It's not different from what I'm saying because because a like a, a piece of high art that was doing this sort of thing would want to deconstruct the concept of value itself. They would want to have some intellectual discussion about how you know how diff- they would want to do what we're doing, what yeah. you're doing, where you're saying, oh, isekai is about flipping the power dynamics of reality, where the otaku nerd is actually suddenly his skill set is the most important thing ever. Being the best MMO gamer of all time suddenly makes him super powerful and so have lots of social influence in the real world. Or being a vending machine otaku is suddenly the most useful skill to have and makes yeah, him but, the most powerful. But that's in what the, the isekai do these things. I disagree. I think that I, they just, they just... I, what I'm saying is. Um, okay, take superheroes, right? Yeah. Superheroes when they were schlock, yeah. i.e., the OG, like Spider-Man, yeah. right? Lots of nerdy uh, guys at the time were photographers because being a photographer and into that sort of stuff yeah. was a nerdy hobby. And Spider-Man is all about what if the nerdy guy was secretly the strongest guy? Yeah. That's a power fantasy. You look at modern subversive superhero movies, and it's it, you can't allow that. You have to have some analysis of like you know, Homelander-esque character where it's like, yeah, he's the strongest guy, but that's actually bad. You shouldn't be the strongest guy, right? Uh, because if... You, and and suddenly, these are acceptable to watch to a mainstream public who wants to... Or, or a, yeah. a middle class, upper middle class and upper class public who yeah, wants but, to see themselves as some sort of... But the thing is, right, is it, is, it all, is it all goes downstream anyways, right? Because what these movies are doing now was high art back in the early 2000s. But, but at this point, the voice is tried. It came out by a time when it was no longer relevant. Yeah, because because even even saying that is now not not intellectualized enough, right? Yeah, the, the, the intellectuals these days, you know what you're saying. What? I like movie with explosion. That but they they don't they they they're not saying that they're not saying that because they they. I'm, it's it's gone full circle. It's all fashion. It hasn't it hasn't come full. It's all fashion. I agree yeah. with you on that. But it it hasn't really come full circle because the the I like movie with explosion. It's like I don't know what 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 movies are you talking about? I don't know, like fucking John Wick or whatever. John Wick is not John particularly. Wick. I don't know if it necessarily fits within this, but like even that, yeah, it's like okay, I like John Wick, but I don't like you know Black Widow. Which is also a movie with explosion and and person yeah. who does close quarters yeah, but combat. Yeah, what I'm saying is it's like it's like um, the current fashion within the intellectual sphere is about the effects, it's about the choreography, it's about the, the um, directing, it's yeah. about the but that's, plot or substance or themes. But that's also a level of intellectualization. Yeah, I know it is. Right, but isekai. What I'm saying about tr- like sh- uh, schlock or pulp yeah. media is it 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 does does away with any of that no, it, it shows is, you what you want to see no that's that's not true that's not how pulp works right because isekai isn't like some animation studio coming up with an isekai generally generally it's a light novel author who's really into rpgs or has some other otaku hobby i disagree who, who actually like spends time like fucking gaming for 10 years i disagree. and then tries a light novel i think that was the case when no game no life was written and when um, Mushoku Tensei was written, yeah. and so on. But now, it's some guy on Shosetsu Kaninado who has read a bunch of other isekai on Shosetsu Kaninado is recreating their tropes without any self-awareness. Yeah, but the thing is, like, if you're a Japanese male, or even if you're a Japanese Yeah, I person, mean, you play JRPGs. You play Dragon Quest. Yeah, you play Dragon Quest. Yeah. I, I agree. Or, so or, you can't really separate it from that context. I'm, I'm not separating it from that context. Yeah, but the thing is, like, every guy, everyone who writes an isekai writes it from a perspective of having played an MMO. Right, but what, what I'm saying is an intellectual version of an isekai would have some aspect to it where it it it's it's like okay 
take take Hunter Hunter for example. Yeah. Right. Hunter Hunter, it's like you it has all the stuff that you're saying about grinding, right? Yeah. Hunter Hunter is very grinding focused. Yeah. But it's always like, okay, we're going to take these characters and contextualize them in the world where actually they're not the strongest guys of all time, and they have all of this inter- in, internal turmoil, right? And yeah. It's like we never really want to give them all the power. Yeah. Because because we know that that's like fashy. We know that that opens up a whole kind of taboo worms that we don't want to deal with. Yeah, but you you know what happens in the isekai when the guy has all the power. What? It ends. That's true, yeah. but that's that's because uh, that's not true. That's not true actually. Yeah. No, most of the trashy isekai start by giving the guy all the power, and then it just sort of lets things play from there. Like this yeah, one that I'm one, watching. The only one that I have read that's like that is Kuma Kuma Bear. That's a different thing altogether. Most of them are like that, in my opinion. Like this one, the this is called um, Kenja no Mago, right? The way this works is the guy's the strongest guy from yeah. the beginning. He's always been the strongest yeah. guy. He's 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 always been the strongest guy. He was his adoptive parents in the isekai world are the previous strongest guys who are national heroes yeah. and incredibly rich, and also best friends with the king who's, you know, the king, yeah. who has all the money and power, who he gets into school for, you know, the the best, most prestigious mm-hmm. magic academy for free because he spends with the king. In the magic academy, he's so much absurdly stronger than everyone else that it doesn't even make any sense to judge them he, similarly. You know what they figured out. And he's world famous. Every woman wants to fuck him immediately because he's the strongest guy and handsome yeah. guy. Uh, the the pure maiden, the, the, the Madonna whore, right, yeah. who's like simultaneously a pure maiden but also no, I just I just figured that's what this entire conversation is about. What? I'm re- I read just like random isekai that are in manga form and that start publication in like 2021. You're you're watching an anime based off of like a 2019 isekai light novel that was wildly successful. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I think that's where the difference comes in. That's true. I think we're both I, right. I think that they're, they're definitely some of the isekai manga yeah. are more heavily they lean more heavily into the jrpg elements yeah like, i think i think he's a, like i think since manga is a more niche medium altogether right yeah but i don't think it's necessary what i'm really trying to get at yeah here is i'm defending trash isekai i'm not defending like slime isekai or konosuba for example yeah. those are good shows wait, wait, we're not talking about slime isekai or konosuba we're talking about fucking the, i got the a- I got the exiled and I'm the fucking strongest heavy knight with the most game knowledge. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's what I'm talking about. But my my point about these isekai and why I'm trying to defend them yeah. is I'm saying like I'm I'm trying to frame the fact that they're not good as part of the appeal. Yeah, but what in I'm this, saying. But, but in this, the reason I'm appealing to abstract art and stuff yeah. is because what I'm saying is in the same way that if you judge like Rothko by the yeah. standards of Da Vinci, yeah. you know, it doesn't make any sense. It's like, this yeah. is trash. It's just fucking splashes of color yeah. on it. It doesn't make it, it's garbage. Yeah, right? but, but what, what I'm saying, right, is that pulp media is almost always necessarily intellectualized because it's not made by a group of people. It's generally made by like one guy, right? And I, that I one guy has I strongly disagree with that. I think pulp media, especially isekai, is, is basically just spawns out of uh, otaku existing. I, I I don't think it spawns. I think it's like a living human being who has thoughts and opinions and wants to express them within the context of. I don't agree. I think attitude. I think it's just someone mindlessly recreating tropes. The bad ones are just someone mindlessly recreating I've tropes. I've never heard one that's like. That. This is I mean this one's like that. There's also um fuck the one I just dropped, which was like the most like that I've yeah. ever seen. Which is um fuck, it's got a really long title. Isekai the cheat skill wa tenishta orewa genjutsu sekai wa mo muso suru level level up wa jinsei wa kaeta. Oh no, I haven't read it. Yeah, it's really bad. It's, but this is like the most wish fulfillment that yeah. I've ever seen in Isekai. The way yeah. this this anime works is the main guy, he's a, a, a fat, ugly nerd otaku, right? And then yeah. he becomes skinny. Yeah, he becomes... No, 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 no. Not only does he become skinny, he literally becomes the most attractive guy in the world. Oh my to God. the point where he's just walking in the mall in like episode three. He's just walking around and... Um, because uh, he can go back and forth between the yeah. isekai world and the real world. So he 
he's just walking in the mall and literally a photographer comes up to him and he's like, oh my God, you're the most handsome guy ever. We need to do a photo shoot with you. Okay. And this this girl, and the girl, like, okay, and the opinion. girl is instantly attracted to him who's a model, right? So there's that. He's also the best in school, the most attractive guy ever. And in the isekai world, he's the strongest guy ever. He never had to grind for any of this. It was all left to him by his is... grandpa, right? His grandpa left him the yeah. strongest gear in the isekai world. It, it, and he never... The, even the small grinding he does isn't, like, any risk. Yeah. It just takes place within the... So it's all very stupid. No, in the isekai world, no, the no, princess no, no, no. instantly falls talk. in love with him. Are you, right? are you made your point... No, 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 no. You don't understand your how wish fulfillment is. Your podcast listeners, how will they hear you You don't understand how wish fulfillment is. I, 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 I got it. No, no. I got the point. Okay. It's you don't need to explain it to the listeners at twice. One point, they're a, people too. At one, <laughs> Think of them. No, they're not people. We're they are numbers. Innocent <laughs> men. <laughs> okay, okay. Okay, so what I'm saying though is that like an isekai like this isn't actually recreating tropes. It's inventing tropes that they think exist. Yeah, but that's how it's always been. I guess so. But, but I, I think that's a different, uh, different thing entirely because that's not, that's not pulp media. That's, that is pulp media. What are you talking about? Actual pulp media isn't ever about recreating imaginary tropes. Actual pulp media is about something someone thought was cool. That I think that is what this is. I I don't I think that's just something someone wrote because it's, it's also like it kind of corporatized. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. So like at that point when you reach that level of like just complete it's kind of you know what it is yeah you, it's it's basically like like you go on youtube and you find 20 million fortnite videos that are all exactly the or same fucking video. mr beast clones it's that yeah but, it, but that's it, not pop media too no but it instead of being no i don't think it's mr beast clones yeah because they're too high effort no mr beast clones aren't high effort i think they are they require a lot of edit i mean i haven't watched any mr beast clones so they just put a funny face in the thumbnail and hire an editor I'm I'm thinking about like like the 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 sort of I don't know whatever. No, to to me this is kind of a Mr. Beast clone type situation. It might maybe it's a Mr. Beast yeah. clone type situation. So what, what I'm saying, right, is it's 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 not a clone of like the actual pulp media. It's a clone of the public perception of the. My, my, the point I'm trying to make is that trying to critically analyze media that is like willingly uncritical of itself is missing yeah. the point yeah well, what i'm saying is it's not uncritical of itself because it's recreating other isekai i'm saying it's uncritical of itself because it's just one guy with opinions uh, here's here's my point right yeah if you were to watch some media which depicted slavery yeah. right like let's say i don't know something unproblematic what's an unproblematic thing that has slaves in it no but like, like what i'm saying like the general point i'm trying to make is the slave girls in isekai aren't there because people think slave girls are hot it's because the author thinks that slave girls are hot yeah but also lots of other people think yeah they, are hot. they just happen to think that way yeah yeah so what I'm, what I'm saying is it's like way more personalized well, it's, I don't think it's, it they way. just happen to think that way I think it's a product of so, yeah. So society yeah, but what, what I'm saying Craig, the, the thing the, the reason I disagreed with you that it's about individuals yeah. is because it's. I think it's about a scene it's a bit about the scene but it's also a lot about individuals it's about a specific fantasy that the person writing the isekai has right but that fantasy doesn't make any any fucking sense unless isekai already exists like no one no one or very very few people would be randomly walking around and think to themselves I wish I could get hit by a bus while saving someone so that I could get transported to a fantasy world while I'm reincarnated as a vending machine. Yeah, but the thing is, like, the, the tropes of these are kind of begin and end at the first two minutes of the first episode. <laughs> uh, I don't know. There's more kinda, to it. There's the heroes part. The fact that, like, n- there's never... Like, no, but the rest are just RPG tropes. Yeah, but, but the fact that the RPG tropes are unquestioningly in this media yeah. is a trope itself. That is like, trope uh, itself, to, to normally, like... You'd have to have some justification, like the early, like Log Horizon or whatever. Yeah. It's like, oh, it has RPG mechanics because it's literally in yeah, an yeah, RPG, yeah, yeah. right? Like but, the modern but, ones, but they just, don't even have to abstract it. Like it just that. merged with like the fucking Proto Isekai from the nineties. Like, that's all that. that yeah, I guess so. But like the the thing what I'm say the thing I'm saying, right, is that Isekai tropes only exist within like a fucking nebulous sphere of like things that might be an isekai trope, right? Yeah. Because every single isekai itself, other than those like pseudo corporate isekai, it's just one guy who wants to be a cool guy. I and don't. It's about how he wants to be a cool guy. I I don't think it's that. <clears throat> I I think it's about the website show sets Kaninano wants to be a cool guy. Yeah, but everyone like everyone just the thing is it's like it's 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 like it's like the Denpa sphere. <laughs> okay. 
We've made the, a point. No, no, no. I want to make my point about slavery. Okay. Okay. So you let's say Twelve Years a Slave, the movie, right? Sure. I haven't watched it. You haven't watched it. No. I'm, I'm sure what what I think it's about is it's uh, they're slaves and they're they're not happy about it, right? <laughs> they're not happy, about, which is fair it enough. Lasts for twelve years. I, I'm sure it lasts for twelve years, right? This guy, he's a slave for 12 years. He's like, this sucks. And the movie shows him getting beaten up a bunch of times or whatever. Yeah. This one's okay because it depicts slavery. <clears throat> but look, we're making some commentary about how slavery is bad, right? But in Isekai, they're just like, well, I want the main guy to be surrounded by the hottest women of all time. But, like, these women can't be whores. They can't be, like, actively trying to fuck the main character. Because otherwise, you know, that ruin that would be a feminism or something. So they're like... They have to find some excuse for the main character to be in proximity with a bunch of women who don't have... But he's not particularly good. It's not true anymore. It was true originally. It was true. Now they're just doing it because it's a tr- it's a, like a fetish in itself. I yeah, think. and every every girl in an isekai actively wants to have sex. Yeah, but like they they want to. Few minutes, few people. But though. but they only they only want to have sex. This is the thing. Like that like men want a, a girl who's like uh, quiet, reserved, pure, and innocent to everyone else, but a, a, a whore and a slut specifically for them, right? That's the, yeah. the, the the thing. They want they want someone who who's a, a mom to you know like to the broad public looks like a, a mother, but then to them looks like a, a whore. Yeah. Right. Like that. That's the. Yeah, but that, that's different. But that's always the same thing. It's also the case for every isekai girl. I mean, yeah. But but, but the thing is that the like a normal movie would either like have that and have it be in some way justified. Or, like, have that, and the point is, it's Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, the Manic Pixie Dream Girl is actually bad, actually, or something like that, right? Which, let me clarify this. That's, like, a great movie. I love all these movies. I'm not saying they're bad. But the isekai can just be like, no, fuck aesthetics, fuck being good. Like, this is just pure, uh, you might as well be watching sludge. Yeah, but the, but the thing is, is if you're... If you're you're too far it, away to be uh, on the microphone. I am. Uh, I like sitting in the bed. I know how you do it, don't I? I'm bed-pilled. I'm you're a bed-pilled, bed-pilled. bed cell. But yeah, like, what, what I'm saying, right, is that that's only a positive if you're a fetish slave girl. It's not even a matter of it being a positive or negative. Yeah, but you're, what I'm you're, saying is... The it's, point is... It's not enjoyable unless you're a fetish slave girl. You think isekai is enjoyable? Yeah. This is where you've missed the point. There's we're beyond we're beyond enjoyment and hatred here. This is the entire this is the point I've been trying to make. Is that like even okay, I think this is actually the fundamental yeah. point. Even the most deconstructive uh, uh transgressive art or philosophy or anything that or, that exists has to at some point justify its own existence by saying I deserve to exist because I'm I'm worthy, I'm good in some sense, right? Like, say The Fountain by Duchamp, right? Yeah. Oh, it's just a urinal, but it deserves to exist because it's making some commentary on this, this is. Isekai is, doesn't care. It doesn't give a fuck if you think it's good or deserves to In fact, it actively doesn't, right? No, isek- no one the, the, wants okay. 50 isekai per okay. season. No, no, even the most I Japanese... Do. I do, I do. <laughs> no, but, like, once... but even the most Japanese man of all time doesn't want 50 isekai. I'm currently reading at least 50 isekai. Yeah, but those are all good. No. Most of them, probably. Most of them. Okay. But, like... No, no but, like, what I'm saying, right, is the appeal of the isekai isn't... Uh, hey, this, this is like a fucking anti-intellectual exercise or whatever. I'm saying the point of an isekai is how many fetishes that the offer has that you also have. Yeah. But, but, mm, I think that's more the point of like a harem anime. Yeah, but uh, I'm using fetish in this sense as like okay. a color, broader yeah. concept. But that's always, that's good. Yeah. But that's, but, but the point of a, a, a bad isekai is that like even the fetishes are kind of subsumed by the fact that the main character is too cool, right? Like, like the previous, the the one that I said, this one that's really bad, right? Yeah, but that's Did a corpo she, one. This isn't a corpo one. This is from a Shosetsuki Ninado novel. Is it? Yeah. Okay, it's from a guy who thinks he's cool and wants to be famous. But what I'm saying is, there's it's, not even, it's like... A, it's a one of even, corpo. Even the fetishes in this are, like, so bad, right? The fetishes are literally, these are the, the girls that are attracted to yeah. main character. A model and a princess. Yeah. Right? It's like the most basic ass, like, yeah. it's just attractive women. And they don't even have the concept of, like, a cat girl or something yeah. like... It's, it's just a guy who wants to be famous at that point. Yeah. He's not He's not an otaku. 
He can't. It doesn't count for this discussion. No, I think this is the. I mean, this is a bad. This is like too too bad. Yeah, that that's not, that's not even like what we're talking about. That's a different thing entirely. Maybe it's a fucking. I, I think the perfect. I talked about this in 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 this video, right? The perfect analysis of the trashy anime is um, Netoke no Yome wa no Noko Janai desu, right? Uh, but uh, the the point of this this anime is I, uh, the the plot is this is the main guy he's playing an MMO. Yeah, no, I've, I've, you've, you've, you've read but, this. You've, oh no, that's a different one. Uh, okay, this is the main. It's not an isekai. Yeah, this is the main guy. He's an MMO guy, yeah. otaku. He's playing. A, oh, I have read this. He's one. playing an MMO. He gets someone in the MMO who's a girl in the MMO is like, you need to marry me for some contrived. I have read this one. They at get, some point. They get married in the it. MMO. He's like he gets married to the guy to the the girl in the MMO, thinking it's just a guy pretending to be a girl. Yeah. Turns out it's this super attractive. Yeah, girl I've read the first chapter of in this. A hundred percent. Right. Or another one that had the exact same first chapter. It's probably this one. Yeah. The premise of the anime is all of these super attractive girls are all really into MMOs. Yeah. And all want to fuck the main guy. Yeah. But this girl especially wants to fuck the main guy because yeah. she thinks they're married for real because they got married in an MMO. Yeah. Right. There's no level of like at no point was someone thinking now how can I make this story good or yeah. interesting nothing ever that never occurred to the it's guy it's just a thing this. that has happened twice in real life and the guy goes goes like I, I wish, wish that happened. was me yeah exactly yeah. that's all it is yeah so the point of Penisa is how much you wish that the main character was you essentially well, I don't think so because I I think that this is my my meme about like <laughs> wish fulfillment is really only successful wish fulfillment when it has this gap where there's always this knowledge of like, but this could never be me because in real life this would suck. But I don't want the show to tell me that. I don't want, I don't no, want the like, boys uh, to come along uh, and be like, actually, superheroes would be bad if they were real. Yeah. I want the, my brain to be able to do that, but to be able to, to, like, for example, you watch you watch moe anime and you know that none of these girls would ever hang out with you in real life because in real they life they would hang out with me you, they would hang out with you yeah but none of the none of the the Kaons or the Hidamaris would ever hang out with me in real life because I'm an ugly annoying stinky neat guy who's like 10 years older than them or whatever <laughs> right like it's no, they would hate me they, I mean they wouldn't even hate me they would just think I was they would never even talk to me in real life right I don't need an anime to come along to tell me that I already know that yeah right a, a good show would, that would have to justify its own existence would have to be like we can't just show cute girls doing cute things we have to have some reason why this is okay yeah right? but, well like what, what i'm saying isn't about like the fucking otaku's fear i know slavery is bad i don't yeah. need anime to tell me sl- i'm fine with an anime being like in this universe for contrived reasons slavery in this instance yeah. is okay yeah but like the thing is 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 what i'm saying is what what at least i want and what i think you want is like you go like oh you know what's really hot a fucking slave cat. I don't think that's hot. You, you don't? I, I don't think it's did. especially hot. It's like, it's not unsexy. It's yeah. not a fetish. I wouldn't go out of my way to look for slave characters. Yeah, but like, I would imagine if the stuff you read that comes out pretty often. No, it doesn't. It doesn't? Really. No. I, contrary to popular belief, I am a fan of enthusiastic consent in pornography. <laughs> cringe. Yeah, I, it's kind of cringe. <laughs> well, no, 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 let me clarify, let me clarify. I'm a fan of enthusiastic consent from the woman in pornography. <laughs> <laughs> male yeah, feminist The cringe. male can do whatever the fuck, he, the, he can be raped as much as, like, that's good. But I'm, I'm, I'm not a particularly into rape. I'm sorry, I'm just not. It's kind of cringe, but I'm not much of a rape. <laughs> I'm not, what can I say? It's not that attractive to me. I like to see, uh, yeah, I'm I'm okay with. I, what I want to see is I want to see uh, a woman look down with a disgusted face. I just imagine that like you would plant into the entire maid thing. What do you mean? Because like you're into maid characters. Yeah, but I'm into maid characters more aesthetically than oh, sexually. I see, I see. I mean, like they're sexy, but like it, it's you know what I mean. The, the 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 point of the maid this is the thing right the the, yeah. the point is the gap moe right where the maid is supposed to be subservient to the master but the gap moe comes when that dynamic is switched around I see me. I mean the, or it's not even necessarily that you can go relatively vanilla with it it's just to me it's not hot if uh, the the girl's not having fun with it that's that's just the case that's a different thing it's the same thing I mean. 
I'm okay. Like, because the slave girls in Isika are having fun. Yeah, that's fine with me then. Yeah. That's why I think it's... Yeah. Yeah. That's why I don't mind watching it. Yeah, I'm I wouldn't, saying I like, wouldn't want to watch a show where the slave yeah, was yeah, like yeah. fucking miserable the whole time. Yeah, what I'm, what I'm saying, right, is the point of the slave girl in an Isika isn't like, oh, I just... I, I want to I wanna go who's out whatever. The point is like... Oh, it, wouldn't it be hot if, like, a slave girl was, like, super into me, lol? Yeah. Yeah. So if you think that's hot, that that's what it is appealing to you. I mean, I don't think it's, like, especially hot. But it's not, like, bad. It's not It's not a turn-off. Yeah. But, I mean, maybe I'm being too brazen with my anti-rape takes. Shut <laughs> <laughs> the fuck No, no. There was some... I'm thinking about it. <clears throat> I, there was some good... I was too sweeping with my... Yeah. My opinions. I, it's just that's just a general trend. I think it can there can be some good rape dojins. There aren't any. I they, I I think I've read like maybe a couple, but they're not that. They're, none of them are. There has to be something extra going on. For no, me. the the problem with rape dojins, right? No one knows how to make them. I've I don't want to go into too much detail on YouTube yeah. about the ones which I am remembering right now that yeah. I think are, are pretty decent. But there's normally some other gimmick that goes along with it. That makes it okay. Like makes it better, in my opinion. I mean, it's just that if, if, if or or for example, you know, I think you would agree with this. Yeah. The 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 rape dojin which then gets flipped on its head, right? Where like for example, I'm not into it. There's, I think you said. I thought you said you were into this at some point. Like there's a there's a um a kankole dojin where the yeah. girls all rape the captain and then the captain's like. Yeah. Aha, I was actually, uh, now I'm mad and now I'm You literally sent me that one. And, yeah. that, and that was the specific one at which I was like, yeah, it's kind of poke. Uh, yeah, that, yeah, see, that's what I'm thinking yeah. of. Yeah. Yeah. And th- there's there's a couple ones that are similar to that. But like, the, f- the thing is, right, if, if you want if you want decent, to, there, there's only one artist that knows how to do it and I'm not going to look in YouTube. I mean, I can think of a couple, but there's again, one. There's one who knows how to do yeah, it. Yeah, but I mean, the one, yeah. the, one, the one that I'm thinking of draws some things that you're not interested in at all. Yeah. So we're going to leave it at that and not, not name these tropes on YouTube. Turns out it's the same one. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's not. not. It's yeah, not. I know the. I know the one I'm thinking of, and I know for a fact you're not. Interested. Yeah, I know. I yeah. know. Uh, absolutely fucking giga based uh, Belgian author though. Yeah. What were we I talking think, about? Yeah, I'm just thinking of the. At this point, I'm just thinking of the only Gatriona fucking Belgian artist. Right. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking of right now. The point I'm trying to make about is is I don't. I think that for people when looking at high art. If they they want it to be transgressive, but they don't really want to transgress. They want yeah, to keep yeah, some yeah. safe distance from the transgression. Whereas for me, I, I I don't even necessarily I wouldn't even necessarily say I like actively want to transgress. I don't want to live in a world where like even taboos or non taboos even necessarily exist. You know what I mean? <laughs> like yeah. like when I see slave girl in anime, I don't even want I don't even care if the anime make some effort to justify it. It can make the minimal effort possible, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, I I think this conversation is done now. Mainly because I need to pee. But uh, we went from... Let's just see all the things we covered in that. We covered uh, Marx, Baudrillard, Foucault, um, high art, modern art, uh, Rothko, Michel Duchamp, uh, and then rape dojins. So I'm pretty sure we covered all of our bases there. I want to make something clear about these sorts of trashy uh, isekai. They tend to be like, to me, the 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 what I'm looking for is anywhere between a four and a six out of ten. These are the isekai I'm talking about. So, in fact, you know what? We can we can go on Mal and I can just list a bunch. You know what? We're gonna do that. We're gonna go on Mal. I'm just gonna list uh, list some of these isekai. Let me see if I can like find a way. Okay, here's here's me listing some of these mid tier isekai. Uh, for example. Um, maybe, uh, the smartphone isekai. Isekai was smartphone, whatever. Smartphone isekai. Death March to the Parallel World Rhapsody. That's a mid-tier isekai. Uh, Kenja no Mago, of course. Um, let's see. Uh, no, these are too good. See, something like A Sentence of a Bookworm, that's a good isekai. Or book. Holy shit. Bofuri, that's good. 
We're not talking about the good ones. We're talking about the mid-tier ones. Uh, what, didn't I say to make my abilities average in the next life? That's that's a, a mid-tier. This is the sort of thing I'm talking about. Um, or, uh, let's see. What else have we got here? Kuma 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 Bear is good. Doesn't count. Um, oh, and also this one. A redo of Healer. That doesn't count because that's a subversion. That's its own thing. Uh, yeah, Kuma Deska Nanika is too good to count. Um... Personally, I think this the the uh, I I've been killing slime for three hundred years and maxed out my level. I think this is good. I I don't know why people don't like this. I think this is actually pretty good, but it probably fits in the the mid tier isekai thing. Uh, cheat Kusushino slow life uh, isekai pharmacist one. That's pretty mid tier, I would say. Realist hero, even though it's highly rated, I think it fits in the mid tier. Say it again, so the Mid tier. Um, what's this one? I've seen all of these. I've seen way too many of these fucking things, man. You don't even understand. I have seen way too many of these things. Um, Moonlit Fantasy. I don't know if that even counts. Someone's just really bad. Um, banished from the Heroes Party, I decided to live a quiet life in the countryside. That was one of them. Uh, this one I, I only watched the first episode of. I don't know if I can count that. Uh, Maybe, uh... I think Isekai Yakyo is probably just too good to count. Just about too good. Um, yeah. Oh, and as an example of one that's too bad to count, this one, um... I've somehow gotten stronger when I improved my farm-related skills. This one's too bad to count as a mid-tier isekai. This is one of the rare isekai that's that's too bad to count as a mid-tier isekai. Uh, the other one that I was just talking about earlier is also too bad to count as a mid-tier isekai. Um, although it's it's just barely too bad. But yeah, the th- these are the things I'm talking about. And the thing that I want to under- that I want to get across is when I say that these are bad, I'm not lying. <laughs> they literally are just not very good. Sometimes they're not terrible. Sometimes they're on the 6 out of 10 side. But they're not great. Like, if someone asked me what are your favorite isekai anime, it would be like No Game, No Life, Ascendance of a Bookworm, maybe Log Horizon Season 1, um, what else? Slime Isekai, Konosuba, uh, you know, the class, the one that everyone thinks is good. The ones that everyone thinks are good. Um, maybe, uh, Kuma 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 Bear is pretty good. I've read the manga. Well, not amazing. You know, these sorts of things is what I would say, probably. I wouldn't say, if someone said, what's your favorite isekai? I wouldn't say Death March to the Parallel World Rhapsody, right? That's not something I would say. Uh, I wouldn't say isekai non I, you know, I wouldn't say, um this fucking one saving 80,000 gold in another world for my retirement that one's pretty bad right but I still watch them even though I know they're not only do I watch them even though I know they're bad I actively seek them out to watch even though I know they're bad because to me this is like the same appeal that most people get from like grinding in an MMO or something like the fact that it's bad is the point it's not supposed to be good. It's a different appeal to watching good shows. That's what I'm trying to explain. I'm not saying by being bad these shows are in fact good. That's not what I'm saying. It's by being bad these shows are in fact bad and that's okay. But not in a... I don't know how to explain it. Maybe I am closer to an anime is trash attitude. The thing about Kenja and Mago that's a bit confusing in terms of... I mean, I, this is in terms of magic system is the main character early on, I think even in the first episode, it's implied that Isekai Jin, you know, people from other worlds, are naturally strong. Like, some rare occurrence of, like, super powerful magic users in this world. Which is a common trope in Isekai. But, later on, well, there's also shown that, like, he's strong because he's, like, retains some memories of his previous life and understands, like, chemistry and physics... And so he, like, instead of, like, for example, when he's doing, he at one point he's demonstrating how, like, he has to demonstrate how strong he is in an early episode, like, how powerful his magic is. So he makes, like, the, a really big explosion. And he talks about, like, in, in his internal monologue, like, separating the oxygen in the air and, like, hydrogen to create an explosion. It's like, okay, so he's doing it using chemistry, which is why he's stronger. And then later on, 
in episode five, uh, it's ex- it's sort of explained like, oh, well, the reason he's so strong is because like most people just think about the outcome. Like they visualize, because the way magic works is you have to visualize what you want. Like they visualize a fire, for example, if they want fire. But the main character, he is always asking questions like, what is fire? How does fire work? What makes fire burn? But the question is now, is that, is that because he remembers the chemistry of oxidization or whatever from his previous life? Because they never mention that. Like, it said, I still remain, retain memories from my previous life at the beginning of the anime, but the, it never comes up again. So the question is, like, how much memory does he retain? Is that what's making it useful? And if he's teaching this to other people, does he also have to teach them about chemistry? Is he even, like, you know? <clears throat> it's a bit confusing. Is he strong because he's inquisitive about the world? Or is he strong because he knows chemistry and physics from the the real world? Or is he strong because he's from another world and that makes you naturally strong? It's kind of, they're just kind of slamming this stuff together without making it clear. Like, the smart thing to do, the cool thing to do, would be to be like, you know, I, I think this happens in, um, I mean, this definitely happens in Isekai Yakyo, right? Uh, where the main character is good at creating medicines because he, and summoning materials because he understands chemistry. He was a, a, a chemist in the previous life, which is super cool, a really cool concept. Um, so when he's creating materials, he's summoning them by thinking about their chemical form. Uh, is that the case here? Because that would I, I like that concept. That's a good concept. I'm not sure. I wish they would be more... Uh, I, wish th- I wish they would explain this in, in more detail. I like magic system. I, I wish... Or rather, I wish they would just come down on one side. I wish they would just say, like... We're just going to do some some chemistry now, and we just have a dialogue, like a scene where main character explains some concept of chemistry or physics in order to teach people how to do some magic. That would be a cool scene. Maybe it maybe it exists later. I don't know, but let's see. I'm going to do an odd segment. An odd segment. This is this segment is going to be called countries I feel uh, allegiances to for some reason. Countries I feel allegiances to for some reason. This is the segment. Okay, so. We're going to start off with um, <clears throat> Great Britain. Great Britain is a country I feel an allegiance to for an obvious reason. Uh, I'm from there. This is also the United Kingdom. Um, the United Kingdom and slash or Great Britain. Uh, the, this is a country I feel an allegiance to because that's where I've lived my whole life. Um, England is also a country I feel an allegiance to. Uh, although... I feel like I feel more British than I feel English, if that makes any sense. Um, but yeah, that is the case. So that's the obvious one out of the way. Uh, next, I feel an allegiance to uh, the ex-Yugoslav countries, specifically Serbia and Croatia, especially Croatia, because that is where my grandparents are from on my mother's side. So Croatia and Serbia, I feel an allegiance to that. Uh, I also had a friend in year two, my second year of primary school, uh, whose parents or grand, who also had some sort of Croatian heritage, and he was like my first school friend ever. That was a terrible, ex- the things went very wrong with that friendship. It was very odd, but um, <clears throat> yeah, the, he was uh, also had Croatian parents or grandparents, I don't remember. And so, yes, there you go. Uh, Australia is another country I feel some level of allegiance to, although, um, you know, as with all of these, it's kind of not much, because I I don't really care about countries or national, like, I'm not much of a nationalist kind of guy, but uh, I'm just doing this for fun. So Australia, my mum is from Australia, so her parents uh, moved to Australia when Yugoslavia collapsed. I think that's what happened. It might have been before that, actually. No, it might, no, it wasn't when Yugoslavia collapsed. It might have been just during... No, no, it would have been before Yugoslavia collapsed, 100%. What am I talking about? It was... Basically, they were rich, and Yugoslavia became communist, so they fled the country to Australia. So, yes, Australia, I feel some allegiance to. Um, these are all the obvious ones. These are all the obvious ones where I have DNA, too. Um... But somehow, the, the the Yugoslav DNA in me gives me some sort of predisposition towards Eastern Europe in general. I feel a general sense of... Um, I'm not sure how to explain it, but I feel solidarity with Eastern Europe, you know? I think 
Eastern Europeans really don't get they don't get any appreciation. They're just as fucked as any other uh, like part of the world that would be considered fucked to be from, and yet they get no sympathy from anyone. Uh, probably I don't know why. Uh, the, the Eastern European countries get fucking zero sympathy, despite having been, you know, equally fucked by imperialism and all the other sorts of things as anyone can claim to be. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, the fact that I have some level of Eastern European blood. Well, I mean, both of my mom's parents are Eastern European, so my entire maternal side is Yugoslav, which is in Eastern Europe, if you're not sure where Serbia is and Croatia is. Um, yeah, although they're kind of down south, I don't feel like I should be down... Like, that just feels wrong to me. I feel like I'm more of a cold North Eastern European kind of vibe because I don't like the heat. I've never liked the heat. I hate hot countries. I'm not much of a Mediterranean type of guy. I mean, I love olive oil, but aside from that, I'm not much of a Mediterranean kind of guy, you know? I've been to the Mediterranean, I've swam in the Mediterranean Sea. I've been there many times. It's a nice place to go on holiday, but not my vibe in terms of uh, my soul. Cold north parts of East, yeah, that's where I'm at. That's what, that feels more, more like me. Which brings me to the country I'm currently in, Estonia. Of course, I feel linked to Estonia because my girlfriend is Estonian, and I have been here quite a lot. Um, Estonia is the country I've visited most in my adult life now. Um, yeah, I think, you know, pretty soon, there's probably going to be a strong argument that Estonia is the country I've been in the second most after uh, the UK. Because, I mean... It's not there yet, because if you've watched my video about Turkish billionaires, you'll know that I went to Turkey a lot as a kid, um, over the summer holidays for complicated reasons, so I've probably been to Turkey more than I've been to any other country. Uh, but, given that I stay in Estonia for like three months at a time, I feel like it's not going to be that long until Estonia becomes the country I've spent the most time in outside of the UK. Um, so I definitely feel... A, a vibe with Estonia. I've never felt that. V I, I, I don't have a, any sort of vibe with with Latvia and Lithuania. Those places can go fuck themselves. <laughs> if you're Lithuanian or Latvian, fuck you, man. Fuck. You. No, I'm joking. You guys are chill. You guys have good food. Um, but yeah, it's a vibe up here, man. It's, it's a it's a fucking vibe up here in, in Esti. The language is absolute nonsense, though. But yeah, I don't know why, but I feel a vibe with it. I think these are the countries that I feel allegiances to. I, I'm not sure there are any more. Maybe, you know, to some extent, I've always liked New Zealand, but I don't know if I can say I feel an allegiance to New Zealand. Like, when I was a kid, we'd, the ashes would happen, which if you're not British or Australian, you probably don't know what that is. The ashes is a, a big test cricket uh sort of tournament slash matches series they call it a series it's a series of matches um between england and australia that was set up back during england's colonial days right um <clears throat> uh, it, it's it's england versus australia it happens i don't remember when it happened when does the when does the ashes happen is it every year test quickly at the time so i'll turn to I'm trying to see. Every two years. Hosted in... Yeah, it goes one once in England and once in Australia. At least once every two years. I guess there's just, like, some sort of weird thing. But, yeah. Um, that's the vibe. And so when I would go to the Ashes, I remember that... Well, the, the only time I went to the Ashes, when it was in England, I, I, I went to go see uh, one of the days. And um, I wore an England cricket shirt with an Australian cricket hat because... I'm half Australian. Uh, although I was secretly rooting for England the whole time. And England lost. Because we didn't get good at cricket until like a few years ago. Uh, yeah. I, this classic England form. We colonize a bunch of people and teach them our sport. And then immediately become the worst in the world at the sport we invented. And all of the colonies are way better than us. Uh, until recently. Very recently. When England has suddenly become... As I understand it, I haven't been reading up on cricket because I go through fucking... I'm ADHD and I rotate between hobbies and my brief cricket phase ended. Uh, but yeah, as I understand it, England had some sort of revolutionary strategy in terms of test cricket um, where a bunch of young cricketers are like the new generation of English talent and are now like insane. Uh, 
having like the highest scoring games of all time and stuff. It's pretty cool. I think that happened. Any cricket fans in the audience can tell me the specifics in the comments. I doubt it, but to exist, that's cool. It's called the Ashes, by the way. Um, so the, the 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 comedic thing about the Ashes, like the the sort of the famous, I don't know, the, maybe the most notable thing, is that you get a trophy at the end, of course. But the trophy is this comically small thing. It's about the size of like an egg maybe it's like a bit bigger than an egg it's very it's a it's a very small trophy um and it's this this urn an urn you know it is called the ashes uh it's this urn that rep- that supposedly contains um honestly i'm i'm not sure i've heard that it i've heard some people say it contains the stumps or it contains a, the ashes of like it either contains the ashes of a of a stumps or the ashes of a uh, a cricket ball. I think it it can it, it has the not the stumps, but it, I think it has the the bale, right? I think it has the bales. So the 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 story goes that um like the the story is something like the first ashes. Uh, I I forget whoever lost burned the 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 bale, which the bale is um so cricket. There's there's this thing called a wicket in cricket, right? Which is like if you look at a cricket match, you'll see there are these three sticks sticking up out of the ground, and the bowler has to try and knock down the sticks, right, um, with the ball. So the bale is the, the the smaller bits of wood on top of those three sticks, and if you knock those off, that's how it's counted as a point. They're steady, smaller bits of wood. So supposedly, um, Australia won the first Ashes, and then. Uh, I believe the story is that England got so mad that they burned the bales, um, and that is how the term ashes came from. But I don't. I think that's an apocryphal story. Um, actually, according to Wikipedia, it, the obituary that after after Australia won, um, there was a newspaper called the Sporting Times. Uh, which published an obituary for English cricket, <laughs> stating that English cricket had died and that, quote, the body will be cremated and the ashes taken to Australia. And so that's that's why, that's what happened, I guess. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. It's a, just a funny, weird fucking historical thing from the 1800s, okay? Don't ask me. Uh, it's a cool, it's cool, though. Cricket, I'm telling you, you, you won't believe me, but cricket is actually pretty good as a sport. It's actually pretty fun to watch, especially to listen to on the radio. I think I've talked about this when I was going through my cricket phase. Um, why was I talking about this? Oh, yeah, because I went to the Ashes once and I had an, an Australia hat with an England shirt. Uh, so that was cool. Yeah, those are, that was the end of this segment. This segment called Countries I Have an Allegiance To. I don't believe that there are any other countries which I have a particular allegiance to. In fact, any of the ones just mentioned, I still don't have a particularly strong allegiance to. Um, fuck countries. I do have an allegiance to London, though, which should be a country, but isn't. I have. A, I'm a. I'm a. A Londoner before I'm English and before I'm British. A hundred percent. It has its own identity, but even that is kind of stupid. <laughs> anyway, for some reason, I was going through Jeremy Corbyn's Twitter. <laughs> Okay, don't ask me why. Don't ask me why. I was going through Jeremy Corbyn's Twitter, okay? Based guy. Um, and I saw a picture of him posing uh, at some sort of independent venue. I just thought it was a little funny. I just thought that this image was a little funny because it is it is a, a old fucking Jezza, right? The most normal looking guy ever posing next to like... I don't know what to call it. Twitter aesthetic, you know, Zuma, hyper pop music type, NB type people. Um, and I was like, who the fuck are these people? And so he tagged them. And the first one is called I Hate Zand. Do I think their 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 artist name is just Zand? But their 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 Twitter handle is I Hate Zand, which is the one that I was interested in. So like, because it looked like the other one is, if you're interested, Delilah Bon. Um, I'm not sure if this matters to anyone. Uh, I haven't looked into this Delilah Bon person yet, but I, I I was like, who is this Zand person? Because they have a pretty striking aesthetic. I was like, this is interesting. So I went to look at it, and look, 
I don't want to like be an artist who is being mean to other artists. The music is not for me. <laughs> okay, the music it's uh it's it's not for me, okay? It's uh it's pretty um I don't want to be too mean, but it's garbage, okay? It's absolute fucking trash. It's garbage. It's bad. It's trying too hard in every direction. Um, but that's not what I'm super concerned about, because there are plenty of people who make bad music. It's not that interesting. What I'm curious about is, like, how this comes to be. What I mean by this is if you look up this Zand person, you'll find a social media pre- presence, which is very... Um, how do I put it? It's very clean. It's it's very professional, you know. Um, it's it you know the the I mean there's the, there's there's lots of it's just a very professional social media presence. Okay, I'm not I don't have to go that f- much further than that. But what I'm interested in, I, I go on their YouTube channel and I see a bunch of like produced music videos and what looks like you know visualizations or, or visuals for for singles. And not to mention they're doing a North American tour and a UK tour. So, like, big touring artist with professional quality visuals. Like, this is not some sort of indie person who's just doing this all themselves. I mean, and and in fact, you know, I click on uh, one of these official videos for one of their songs, and what do I see? at the Right at the beginning pops up the logo for Jägermeister. So they have, like, a Jägermeister sponsorship for this this whole setup and then it's a professionally shot music video you know like you could see anywhere i mean it's not the highest budget thing ever but it's a i mean it's got a budget it's got a a a costume budget a lighting but you know things happened here okay there's there's uh information about uh the directors and stuff on um in the description uh, right, who, who who was behind it, and then for some reason links to brands and designers, which I guess is a thing people care about. I don't know. What I'm curious about though is just like how this gets to be, because when you look at the the view count on on a lot of these songs, I mean, look, I don't mean to be, I don't mean to like. I don't know how to say this. Like, I, I'm not trying to big... I'm, I'm pointing to myself as an example of someone who is not successful, right? Like, I don't make any real money from music. I'm not a successful musician, right? I think we can all agree on that. I mean, it depends how you want to define success. Like, I'm happy with the music I make, so in that sense, I'm successful. And I have a, you know, small but fan base that I like. You know, all of you people are, are cool. So, you know, whatever. But I'm not financially successful enough to have produced music videos and so on but if you compare the view counts like yeah they have like one or two songs that have gone viral and got a lot of views but most of their songs are like the same as some of my more successful songs like i have songs that are bigger than some of their songs right like you see right through me i see right through you for example that has 19k views on youtube Their most recent song only has 2.5k, which is fine. Like, I'm not trying to belittle this person or say that I'm better than them. I'm doing the opposite. What I'm saying is, like, okay, how is this person who is not getting massive views um, getting a Jägermeister deal and professionally shot music videos? Like, how is this... where's, Where's the money coming from? How are they doing, you know, tours? How are they touring... Not just the UK, but also the US. And how do they have, like, extensive costuming and and makeup and production design and all of this? I mean, I I know what the answer is. I know what the answer is. We all know what the answer is here, okay? Right? And this is interesting. Well, look, I'm not going to say that because that doesn't necessarily just prove anything. But... It's interesting. It's an interesting setup that's going on there, is all I'm saying, okay? This this Zand person, I'm sure they're a lovely person. You know, I have an absolute... You, 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 I mean, people, they need a way to make money in life. If being an industry plant... <laughs> I'm just, I mean, look, if someone's got to say it, someone's got to say it, okay? If, if being an industry plant lets you, you know, pay your rent and pay your bills, I'm, I mean... Hey, it is. It is what it is. It is what it is. I'm just. It's a bit. 
it just is you gotta point them out when you see them that's all i'm saying you gotta point them out when you see them because there's real motherfuckers out here like me making real shit go stream my latest album go listen to it it's out on spotify now motherfucker go listen to me real shit okay i make my shit in my fucking bedroom right i don't have no label helping me my shit's Creative Commons, motherfucker. Actually, did I remember to mark this as Creative Commons on Bandcamp? Shit, let me actually double check that. Drift D. You just called it Drift D. No, I did not remember to mark it as Creative Commons. Okay, we will go ahead and do that right now. Um, do I have to do it song by song? Oh, they are. They they should all be attribution share like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. It is attribution. Okay, we're fine. We're fine. False alarm. False alarm. Look, that's all I'm saying, okay? This is all I'm saying. You gotta call them out when you see them. I'm gonna see if they have a band camp presence. Now I'm just, I feel like I'm just being mean. Now I'm just cyber stalking, okay? They've done nothing to me. They have done nothing wrong to me. It doesn't look like they have a band camp presence. It's a little, it's a little odd. For, a, for an independent, you know, bit musician who's marketing yourself like that to not have a band camp, it's a little, uh, I mean, look, I'm not saying anything, okay? I'm not saying anything. I mean, we've we've established at this point that we don't have to we don't have to beat around the bush. We've established that this person probably has some strong ties to some sort of record label. Which label should we find out? Should we do some digging? Because obviously, this stuff is always going to be hidden as far as you can possibly hide it. Um, I mean, look at this look at this website. No one's making a website like this themselves. Powered by Commie. What is Commie? Oh, it looks like looks like this is some sort of. I'm not sure what this is, but this is some sort of like click and drag esque WordPress esque website creator. Okay, you know what? I'll allow that. I'll allow that. I want to know who. You see, this person has some sort of legal team behind them, okay? Because they have a, a privacy. Pro- I mean, maybe this comes pre done by this Comi website or service, whatever this is. Um, just, just you don't need all of this JavaScript to make this website work, okay? This could just be, this could be nothing. This could be just fucking HTML and CSS, okay? This is way too crazy. Oh, Spotify should make you link. Spotify should force you to list your um your label, right? I think it, I think it does. It looks like they've had a few big Spotify hits. Maybe that's the case. Maybe they just have a small following on YouTube, and I'm overreacting. Maybe they're big on. Maybe they. They're in some playlists on Spotify. Now, how do you get in those playlists on Spotify? Also a thing, okay, let's just not ignore that. Let's just not pretend that that happens out of nowhere. Um, trying to see... You know what? I'm not seeing any any uh, any label connections here. They do do a good job of hiding this stuff these days. I mean, no one's just going to put this out like it's nothing. But I'm trying to... Is there some way to find, like, the metadata behind these songs? I don't use Spotify, so... Show credits. Written by, produced by, the, oh, we've got a producer. It just does not say a label, but it does list a producer. Maybe this is a producer working with some sort of label. I found, uh, hmm, oh, this is something. I don't know if that's it. Let's say the Twitter. Oh, this is a big time person. Oh, this is a big time person. Hmm, now that's interesting. Producer is a big time person. Perhaps, you know, something interesting is going on there. Let's see, Spotify of the producer. Can we see something interesting? Oh, but they get no views on Spotify. What is happening? This is very odd. See, this producer, whose name is Stefan, lots of Twitter followers, lots of Instagram followers, seems to have a Twitch channel, but no Spotify listen. So perhaps something interesting is going on there. Nice collaboration, boosting each other. I see. Um, but I don't see any label. Um, yeah. Oh, this is a different, a different producer for this track. Uh, doesn't seem to have much of an internet presence, at least probably not using their artist name. Uh, okay. Well, I think I've given up on trying to figure out the, what label this person is signed to. Um, uh, in partnership with, wait, what is this? In partnership with version three. What is, what is version three? Aha! I think this is it. Yes, I found, I found it. This must be it. This is a, some sort of talent agency or something. What is this? 
Oh my god, version 3 is a family. Mission statement. Version 3 is a family. Good music, good people. Simple as that. We are a streaming and artist development company. Here to serve artists and help them. Oh my god, we've done it. Things we're good at. Distribution, streaming pl- strategy, playlisting, playlisting, radio, sync, TikTok, and influencer campaigns. Oh. We found it, buddy. We found it. We've discovered. We've discovered the key here. You have to scroll all the way down, and it, it, it is tiny. It is tiny. Um, let's see. Any now? I'm curious. Now I want to know because this is this is a thing, right? Is this is this the, if this is okay? Well, I mean, something's happening there. That's all I'm gonna say. Something's happening there. They really try and hide this stuff, man. Should I try and get like like? I'm not gonna know. You know what? None of these people know how to market me. What am I talking about? You know, sometimes I'm like, what are the? They they're saying. We can do all of these things, but do I want to be in any of these things? Uh, do I want distribution, streaming strategy, playlisting? I mean, this is the secret of the music industry, by the way, is that no one, like, a natural growth is a fucking meme, okay? All of these people, they just pay for it. Like, this is the actual truth. There's there's all of these, like, fucking marketing agencies. Uh, they call them, what do they call them? They call them, like, artist development something something. Uh, yeah, artist development. So yeah, I mean, when I was in uni, they were trying to link us up with all these people. I just fucking ignored all of it because it seems evil. But they're really just lit record labels, um, and they they all want to take all of your money, um, and they all want to like make you you know into some sort of aesthetic that they can wrap their heads around, and they won't let you make albums in fifty different styles because that's how you like to make albums. These people, they're evil, but they're the ones with the connection. There's no like. It's wild. I mean, it's just fucking wild how Spotify works, how playlists on Spotify work, you know? Like, you get... You, 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 I don't know, man. It's crazy. Maybe I need to... Maybe I need to get fucking driftigy on some Spotify playlists. Maybe I need to pay pay some fucking stupid company to give me Spotify playlists. And what did they say? TikTok strategy or some fucking insane thing like that? I mean, come on now. Look, I'm sorry, Zand. I didn't mean to expose you like this. Again, I'm sure you're a lovely person. Uh, but where's all this coming from, you know? This is all I'm saying. How? I just want to know. I just want to know how people do this. I just want to know, like, how people are going around with the same amount of shit that I've got. No particular advantage over me. And yet they... I mean, maybe. I mean, look, we're going to be honest here, okay? As I said, Zand's music is not very good, in my opinion. It's not it's not up to the level that I consider my own music to be at. But obviously this stuff is subjective. I'm making the music I like, they're making the music they like. That's fine, it is what it is. What, what was I talking about? What is this? I found a new button. Oh, that's just that button. Okay. Um, yeah, I just want to know, all I'm saying, there are people out there who are, don't have, they, they just have magically more resources than me. And and this is this is the thing. Where are they getting these resources and the connections and stuff? Maybe you know, maybe there was a world where if I'd paid attention to this side of stuff in uni, because there was some stuff like this in uni. I ignored it all because I thought I just assumed maybe this was stupid. But I also, I, I I'm gonna be honest with you, right? Being actually indie, it has cred to it, right? Especially if I'm making punk music, which I have been mostly making punk music. Being not signed. It gives you a lot... I mean, to me, it's cred. That is cred. Ignoring all of this stuff, that's cred. And cred is important to me. It helps me sleep at night to have cred. Um, But also, I've just known that I'm incapable of making two albums that sound like each other, and I don't think these people would like that. Because how often do you hear a band like that? I mean, it's very, very rare. Um, And also, you know, these people, they take all of your money and they make you do stuff that you don't want to do. Uh... And there's a lot of people out there trying to scam artists. A lot of people. There was a lot of people out there trying to scam artists. So I just ignored it all in university, knowing all of that. Because none of it seemed like it could help me. I mean, they're really all focused on, like, the pop side of things. They're so focused only on the pop side of things that I just ignored it. Uh, yeah. But maybe there's an alternate version of me who didn't ignore it, and now I'm paying for some sort of 
Spotify playlisting service where they they put me on some sort of I don't even use Spotify I don't even I don't even know how this stuff works um, but anyway I feel like I've been ranting about this for too long you know what I'm gonna give my my TF2 weapon balance opinions because that's how TF2 players go uh, so other than buff the caber which is a strong opinion that I think if, I, I mean turn the caber into a market garden of a soldier make it do more damage when you're sticky jumping. That's obvious, uh, but here's my here's my take, and I, this is not I'm not saying I'm the first person to come up with this, but I think it's a I think it's a perfectly reasonable idea. The flog, I don't think the flog, even with the scorch shot combo, is actually that overpowered on its own, uh, because it take it it it's a it's a risk reward weapon, right? I think it's fine, even with flog cancelling. That's okay because it requires skill. It's really difficult to pull off in a in a real situation. So personally. You know, I'm I'm uh, actually pretty much okay with the the flog as it is now, except that it is ridiculously overpowered or annoying to play against when you have a pocket medic. It's just it's just too fucking annoying to play against when you have a pocket medic. It clearly they didn't think through what would happen if you had a friend to go medic and just uber you every time you activate crits and constant like it's just too it's you can't fucking do anything because normally a pyro would just like you might be able to deal with uber players by having pyros air blast them out of the way the problem is that uh the second you get an air blast range you get deleted by flog crits uh so they pretty much just are able to steamroll through your entire team uh, it's 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 very fucking annoying i'm sure you know this so the simple change is the flog can still de- deal crits normally uh but when you're being healed by a medic, it should only deal mini crit damage. That's my nerf. It's not even a big nerf. It's actually a pretty small nerf. Just if if the player is being healed by a medic, flog does mini crits instead of full crits. That's my that's my that's my nerf for the flog. Last night when I was falling asleep, I had a, like a vision from a hypothetical YouTube video popped into my head, and the video was this. It was it was looking at a soldier loadout, and it would say, uh, you know, playing a class with a high damage explosive projectile weapon and it would show the first slot, um with uh, advanced uh movement techniques lots of lots of movement and mobility options it would sort of show the second slot where it would have the man the, not the mantras the gumboats and a uh funny and stylish melee and it would show the uh the, the fucking market gardener and it'd be like hold on i already do that uh, explosive, high damage explosive projectile weapon with four with four shots. They would show the iron bomber uh, with lots of advanced movement options and mobility, and they would show the sticky jumper and a funny melee, and it would show the caber, which is my normal demo man load. And so the video was supposed to be in my head. The hypothetical YouTube video would be like, "This is why I don't play soldier." Right? That segment would be like, "Everything I want from soldier, I already get out of demo." But then I was thinking to myself, "Why?" Do I just want to play Soldier? <laughs> Do I, like, am I just secretly wanting to play Soldier this whole time? Then today, I was playing, um, trying to play this game called Warfork, right? Which you might have seen a video about by a guy called H2, who's a, normally a TF2 YouTuber, but he made the video about this game. Which is like a Boomer Quake inspired arena shooter, but modern, uh, with a bunch of interesting movement tech inspired by Source Engine and Quake Engine and uh, Quake weapons. I mean, it's a really cool game. I played some today, and there's obviously the Quake-style rocket launcher in that game, uh, which is always centralizing in these sorts of shooters, very important weapons, so I've been using it. And of course, it has rocket jumps as well. And so I was trying to play this game. Of course, you know, as with all of these arena shooters, there are only two types of players. There are players who are like ridiculously good, have 10,000 hours in the game, and in Quake, and whatever, and have been playing forever, and will just destroy you. And then there are complete and utter noobs like me. There's no in between. There's no like mid tier players in these sorts of games. Uh, so every server I joined, I got absolutely demolished. I think I got, I was playing for about two hours. I think I got about five kills in that entire time. But each of those kills felt amazing because it is a great game. Play Warfork. It's free on Steam. It's a really fucking good game. I promise you, you will like it if you like FPS games and if you can find servers that aren't dead. Um, Great game. So, but then, you know, I was like kind of bored of just getting killed over and over again without really having any recourse. Sort of game you really want to play with friends, but no one's around right now to play with me. So I switched over to TF2 and uh, loaded into TF2 
and you know without even thinking loaded it to demo and then realized on like you know i've been playing with the rocket launcher in that other game uh and i it felt like i wanted to, to do a rocket jumps just like naturally the movement the motion of flicking behind yourself in a 180 that very satisfying classic rocket jump movement so i was like you know what let me play some soldier now the difference is between this time playing soldier and the last time i played soldier is when I first, you know, got into TF2 and I played Soldier for a bit, I was a noob with Soldier just like everything else. Um, and even playing a little more of the game, I was still relatively bad with Soldier. Like, I didn't know anything about it. But since then, I have become a bit of a high tower Soldier gamer. Not a lot, but I've played like maybe 15 hours, maybe less, maybe 10 hours of, eh, probably more. If, let's say 15. I'm happy with 15. 15 hours or so of high tower Soldier. What I mean to say is, I've gotten my head around rocket jumping at this point. Like, I'm, I'm actually would class myself as a pretty mediocre, like mid-tier rocket jumping guy. I know how to do it relatively well. So I decided to load into a game uh, and play some soldier. And immediately, I fucking top scored, including hitting multiple air shots and not easy air shots either. Relatively difficult like, air shot because it turns out. Soldier is just, like, I'm kind of good at Soldier now, I, I think. Maybe I just got lucky, but I, w I loaded in and immediately top scored, including an, an insane fucking play where I killed, like, I, I got Ubered, I fucking, I'm on, I'm on bad water red, right? I'm on the upper level uh, of the first point. I get Ubered, I go kill a demo man that's there, walk around the corner, there's a sniper in the little ramp area right to the side, uh, towards spawn. Kill, kill the sniper there, completely unaware guy. Then scout and medic running around below me. Uh, rocket jump up and then fire three shots down in their general direction, kill them both. Then I hear uh, some, my, some, something, I don't even remember, something. I spin around 180, there's a soldier there. I shoot him, d fucking crit, random crit, I uh, killed him, I probably, I don't know, but I'm still Uber, and then the Uber fades, and now I'm behind their entire team, and then I, like, in making it, going back to the front, I go, chew through their entire team and get, like, five more kills, including a, an air shot on a fucking, uh, what's it called, a pyro with the jetpack thingy, there's a jetpacking pyro, and I hit him out of the goddamn air, it doesn't kill him though, unfortunately, but I did hit him out of the air and then just get him with splash damage, so, fucking soldier, they might, I don't want to, see the thing is, I don't want to be soldier main number 5226, but, maybe there's something to this class, maybe there's something to this class, we'll see, we'll see, maybe I just got lucky one game. Oh, it was definitely just luck. I played like three more games of Soldier and didn't do that well ever again. So, I mean, I didn't do terribly. I was like middle of the scoreboard, but I definitely just got lucky that first time. But yeah, Soldier is okay. I've been playing more Warfork, giving myself fucking Carpal Tunnel because it's a Carpal Tunnel type. It's a, you know, you've heard of a Strand type game? It's a type Tackle Carpal. <laughs> oh my god. You've let me run that bit back. You've heard of a strand type game? This is a carpal tunnel type game. Um, but just as as always, Instagib. Instagib is my game mode. I'm an Instagib guy, okay? I was born to play Instagib. Unfortunately, everyone left and there were no servers that are active anymore. So, just me. I'm the only person in the world playing this game right now. It's so close to hitting the critical mass of players to be like alive as a game like it just needs like a hundred more people to play it and then you know it'll be a vibe so go down i'm telling you i'm going to be doing it we're going to be playing warfork with my discord server so you should download it you i mean you probably already know this if you're in the server because i would have been talking about it in the server but i want to arrange warfork matches in the discord server it's going to be a bit tricky given pings but it's the sort of game that is very good to organize with a Discord server. It's easy to host a game, lots of fun game modes. It's easy to pick up, especially if you're familiar with Quake or Source games, because uh, Source Engine movement translates. Like, So I'm instantly pretty decent at this game, because I have decent FPS aim, just because I'm an FPS gamer, and air strafing and source movement is, uh, you know, it's very inspired by that sort of thing so there's a lot of carrying over of skills there uh 
So I'm pretty good at going fast. I'm pretty good at aiming. I'm like, if I played this game for, you know, 10 hours more, because I've hit, I'm, 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 I only played for like an hour and a half so far. But if I play this game for like 10 hours, I think I'll be pretty good at the game, to be honest. Uh, I'll, I'll at least instigate. Because what I suck at is changing weapons. I'm so bad. This, I've always sucked at this in every arena shooter that I play. It's like you have like 50 weapons, and like how the fuck are you supposed to be pressing like the number 8 on your keyboard mid-fight while your hands on WASD? Like, I don't understand how people do that. Do they, like, rebind stuff to make... I don't even understand how the fuck people are changing weapons mid-fight. It doesn't make it... Like, this is the one skill of, of arena shooters that, like, keeps me from ever getting into arena shooters. I don't... Like, it's... Is it just a get good... Is it just a matter of get good? Because, like, that's a such a weird hand movement, you know? Like, I don't even understand how you're reaching over there. Like, what's the... Are people using their scroll wheel on their mouse? Is that how people normally do it? I didn't even check. I legitimately didn't even check if the scroll wheel changes weapons. I probably should have checked that. I, I didn't even bother to check if that was the case for, for this game. Um, maybe that's how people do it. Because I don't know if you know this, but when I'm normally in game, I have I have all the weapons on mouse buttons. So uh, middle click is always my melee, and then the two buttons on the side, the, the one furthest away from my body, is my secondary and the one closest to my body is my primary. I've had that, that's how I played CSGO, that's how I played TF2, and uh, but the problem is with with arena shooters is there are simply too many weapons to do that and unless you have a mouse with more buttons on it than I do. Like there are like nine different weapons, uh, you, you, you know there's not enough buttons on the mouse but my left hand is already doing too much, it's already busy doing movement. Like, I, I want to be able to do that with my right hand, but such an option doesn't exist. So I don't know how people would fucking do this. I, I mean, maybe the scroll wheel is the play. Maybe there's some way to go about doing that. I haven't checked. Um, I, I guess I could check, but oh, fuck it. Um, but yeah, Warfork, great fucking game. And in, in H2's video about Warfork, he says every, every, like every kill you get feels like a clip. It is so true. Like, every time you get a kill in this game, it somehow feels miraculous. Like, you just pulled off the most insane shit. That it's every single time. It always feels like that. It's great. It's honestly a great game. I think this is why I prefer Instagir, because there's normally just one weapon. Like, this is like Rats. I mean, I like Rats Instagir as well a lot. I've put in, what, how many hours have I got? I've got 34.6 hours in, in Rats Instagir, which is the other... And it's a pretty similar game. I mean, they're all, you know pretty inspired but that has slightly different mechanics honestly this is what i wanted rats to be like rats is a good game but i always felt that the movement was a little unnuanced in rats like obviously you have the rail jumping type of mechanic which it, it sort of works like a rocket jump right where you shoot behind yourself to go forward and shoot downwards to go upwards and that sort of thing with your uh, right click um but, like, the air control, I mean, there's no way to, like, there's no air strafing. But just the addition of air strafing in Warfork, plus, obviously, the whole point of the, the H2 video, the being able to redirect all of that speed on a dime, is, um, I mean, it just is super deep, movement-wise. And there's rocket jumping and stuff in this game as well. So, yeah, I mean, you can get some pretty insane speeds, and I think the, that's what makes every every kill a clip because every time you kill someone you're always both going 100 miles an hour in opposite direction so it's it's like somehow you manage to pull this thing off in like one frame and especially if you ha somehow did this i mean i have i've only done this once in my time playing today but if you manage to kill someone with a projectile at that speed it is insane but uh, yeah, I got, in my first game, I I managed, I basically by pure luck, to hit a, a rocket. I guess it's an air shot on someone. Um, actually, it wasn't an air shot. It was actually not an air shot. They were, they were just, they were just fighting. It was a bit of a lame kill, to be honest. Like, I, this is why I didn't mention it. Because it, it so they were just fighting someone else. They had already taken damage, and then they were speeding off in the other direction. And I saw them, like, basically, I don't even think they saw me. I just shot a rocket, and then they basically ran into the rocket. But it did splash damage. It hit the wall behind them, and that's how they died. 
Anyway, that was kind of unnecessary detail. It's a good game. Warfork, good game. Don't know why it's called Warfork. Kind of a terrible name, but the game's good. I should give it a positive review. Yes, I reckon this game. Uh, let me type a review up. Um, zoom. Gotta go fast. Maybe I just say gotta go fast. Okay, I've done it. You know, at some point, a few years ago, many years ago, um, I came up with this, this saying or this phrase. Um, I used to say uh, that, like, a lot, of, a lot of communities, they have problems with, with gatekeeping, i.e. they're not doing enough of it, right? They're like, they have in, invasions, what are, what are typically called normie invasion. And uh, there's always been this ongoing debate over, like, gatekeeping, whether it's bad, how, like, you know, you know what I'm talking about, right? Um, people like to put, there's, there's a lot of people like to pretend on the one hand that a sudden influx of new people who don't understand the culture of a fan base or a community is definitely never going to have any negative impact on that fan base or community. Of course, it po- there's no way that could possibly happen. Uh, so a bunch of people like to pretend that, that that's impossible and get mad about gatekeeping, which is just a, a very strange position to take, in my opinion. Um, but anyway. The other problem, though, is that gatekeeping doesn't really work. Like, there's not really any solid ways to gatekeep a community, not not particularly effective, um, that doesn't also, like, have ripple effects and ruin the community itself, or at least detriment... You know what I'm saying, right? There's a, there's a lot of problems. So I used to say, like, my opinion is you shouldn't worry about gatekeeping, because if you have to gatekeep, your interests aren't obscure enough. You should be being interested in stuff... That it, that is that gatekeeps itself. Um, now, what I meant, like when I when I said that, I would never have imagined that Serial Experiments Lane would have a TikTok Zoom and Normie invasion. I would never have imagined that because Serial Experiments Lane would be one of the sorts of things I would imagine would have gatekept kept itself. What I didn't think would happen is that if something becomes cool to be seen as liking. Um, people just, you know, if, if something like Lane, which is relatively obtuse or dense um, as a piece of media, um, becomes cool to like, people will just m- willingly misunderstand it or, and manipulate it because they just see it as a meme, disc- a, a floating signifier rather than the actual signified. Right? They just see. This is how you get this. Um, there's this. There's this fucking image. There's this disgusting image, like the worst thing ever made. Um, this image that says uh, it's like a picture of Misato. It's a screenshot of Misato, but edited Photoshop to have like fish nuts on, and then edited with Lane's hair holding a monster energy can with like a VHS filter on it uh, that then says on the bottom, these are the perks of being bimbo-pilled, Shinji. Right, so this is just nonsense. Like, these are just completely... This is just a mishmash of, of signifiers with no meaning behind them at all. Like, what does Lane and Misato have to do with each other? Nothing. What does Bimbo Pilled have to do with any of these characters? Nothing. Why is the VHS filter there? It doesn't mean anything. There's no appeal to nostalgia as a part of the meme. It's just itself, the monster energy. I mean, look, you could make some connection, maybe, between a monster energy and Lane, or a monster energy and Misato, if you really wanted to. It'd be a bit of a stretch, but I, that alone would be okay. But, yeah, so this meme is, is like, nonsense. It's, like, almost perfectly constructed bait. Um, yeah, it's very bad, right? This is, this is like, the worst... One of the worst images ever created, and it got a lot of flack uh, on the internet uh, because of that fact. But this is what happens, actually, when you have a relatively... Like, both Lane and Ava, you know, both came out at the same time, both part of the boom, the post-Evangelion boom of uh, original late-night anime in the late 90s. Um, sort of cerebral shows with a bit more of a, a philosophical bent. Right, we've all heard this story a million times. Um, like, people don't, they don't, they just see that it's a cool signifier. Like, they just see it as a cool meme. And if the thing is obs- obscure, rather, they won't even make the effort to, to go through the the trouble of trying to understand it, right? They'll they'll just make shit up because because they don't. This is the thing about normies is they don't really care about the stuff that, like they just. It's all about some sort of fitting in for them, 
Right? It's all about doing what you can perceive as being cool, um, rather than you know something like understanding the messaging of Lane and where it fits into the anime landscape or anything like this. Um, am I being a pretentious elitist right now? Yes, I fucking am. If you have a problem with that, what are you doing on this channel? Get the fuck off this channel. Go away. What are you doing? This is the wrong channel for you to have a problem with pretentious elitism. That is my fucking brand, okay? <laughs> pretentious anime elitism is... I was born and molded by pretentious anime elitism, okay? Um, so that was the thing that I didn't expect to happen. This is what I what I misunderstood by my, my idea that you can just simply have things that gatekeep themselves, is that normies will just find a way to bypass that by ignore because they don't even really care about the thing. They'll just invent their own thing and make it so close and annoying to the thing that you like that it just constantly bothers you. Another example of this is breakcore. Okay, so I've been a fan of breakcore music for a long-ass time. We're talking at least... 2015, 2014, when I first started listening to Breakcore. How long ago is that now? 2014, 2023. It's like eight years at least, which in my lifetime is a relatively large chunk. Okay, and then I got like more into Breakcore maybe around 2016 when I got really into Venetian Snares. There was a period where Venetian Snares was my favorite musician. Uh, like I, I got super, super into Venetian Snares for a while. Um, uh, and Still am, by the way. I love Venetian Snares. Absolute legend of a guy. Uh, <clears throat> and that's when I started making Breakcore, was when I got really into Venetian Snares. Um, and then, sort of around the same time-ish, I stumbled into... Actually, I'm pretty sure I know exactly how this happened. It was... Um, uh, it, why, as soon as we become so close, do I have to say goodbye? No, no, no. Yeah, it was the, It was the, this... this video on the bread memes channel which funny enough i now know i'm now friends with the person who runs the bread memes channel but this is what got me into like depressive break or so this this was posted in 2015 but i i think i probably first heard this in 2016 um it's this song called why as soon as we become so close do we have to say goodbye by lolly pusher i believe it's a remix of a um uh, Gorshet song, and I also believe that Lolly Pusher is a wax, another one of the many wax pseudonyms. Um, if you're not deep in this particular breakcore scene, you might have absolutely no idea what I'm talking about. But essentially, there's this guy called Wax W A Q S who sort of invented this genre of internet online anime depressive breakcore based on like. Uh, I don't know what to say with regards to this, right? But this has the OG, first of all, and the absolute legend and the goat, okay? Wax is the absolute goat. This song is very good, um, and it has a very clickable thumbnail. It also has, like, it's pretty popular. It has 200,000 views on YouTube, so, you know, pretty... Um, as far as, like, this genre of breakcore goes, pretty popular. But I believe this is how I ended up getting into the, like, depressive anime DPH side of Breakcore. So there's there's this very particular scene of a, a few artists based around Wax, who um, are mostly inspired by Wax and Gorshit, who's another Breakcore artist, um, and uh, make music themed around more of a depressive side of Breakcore, but also themed around uh, DPH, diphenhydramine, which is a... Uh, antihistamine drug which you can you know if you you probably know about this it's benadryl if you take a shitload of benadryl you'll become delirious and have strange hallucination um it's not very fun i don't know why anyone does it it's like the worst drug ever <laughs> um but anyway through this bread memes channel i started listening to this sort of thing and my break call that I was making started to, you know, become a little closer to this because the original break call I was making, my, like, quote-unquote innovation based on the Gorsha, I mean, based on the, the Venetian snares that I'd been listening to was, if you don't know this, Akazi was originally lo-fi hip-hop. Um, I would make one lo-fi hip-hop beat every day and post it on SoundCloud. And I would make one a day, and I did that for, like, kind of like Kanye, you know, he made beats every day for a summer or something. I did that for like, you know, a few months. I just made a loaf. And then once I started getting into uh, Venetian snares, I was like, I'm going to invent lo-fi drum and bass and lo-fi breakcore, lo-fi jungle. You can still find, if you go on, um, let me see if I'm getting my timelines right here. Cause I, I might be, my timelines might be off. I want to see when did I put this album out? Uh, this was in, 
Oh wait, this was in 2018? But I definitely remember being into this earlier than that. So maybe I just didn't make this album until later. But anyway, then I started, after getting into like the Wax Star stuff, it probably would have been 2017, maybe even, you know what, maybe it was 2018. Uh, no, it must have been earlier than that. It must have been earlier than that. Because that's because I was going on 420chan regularly, which was more of a 2016, 2017 era of me. It can't have been as late as 2018. That was too late for that era of me. Yeah, it must have been a 2016, 2017 kind of era. This is why I got into... So, you know, you've got what, all of the wax aliases, Waiting to Die, which is um, Better Off Dead. Um, you know, this this stuff. And it was it was Pog. It was super Pog. And this is how I got into it. So this is the OG, what's well, sort of the OG anime break called depressive internet scene, right? Um, now, if you want to be a stickler about it, Depressive Breakcore has been around for a long time. The original Depressive Breakcore album is by a guy called Christoph de Babylon. Um, and it's called, I believe it's called something like, If You're Into It, I'm Out. Um, it's called, yeah, If You're Into It, I'm Out of It. And that was in 1979, or 1997. So, yeah, check that album out. It's a great fucking album. But so, so Depressive Breakcore has been around for a long ass time. Yeah, long ass time. And uh, the first ever, what is generally recognized as the first ever Breakcore album, uh, which is by Alec Empire, The Destroyer, actually has anime samples in it. And Alec Empire is an anime fan. Um, he's, he's known to, to be into anime. So the first ever Breakcore album has anime samples in it. And then again, you know, a lot of Breakcore was popular in rhythm games, which is why it's kind of associated with a lot of anime stuff. Same with like hardcore techno and hard like you know happy hardcore these kinds of things um hard trance these genres and breakcore are all popular in rhythm games so they end up getting associated with nerdy anime culture and gorshit has been making nerdy anime breakcore for a long ass time um so what i'm saying here is you know none of this stuff is particularly new the new thing was the 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 dph dxm drug influences in this small scene um, but but this stuff had always been around for a long time, and I was honestly a little late to it. I was probably like a few years late to the scene. Um, but you know, I got into it and started making breakcore on a Kazi, and ended up in a Discord server with a bunch of these breakcore people, uh, which unfortunately died. They all stopped using it. Um, anyway, that was a lot of words to say. There was this scene of depressive anime breakcore on the internet that was a very small, minor scene, right? Like, they, these things, they didn't get that many views. There was a couple of breakout hits by Wax, but that was pretty much as far as it ever went. And then this motherfucker called Sewer Slut shows up out of nowhere. No one's ever heard of this person in the scene. Like, again, we were all talking in a Discord server this whole time. Like, none of us ever had ever heard of this fucking person or any of the people that they were, like, close with. They came out of nowhere, and they made, like, a dumbed-down, you know, normie-friendly version of what we'd been doing for years. Uh, and this is this is what happens, right? Is when there's a scene that's doing something interesting, you know, someone just steals it. It's the same thing that happened with Lane, right? Lane is one of the best anime ever made, you know, arguably the best anime ever made, but definitely one of the best anime ever made. And it's, you know... To use a shorthand, it's deep, right? It's deep. It has a lot of depth to it. It has a lot of density, a lot of themes and messaging, and the, the, even the, you know, what was the word? The presentation of the show is very unique. Atmosphere, music, directing, character design, you know, it has all of these elements to it which provide a lot of depth that's what i mean by deep it has a, you know a lot of thematic density the dialogue is not very like on the nose there's not a lot of like very clear exposition although sometimes there is but the, a lot of the time the exposition is quite dense itself comes you know like there's a lot to it there's a lot to lane there used to be a meme this is an old school meme about lane that you need to watch lane four times to really understand it i don't think that's true but i mean it can't hurt I've seen it eight times, just to be clear here. Um, you know, I, it definitely is a show that you probably need to rewatch at least once to, to really, you know, wrap your head around, you know, since it's, it's relatively abstract in terms of presentation. Um, so because of that, people just make shit up. They're like, it's cool to like this thing, so I will just make my own version of it, where Lane is someone who says bimbo-pilled. 
uh, you know, just completely nothing to do with the original. And it's the same thing with this anime break core, depressive break core stuff, right? There's a scene going around, and people see it, and they're like, well, I don't want it to sound, you know, actually you, you like emotions so I'm just going to make my own shitty version of it that, that has nothing to do with anything I mean it's not even breakcore I'm not the first person to point this out but Suicide is not even breakcore right you're just making something up and calling it that right it's just a, it just breakcore just becomes a floating signifier so this is what actually you know I feel like this is actually what happens when you make communities that gatekeep themselves in terms of uh, aesthetics uh, artistic abstraction or obtuseness uh abrasiveness is that people will just make up their own shitty version of it and that's the one that will become popular right and now everyone thinks you know i'm fucking depressed because all the time i think people are going to find my soundcloud and they're going to think i was inspired by suicide motherfucker i've never listened to a suicide album i've listened to like songs here and there they were all bad so i never like i'm not i've been doing this for longer than suicide has existed as an as an entity Right, like this motherfucker, and now everyone's like, "Oh, I, I bet you like suicide." I, I mean, these are just people I've invented in my head. <laughs> no one's actually saying this to me. I'm just inventing a guy and getting mad at him. But you know, I don't like that. I don't like the fact that that my scene is now associated with some fucking bullshit that I I actively dislike. I don't want that at all. And that's the case with Lane. That's the case with, with this anime breakcore internet depressive breakcore stuff. Um, you know, it fucking sucks. So that's what really happens a lot of the time when you have a scene that gatekeeps itself, is people will just make their own thing up. The normies will just make a worse version of the, of the thing and then pretend that it's that. They'll just pretend. They'll be like, ah, oh, yes, Lane, that's the one that says bimbo pill. That's the Lane-pilled schizo aesthetic, right? Like, even the idea for some reason, like, there was a trend for a long time where everyone thought, like, everyone was trying to pretend that Lane had anything to do with Deleuze. Like, Lane is like Baudrillard, like, very clearly. Simulation and simulacra pilled. Absolutely nothing to do with Deleuze, as far as I can tell. I mean, you can you can apply some Deleuze to, to Lane. I read a paper when I was studying for my... Um, or when I was, when I was, uh, you know, researching for my paper about Lane, uh, which, by the way, my paper about Lane also uses Deleuze, so it might not be a good example, but mo- mostly it's about Kodoreshin, so I think I'm safe there. Um, but th- I did read a paper about Lane as Deleuzean time image, which I don't really know, I haven't read... I think that's from, it's either from Difference in Repetition or What is Philosophy, I don't remember, but time image is not a concept I'm particularly familiar with from Deleuze, but uh, that paper seemed pretty good when I read it, so uh, maybe there's, you know, there's some stuff from Deleuze you can apply to Lane, but if you wanted to pick a philosopher that is, like, more obvious, it's it's Baudrillard, I mean, it, right? Clearly. Like, just the name Simulation and Simulacra can be applied to many aspects of Lane's plot and messaging. Uh, anyway, sorry. So that was that's just a weird thing. I don't know. Cult, these cultural memes are so strange. How stuff just like happens <laughs> it has nothing to do with the thing that it's based on. So so that's something I'm a little worried about. But I think there is actually a trick here. I think there is a trick here. This is I've been ranting for a long time about this. This this could have been a much shorter segment. This could have been an email. Um, I think the trick is that it's it's about two things. Firstly, I think technical barriers can still work as effective gatekeeping but they're almost too effective because no one wants to quote unquote do homework to do any to, to be able to right? like everyone's terrified of this concept of like oh i wanted to get into the oh you want me to get into this technology thing but okay i have to do homework and honestly like you know kill yourself but like that stuff is effective like you're not going to get a normie invasion of of some sort of pub next server or uh, you know gemini capsules or whatever maybe they need a normie invasion in those places but they're not going to get one because it requires having some smidgen of technical knowledge and people are completely unwilling to do that and unlike being unwilling to like interpret a piece of media like lane or you know interpret a piece of media like break or as a genre if you can't interpret basic you know technical skills you don't get to interact with these sorts of online places these sorts of technologies protocols whatever like you're just not allowed in you just can't get in unless you can you know read one web page in order to figure something out (laughs) right like that's that's a strong difference um so i i I believe that's what that's something important uh if you want to formulate good gatekeeping uh but 
the other thing is when it comes to stuff that isn't going to have some sort of technological barrier, I think the key is to have stuff that's just not cool. Like, I think that's really the problem, is that like a lot of this stuff is too cool. Like you, you, I want stuff that you're seen as weird and lame for being into. Like if someone, I remember right, like people back when no one knew what Lane was and I was super into Lane. Well, I'm saying no one knew. Lane was like beginning to um, explode in popularity, but it was right at the beginning, but in 2015, 2016 kind of era. Um, so a lot of people did know what Lane was, but it wasn't like super popular with the anime watching public like it is these days. Um, so when I like was obsessed with Lane at the time and would talk about it to people, people were interested. Like, uh, you know, random, this is my hyper obsession, so I'm fucking talking to people about it randomly. And people thought it was cool. They were like, oh, this weird, obscure anime about, like, sci-fi and philosophy stuff. Like, normies literally thought it was cool. Now, at the time, I was in, you know, a a music-focused college, so these were, like, artsy kind of people. But still, like, they weren't that artsy. (laughs) Like, a lot of them were, like, you know, aspiring rappers rather than, you know, aspiring... No, there's... Hold on. Let's clarify. No, there's nothing artsy about rappers, but... They're not like, you know, art school student type people. They're more interested in making pop music or or hip-hop music rather than like, you know, math rock or or something like that. I think there's a difference there, okay? Have I cleared myself of any allegations? Okay, good. They thought it was cool. Whereas if I tried to show them, you know, got you, they're just going to think I'm a pervert. And that's how you know got you, is good, right? Like, they're just going to think... If I'm like, guys... Check out this anime. It's about a near future cyberpunk setting. It has a whole bunch of commentary about the nature of the internet. And even though it was made in 1998, you know, it was super prescient. It predicted stuff like anonymous and hacktivism. Uh, and it has a lot to say about like how we interact with the internet on a day to day basis through the character of Lane, who's this schoolgirl who's like suffering from some sort of schizophrenic style disorder. Or possibly, you know, how much of it is schizophrenia, how much of it is real, is, like, always called into question. Um, But there's allusions to, you know, like, someone's instantly going to be like, oh, that seems like it has merit. Like, that seems interesting. Even if I'm not going to watch it, it's cool that you're into that. But if I say, guys, let me tell you about this anime called Rokubu. Okay, it's about a bunch of little girls. (laughs) Their brains are just going to turn off and they're just going to instantly think, oh, you're a pervert. Okay, that's cool. Thanks for telling me that, I guess. But, you know, I'm normal, so I'm just going to... Like, yeah, you just it just has to be stuff that's lame. Now, the problem is, the scary thing is, right, the scary thing is that sometimes something that's lame at one point becomes cool. Like, I would never have imagined that Ayumu Kasuga Osaka memes would be popular or even like MLP, right? Like a lot of people use MLP as an aesthetic now, as a like, oh, you lol random 2000s aesthetic. Like, isn't it so aesthetic and cool 2000s stuff? But back in, like, these are the sorts of people that would have made fun of bonies back in the day, right? Like, a lot of stuff that you never know what's going to be considered to be lame and what's going to be considered to be cool. Which is why, you know, I think you've got to stick to the pillars of stuff that is like the defining. The defining structure that separates autists from normies, which is Shadow the Hedgehog. If you think Shadow the Hedgehog is unironically cool, you're a based autist. If you think he's cringe and and, uh, only good to be laughed at, you're a cringe normie. That's where I draw the fucking line. I think that's the basis of all of this, right? Is that if you can admit to yourself, if you can sit there and admit to yourself, you know what? I don't like all of Shadow's appearances, but like there's something, ultimately, there is something cool about Shadow the Hedgehog. Like, to be frank, he is kind of cool. If you can admit that to yourself, you're a based autist. If you can't admit that to yourself, you're a cringe normie. There you go. That's the difference. So I wouldn't have predicted that Osaka memes would become popular. But it's not really so much... I, for some reason, like this, I don't I don't think that this invasion, this normie invasion of... Um, it's not even an invasion of Azumanga Daio. It's specifically the character of Osaka. Um, this is odd because I have a friend called Osaka. But specifically this one character, because she was popular in memes in the early 2000s, and it's about 2000s memes nostalgia rather than the actual show. But for some reason, I don't feel like they're missing the point. When people share Osaka memes, they actually get it. Like, they get the, like, you know, unlike Lane, there's not much to misunderstand about 
Osaka. Maybe they will fuck it up at some point, but like so far, I feel like all the memes generally they capture the same sort of vibe. Although, what they really, what all these zoomers really want to be watching, by the way, is Pani Pony Dash. Okay, like all of the stuff that they like about Azumanga Dayo, they would love Pani Pony Dash for. Okay, like all of these zoomers need to watch Pani Pony Dash, um, but they they won't because they don't really watch anime. They just like the aesthetic, which is sad, but it is what it is. They do watch anime. They watch like this is what this is the average zoomer. Average zoomer. They watch like Jujutsu Kaisen and like Demon Slayer and Spy Family uh, and Chainsaw Man, and they probably watched Naruto and, and Dragon Ball when they were growing up and Pokemon. Right. So they watch all of the shonens and they go online and they have a profile picture from like Fate. Which they've never seen Fate, and they've definitely never read Fate. They have like like Tosaka Rin profile picture from the visual novel because it's aesthetic, and then they post like memes from uh, fucking Azumanga Daio and and a bunch of early two thousands moe shows that they've never watched. That's what they do. Is they've only ever seen this, the the popular shonen. But they LARP as if they like Moe shit. It's like, why not just like Moe shit? You, you, if you like the aesthetic, you're already half the way there, right? Now you just have to sit down and watch it and enjoy it, because it's good. Sorry, I'm going on a rant here. But I don't feel like the, the Osaka memes miss the point. Maybe it's because the, 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 the real invasion, normie invasion, is just of the meme of Osaka rather than the, the show itself. But I think it's also because, like, unlike Lane, there's no... Most people can't bring themselves to be pretentious about slice of life young comma adaptation. I'm one of the rare people that can bring myself to be pretentious about these shows, but but the vast majority of people they're too I don't know they're too loosey goosey. The shows are too like you can't really miss the point of of Azumanga Daio. Either you like it or you don't like it. Like that's one thing, but like if you if you you know it's Azumanga Daio, it's funny. That's what it is. It's about girls in high school, and it's funny. They they do funny things. It's wacky. They they get up to some wacky, funny things. Like you can't really misunderstand that. Um, or like even if you don't want to look into the show deeply and actually analyze its themes, which by the way do exist. Most people, most people, many people don't realize the manga Dio has themes. Um, <laughs> it's actually a good piece of media. Uh, but anyway, even if you don't want to do that, like unlike Lane or. You know any of these other things, and also the other thing is Azumanga Day was like arguably the first cute girls doing cute things show, right? So there's not a cultural context that you're missing from the show. You, there, there is to some extent, but it's not as important as some you know other anime. Like if you don't understand the cultural context of Lane, I don't think you can really understand Lane. Or if you don't understand you know the cultural context of Ava at least a little bit, if you don't under if you don't know what Gundam is. <laughs> You know, you're you're not gonna have a great time watching Ava. And the more anime that inspired Ava you've watched, the better time you're gonna have watching Ava. Same with Monogatari, same with Madoka. You know, all of the there's. I mean, these are like the obvious examples, but there's there's more to it than that. You know, a lot of anime references other anime. Um, but Azumanga Daio is like arguably the first in its genre. It's not really pulling from anywhere um, that it expects its viewers to know. Now the the Lucky Star memes are worse because Lucky Star is one of these shows that requires you to understand the otaku culture of the time. Now it does a good job explaining it within the show, which is one of the reasons why Lucky Star is so good. But also there's a lot of references that people aren't going to get, and there's a lot of references that people don't still who I think validly like Lucky Star, including me, don't get. Like I know people who have watched Lucky Star that don't know what Too Hot. I, to me, I'm like I remember. I always remember seeing the two heart cosplays in Lucky Star, and thinking to myself, "Huh, that's too hot. That makes sense." But a lot of people, they don't even know the two, like what a two heart is. And if they do, they might think like, "Oh, that anime that has like a six out of ten on Mal, right?" They don't know how culturally important two heart is to the, to the uh, otaku, to the moe boom, right? And also, I'm sitting here. And I've never played Too Hot because it's not translated. I've played Too Hot Two, but I've not finished it. <laughs> I've played a bit of Too Hot Two, but I've never played Too Hot One because it's not translated. Uh, so I'm as much as a poser as anyone else. It's not about being a poser or not a poser. It's about understanding. It's about assimilating to the culture. You know, it's about 
fucking vibing with the vibes. It's about vibing with the vibes. Most people, they can't vibe with the vibes. Anyway, you know what I'm doing? I'm watching this show. Well, I'm still watching Kenjin Omago, which is not a very good anime, to be honest. But I'm in too deep now to turn back. But I'm also watching Taisho Yaku Musume, which is a show I've been meaning to watch for years. Like, this is what I'm saying, right? There are all of these, like, crazy dope shows that just no one knows about. It's insane. It's insane. No one... I, I don't think anyone actually watches anime. Like, I don't... I don't fucking get it. Why... Why does no one... No one even knows that, like, good anime exists. It's wild. I need to watch Bamboo Blade. That's another show I need to watch. I think that's the show I'm thinking of. I might be wrong. Which one am I thinking of? Let me... Hold on. Asagiri no Miko was the one I was thinking of. Asagiri no Miko. Um, here's my question. Here's my con- here's my my take. Okay. You know I've done I've done my fucking. Uh, you know I've done my due diligence. I do my due diligence on the Wikipedia page for list of slice of life anime. Okay. I I I have done my research and added added stuff to this exists how many of these have i seen you know what let's go through this okay starting from 1978 or 79 with akage no an Anne of green gables i haven't seen Anne of green gables urusei yatsua i've seen about five episodes of urusei yatsua so i'm counting it uh 1985 we got high school kimen gumi i have not seen them in 1991, we have Only Yesterday. I have not seen that. 1995 is Whisper of the Heart. I haven't seen that. I'm afraid I haven't. Uh, 1998, Yokama Kaidashi Kiko. I have seen that, and I've also read the manga. It's excellent. Uh, 1999, My Neighbors the Yamadas. I have not seen. 2001, Kokoro Toshikan. I have seen this. N- no one else has. <laughs> No one else has, but I have. I have seen Coco Toshikan. It's good. You should watch it. Uh, Shrine of the Morning Mist, aka Asagani no Miko. I haven't seen, but I am planning to. Almanga Dial, of course, I have seen that. Um, Aria, I have seen Aria. Ichigo Marshmallow always gets left off of the slice of life anime lists, but yes, people don't realize. You know, basically, Almanga Dial, Ichigo Marshmallow is like. You know, almost direct. It's, it's definitely a, a, a missing link in the the lineage of, of cute girls doing cute things anime. Bartender. Surprisingly, I have actually seen Bartender. I dropped it. Um, five centimeters per second. I have not seen. Clanad. I don't know if you can really count that as a slice of life anime, but Lucky Star. I have seen. Minami K. I have seen. Sketchbook Full Colors. I have seen. Hyako. I have seen. G A Art Design Class. I have seen. Hidemari Sketch. Yes. Kaon. Yes. Restaurante Paradiso. No. Seto Kainiyaku. Now ya. Seto Kainiyaku. Domo. Yes, I've seen. Sorted Machi. I've seen. Bakuman, I've seen. Mitsudomoe, I've seen. Soda no Oto, I haven't seen, actually. Uh, Tamayura, I've seen. It's great. Squid Girl, I've seen. Working, I've seen. A Channel, I've seen. Anohana, I have seen the first episode of Undropped. Chihaya Furu, I have seen. Um, from Up on Poppy Hill, I have not seen. Uh, Hanas- Hanaska Iroha, I have not seen. Nichijo, I have seen. Tamayura Hitotose, I have seen. Yuri Yuri, I have seen. Daily Lives of High School Boys, I watched the first episode of and put it on hold, I think. Hidemari Sketch Honeycomb, yes. Yoka, yes. Kill Me Baby, I have seen. Kimi Toboku, I have not seen. Mysterious Girlfriend X, I have seen. Place to Place, I have seen. Uh, Shirokuma Cafe, I have not seen. Take You, I have seen. Wolf Children, I have not seen. Yuru Mates 3D. Wow, I'm amazed that made it on here because that is an obscure fucking show. And uh, yes, I have seen it. Free, I have not seen. Genshi Ken, second season. I actually have not seen Genshi Ken. I know it's not good. Uh, GJ Boo, I have seen. That's, I actually watched that really early on into getting into anime. Kino Mosaic, I have seen. Kotoro san, I have seen. Love Life, I have seen. Minami K Tadaima, I have not seen because I didn't like Minami K that much. My Teen Romantic Comedy Snafu, I have seen. Nonon Bioi, I have seen. Seven X Service, I have not seen. Silver Spoon, I have not seen. Super Station Brothers, I have not seen. Tamako Market, I have seen. Tamayura More Aggressive, I have seen. Watamoto, I have seen. The Wind Rises, I have not seen. Yuyushiki, I have seen. Barakamon, I have seen. The Comic Artist and His Assistants, I have not seen. Engage to the Unidentified, I have I have seen Free Eternal Summer, I haven't seen Free. Hana Yamata, I have not seen. Gotchiusa, I have seen. 
My Neighbor Seki, I think I might have seen this one actually. I don't remember. Go Go 575, I have not seen. Shirobako, I have seen. Soul Eater Not, I have not seen. But I should maybe watch it. Tesagure Bukatsumono Encore, I have seen. Wake Up Girls, I have not seen. Um, wait, have I seen this? Hold on, I need to check, I don't remember. Maybe there's some. Let me double check this on fucking off. Wake up, girls. No, I, I have not seen this. I simply have not seen this. It looks like idol shit. Um, <clears throat> Food Wars, I have seen. That is not a slice of life anime. Castle Town Dandelion. I don't believe I've seen this. What the hell? Let me, uh, Joko. This has an anime? How come I've never heard of this? This is the, what, the, only, sh- the only slice of life anime I haven't heard of. It's not even on, it's not on Mal, what the fuck? Hold on, let me try the English. Oh, okay, found it, it's just spelled, spelled different. I apparently dropped this. Apparently I have seen it and dropped it. I gave it a five and I watched three episodes. I have no memory of, let me watch the PV. No, the, the PV doesn't exist, it's, it's been taken down. Okay, fucking epic. What the fuck is this show? I have no, I don't remember this show existing at all. But apparently I've seen it. Wait, if you go on, I've forgotten how to do this. You have to, you can, you can see when you watch this somehow. I, I don't remember how you do, oh yeah, don't you have to go to, you have to go to edit details and then history. Apparently I watched this in 2022. What the fuck? I don't remember watching this at all. What is this show? I need to look at some footage. Hold on. I need to look at some footage of this. I really don't remember this. What is this show about? Okay, here's something on YouTube. Oh, there's just the whole show on YouTube <laughs> in one video. What the hell? I have no memory of this. I have zero fucking memory of this. This has almost a million views. Just the whole show in one YouTube. What the hell? Why don't I remember this? I, like, it's not even like, oh, I don't remember the specifics. Like, I legitimately don't remember watching, like, I don't remember this ever having existed. That's so strange. Okay, so I got distracted by that. I might have to, like, rewatch that or something, because... Yeah. Uh, Himoto Maru-chan, I have not seen. Kamisama Miranai, I have not seen. School Live, I have... Uh, oh, that's Gakko Gorashi. I have seen the first two episodes, and it's bad. Uh, Hibiki Euphonium, I have seen. Unhappy, I have seen. Koro Katachi, I have seen. Sakamoto Desuga, I have seen. Tanaka-kun is always listless. I believe I watched one episode or something and dropped it. I haven't seen Centaur's Life, but I've been meaning to. Blend S, I have seen. Gabriel Dropper, I have seen. Girls Lost Who I have seen. Kino's Journey, surprisingly, I haven't seen. Kobayashi's Dragon Maid, I have seen. Comic Girls, I have seen. Great show. Eurocamp, I have seen. Uh, Takagi-san, I have seen like seven episodes of, and I keep meaning to finish the first season, but I'm stupid. Senko-san, I have seen. Kaguya-sama, I watched the first episode and didn't like it. Azoken, I have seen, and it's one of the best shows ever made. Uzaki chan, I watched the first episode, it was terrible. Um, okay, now we're into like modern shit that I don't even know about. Wave, listen to me. I don't, I've never heard of this, but it's probably, I don't know. Um, words bubble up like soda pop. It's a film. Interesting. Um, Nagatoro, I have read, uh, I watched the first episode of the anime, but I've read the manga, like, deeper than the first, I don't know, I've read them quite a lot of the manga. Uh, I have not actually seen Super Cup. Um, Mug Cup, I have seen. It's good, it's actually good, you should watch it. Um, Aquatope on White Sand, I watched the first episode of, for one of my first episode, watching every first episode videos. Akabi... Akari-chan no Seifuku, I have seen the first, like, four episodes. Uh, My Dress Up Darling, I have not seen. Uh, Sasaki and Miyano, I have not seen. Daimon, I watched the first episode of, and I want to watch more of it, because it's good. Slow Loop, I have seen. And When Will Ayumu Make His Move, I believe I have not seen that. So if anyone wants to tally up what percentage... I have seen of every slice of life anime ever made, according to Wikipedia. I believe you'll find I've seen most of them. Um, although, strangely enough, the fucking one I'm watching right now, the, the Baseball Girls, is not on here. Maybe I should add it. I don't know. Don't you just love anime? Isn't anime good? Wait, I'm starting to remember this Castle Town Dandelion, Jo Kamachi no Dandelion. I'm starting to remember this. I remember, but am I, I feel like I'm getting confused with with that one fucking Shaft series. 
It's shin bow, of course, because it's shaft. And it's bad. But the first episode's really good, but then it gets bad. Or at least really weird. The first episode's really weird. Um, Sasami-san at Gambara Night is the one thinking of. Because that also has security cameras as a part of it. And this has security as a part of it. Superpowers, 2000 security. I really don't remember this show at all. This is kind of weird. I mean, I guess I've watched so much anime at this point that there's no way I could remember everything. But the fact that I have zero memory of it... Maybe I was, like, really drunk when I was watching or something. I don't know. Okay, well, that's my rants. These are my rants. I hope you've enjoyed my rants. If you'll allow me to shill something real quick, if you'll allow me to shill something, uh, I made a new t-shirt design. On You can find it on my Teespring store, which uh, I do not link enough. It does exist though. If you so, I think maybe if you just Google "no thank you" merch, does it come up? Yeah, top top link is 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 my Teespring store. There's also this Spreadshirt store, but this thing I I I set it up and I lost the fucking login because because I don't. Yeah, there's there's some T-shirts available on Spreadshirt, but that's not my that's not my thing. Let me see if I even have... Do I have... Yeah. Oh, apparently... Apparently Firefox has my login for Spreadshirt. What the hell? What is this? Notification. Today. Def as... What the fuck is that? Apparently I have £3.80 on my (coughs) Spreadshirt store. (coughs) Sorry. Um, uh, I guess maybe someone bought something once. 10 million years ago. But no, the Spreadshirt is not the thing I use. I use the Teespring. Uh... Which is now called like Creator Spring instead, which is odd. But yeah, if you if you just type in Google "no thank you" the O's and zeros merch, it'll be the the top link and also the second link. And you can find a T-shirt that says "I hate." It says "hate ecstasy, hate mushroom. I only want feel like shit." And I think it looks pretty cool and it's pretty funny. And you can get it in white or black. Or blue, and you can get it in not a shirt either. You could also get a, a sticker or a poster. Honestly, I think the poster looks kind of cool, but it's up to you, of course, what you choose to do. But there you go, that's my shilling. Every time the main character of uh, Kenjin Omago does his powerful explosion magic, it's always a hydrogen explosion, which, like, I might not be, listen, I'm not a chemist. But I don't think that's the that's a particularly effective explosion. Is it? Wait, what do you what do you mean? Yeah, yeah. He I takes does it? I thought but yeah, Oh yeah, rocket fuel is hydrogen. Okay, what am I am I getting it confused with something else? What am I thinking of? Maybe I'm thinking of something else then. I'm thinking of you know there's a chemistry experiment that you do in school, they fill a balloon with something and then make it explode. Is that they, helium isn't explosive? It's non. Okay, now I don't know what's going on. I thought hydrogen wasn't that explosive. Also, but also. The, the thing is, you don't really see it in any way. Yeah, I guess so. But the thing is, isn't explosive have to? I guess he could probably explain that with magic. Okay, maybe I'm just getting my chemistry wrong. I would have imagined he would have been like, okay, time to create some nitroglycerin type of situation. I didn't know that. Okay, I guess I'm just wrong. Well, good job to the light novel author for knowing more about chemistry than I do. Listen, I don't want to call it too soon, but I think Warfork might be my fucking game. This is the first time ever, literally the first time I can ever think of, where I have loaded into a game, and this is day two of playing. I am now... This is the first game I think I ever have natural talent, which is crazy. It's not an experience I've ever had before. Now, I'm not saying I'm good. Listen, there's a... <clears throat> there's still a very clear distinction between me, the good players, and the really good players. And when you're on the, I mean, you can just see. But I am, like, you know, I'll, I'll, I'm getting... Like, I'll be there soon, I feel like. Not in the really good players level. Okay, those guys are just insane. When you see them play, they're just playing a completely different fucking game. But I think with, like, you know, a week's worth of playing so I can get, you know... I'm still, the thing I'm struggling most with is weapon switching, which is the thing I've improved at today, because I've figured out a way to bind bind the weapons to my mouse in a way that is not natural, it's still a bit unpleasant, but it's better than what I had before. 
uh, to the mouse buttons. It's yeah, it's not great. Like it's not, it's not. I don't even know what optimal would be. It's as close to. It's good enough. It's good enough. Let's just say it's good enough. Um, so now I just sort of need to wrap my head around which weapons it like. Being very quick at like not having to think, getting the muscle memory of like switching weapons, and also like knowing intuitively which weapons are best to use in which scenario, like not having to actively think it through in each encounter, which is something I still have to do. Um, but generally speaking, my aim and movement is kind of good because it simultaneously it has a lot in common with other games that I have played a lot of. You know, it's got a lot in common with TF2. It's got a lot in common with Counter Strike in certain aspects. It's the sort of it doesn't have that much in common with Counter-Strike, actually. But in terms of raw aim. And it's got a lot in common with Rats Instagib. Um, so a lot of the source engine movement translates pretty cleanly over to the Warfork movement. Warfork movement is more based on Quake, but it has some source engine stuff. I mean, it's there's similarities there that work. Also Half-Life 1. Uh, but yeah. Like Gauze can Gauze boosting. A little bit of little bit of similarities to that. I mean most people when I say CSGO, I'm talking about B-hop servers in CSGO. Because B-hopping is the, 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 the main movement mechanic in the game. Um, so that definitely prepared me for that. You can tell, like, this is another thing, is that noobs will join, like, like fresh installs, right? Which I emerged one day after installing. And unlike in most other games, when you see someone who's a, a, a new player, I was about to say free to play, I'm fucking TF2 brained. New player. Generally speaking, they're all actually pretty already like competent at aiming. They just the movement is what they need to get used to. Like, I think the people who would discover Warfork are already you know FPS gamers. Although if you you know, it's not to say everyone's like that. Not that there's any problem if you need some time to learn aiming. Uh, but yeah, generally speaking, people seem to get the hang of the aiming very quickly. And the movement you know is takes a little bit to learn, but it's not that quick. But anyway, I'm doing pretty well. Is what I'm saying. Hit some hit some nutty. Flags. This time I wasn't playing on an Instagib server, playing on Clan Wars, which is basically Team Deathmatch. But you, uh, it's it's like Team Deathmatch, but when you die, you're out for the round. Which I don't know if that's how that's not how Team Deathmatch works. Uh, but yeah, you you die. Uh, whichever team kills the other team wins, and when you die, you're out until one team wins the round. And it's best to something. I haven't even been paying attention to the scores. Uh, but yeah, no, I it's uh, this is a crazy fun game, but also. Re- ridiculously fucking brain it's very brain you have it's so fast paced it's like i mean i can't think of a faster paced game that i've ever seen it is probably like the fastest paced game that i've ever played um the, it has the pace that i wanted neon white to have but anyway yeah it's super ridiculously fast paced and uh frantic because everyone moves at a million miles an hour constantly um, and it just takes a lot of active brain power. Like, too much to... E- I, I was listening to a YouTube video in the background. I couldn't tell you a single word that was said in that YouTube video. I have absolutely no idea. My brain was entirely video games. I'm, I'm fully video games. I am become video games. Uh, which, it's just too... Like, it's almost too much. I don't... Th- and it's also, like, super intense in your hands. Uh, lots of pressing button but i'm having a lot of fun i'm having a lot of fun i hope this isn't i hope that i stick to this and actually get good or that the game doesn't die because it would suck if the game died okay i've been playing warfork pretty much all day for like six hours straight um that's not pretty but that's about as long as you can feasibly play warfork for because the thing about warfork is it goes faster than the human brain can calculate and significantly more intense than the human body was ever designed for. So after about six hours of playtime, your fingers are going to be falling off your hands. Your back is going to be in a state of pain. And your neck is just no longer within your control. Because it's some very int- very high-octane gaming. Uh, here are my thoughts. So firstly, I said the Warfork might be my game. Here's the, the thing about it. I definitely just got lucky early on beginner's luck or i was playing against people who weren't that good um because i today had some good matches some bad matches but generally speaking was towards the bottom middle of the scoreboard better than the absolute noobs but not as good as the people who've been playing for you know more than a week or whatever. um which is fine i guess uh that's to be expected but to, but i'm very happy about this like i'm very happy about the fact that i 
am an absolute noob and yet I'm not as bad as the absolute noobs. Although I say that, I played with a bunch of people from my Discord today and they were all about as good as me. So maybe they people who are absolutely just like don't know anything about the game. FPS gaming noobs or something, I don't know. Uh... Because people, from, I was not doing that well against them from my Discord, which is a bit disappointing because they have a whole day of gameplay ahead of them. Um, <laughs> but anyway, uh, it's a pretty cool game. It's a very cool game, actually. Uh, I will say, I understand now why arena shooters fell out of style. I never was able to wrap my head around it. Like, I was always thinking, like, why would anyone play anything other than a good arena sh- Um Because they, they have many different variations in terms of gameplay. Like, it's not just a, a fucking kill box. You could have free-for-all, instagib, deathmatch, CTF, plan wars, you know. But there's many different types of gaming experience if you want to be more objective-focused. Like, it's, you know, there's variation there. Like, why did people move away from, from that sort of game, from the Quake-style games towards the... I don't even know. Right. I think I found the reason. It's because Quake, when it's played competitively, is always a 1v1 game. And I think, like, you know, arena shooters in general, but Quake especially, is undoubtedly the best 1v1 shooter. I think. I don't think you can really make any argument. I think Quake is the best 1v1 shooter. Um, and... Warfork is at its best when you're taking 1v1s. That is like peak fucking gaming experience. The problem is, it kind of sucks in team fight. It's not terrible, but it is not great with, with when team fights are involved. Not just like, you know, fighting a group of enemies, but specifically trying to, to as a team, fight another team in one location. Firstly, because everyone's so fucking fast, it's impossible to like coordinate positionally with your team. It's just not feasible. Um, but secondly, you know, take TF2 for it. Like, in TF2, you can... The, the, the game has many options for crowd control, right? Because TF2 is inspired by Quake. It's, it, you know, draws direct, direct lineage from Quake. But as the game has evolved over the years, it's become, you know... That they've made optimizations in terms of, like, fixing this problem. So, for example, you have many options for crowd control. Heavy is tanky enough that he can just take on a crowd, right? Uh, you have Demo Man's stickies, which are excellent for crowd control. Splash damage from rockets. Pyro with air blast and having a wide part, you know, particle effects dealing damage. Uh, so there are options. There are many options there for dealing with crowds. Not every class can, but you know, those classes that can't aren't supposed to. So there are the, like that's, and obviously sentries are good for dealing with crowds. So, you know, there's, there's, there's stuff there. Whereas Warfork has no crowd controlling, nothing. There's no, if you're in a 2v1 fight, your only option is to try and narrow it down into 1v1, which is not, this is not bad. This is, this is fine. Like, this is not bad by itself because CSGO is also like this, right? Like Counter-Strike is the opposite approach of TF2. Like in Counter-Strike, the meta centralizing gameplay at high level is trading. Like, like you're supposed to try and trade for your teammates because it's assumed that you're not going to win a 2v1. That you're, you, you know, a 1v1 is the best you can possibly manage in Counter-Strike games. Um, and I'm assuming that probably extends up to Rainbow Six, even though I never played. But that's kind of how tactical shooters are. Um, and so it all becomes about... But but in Counter Strike, you know, you move slower, the gun's different, and so that allows for tactical gameplay built around that. There is zero room for tactics in Warfall. You simply move too fast. There's no there's no such thing as game sense in Warfall. Because, you know, in Counter Strike, you can learn player psychology and the maps and and, and all of these details in order to have psychic powers and predict where people are gonna be, right? Which is one of the best things about the game. In Warfork even if you know exactly where someone is right now, they can teleport across the map in half a second and you will have no fucking clue. They're, they're ju- it, it's so fast. I can't overemphasize how fast people move in this game. They move very quickly, very rapidly with a lot of speed. Um, and so, you know, game sense doesn't matter. Which means there are a lot of unfortunate scenarios where you're in a one-on-one fight correctly And then someone that you had no idea existed shoots you from behind and then zooms past you at a million miles an hour in the kill cam. There's a little bit of an unfortunate situation, and that tends to be how a lot of team fights go, right? Is that when you get in a team fight, everyone just sort of splits up. Like, rather than dealing team versus team as it goes, like, in CSGO when you're... Oh, sorry, in TF2 when you're fighting over a point, right? 
it, it, feel, it doesn't feel like you're just engaging in 1v1s. It feels like your team is fighting the other team as a, as a whole group, right? And you have strategics, like you're going to take this high ground, uh, you're going to put a sentry here, tally here, like everyone has their part to play. And it really feels, I don't know, however they achieve it with the, the, the weapon choices and, the, you know, all of this stuff, it feels like fighting team versus team. In Warfork, if your team is in the area as, this, you know, if you're in a same, similar kind of position, everyone just breaks off into 1v1s. It's kind of like looking at, like, fight scenes in, in stupid movies. Like, Shang-Chi does this. It's actually really annoyed me about watching Shang-Chi. You look at the fight scenes, in the, the end of Shang-Chi and the Seven Rings, some Marvel schlock, right? Towards the end, there's there's a fight scene which starts as, like, a human-scale fight scene and then becomes a kaiju-scale fight scene. Um, but in the human-scale part of the final ending fight of, of Shang-Chi... It's two, like, armies going against each other, except once they start fighting, everyone just breaks into one-on-one groups and fights as an individual in the background, and you can clearly see it, and it looks really fucking awkward. Uh, but that's kind of how Warfork is. Even if you're together as a team, the second you come against the other team, pause, uh, you're just gonna, everyone just sort of breaks into 1v1s. But then the problem is that you only you can't physically pay attention to everything that's going on. So as soon as someone like wins their fight or just decides to shoot you opportunistically, you're just kind of fucked because some you can't really deal with it. Like the only option you have at that point is to try and run away. Um, and depending on the environment, you know that may or may not be possible from where you are on the map. Now maybe that's a matter of positioning. Maybe you should never put yourself in those situations. I don't know. Um, as for my main difficulty with this game being weapon juggling, uh, I have learned the meta. The meta is that there's a holy trinity of weapons. The, the rocket launcher, which is extreme, extremely useful for mobility, but also a powerful weapon on its own. And somehow, everyone using it against me seems to do massive damage, and I never seem to do any damage to anyone with it. I, even though I hit my shots, I, surprisingly, I know, you wouldn't believe it, but I actually do hit my shots pretty well. I guess I don't hit them well enough. Uh, but people have these insane combos. That's how I often get destroyed, is people combo with some weapon and then combo it into the rocket launcher, and that's what destroys me, which is, I guess, just technique I need. But yeah, the rocket launcher, which is extremely useful for mobility, but also a powerful weapon. And then the, the railgun, which is good for long-distance fights. Uh, yeah, I'm good with that weapon. I'm pretty good with the railgun. My my hours of orping in CSGO prepared me for, for the railgun in, in Quake or whatever. <laughs> Um, uh, and then finally the piss laser as it's been affectionately termed by the community it seems everyone just calls it the piss laser that I've seen which is a weapon that doesn't really have I know it existed in Quake I forget what it's called in Quake it's like an electricity gun Uh, there's also a version of it in Unreal Tournament Um, it's like the, the, the the alternative fire option on one of the weapons in, in Unreal. It's basically just like a full-on beam, like an unbroken beam that does damage over time. I guess it's almost comparable to, to Pyro's fucking flamethrower, but it's also different. It's not really, because it's, it's, it is continuous sustained damage over time type of thing, but it's not like the flamethrower at all, because it's all about, it's, a, it's about tracking, right? It's the, the, the weapon that tests if you're good at tracking, which I think I'm like not that good at tracking. I may be okay, but I'm not that good at tr- But yeah, those are, basically those are the main weapons that you're ever going to be using. Uh, and once I figured that out, it became a lot easier to, to juggle weapons. I'm still terrible at it. I'm still god-awful at it. But now I at least know what I'm doing wrong. Because those weapons all have like pretty defined... Like it, it may, Once you use them briefly, you put it, they, they, they each have... It's like 2-4. It's like the map 2-4 in TF2, right? In 2-4... Every class has a designated place, right? If you're an engineer, you go into the intelligence room and you're sentry there. If you're a sniper, you go on the battle. You know, they're every, it's very easy to understand where you're supposed to be on 2-4. Uh, it's like that. I don't know why I'm using that as a comparison. But every those trinity of weapons, it's, it's very obvious. You have the rocket launcher, which is for getting speed, basically. And is good at really close range because splash damage. Uh, and also pretty decent at mid-range. And then the pierce laser for mid and long range. And then the railgun for long range. No, no, sorry. Pit, mi- the pierce laser is for mid and, like, mid-long. Like, if you're closer than that, you probably want to be... I don't know. Maybe. I might be wrong about that. Um, But yeah. The rocket launcher and the, the laser kind of have overlap. 
um, it's about whether you think you're in a position to do damage over time or to do burst damage. Um, there's also, the other guns have more niche uses, but I've been destroyed with them and seen people get destroyed with them as well. So that's something I need to figure out as well. Anyway, so once I figured that out, juggling weapons became a little bit easier because now my choices are narrowed down. I only have to remember three binds instead of nine binds. Uh, yeah. I can't express to you how fast you move in this game. You move you move so fast. You just move very quickly, rapidly, with rapidity. Played some with my Discord server. We will probably continue to do this. Anyway, final, final thing I want to say on this subject is... Uh, so, the game, as I, far as I can tell, was revived. It was, like, borderline dead and was revived by this YouTuber making a video on it, which is how I found out. Um, but that video was quite a while ago now. Let me see if I can... Uh, that video was oh it wasn't quite a while ago it was only two weeks ago but two weeks ago is this is like about the time right where you would expect players to start dropping off because I know this because of another video game that I haven't played called Phantom Dust uh, Phantom Dust is supposed to be like the best game ever everyone who's into it loves it and just, like thinks it's the best thing ever made um, it's like an original Xbox game and uh, if you know about it you probably know about it, well, either because you're a fucking nerd, or because you've seen the Nick Robinson video with, like, two million views about it, called The Xbox's Forgotten Masterpiece. Now, that video has two million views. H2's video on Warfork has 163,000 views at time of recording. Um, so, yeah, Phantom Dust video, way more popular. Now, I happen to have a friend who's big into Phantom Dust and was playing Phantom Dust before that video came out. I don't know how they discovered it, but yeah. And uh, as they told me, when the video came out, the community got a huge bump in player base and it was great. Everyone loved it. And then as time passed, almost all of those players that, that started playing because of the video slowly dropped off. And as I understand it right now, the game is not dead. They still host, like, weekly um, tournaments on Discord, and it's slightly bigger than it was before the video, but it's, you know, it's not... It, it didn't create a permanent community for Phantom Dust. It didn't really revive the game. It just, like, you know, gave it a little help. Uh, and so I suspect this H2 video is probably a similar situation. I think that, you know, right now... The game, I mean, you're talking like you probably have, you go on and there's like one server that's active. So like, you know, not a huge amount of people actively playing, uh, like, and it might just be my time zone, but there's not a huge amount of people actively playing, but there is generally speaking some activity in the game enough that you can play it. And as I said, Quake is the perfect 1v1 shooter. So as long as there's one other person playing, you're going to be able to have fun in the game, which is an advantage that this has. Uh, but, you know, I suspect, I'm worried that as time goes on, fewer and fewer people are going to play and it's just going to get harder and harder to find matches, which is a bit of a shame. Uh, however, given the amount of people who are cracked at this game, I, I don't know, I would be surprised if, I, if they all left, given that they seem to have... To get that good, you have to put a lot of time in. And some of them you can tell. You, here's how you can tell. You can tell the the old school or like hardcore arena shooter players because they all have like you know gamer names. They all have gamer names, and they're the ones that are like extremely cracked. They're the ones that if you're fighting them, you have absolutely no chance. They'll just delete you. You don't even see it coming. And then there's the people who are just good at the game, and they're all transsexuals. <laughs> they they all have names like uh, Puppy Girl Destroyer or Colon Three. Uh, you know, they all have those sorts of, uh, and, but those guys are still cracked. They're still good at the game. So like those people, the, the Zuma type the transgenders of the game, I think my, my, my point is they've put enough time and effort into getting good that it would be weird if they just stopped playing, but that doesn't, Hey, I don't know. We'll see. Hopefully the game stays alive and hopefully I become a, a cracked transsexual. <laughs> You know what I don't like? And this is a very uh, stickler of a conversation to have. I don't like the idea or this like common meme of like, oh, how do I even put this? The, the meme goes something like, uh, you speak English because something, or I sp and, but I speak English because you speak it. Like, you know this meme? Basically, like, 
uh, oh, everyone in the world speaks English and you're too, in English-speaking countries are too lazy to learn a foreign language. You know this? You know this meme? Um, okay, so let me just d- step right in. I got things to event. I'm an innovator, baby. Said the world. 4,500 for you kids to go. You know what I'm saying? Let me step right in real quick uh, and, and, and debunk this, right? So there are, there are 112 countries on the uh, English proficiency index, right? Only 31 of them score high or very high in English proficiency, even though English is considered to be the most widespread language, the lingua franca, right? Um, English has about 1.4 billion speak first and second language speakers. Chinese has 1.1 billion, okay? Um, only two Asian countries have English proficiency levels above moderate, right? Let's just be very fucking clear here. And one of them is Singapore, where English is one of the main spoken languages. So let's let's just be clear here, okay? The reason why people in Europe speak English, it's it's not, like, comparatively, like, th- what I'm saying is I, I agree if you're European. If you're European, I think this is a reasonable point. Or, or South American. We speak European language. But if you're Asian, if you, it's, it's not really comparable, right? Like, Ex- expecting English speakers to all learn Mandarin or Cantonese, as some people think. I mean, Mandarin would probably be the common one, right? Expecting English speakers to all learn Mandarin is a bit insane because, firstly, I mean, not all Chinese people speak Mandarin. Let's put that out. But um, they're supposed to, but in their day-to-day life, yeah. There's, there's actually quite a lot of Chinese people who, even though they're state-educated in Mandarin, Uh, actually have pretty poor Mandarin skills because China is a massive fucking country with a billion people in it. Uh, Just like how you can pass your French test and then a few years later forget every word of French you ever spoke, it is very possible to pass your Mandarin test and then forget all the Mandarin you ever learned in school. If you live in one of the many, many regions of China where Mandarin isn't commonly spoken. Okay, so let's get that out of the way. Here's the only countries that have a very high score that aren't, you know, native English-speaking countries. Basically, all of the... Norway, Finland, and Sweden. uh, Yes, Norway, Finland, and Sweden. uh, Portugal. And then Germany, Denmark, the Netherlands. I think that's it. Oh, and South Africa. So, uh, Portugal is interesting, but Germany, Denmark, and... uh, Or Germany and the Netherlands, you know, obviously, they share a lot of similarities in terms of language with English. So it should be, like, it, obviously there's not enough for these languages to be interintelligible, but enough that, okay, I'm getting way too fucking in the weeds of this. All I have to say is, hey, it's easier to learn a language that's more similar to yours, right? Like, it's, it's there, there isn't a world where a bunch of people who speak completely distinct languages, very unrelated from English, all learn English because... Uh, you know, of whatever reason. That is not really the case. Uh, most of the people who sp- who learn English and speak English uh, reasonably well come from a place with a language that is already relatively similar to English. And then they learn it because, um, you know, the world is very ing- ing- Anglo-centric. The, of course, you know, a lot of the media produced is American and, and so on, right? If you... You know, anyone who, who, I'm sure there are people who are listening to this right now who are at least, like, somewhat familiar with the process of learning Japanese, because you're all fucking weeaboos like me, right? Even though you haven't done it, in the back of your head, you, you, you're, you're always thinking, like, oh yeah, I should uh, start an Anki deck and, and all of this stuff. But you know about the AJAT process. You will, I'm sure you will know about it, right? The way you learn a language is through just having constant input. And if you don't live in, in an English-speaking country you basically can't get away from constant English input. Like, it's very common, right? There, there's, there's, there's a lot of English language media out there, and it's very, very prevalent in the internet and in, you know, all, every type of media. So if you wanted to learn a language, English is the easiest one <laughs> in terms of, like, the availability of input that's going to have been translated into your language uh, if you need that. Um, and especially if you come from a country that already uses the Latin alphabet, you're probably, you know, pretty close to already... Un- like, it, you can already read, as long as you learn, like, a couple of rules, right? Like, let's say 
you want to read let's let's just google like no I'm, i don't know why i'm picking norwegian this is i'm probably gonna fuck this up now that i've done this but let's say i just google norwegian phrase norwegian phrase uh here uh ver sa ni snil ver sa snil that's how i'm guessing that is pronounced that means please in norwegian let's see if i got that pronunciation right um okay i was close enough okay I was close. I, I didn't get it because I we don't have this particular letter and we don't have that particular letter. So I highlighted them on my screen as if you could see them. We don't have two of the letters in that. But I was close enough, right? Vasa Vasha Snil, right? Because if you already use a similar enough alphabet, that's a whole fucking part of language learning that you don't have to do. And the pronunciation, you know what I mean? Like it's a stupid analogy to say. Oh, a fucking English speakers can't learn Chinese as if the average Chinese proficiency in English is fucking not bad. Firstly, you can't trust China's data on this. But secondly, uh yeah. I'm not I'm not trying to insult the the Chinese people or the Chinese education system, but they have a very insular English l- language learning community. Um and in terms of like pronunciation and accent they have a very standardized way of learning which is uh, in my opinion and the opinion of I've heard people who know more about this than me like my friend who's uh, actually a, a English teacher for foreign language students and has like done a course in this and like he he knows a lot more about this than me but I remember him to it telling me once about how like the chinese system for learning english is really bad because it's all about rote memorization they don't learn the correct pronunciation they have a but yeah it's it's uh not very good and people come out thinking that they the problem really is that people come out of the program thinking they speak really good english and then they come into contact with actual english speakers and they can't communicate very well that's the real problem with the chinese program uh india is of course a different issue entirely because we colonized that we colonized that bitch <laughs> um but uh as time goes on and we move you know as we get further and further away from colonization english proficiency in india has steadily declined and declined uh, so that's something interesting uh i just i just wanted to put it out there that english people not being able to speak chinese or english speaking people anglos not being able to speak chinese is not comparable to like you know french people or german people speaking some english it's not it's not really the same sort of thing there are some countries um in europe where especially like northern europe like as, as far as i understand norway is kind of like this um estonia is kind of like this even um and i think i think iceland is also kind of like this where the youths they basically speak english to each other Uh, a lot of the time. I think that's the case. Um and that's an interesting phenomenon. I don't know what I'm fucking rambling about. No one I don't think I think I'm responding to a guy that doesn't exist. No one actually thinks that the thing that I'm accusing people of thinking. What am I talking about? Well, I don't know. I've had some really bad fucking segments so far. We're 5 hours in already. What have I been talking about for 5 hours? What the fuck have I been saying for 5 hours? Why are you listening to this? Oh, oh my god. Oh, this is this is terrible. We're almost halfway through and I don't think I've said anything of substance this entire episode. When I first saw Bani's Pyro Balance Run from 2015, I was not that familiar with with the video game of Team Fortress 2, so I just took his word for it. But now that I've got, you know, some solid I think a couple hundred hours of Pyro experience and you know, I played the game a lot more. I actually think he's completely wrong. And there's a comment in this reply section in the comment section that has it's the most liked comment right and it's and i've heard not just this but i've heard lots of people parrot this exact same phrase which is the problem is the pyros are too strong with air blast but too weak without it i'm sorry in what fucking universe are pyros too strong in what way are pyros too strong oh pyros too strong how come you never see pyro in sixes then how come in in highlander pyro isn't an offensive class really at all A pyro's too strong? What fucking world are you living on? The entire problem is the pyro's too weak, even with air blast. The entire balance run doesn't make any sense because it's really an air blast run and it's it's all about nonsense. <laughs> It doesn't make any sense. Like I'm not quite sure I understand. Look, there's some valid criticism in there too. Okay, let's not say everything's wrong. 
Pyro's air blast range is too big. I agree. I think most people agree with this. You should not be able to fucking air blast things that are coming from behind you. That is insane. That should be shrunk down to how it was before in a cone, right? I think many people agree with this. But I don't like, you know, Vanny simultaneously is saying X mechanic takes no skill while playing the game. And you can clearly see he's bad at it. And he says at the end of the video, I'm bad at Pyro. Like, it's it's just a weird thing to believe. To actively be bad at something and then say, oh, it's too easy, it takes no skill. What do you mean? Air blasting and reflex, learning the timing in order to reflect direct hit rockets and huntsman arrows and, all, and the more difficult things. Or to be able to, like, insta reflect, you know, before you even have one frame to react just based on pure instinct. That is fucking game sense. That is skill. That, you, there's no way of learning that other than memorizing soldiers' reload times and then trying to soul read the other player. Okay, that takes fucking skill. And it feels good to do as well. There's no universe where that's like some bad mechanic that shouldn't exist. Like, yeah, as a soldier, it maybe doesn't feel good to get your to get ends and deleted by a pyro who soul reads you. But that's because you just got outplayed. Of course it doesn't feel good. What were you thinking? You're telling me you're on fucking bad water second? There's a pyro... On the upper bit, right? There's a there's a there's a blue pyro. They've taken control of the upper section of Badwater Second. You're a fucking soldier. You're like, I will just rocket jump up here and deal with this pyro. And then the you rocket jump and then the pyro reflect kills you with your rocket that you shoot. And you're mad about that? Maybe don't fucking do that, because that's an obvious bad situation to put yourself into. You're just being punished for being bad at the game. That's a perfectly reasonable thing. And you're not even being punished. You're literally being punished by being worse than someone who's good. It's a perfectly reasonable mechanic. Pyro isn't too strong with that. Like, this is literally nonsense. The reason Pyro is too weak is because he's a short-range class, and yet he has no way to actually get people in range. They've tried to fix this with debt jumping and the, the jetpack, and neither of which are really that great. The other two melee classes, or the only real melee class is Spy, right? And Spy is the weakest class in the game, first of all. So, you know, it's not like saying Spy is stronger than Pyro makes any sense. But Spy has ways to get behind people, right? He has disguises and he has invis. So he has some way to close the distance. And then the Demonite, which is a subclass, but, you know, Demonite has charge. He has a, a lot of movement abilities to help him close the distance. And resistances so that he can actually sustain in close range fights. From the shields, Pyro has none of this. Pyro has no way to really close the distance on enemies. You have to ambush them with pure, you know, positioning skill, except for really detonated jumping and thermal thruster. And the thermal thruster, while it's a fun weapon to use, is pretty much, you know, for, for a lot of people, it, it basically gets rid of your entire ability to deal any damage outside of close range. So it's like a pretty big sacrifice. And as a movement tool, it's pr it's very clunky. Like, that's the word everyone uses for it, and they are correct. It is the best word. It's an extremely clunky um, item. So the detonator is pretty much your best option, although it has less movement abilities. It's still pretty good, which is why the detonator is probably the best pyro secondary. Um... You can't... Scorch Shot isn't good for movement. The Scorch Shot is not the best Pyro secondary. <laughs> no, it's not. It's not the... Not in... I'm talking about high-level play, like Banny is talking about. Because if you have... Because Scorch Shot doesn't mean anything if you're... If you have really good team coordination, because you'll just get... You have a medic yeah. <laughs> who will actually heal you. So Afterburn doesn't matter. And it's not really... Like, if you're wanting... Talking about the knockback, the knockback is really not as much of a big deal as anyone says it is. Like, afterburn is meaningless. Yeah, I don't know. It doesn't make any fucking sense. How is Pyro unbalanced? Like, if you want to say Pyro is too weak, you can t say that. And he's too weak because his movement options are too weak. You're not getting any food for him, so this is my fucking food. Yeah, Pyro is... It's very simple. Pyro is too weak because his damage output is too low. And his movement options are too weak. That is why. He's supposed to be a short-range class. Saying, oh, Pyro doesn't have any options at long range, is like saying... You might as... I don't know, it's like saying fucking... I know. Oh, medic doesn't do that much damage, or, or you know, or a scout is too weak. Like that's yes, that's how the classes work. That's how the, the that's how it works. Pyro is the the scissors to demo and soldiers paper. And then long range classes stuff that Pyro can't deal with, like sentries or snipers, are the rock to Pyro scissors. You know, that's how the game balance works. It's per it's fine. Did, did you 
moved the clown from Tumblr. Oh, they removed the clown? It's just, clown. It's just skull now. I see. It's a skull with ads on it. I see. Alright, well, there's my pyro balance rant. Oh, one, one final thing I've got to comment on. Banny says at one point in the rant, it's too easy to juggle people. All you have to do is hold down, you know, mouse two, and you get to juggle people for free for ages, and they can't do anything about it. It's too easy. Actually, you're, that is not true. Because in order to do that, you need to be in a. It, like, that is a thing that you can do as Pyro. It's one of your strongest abilities, which Pyro needs more of, by the way, because he's too weak, as we've all established. But um, the, it's actually really hard to do that because of positioning. Because in order to do that, you need to catch someone out of position, away from their entire team, and they can't be a scout because scouts can double jump out of, you know, and fuck your air blast. It's much hard. I mean, you can juggle a scout, but scout's going to be the hardest one. So it has to be someone flanking who's not a scout, first of all. They have to be separated from the team because obviously if you're juggling someone, you can't be defending yourself from other attacks. And to make it most effective, they have to be up against a wall or a corner, which is a pretty rare situation to find yourself in. You're a pyro facing off against someone and they happen to be alone and right next to a wall or a corner on the flank with no one to defend them. And for some reason, they're unable to attack you while they're being juggled. No, juggling is not too powerful. And also, it's not even that powerful on its own unless you combo, you know, it's only really good for setting up combo because you're juggling someone out outside of your flamethrower range. Okay, let me tell you about my, um, my light novel plot idea, Isekai. And I say this, I want to give some credit to Dote Smite who was kind of the genesis of the idea in the first place. Uh, but here's the, it's a, something along the lines of reincarnated as a cheesemonger in the other world or something like a title like this. The idea is it's cheese isekai. It's a cheese isekai. You might think that's a, that's a silly idea, but let me give you the premise. Okay, so main character could be either a guy or a girl. It doesn't really matter. I've been visualizing them as a guy, but that's always a pain because then you can't have like Yuri. You need Yuri. So maybe I just have main character be a guy and just have Yuri side characters. I'm actually hella down for Yuri side. Um, but yeah. So the premise is, I haven't quite thought through, like, should the main guy already be a cheesemonger? Like, he has to know about cheese, is the thing. But it could be because he's, like, just a cheese aficionado. He just likes eating cheese. Like, that's a definite valid thing. Or, and this will make sense, he could be like some kind of microbiologist. Um, he could be some kind of microbiologist, but whatever the case is, this guy knows about cheese. I haven't thought that bit through yet. But anyway, he gets hit by truck coon or dies in whatever way he dies. And then when he's being re reincarnated, um, a bunch of like menu options pop up, right? For like, which cheap power do you want? And you see a bunch of like references to other isekai cheap powers, right? Like... <laughs> Uh, funny, funny references. Some of them are just random, but some of them are, are like references to to other anime, right? Or isekai. And then one of them says bacterial manipulation, and he's like reading. To, he he reads out loud. He's like bacterial manipulation. What even is that? But then before he can finish speaking, the robotic voice says, uh, "Bacterial manipulation registered." reincarnating now or something like that and he goes what no no i didn't want that one and then he reincarnates right so the idea the gimmick is he can manipulate microorganisms in order to grow many different kinds of cheeses um or to ferment many different kinds of cheeses that's the basic the basic premise um and he becomes a cheesemonger but he doesn't he should find this out by mistake like he should stumble across some milk and be in like a relatively like, I don't know, I guess the, the main isekai village would be in some sort of alpine type place. And I think to s start off with, yeah, he just sort of comes across them making some ricotta type cheese, eats it, it's tasty, um, or whatever. And then he, uh, it, it, like, ferments the cheese and they're, they're kind of like, well, this is really good. It's not a situation where I've never had cheese before. But they would never have had cheese like that before, right? Because because most of the time in a medieval setting, people would have only had whatever local variety of cheeses were common. Um, and so they probably would have, you know, he, the fact that he can produce all sorts of crazy cheeses with high proficiency becomes cool. And so... <clears throat> look, there's, other, there's more details I'd have to think out if this was a full story about side characters and stuff. Um, but yeah, basic premise is he makes cheese, but 
the more important, like this is an, an important factor, is he still actually has an isekai cheat skill. He's still secretly the most overpowered guy in the world, and he could kill anyone if he wanted, because he has bacterial manipulation, so he could very easily summon some sort of uncurable bacterial infection, you know, they don't have antibiotics, so he could very easily, you know, afflict a king or an entire army with the plague and just kill them all, um, but he doesn't want to do that. But at some point, I think in the story, he should have to to kill someone for some reason. Um, or maybe he does it accidentally, I'm not sure. Because what I want to happen is I want, I want a situation where, um, like, well, you don't have to necessarily make it like that, actually. I think a better way to do it would be that, Okay, so so obviously the gimmick of it would be kind of we can talk a little bit like Izuka Yakyo, right? Where he's sort of taking, he's really good at making cheeses. People discover his really nice cheeses in the village he starts off at. becomes, um, you know, he becomes popular in the village. Then episode three or whatever, at some point, it could even be like the first episode if you just ran this real quick. Some trader from an outside village comes in, tries his cheese, is like, oh my god, this is amazing. Um, but at first he would only be producing like a couple types of cheese, and as you go on through each episode he would develop some new kind of cheese that would be the gimmick that you learn about um through each episode so for you know you have one episode he makes he goes to a place and he's like oh wow we've got a, a sheep here i can make pecorino romano and then you know he goes and does that but obviously that takes months to ferment so he would have to like do that and then later on in the story come back to the same town to pick up the cheese and he would, you know discovering a cave to make the correct types of cheese and like that would be a really cool story element i think but you could basically learn about different kinds of cheese through each episode and each episode would have to take place on a relatively long time scale just because of how fermentation works um but uh yeah he should have so you know he, the, the trader likes his cheese decides to like hey uh, can i buy a bunch of cheese off of you to sell in the capital you know it becomes so popular he ends up moving to the capital to open a cheese shop this is the obvious stuff that would happen it's kind of a slow life slice of life type isekai he opens his cheese shop in the capital but uh some you know rich businessman or some person in a, in a position of authority decides they don't like him they keep sending people to you know the inspector keeps coming around trying to shut him down for bullshit reasons and so then he he's like i'm gonna infect the inspector with uh, a common cold so that he can't come and bother me on this important day the inspector get then that can be a plot for an episode right it's like how do i get the inspector to consume some sort of food with the cold in it or with the actually the cold is a virus bacteria but cheese is fungus not bacteria so what well, cheese is both fungus and bac- mold and bacteria so Maybe it wouldn't have to be just bacterial mission. Or maybe you could make that a part of the show. I'm not sure. You could figure something out there that would be interesting. But anyway, he would have to give a virus to the, you know, to the guy. And that would be funnier. Um, but also, like, it would show that he's actually dangerous. Like, like, you could have that episode. And then, so at the end of the episode, someone would, like, say to him, like, Hey, like, if you can just give people viruses, like, or if you can give people sickness, does that mean you could, like, spread a plague across the entire country if you wanted to? And he's like very seriously sort of like yes i could do that but i just want to make cheese (laughs) i think that'd be really funny and there's also a lot of one of the reasons why cheese is such a good thing for for this type of story is so there there are lots of anime that sort of have a like cycle of you learn about some particular niche interest while you're going like this is super common i can think of like you know clay pottery with mug cup uh or Bicycles with, with with fucking not bicycles, um, motorbikes. You know, there's a, like super cup or two cup. Well, not two cup. What's the other one? I forgot. Um, or uh, you know, fucking Doctor Stone has a whole bunch of stuff like this. Or uh, even the vending machine isekai. You learn about vending machines. Even something like uh, Yudo Camp. You learn about different camping styles and techniques and so on, right? Like, this is a very common thing in anime, where you learn about some sort of niche interest that you probably wouldn't associate normally with anime, but then, it, you know, this is the sort of thing that happens, and I think it's a pretty good format. I like them a lot. So, cheese is good for that, because there's loads of different varieties and techniques, and you can talk about their history in the real world and so on. But also, it's good for gross-out humour, because there are cheeses that are very gross, like, for example, blue brain 
or there's that one cheese that has maggots in it. And you could easily use these as gimmicks for like throwaway gross out jokes, which wouldn't be particularly funny, but they do fit in an anime of this kind. Sort of like in Food Wars, when they, they, the main character has the gross recipes experiments, like you can be like, and I have, you know, at the end of an episode, as a throwaway gag to end an episode, he could be like, and now you want to try my new experimental cheese, and it'll be some reference to some real world cheese that's considered to be gross, uh, you know. <clears throat> also, We'll just pretend that lactose intolerance doesn't exist in the isekai world. Maybe he can even complain about that. Like, man, I was trying to live a normal life in Japan, but nowhere, it's a, it's so hard. Maybe, like, I went to Europe on holiday, I tried so many great cheeses, but in Japan, it's impossible to find great cheese because everyone's lactose intolerant, but I'm not like something like that. I think, uh, I don't know, I think this has a lot of, a lot of good ideas. Um... There's lots of I don't know I think this is a good idea for for any for a stupid kind of generic isekai slow life isekai story. You can go through the whole you know general plot that most of these stories have. Anyway, that's my isekai idea. It's open source, free open source isekai. If anyone wants to write that, be my guest. I'm watching this strange Eons video. I don't normally watch this channel. It was just randomly recommended to me, and so I decided to click on it. I will not be watching any of their other videos. This video itself has interesting content, but I am not interested in the personality-based aspects of the channel, as this person's personality is not particular. Damn, we did some great alliteration there. This person's personality is not particularly prescient to my personal preference pertaining to particular personality property. Practically, Purposefully, okay, I've run out of p words. Um, and one of the, here, here's an example of what I'm talking about. So in the video, they say something about hey, uh, 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 this Tumblr user tried to start a Kofi Patreon. Uh, no, 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 that wasn't it. It was Tumblr shut down this blog because they were trying to sell diet pill scams, and Tumblr doesn't have any part in that, which is why it's the only usable social media site still around. Um, and I'm like, oh. Tumblr's the only usable social media site still around. Oh, great. Wonderful. So anyway, the rest of the video is basically... It, oh, the video is called Icebergs of Famous Tumblr Blogs. This is a YouTube channel that just recounts things that happen on Tumblr. And strangely enough, this is like a formula that there are multiple channels built around, which is just like... Like, there are loads of... YouTubers who come from places on the internet. And some of them, like Internet Historian, does hear some events that happened on 4chan, or at least they used to, right? Like, these things can happen. Um, but the, the cottage industry of here's things that happened on Tumblr in long form, strange old niche, but sure, you know, whatever. Uh, anyway, so they, 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 they talk about, like, how Tumblr is very... The moderation and the user base, are, they, they really don't like it when people try to sell them shit, sell them products, schemaz them with diet pills, or set up Kofis and Patreons, is, at least at some point was considered to be in bad taste. And so therefore, Tumblr is the only usable social media site. And listen, I respect that, but calling Tumblr a usable social media site in this video is a bit of a stretch. Because the rest of the video, and listen, I, I, don't, have, I don't have any particular allegiances to any social media websites, okay? Uh, but the rest of this video is multiple instances of people who run Tumblr blogs and then get, like, death threats for doing, like, completely fucking inane things. It's like, so for example, uh, there was one blog that was, like, got death threats for being lesbophobic, for making a joke about saying something, like, I don't even know, it was, it was, I mean, obviously it had nothing to do with hating lesbians, it was just a massive stretch, um, because, because of course it was it's tumblr and a bunch of, you know and this this happens con like every account that they, this, they talk about in this video ends the same way it's like and here's the controversy they were counseled for and got death threats for and it's always something fucking innocuous maybe not all of them are innocuous i haven't finished the video yet but so far they're all completely innocuous even by the framing of the video not by my personal moral you know, standards, but even by the framing of the video, they are innocuous. It's, like, it's, it's a little odd to frame that website as the most usable, <laughs> the most usable social media platform. Listen, I'm not, look, I'm, I'm sure Tumblr is cool, you know, those my users Tumblr, it's, it, I'm sure there are cool people, I have never been able to get into Tumblr, despite multiple attempts, but, uh, you know, there are funny posts, I've got nothing against it, uh, 
you know, it is what it is, but like, come on, come on now, it's a bit of a stretch. Wait, it actually happened. The thing I said was going to happen, I think it might have actually happened. I hit a thousand subs, and then I lost a subscriber. I am, I, according to my phone, I am now at 999 subscribers. It happened. Here's my question. Did I lose monetization from dipping below the thousand sub? No. You, you retain... Oh, I have to do some f fucking stupid verification thing. What the fuck? My phone is in the other room. I can't be able to do this. But it doesn't look like... It does not look like I've lost... I'm earning still. Okay. Well, that's interesting. Huh. Who needed a thousand subs anyway? Oh, man. Oh, man. I feel weird. I feel weird. You know what, guys? I feel weird. I feel weird. Maybe it's because... I ate too much. Did I, no, I don't think I ate too much. I feel like I ate a normal amount. I did drink some vodka. That's probably what this is. I'm probably, you know, like, I don't know if you guys get this, but when I drink alcohol, it's rolling a dice. You know what? I'm pretty sure it's this. It's, it, I'm pretty sure it's this and I just didn't recognize it because I don't really drink alcohol very much anymore. But when I drink alcohol, I'm rolling a dice and it's like maybe out of 20 times, might be less than this, but sure. Out of like every 20 times I drink alcohol, like there's a one in 20 chance that instead of getting all of the buffs from alcohol, I just get tiredness debuff. I just get like no energy sleepy. I think that might be what's happening. I think I might have just hit the tiredness alcohol debuff. Um, don't know why that happened, but that's a possibility. I'm also, here's the thing, right, um, that I'm struggling with. Here's another thing that I'm struggling with, okay? So I was watching Kenjin Omago, and I'm eight episodes in right now. I'm six minutes into the eighth episode, okay? And at this point, it's made it pretty clear that this show is not going to, like, get any better than it was. Not that I was expecting it to get any better than it was, but, like, there's definitely no merit to the show. And when I first started watching it, I was like, that's not a problem. I'll marathon it in one day, and it'll just be over with. But then I, I fell asleep... And then since then, I haven't just marathoned it. I've been watching, like, an episode, you know, I, I, I don't even know. I've not been marathoning. And now, like, I kind of don't want to finish it, because it's not very good. Like, I kind of want to drop it. Uh, it's probably a 5 out of 10. If I had to rate it, probably I'd rate it a, f a 5, maybe a 4. Um, but I'm also on episode 8. Like, it would take just over an hour to marathon through the rest of this show, which is something that's very doable. Hmm... So I'm kind of stuck. Also, playing Warfork today, the server's very active right now. And, uh, yeah, I figured out, like, I just don't really like the game. I mean, I don't dislike the game. But the game is way less fun the more people there are in a server. Like, having about, like, four, five, six people is, is good. But once you get above that threshold, once you get into, like, 12 people, you know, 6v6 kind of, or, or even more, I, I, I don't even know what the f fucking server I was on today, because it was a free-for-all server. Um, it just becomes kind of, it kind of misses, you start to lose the point of the game, because you can no longer really sustain any speed. Because, you, firstly, you just bump into people uh, more often. And secondly, like, there's no opportunity for fights to happen at high speed. Not really. I mean, even the skilled players don't seem to be able to pull it off. Um, because it just doesn't really make any sense. You can't really be zooming by when there's so many players because you'll just get, like, some other... You know what I... Like, the, 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 the pace slows the fuck down when there's this many people, which is weird. You add more people and the pace slows down because the pace of movement slows down. The tension slows down. You can't really... Like, winning one fight doesn't really matter because there's three more people next to you. And, you know, you're now low health from that fight, so you're just going to die. Um, you know, maybe you manage to get, like, two two frags or whatever. But there's not really any, like, seriously winning. Whereas if you're, like, Clan Wars, you know, a team deathmatch kind of situation, and you have a goated player on your team, they can definitely clutch a 1v5 by just zooming around the map and picking off players who are separated and so on. You can't really do that and get a decent score in a, a free-for-all with 50 people on... It's not really 50, I'm exaggerating, but with more people on the server, because they're really... Everyone just gets concentrated in these team... I'm not even team fights. And everyone gets concentrated in these big fights in certain areas, and then there sort of isn't anyone anywhere else. But then if you do find someone somewhere else, and you start 
you know, a fight with them, the 1v1 very quickly devolves because some third, you know, third party is going to come and steal your kill or kill you while you're focusing on the other guy. And I don't think it's that, I don't think it's super fun, to be honest with you. Um, I don't hate it. But it's nowhere near as fun as, as what I know the game can be. And then another aspect to this game, which I'm starting to figure out, is, you know, the piss laser? I'm not a big fan of the piss laser. Not f- just fighting against it. Fighting against, like, in a 1v1 piss laser fight, it's not even, I don't even have a problem with it. The way, the way fighting against piss lasers becomes unfun is when you're in, like, a... A scrappy battle and there's there's five people and they're all using the piss laser because it's just beams of damage that this just, just like you walk into it's kind of annoying but the, no really i just don't like using it like it's it's pretty unsatisfying to use it's annoyingly effective and relative you know it's pretty uh maybe it's i just don't really like me like maybe there's a reason that this sort of tracking type gameplay has sort of fallen out of use in, in first person shooters because i personally i just don't think it's that fun like, there's not... It just kind of feels like playing heavy in TF2. Like, you don't really do anything. Like, yeah, there's some level of, like, evasive movement, but it's not really that much. You kind of... Everything sort of slows to a crawl, and suddenly you're playing a mini game where it's like, how well can you follow the shape on your screen with your cursor? And the answer is like, yeah, not not that not that well, but, like, yeah, not that badly, but not that well. He's probably going to be better than me. Uh... And it's just not a very fun mini game. But even when I win, like even when I successfully get kills, it feels kind of cheap because I don't know. It's just it's not not cheap. It's kind of too too harsh. But it doesn't feel it. It's not as satisfying as any of the other weapons. I'll just put it that way. The other weapons, when you get a kill with it, it feels like a clip. Unless you like manage to do some insane tracking, which I don't. But if you manage to do some really insane tracking with the piss laser, it feels really good. But most of the time, they're just kind of these scrappy fights. Um, and it's, it's, I don't know, it's just not that satisfying weapon to play with, in my opinion. Um, which is a bit of a shame, given how, you know, since I think it's a little too effective. It'd be nice if it was a little less effective. Um, yeah, I don't, I, as I've seen other people complaining about fighting against the piss laser. But I'm, I personally just, I don't even mind fighting against it. I just don't like using it. Now, what I do think is a viable strategy that I need to get better at is the piss laser into rocket combo. Because it seems like a common thing people will do who are good is they'll weaken you with the laser. Like, if you're in close or mid, mid, mid-range mid combat, they'll weaken you with the laser to force you to switch to the laser. And then when you switch to the laser, they will you know, fucking pump you full of... They'll, they'll just direct hit you with a rocket because suddenly you have to slow down in order to aim with it, yeah. I don't know. I'm not a big fan of that weapon. It's a shame that it's as effective as it is. But maybe it'll grow on me. I don't know. Anyway, now I have to decide if I want to watch... Because I've also been watching uh, a much better show. A, a way better show. A really good show called Taisho Yaku Musume. Taisho Baseball Girls. I don't know if I mentioned this on the podcast yet. But that's a good-ass fucking show. And no one's seen it. That's the that's the crazy thing about it. That that the that no one's no one's ever watched this show. Um, it I don't think it has any views. <laughs> I don't think anyone's ever seen it. It has like seven thousand users on now, but it's really good. You should watch it. Um, yeah. Uh, I was thinking about making a video for my my IDMR channel called Anime Shit Now Still or something like this, which is a play on an old Digibo video called Anime Shit Now. But um, while just randomly looking at what was airing, I noticed something that is that has given me an ability to to come up with a derogatory derisive term for anime I don't like which is popular uh, that I think is uh, very memeable, even though. This is, this is, it, it's both notable as a real phenomenon, but also, you know, not all-encompassing by any means, uh, but also kind of funny to, or mimetic to point out. And this is what it is. So if you don't know, uh, like, about anime, most anime, there are sort of three time slots when anime airs. Again, this is something that's very easy to forget if you're in the West, but anime airs on TV in Japan, okay? So... Most anime, there are morning time shows, which are normally shows for children. So either the shonen or uh, Maho Shoujo, you know, these sorts of things, right? Like the shows that are 
made with an audience of kids. They're basically the equivalent of Saturday morning cartoons. Uh, they air in the morning, right? Normally on the weekend. Then there are evening shows. Um, normally these are the broad appeal shows designed to be watched by the whole family. There's also some shonen stuff in there, like My Hero Academia, for example, as at like 4 p.m., 4.30, um, the afternoon type shows, I guess. Like, like you know, is it four or five? Let me go back to the first season of fucking Uraka. Uh, Adapt Boku no number one. Okay, here we go. 1700 JST. That is five o'clock. Okay, five o'clock. So there you go. Um, that's that's a, a, a semi-common, you know, I think this is also when your, your Lupin the Thirds would air. You know, the sort of shows that are very popular with um, a broad range of demographic. And then... You have the final time slot, which is evening to late night. They call it late night anime, right? But but here's where I'm going to make a sort of contention. Because anime has always aired in the evening, right? In the late evening. There's always been some anime airing in the late evening. But the story behind what is classified as late night anime, um, it's, it's an interesting anecdote. It's, even though people had done it before, it became popular because Evangelion was obviously very popular. That didn't air at night, but they ran a rerun of Evangelion at like 2 a.m. And it was massively popular, and that was what proved that late night anime could be successful, and then it became the sort of otaku spot. So if you're watching, you know, a lot of anime, you can expect it to have been airing past midnight in Japan, Um, which is why there's a meme in anime about otaku characters who stay up late every night to, to catch the late night anime. Although, obviously, with streaming, this is less and less relevant these days. But regardless, that is the case. Anime airs late at night. Most of the anime airs late at night and on you know often on weekdays because it's a, it's a niche. Or at least it's supposed to be a niche. It, it still thinks of itself as a niche for some reason. Um, but here's here's my... So, now you've got your, your anime history out of the way. Here's my memed i call it 11 o'clock anime right you've got your anime can be distinguished right by the you look at all the popular shows the popular anime that are still anime type anime not like your popular shonen or stuff like this and they tend to air at 11 to 12 right they tend to be either you know so for example spy family aired at 11 villain saga 11 or 12 30 actually more of a that's a bit more of a, you know, otaku type thing, Finland Saga. So that makes sense why I add a bit later. The original series, 11, 10 past Kimetsu no Yaiba, the most recent thing, uh, 11, quarter past 11. The prequel to that, Kimetsu no Yaiba, some other thing, quarter past 11, right? They, they air at these the times. Oshino Ko, 11 o'clock. Jujutsu Kaisen, 11.50, or oh, season 2. Let's see the first season. Okay, the first season was airing earlier, but as you can see uh, later. First, so this is how it works, right? The first season, Saturday's at 1, and then it gets popular, so they move it to a more reasonable time slot at 11, almost 12. Though. So you compare that to, like, let's say, I'm not sure people realize that how this stuff works, right? Hidamari Sketch aired at 1.25 a.m. Mushishi aired at 3.40 a.m. Okay, Serial Experiments Lane, 1.15 a.m. Right, like, what if once you're getting past, like, the 1 a.m. section, that's when you get to the, the, the true shit. That's when you get to the real shit. I couldn't be bothered to look through a bunch of anime and see where it aired. Now, this is not always true. So, for as you, as you saw, there are some popular shows, like, popular shonen, even, like, Villain Saga, that air, you know, past midnight. Um, and even sometimes past 1 a.m. And there are some, you know, more niche otaku shows that actually air earlier. Like, uh, Gotcha Yusa airs before midnight. I forget exactly when, but it airs before midnight. Uh, I'm not sure if the first season did, there doesn't seem to be any data, but the later seasons of Gotcha Yusa uh, air, air before midnight. Um, and the Lucky Star also aired before midnight. So it's they're not all like this, right? Like they're not all like this. But as a broad trend, I think it's it's you can point out the distinction between the the night anime and then the like deep shit, the the th- your 3 a.m. chats. Anything past 1 a.m. is guaranteed to be good shit. Um, that's not actually true. You know what? Let's let's check when when like a typical 
um, mid tier isekai would uh, let me go on current season okay the the vending machine isekai when's this airing oh it airs at 10 10 p.m that's really surprising i wasn't expecting that that's really early for a show like this huh where on what fucking channel it doesn't even say what channel that's weird well that seems odd but i don't i mean i i wouldn't have expected isekai to be like this but I guess I've never checked. Uh, okay, let's let's check another random. There doesn't seem to. Let's go previous season, spring 2020. Random isekai, isekai shoka mani dome this. Okay, uh, 2 a.m. 2 a.m. Uh, or the aristocrats are the worldly adventure serving go to go too far. Midnight. Okay, so they vary. They vary quite a lot. Um, Yushaga Shinda was 1 a.m. I would expect that to be later because that was a bit shittier. Um, and now I'm just curious. Once you start looking at anime errand times, you can start doing some crazy fucking numerology to it and go a bit schizo. Kuma 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 Bear Punch. Was it 11? That makes it more of a... I don't think... Is it a family friendly? I don't know if I'd necessarily say that, but I can see Kuma 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 Bear having more broad appeal than a lot of isekai. What about Watashi no Yuri wa Oshigoto desk? Because I watched a couple episodes of that. When did that air? 11.30. Maybe I just made this pattern up in my head. Maybe this doesn't exist. Maybe I just like happened to look at a couple of shows that fit the pattern and drew too many distinctions from it. I don't care. I'm going to continue to say this as if it's a real thing because I think it's funny. Because you can insult people and you can, you can be like, I'm into anime, but not like like the 11 p.m. anime. I'm not into the 11 o'clock anime. I'm into the 3 a.m. anime. I think that's a funny way to go about your life, to, to make stupid pointless things like that so you can feel superior to other people. Um, so yeah, there's something you can uh, work into your, your daily vocabulary and, and lexicon and idiolect and any other fancy words. When did Heavenly Delusion air? 11. It's a it, the Heavenly Delusion is the sort of show where it would either be 11 or it would be 3 a.m. or 2 a.m. and no in between. Okay, let's keep going. Let's keep going back. When did, uh, fucking... What else have I heard anyone talk about? Nagatoro. When does Nagatoro? 1 a.m. Interesting. Fan service -y stuff tends to be late. Um, fucking Bofuri Season 2. What about this terrible... This was... Was this the really bad one? Um, this can't be the really bad one. That's good. Wait, what was the... Oh, the really bad one was that I maxed out my farming skills. That was that one. Where the fuck is that? Was that this seed? Yeah, 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 here it is. No? I don't know if that's... The, maybe that was the previous season. I think that might have the previous season. When did Bocce the Rock air? Here we go, Sting. Bocce the Rock Midnight. Midnight Aaron. Now I'm just going through shows. Now I don't know what's... When did Do It Yourself... That was a midnight situation as well. Yeah, that makes sense. But if you look at, like, let's go to the top of that seat. Um, oh, wait, I already did some. Let's go previous. Previous. Go back, go back, go back. Spy Family Season 1. Kaguya Sama Season fucking something. I don't care. Why does this have a 9 on Mal? People are so... Oh, my God. See, this is why I want to differentiate myself from these people. Because these people are insane. Like, I don't know, I don't know how they're like this. How does this, this fucking, what season of, I don't even, is this season three? I don't even know what season of Kaguya Summer this is. Fucking, yeah, this is season three. It aired at midnight. Why does it have a fucking 9.04? That is an insane rating to give a Kaguya Summer. That's higher than, like, so much shit. Where does that place, like... I don't even know, man. That's literally... I just want to... Okay, let me just point this out. Fucking Hunter Hunter has a 9.04. Okay? <laughs> Fucking... <laughs> Hunter Hunter has a 9.04. These people are insane. It's literally higher rated than Legend of the Galactic Heroes. It's higher rated than Koei no Katachi. It's higher rated than Clanad Afterstory, Sangatsu's second season, Awari Monogatari, Monster, Kimi no Nawa, okay, probably deserves that, that, that really sucks. How is Bocce the Rock so highly rated? Why is Bocce the Rock the 28th best rated show on Mal? Like, I like Bocce the Rock. It's a good show, but, like, it's nowhere near the best in its genre. Like, not even close. I mean, it's not... It's worse than K-On. If you want to get, like, really specific of the cute girls do music, it's not as good as K-On. This is, like, Mal is just not built to handle a bunch of people suddenly getting into anime, which is what's clearly happened. I mean, obviously this is recency bias, like, people are gonna go walk back and watch Bocce the Rock. Like, for some reason, all of these fucking retards are incapable of rating show lower than Mal rate fucking. Cowboy Bebop is at an 8.75. Let me just remind you, Kaguya Summer Season 3 is a 9.4. <laughs> 0.04. 
and fucking Mush- Mushishi Zoku Show second season is at an eight point seven. Like this show again, Wakuraku Shinju. Okay, that's a recent. I mean, in my mind, that's a recent show. That might be actually pretty old by now. In twenty seventeen, God. But I mean, that deserves a high rating. Fucking show again, Nokura. Such a good show. Uh, I'll tell you what doesn't. Can I just be real with you? Can I be real with you guys? Will you like listen, listen to me if I'm real with you for a second, guys? Guys, Gintama isn't good. Can we like admit this? Gintama is not very funny. I don't know why people think Gintama is funny, but Gintama is not very funny. It's it's just not very funny. Like I I know I know I've known I've known people who 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 like Gintama. I don't I don't know why. It's not it's not very good. Like can, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what to tell you, man. I don't know what to tell you, Gintama. It's not it's not that good. And here's another thing. I've talked about this. This is this is something that I've gone on about maybe too much. Like anime isn't even like there were, there's anime, right? You know about anime? You heard of it? Japanimation? You guys ever heard of this? There's anime, right? And then there's like the otaku centric anime, the the late the super late night shit that we've been talking about, right? Like Kaguya Sama, not I mean, yeah, not not super otaku centric. Like right? there's there's the anime that's like not like you know the shonen, the cowboy bebops, the the, the broad appeal stuff. And then there's like your one level deep, which is like yeah yeah Kaguya Sama's your spy family, these sorts of things, right? You, these are the eleven the eleven o'clock anime, even if they don't air at eleven o'clock. That's what I'm just gonna call them. And, and then you got your your crazy shit, crazy shit for real ones. But your crazy shit for real ones is still like relatively speaking not the hardcore otaku shit because the hardcore otaku shit oftentimes isn't even anime like that's the crazy thing like a lot of the hardcore otaku in japan are now like nowadays they're fucking hardcore vtuber otaku which is crazy to me because vtubers i mean look there's like two vtubers that i kind of like but yeah i don't know about that um, shout out to all my Shondo appreciators listening right now. Shout out to all my Shondo appreciators. But, um, you know, I, I can't be that hardcore into VTubers because I'm not a streaming type. I'm not, not streamers, really. Maybe if there was a, a library of Laterno style channel for Fallen Shadow, I would be a massive Fallen Shadow. But there are, there are clip channels and... and Obviously, she uploads her VODs, but there's no library of Laterno bits and banter style things for Shonda. So that's really what's keeping me. And I've considered, I've thought, you know, I've considered becoming the Shondo librarian a few times, but I don't have, I mean, I don't have the physically, I don't, I don't physically have the hardware to do that. I don't have the hardware to save, I don't know how long she even streams for, but like, you know, that much HD footage and edit it on a regular basis. Like, I just don't own the physical hardware to to have all that footage and edit it. And it's not not really viable. Um, and I don't care that much. I don't care enough to do it anyway. Uh, okay, fuck. I was going to say something else. So, yeah, a lot of the hardcore otaku are... Like, you have to remember that these days they're VTube otaku. They've historically and continually been idol otaku. And then they've gone to, like deeper shit than anime. I mean, firstly, there's there's the whole world of manga and doujin. Shi. My god, why did I say that? Shi, which is a whole world. Because manga is across the whole spectrum of, like, super normy shit that everyone reads. Like, literally everyone. All the way down to, like, the most incredibly niche otaku-centric fetish porn. Um, and then, obviously, there's visual novel. Now, everyone's been saying that visual novels are a dying medium for the past 10 years, um, but I've not actually seen any evidence. I mean, I'm, I'm, it's hard to find evidence, right? Like, I, I, if it was, I can't, I can neither confirm nor deny these changes. Oh, sorry, these, I can neither confirm nor deny these claims, is what I'm saying. I can neither confirm nor deny these claims that visual novels may or may not be a dying medium. I've heard it repeated enough that it makes me think it might be some truth to it, but also, there seems to be plenty of visual novels still getting produced and still being successful, so I I honestly have no fucking idea. But that's some real hardcore otaku shit, okay? Like, there's very... Like, other than... You know, even, even, like, the Higurashi, the, the Ryushikyo 7, Ryukishio 7, I don't know how to pronounce his name, that 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 guy's stuff, or the Nasu, or, or Danganronpa. These things are... I mean, if you want to count fucking... Ace Attorney, then that's a different story, but not counting Ace Attorney. Out, you know, the real shit is pretty, uh, that's the, that's the real shit, <laughs> you know? And you can, as I've said, 
the, this is evidenced by the fact that if you go on YouTube right now and you so if you go on go on Google and you type in Ita Beya, right? Ita Beya, which is the Japanese word for otaku room. It's the same, you know, like Itasha, for example, just means painful. Beya, Heya, is, but it becomes Beya because of some grammar rule that I'm not aware of. And you, anyway, you go into Google Images and you look up Ita Beya. What you're going to see is rooms decorated in the standard otaku room style that you would expect. And most of them have posters from fucking visual, not, not from anime. Like, I mean, okay, that one's Toho. This one, I mean, I don't know all characters. That's Clanad. That is DC Decapo 2. That's Fate Testerosa base. I don't know who that is. I don't, I don't know who any of these other girls are. Okay, that's Toho again. Scroll down. I don't recognize any of these characters, but the art style clearly indicates visual novel. These are also all visual novels. I've read this one. <laughs> Hold on. Wait a minute. I, this looks super fucking familiar to me. Who is this girl? Maybe I have to say. Too blurry to read. I mean, I recognize fucking... This looks super familiar. Shit, what is this? This is gonna piss me off if I don't... I think this is the second time that you've befuddled me. But these are all visual novels, I'm saying. Like, I recognize that art style. That That is that is like a Yuzu Soft, like in something, or a Moonstone Cherry. I don't know. The point is, you go through these, and they're, they're the ones that are actually Japanese. I mean, especially if you search in Japanese, which which I think I might do. Um, hold on. I'm going to do that. Did it go? Yo. Okay. Let's search the, the kanji for Itabaya on Google Image. Oh, also Mobage. I should have made Like, that is visual novel shit. That isn't this one of quality to tell. That's all visual novel shit. That's a character from Love Love. Okay, this one's mostly anime. This one's actually oh, this guy's what a strike with you based. This is this is is this all strike with all strike with yo and giga. Okay, this guy's an anime. These are all lots of love life. We've got a strike with Monogatari. Oh, that I don't even remember what it's called. But he has a lolly. And lots of I don't know. This is cool. This is a video. Um, I don't know why I'm going through these. You can't even see them. This terrible. But this is the evidence. Right, this is the evidence that that it's all about fucking the same thing over and over again. And I haven't even mentioned light novels. I haven't even mentioned light novels. I'm just talking about fucking okay. Light novels are also a whole thing. But these days, light novels are all isekai. There was a time when light novels weren't all isekai. And that was a crazy time that we need to return to. Or at least the isekai... I want, I want the modern isekai to be more like the pre-isekai light novels. That were more weird and meta. Like, most of the isekai that comes out, it has some meta element to it in that it uses tropes and sometimes acknowledges that it's using tropes. But it doesn't do all of the weird shit that old light novels use. Like, it doesn't do the Haruhi shit. It doesn't do the Haruhi shit, you know? And I think we need more fucking light novels that do the Haruhi shit. Like, I want to see a light novel that looks like it's going to be an isekai but then it's a fake out and it's not really an isekai or something. I don't know what I want. I want I want more light novels like Setokai Yakuin Domo or, or or some Haruhi shit, <laughs> you know? I don't I don't know. I'm just sort of rambling at this point. This 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 segment ran out of steam ten minutes ago. Can I just dispel a myth? Just for anyone listening. There's just a piece of knowledge that I want to pass around. Okay? There's a there's a common meme that Shakespeare invented like a shitload of words. Oh, all of these common words that were invented, they were made by Shakespeare. Now don't get me wrong, I like Shakespeare, but he didn't invent shit. Okay, maybe he invented some words, but almost all of the they were all in common parlance. Okay, he didn't just make shit up and expect the audience to understand it. The difference is he was writing plays for the masses and he used a lot of lower class slang type words, which are now, you know, just considered normal words. Uh, but those words weren't typically written down because the people who were writing shit down tended to be upper class writing in a more formal style. So a lot of the words that come up in Shakespeare, th- this is just how people talked. Like, I mean, obviously it's all written in iambic pentameter, so it's more rhythmic and poetic. But in general, the language that Shakespeare uses is pretty fucking similar to the language of everyday working people in London at the time. Okay, that's my rant over. I just, you know, I watched... Isekai or Jisun. I thought it was a pretty good show. I thought it was a pretty good show. Honestly, the first part of the show was pretty... It almost lost me. I almost dropped it. Like, maybe like... How do I put it? 
Okay, so isekai ojisa, let me give you a... In case you don't know what it is, because I, I didn't know what it was. I've heard it recommended before, but I didn't know what it was. It's more of a... It's closer to Konosuba than anything else. It's a parody isekai, and it's about... It's about a guy who comes back from the isekai world 17 years, you know, later, and he's now, like, old as fuck. Not old as fuck, but he's he's a an, a, an uncle, and he's, like, you know, adapting to the world, and he's a massive Sega fan, like Sonic, the hedgehog Sega. And uh, the, he sort of goes back through his adventures in the isekai world by showing his... Uh, or misadventures by showing his, I guess, nephew, who he he's staying with, and trying to become a YouTuber. He's the the isekai oji san. He can still use magic in the real world, and so he tries to use the magic, like to show magic on YouTube to become a YouTuber. But that's not really that doesn't really capture the show, because there's the thing about it is there's actually a bunch of cute girls in this show. The tsundere girl is actually very cute. The ice girl is actually very cute. And the protagonist's main character, love interest in the real world, is actually very cute. Which is why I almost dropped it. Because there's kind of romance subplots hinted at. Or not even hinted at, but like, you know. The girls that I mentioned are interested in the guys in the show. But the guys don't understand what's going on and don't reciprocate. Um, and or it's kind of difficult to explain without just going into unnecessary amounts of detail about the plot. Uh, so like it makes it's not just like stupid. It's it's good. In fact, it's like the best thing about the show, maybe. But for the first like half of the show, it's really going all in on trying to maybe not half, maybe like the first four or five episodes. The it's really going all in on trying to be like mainly set in the real world. And as a comedy, because a lot of it is told in what is essentially flashback, although it's not, because he's he's showing he's showing his memories of the Isekai world to the the people. So it's like a flashback. But every episode is basically like the uncle like showing some event that happened in the Isekai world, and you find out what happened, right? And it's usually things going wrong in a com- comedic way. Uh, but but the earlier part of the show is focused more on the real world. Um, like the uncles, the 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 isekai jisans adapting, adapt, readapting to the real world, the living situation, the romance between the main character and the childhood friend, and the ch- characterization of the childhood friend character, and all of you know, and more comedy in the real world. But the thing is that I don't know if it was by accident or what, but they the the. the the chemistry between the main character and the childhood friend love interest is really good. Like, I want to see that romance get explored. And sadly, it doesn't get explored that much in the show. And then, in the isekai world settings, the the, 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 the isekai or jisan and the tsundere girl from the isekai, I also think the tsundere girl is really cute. And, I, you know, that's not really explored other than as a joke earlier on in the show. Um, and so I was just kind of thinking, like, I, you know what? I kind of just either want to watch a straight romance with these real-world characters or, a, like, more generic harem isekai without the the gimmick. <clears throat> because the first part of the show really focuses on the comedy, but the show has about, like, two actually funny jokes per episode, which is not enough to carry a comedy show. <laughs> like... Consistently having two funny jokes per episode is, unfortunately, better than most comedy anime, but uh, is not really enough to carry you through a whole show. Um, But then, as the show goes on, it focuses more and more on the isekai storyline, and then it becomes better, because it's focused more on the isekai storyline. And now it becomes a good isekai with, like, two reliably two or three really funny jokes per episode. I say really funny, pretty funny. Funny enough that it will make you maybe have a giggle. Mm-hmm. And they're not afraid 
It was also annoying because all of the romance stuff, which I thought was the best part of the show, it would always be like, we're going to do a romance thing, but then in every scene that there goes romancy, it's like, and then it's going to end by being undercut with a punchline. And instead of having any romance progression, we're just going to end this scene with some sort of punchline. And those punchlines were often not very funny, and I was just like, fuck you, I just want to actually see these characters get together. Um, you are good characters I wanted to see get together, and now you're making a joke out of it as if I don't, as if you you didn't do this to me. You did this to me. This isn't funny. I want to see the thing that you made that was cool. But yeah, as the show goes on, it moves away from that and becomes closer to like a straight isekai, with the real world elements just sort of being a framing device where they'll sort of occasionally comment on it. And then once it does that, I think it really starts to get a lot better. So, honestly, I can recommend this show, because it's not, like, you can't necessarily, I, I don't really know how to categorize it. Listen, it's not as good as Konosuba, if you want, like, parody, comedy, isekai, where characters are not very good at being in an isekai world. Like, it's not as as funny, the characters aren't as endearing, it's not Konosuba, the, the animation quality is not up there, you know. It, it's, not, it's not up there as Konosuba, but it's still pretty good, it's still pretty enjoyable. Anyway, now, for some reason, I'm I'm just re-watching El Manga Sensei. I don't know why I'm doing that. I was like, I need anime to watch. I, 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 I want to watch anime. Um, I went through a bunch of shows that I was considering watching, and I was like, I want some fucking schlock. I want it to have fan service. I want it to have an emoto. And I was going through every show that I could think of that I haven't seen yet that has an emoto. And fan, you know, all of the, And literally, I've seen all of them. <laughs> I've literally seen every anime like this that I would want to watch, as far as I can tell. Unless there's something out there that I have scrolled past, assuming it would be bad, and then it actually would turn out to be good. But, you know, these would be... These are the sort... You know, ev- everything that doesn't have, like, a low 6 out of 10 on... Ma- I mean, even a lot of the ones that do have a low 6 out of 10 on Mal... Um, you know, I've just watched all of these shows. Um, and then I realized, actually, you know what I actually really just want right now? I want a show that is exactly like El Manga Sensei. And then I thought to myself, you know what? Why not just rewatch El Manga Sensei? It's been, it's been a long time since I watched it. And honestly, I like the show. It's, I like El Manga Sensei. It's a, it's a fine, it's fine. So Patricia Taxon just made a new video, which or released a new video, which is called We're Six Hours In, We Can Talk About Whatever I Want. This is a, a more reasonable thing to talk about. This video is called On the Ethics of Boinking Animal People. Um, Patricia Taxon is a great YouTuber. Patricia Taxon is the YouTuber that I wish I could be. If I could put effort into projects, I would put effort into videos that would be more similar to Patricia Taxon videos than most other things in the world. Um, I like their videos, uh, a lot, actually. And this was a good video as well. It actually reminded me a little bit of, um, some, some old Digi videos towards the later end of the Digis, I think. Uh, this, but, but here's what I'm thinking, right? Here's, here's where I'm going with this. The video is called On the Ethics of Boinking Anime, uh, not anime, animal people. And unfortunately, she doesn't talk about the ethics of boinking anime people, which I thought, yeah, I was watching the video, and I was like, you know, there is a, like, the video is a response to, it's not really a response to, but it's, the framing device of the video is, like, uh, people who say furries are zoophiles, that's not the case, here's why. Um, uh, it's a good video. It's a 42 minute long video about that, but it's not really about that, it's more about being autistic. But I'm like, hey, you know, there's another um, very autistic internet subculture fetish that gets widely derided as extremely taboo, but actually isn't. And uh, are you going to mention that one? Are you going to mention the other the other one? No, you're not going to mention the other one? Okay. Um, so he doesn't mention the other one, which is a bit of a shame. Now look, I have a lot of sympathy with furries, okay? I, I can appreciate aesthetically a lot of, of furry art and furry subculture. However, I'm not really a furry. As much as I... Like, there's nothing about furries that is a, is a 
a, a knee jerk bad. Like a lot of people, they see furry stuff, they have immediate knee jerk bad, weird. I don't know. That's never been the case for me. I've never had that. However, I also don't have any sort of. You see, being a furry is what I would call a categorical attraction. Um, it's a categorical attraction to anthropomorphic animal characters. Um, I, I don't have that categorical attraction. Like, simply and plainly, they don't really... I mean, it's not bad. It's kind of like... It's kind of like, you know, furry is, um, in terms of as a fetish, it's, it's on the same level as, like, uh... What do they call it? The, what's the fucking Japanese word for this? Hold on. I need to, to look this up. <laughs> uh, omarashi. Omarashi, right? Which is, which is the, uh, omorashi, which is, which is the, the Japanese, uh, word for, for wetting yourself, right? Like, you, you see in a lot of, of, of otaku media, this omorashi fetish, right? Where, Characters have to hold their pee and then can't and then wet themselves, right? Like, that is not something I'm interested in, personally. But it's not going to make me turn off whatever I'm watching, right? Like, it's... I don't really get the appeal. I mean, I, I kind of do. I almost get it. Like, I'm like, I see why someone would like this. Like, I can see the 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 appeal of it, but it doesn't do anything for me. But I'm, I'm not going to turn off whatever I'm watching if it has... Uh, you know, omorashi in it, because it doesn't bother me in any way. It's not like, like, there are some things that would, would bother me. Like, if something had scat in it, I would not be it. That would, that would ruin the experience. Furry's kind of like that. Where it's like, I'm not going to seek it out, but if it's there, eh, whatever, right? And a number one reason why I'm not a furry is, um... Simply because I don't really like fur. I'm not really interested in fur. In fact, fur is actually, uh, yeah. So there's a dog here, right? In Estonia, there's a dog. And he's a great dog, right? Love this guy. And petting the dog is nice. And sometimes, um, when I go to sleep, he will curl up against me, which is nice on a conceptual level. However, the feeling of all of that fur touching me is not a pleasant sensation in the same way petting a dog is a pleasant sensation. Petting is a pleasant sensation, but touching fur just in general and trying to fall asleep while every time I shift my weight, all of the hundreds of fur parts <laughs> will now rub against me every time. Like that is a very unpleasant sensory experience for me. That is extremely over stimulating i do not like it i'm sorry to dog who likes cuddling up against me while i sleep but i do i can't fall asleep like that because it is quite unpleasant um and so that's like a number one reason why i can't be a furry is because i don't like fur i can imagine what it would like uh, you know the furry is like imagine what it would be like to hug big wolf man and i'm like that would be quite uncomfortable for me but that would be very overstimulating um so, there's why I'm not a furry. The other thing about Patricia Taxon is she make a music, right? Now look, I love her videos, okay? I just want to put it out there. I pretty much love all of her videos. Um, and she also make her music. And I'm a music as well. So you would imagine there would be something there. However, I do not like Patricia Taxon's music. I don't enjoy it. That's fine. Not everything has to be for me. Um, I'm glad that she makes music and seems to enjoy it, but I do not, I do not like Patricia Taxon's music. Um, I do not like her voice at all, in any situation, which is a complaint I've also received, and we don't get to control what voice we have, really, so that's a shame. Um, but if you have a voice that is bad, <laughs> maybe don't put it on every fucking song. This is my opinion, okay? Look, I'm, if, if you want to do that, that's fine. If it makes you feel artistically fulfilled, then obviously that's fine. But I don't like the way it sounds. And I also just don't like the sort of music that she likes in a lot of senses. I mean, I do like sometimes. Sometimes I like it. 
she has broad tastes, a little broader than mine, because I don't really go for all of this melodic stuff that she's into. She's a little more melody, melodic pilled than I am. I like my favorite musics, a little more simplistic in terms of melody, a little less, less melodramatic in terms of tone, a little less, uh, how do I put it? I, I like the more abrasive sounds, but not everything I like is more abrasive. You know, some of my favorite albums include The Talking Heads, Dean Blunt, um, uh, what the fuck is that? Oh, hold on, wait, I need to get the dog so he doesn't run away. Where are you going? Come here. Okay, dog has been captured. Um, I like the more melodic sounds like that, like, you know, what's the other thing? Beat Happening, big fan of Beat Happening. Shinsei Kamatsu-chan, they have melodic stuff. I like a lot of the melody stuff, but there needs to be, there's a difference. There's a difference there that I can't explain. Okay, that's enough for this segment. Listen, I've been rewatching fucking Aromanga Sensei. I'm tired of the haters saying this show is bad, okay? They just don't get it. They don't get not getting it. They're, ne- they're not getting it in the wrong way. Or well, they're getting it in the... Okay, but let me just say the point instead of sitting around doing 10 years. The, the, every criticism of Edo Manga Sensei basically boils down to... Um, the characters don't... The characters are poorly written or, or fleshed out or they don't behave like real people. Obviously, I don't give a shit. If I wanted to watch real people, I would go outside. I don't want to do that. That's why I watch anime. Um, but, you know, all the you can point to any aspect of the show. I, I would rather if you didn't point to a lot of the technical aspects, because most of the technical aspects are pulled off perfectly fine in Aromanga Sensei. Um, you know, the animation, the voice acting, etc. Um, I've seen people call it ugly, or but it's not. It's, it's animated actually quite well. The characters are it's subtly expressive. Um, you know, Sagri's voice actress is great. Uh, the voice acting in general is pretty good. Uh, all across the music, the the general BGM is nothing to write home about, but the OP absolutely slaps. Uh, you know, in ter- there's not really any like major technical aspects you can say are bad. You might not personally like the aesthetic of the show, which is fine, but um, I don't think there's anything on a technical level that's wrong with the show. Um, in terms of the writing and the dialogue, you know, there's uh, definitely stuff to be desired there in terms of how fleshed out the characters are. But, but it's not that bad. I've definitely seen way worse shows than this that are way more popular. Um, you know, it's, so, I mean, that's a, a semi-valuable critique. But the real criticism, like, every time you criticize either the plot or the characters or the dialogue or, you know, any aspect of the show, uh, unless you're criticizing some sort of, you know, the moles, but even if you're criticizing the moles, you're going to end up basically making the point that, Every criticism of El Manga Sensei boils down to it's just a vehicle for fan service. Like, oh, blah, 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 it's just a vehicle for fan service. It doesn't have, like, everything that happens in the plot just happens so that um, the cute girls can say cute things to the MC or do cute things near the MC or you can see something this way. And yeah, it is knowingly a vehicle. It's not accidentally a vehicle for fan service. It's not trying to hide it. It's not like some sort of show where. It's it, it just to, oh it just so happens to have fan service in every episode but trust me bro it's not about the fan service no it's obviously not about that because unlike anyone else I paid attention to the plot of Eromanga what is the plot of Eromanga since it the main character was previously writing a light novel an action battle light novel with melodrama and character and then because he needs success quickly he has decided to write a little bit sister based uh, love comedy romance fan service anime or light novel that is the plot of the show i don't know how people haven't noticed this the plot of the show is light novel author needs quick success so he decides to write a fan servicey schlocky little sister based romance light novel which is also what el manga <laughs> like he's telling you what he's doing it, the, 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 the the author's self-insert is literally turning to the audience and telling you what he's doing. And you're like saying, oh, you're pointing it out as if no one's noticed. <laughs> as if no one's noticed. That is the point of the show, right? Like, you can disagree or whatever, but you can say that's just not that, there's not something that you're particularly interested in, that's not to your taste. That is fine, okay? But to say it doesn't achieve the goals it set out to achieve is nonsense. Because it clearly does. That's all I'm saying. The writing is literally on the wall. 
I mean, nothing happens in the show that isn't also the creation of the show itself. Like, you, obviously, it was originally a light novel, so you would be reading a light novel about a light novel author who wants to write. Do, do you understand? Do you understand? It's it's a it's a, it's a bit meta. It's it's meta, but it's not trying to be clever with it. It's just meta for the sake of expla- explaining what it is. It's kind of like he, okay, I'll tell you what it is. I'll tell you what Aramangasin is. One time when I was in school, there was some weird project. I don't know what it was, but it was some people that had come from outside of the school, and they were like, "We're gonna do. Do you, anyone from your school want to enter this filmmaking?" Contest like we give you a cameraman and an editing studio and uh, a bunch of people from different schools come and you get to send like five people from your school and you make a short film um, and you know present everyone presents it in a cinema we went out of cinema and everyone presented like that you that's that was it right and I volunteered to do that because I wanted to be an editor at the time and so the first thing you do is you sit around the table and you try and come up with ideas. And the first idea I had at that table was, what if it was a film about a bunch of people sitting around a table thinking of ideas for a film? Because that is that is like once you have the option to do a meta story in your brain, that is like the first thing you come up with, right? Which means maybe it's a little unoriginal, um, which is why it got shut down. Because I said that, and then um, the the the. The guy from from the place, the adult, not not from our school, one, one, the guy who was running it, was sitting at the table monitoring us, said like, oh, everyone does that, so we didn't do it. Instead, we did a really, really, really terrible zombie film, where mine would have been way better, because it was within our actual budget and parameters. I, I don't know why he shut us down and then let us do the world's worst zombie film. It was it was really bad because we didn't have any people. There was five of us, and two of them had to be behind the camera. So it was like two main actors, and then three more people, all of whom had to be zombies. So we just had three zombies, and it, it, we didn't know how to like imply the existence of a horde of zombies beyond what you could see. And you know what I mean? It was terrible. And the zombie makeup was obvi- obviously terrible because we didn't have any resources. So it fucking sucked. Um, it would have been way better to write a, a movie that was just set in one room uh, and a bunch of people talking. That would have been a way better use of our fucking resources, but whatever. Um, it's like that. The, the El Mango Sensei is like that. It's like this guy was like, crap, you know, Oraimo was really successful, but that was a few years ago now. I need another novel that is going to do well financially. Maybe his, you know, publishers pressured him into it or whatever. And so he was like, what if I wrote a book about a guy who needs to pump out a novel that is going to do well financially so he makes it fan service schlock? But I make my own book fan service schlock because that's going to sell well and do well, you know. Like, that's basically what it was. And then he turns to the audience and explains that that's what he's doing and is like, if you're still watching, you're acknowledging that you're on board with this premise. (laughs) <laughs> because otherwise you would have stopped because I've explained what's going on here so you know essentially giving you a free opt out button right this is why that exists in the show he's explaining what's going on so that you and I and everyone involved know what's going on and you can choose to watch it if you want or not watch it if you don't want but the idea that criticizing it by saying oh it's just a vehicle for fan service this misses the point because of course, that's it's an insane way to go about criticizing media. You could say like, I don't know, oh, a 2001: A Space Odyssey. Uh, that's just a vehicle for cool shots of um, of, of of spaceship, right? Or like, uh, you know, I I don't fucking know. You can uh, Tarantino. That's just all. None of the film matters. It's just a vehicle to have a big violent explosion and whatever. You know, it's like yeah, th- of course. It is a vehicle for that. That is a part of the appeal, especially the Tarantino example more than the Kubrick example. But, um, you know, th- th- that's not a criticism. That's not a criticism. You have to actually explain why it's bad. Like, if the if, if it was... If you were saying more so, like, like, maybe a Michael Bay film. Like, Michael Bay, oh, it's just a vehicle to have explosions. And you could then explain, you know, why that's bad. Like, yeah, but... The explosions don't carry any impact for me because I don't care about the characters or the plot. Like, nothing's happened in the movie to get me invested in the plot. So there's no tension, 
right? Like if in a, in a good action movie, right, there may be big explosions and whatever, but you know you can just go on YouTube and look up big explosion. It's not a big deal, right? The the reason movies have impact is because because of narrative, because of stakes. Like yeah, there's big explosions in a good action movie, and there's also big explosions in a Michael Bay movie. But in the good film, those big explosions carry meaning because I'm like I wonder if my main character is going to make it out okay. I wonder if he's going to beat the odds and save the day, or whatever. And I care about his story. Whereas in a Michael Bay film, I don't care about his story. Like, like it, it, it could be anyone. They don't really have any personality. And that's a reasonable criticism. You could do the same with Errol Mangus and say, you could say, look, I understand that it's just a vehicle for fan service, um, but that fan service doesn't really work for me because in order for me to really, uh, you know, find that sort of romantic titillation interesting. I need to be invested in the character. You know, I need to not just see a good character design, but I need to really care about Sagadi on an emotional level. And the film or, or the, the show doesn't do enough to characterize her for me. Um, and I would disagree with this. I actually think Sagadi's characterization is the only thing that the show does well. Every other character is is literally every other character in the show is one dimensional and, and meaningless. But Sagadi actually seems to have an internal world and goals and motivations and internal turmoil and all of the things you want from a good character. So we could then talk about the specifics and I would consider that to be a valuable criticism of Aramangasan. But you can't, you see what I mean? Like, just saying this show has fan service is not a criticism. And saying this show exists to be a vehicle for fan service in this case is not a criticism because that is literally what the show is about. It's about being a vehicle for fan service in a meta way. So I, you know, I don't want to hear, I don't want to hear none of that bullshit five years ago when people still cared about the show. I don't want to hear it back in time. <laughs> um, yeah. Huh. You know, I think, I think personally, as far as a vehicle for fan service goes, it's one of the better ones. As I said, like the other girls, I couldn't give a shit about, but Sagadi, I think, is actually a pretty good character. I think. Her motivations are clear and strong, and they mean something to me, you know? But even beyond that, like, let's just be honest here. Because this is the part where traditional film criticism and TV criticism fail to capture otaku me, right? Because I could talk about, you know, the traditional ways in which I think there's some surprisingly good uses of uh, direction, especially mainly in the early episodes, um, you know, and I could talk about how there are certain beats in Sagadi's narrative that I think endear her to me, or whatever, but that would be missing the point, because the real point is that none of that really matters, because I have an Emoto categorical attraction, right? If you put a, a fucking cute Emoto character in your anime, I'm gonna be like, fuck yes, and I don't really care about anything else, as long as it has a cute Emoto in it, right? Because that is that is how anime works. That is how otaku media works. It's about categorical attraction. It's about showing me the thing that I know that I like and I know that I want, and you know that you like it and I want it, and so on. And at no point is any, you know, the transaction is is secured through through mutual um, <laughs> a, uh, a a double coincidence of wants, right? You you want you want emotos. I want emotos. You can make emotos, I want it, you know, it's very simple. It's a very simple formula, a very simple circuit. So, while I could say why Sagadi is a pretty good emoto character, but not my favorite emoto character or anywhere close, um, you know, not why is Shiro from No Game No Life a better emoto character than Sagadi? We could talk about that, but it would be missing the point because no one while making Eromanga Sensei was trying to do any of that, right? That's not the point. It wasn't, you know, No Game No Life, it has themes, it has messaging, it has interesting conceits and fleshed out characters with backstories, um, you know, and, and a unique setting and surprisingly elegant prose in in the, the light novel. Um, and all of that stuff, right? And and characters which have actual chemistry. El Manga Sensei doesn't have any of that. And it doesn't... It, it makes it very clear that it's not trying to have any of that. And when I say it makes it very clear, this isn't... I want to get this through to you, that this isn't subtext. I Like, the main character who 
is the author of the light novel says this <laughs> much like he's trying his best to write a good little sister light novel and that's all he cares about and that is all that the real life author of Earl Manga Sensei cared about and it's clear and I think personally that he did an okay job I, I don't think it's the best thing ever made it definitely wouldn't make it into my like top 50 anime of all time but I think he did an okay I don't think it's like worthy of all of the fucking you know trash talking that this show gets among the anime elitist crowd who have no understanding of otaku or categorical attraction they just you know they look at categorical attraction and they say it applies to me when i do it because it's fine but but when it's the stuff that i don't personally like it's not okay and you just like bad stuff the concepts of like this is what i said in that vlog i recorded about bad isekai like the concepts of good or bad they don't really matter at this level of otaku like that looking at media in terms of uh <laughs> good or bad it, it starts to fall apart at this level of otaku because it's not about good or bad it's just about databasing it and and that's where that's where i shine that's where my, that's where i live that's where i hang out in the in my little burrow in the dirt that's that's my home let's talk about a digibro video from 10 years ago so in the video, anime is getting lazy with its meta. Digi contrasts a scene from Myriad Colors Phantom World, which is a show I haven't seen, uh, with a scene from Neon Genesis Evangelion, which is a show I have seen, and compares and contrasts two different versions of a play on a very particular anime trope. It's called the accidental pervert trope, and it is when the main character trips and falls and lands on top of a female character and ends up accidentally groping her. You've seen this in every anime ever. Now, in the video, Digi contrasts uh, the scene in Myriad Colors Phantom World, where the main character trips and falls, is about to accidentally grope the female character, but realizes what he's doing and tries to stop himself. But in stopping himself, ends up tripping and falling even harder in a very cartoonish way, and landing face first in her pantsu, in her pants, right? Um, where the scene in Evangelion, Shinji trips and falls on naked Rei and gropes her breasts, but instead of the typical reaction, which is the female character going kya hentai and slapping him, she just stares at him awkwardly. Uh, or she just sort of stares at him for a while and then asks him to get off, and it's very awkward. And according to this video, um, the Phantom World version is not really a subversion, because it still recreates the actual beats of the trope, just lampshading the fact that it's doing it. It's just saying, look, I know I'm doing the trope. Look, the character is aware that he's he's participating in the trope. But it still does the trope. In the end of, at the end of the day, he still lands and accidentally gropes her. So nothing was really subverted. Whereas in the Ava um, example, the entire meaning of the trope was changed, right? Um, as as Digi puts it, um, you know, this is how, basically this is how it would be in real life if this actually happened. It would just be really awkward. But I don't think this is correct. Now, I'm not here to defend Phantom World because I haven't seen it and I don't really know what meaning that scene has outside of, you know, that shot from that, this, this video. But in Ava, the reason Rei doesn't react to Shinji falling on her isn't because she's acting like a normal person would in that scene. It's to demonstrate how she's cold and unemotional and you know autistic or whatever inhuman robotic because it's expected that a normal person would freak out in that scenario so it's weird when ray doesn't freak out and just quietly says get can you get off please or whatever she says right that's weird because the show is implying that it, the normal thing to happen is for the girl to, to freak out and scream and slap the protagonist. So in reality, Ava isn't really subverting the trope so much as it is reinforcing the normality of the trope. The entire point of that scene from Ava is to say, look how abnormal Ray is specifically, right? Like, we know what's normally supposed to happen in this scene. We know how a normal person would react to it. But Ray is acting weird by not freaking out, which is the exact opposite of what Digi says in the video. Digi says a normal person, it would just be awkward and whatever. And maybe in real life it would just be awkward, I don't know. There are plenty of anime where it's awkward. That's I don't know why you had to go all the way to Ava for that. 
Um, but no, that's not what Ava is saying. Ava is saying that actually acting quietly like Ray did and not being freaked out by that happening, um, in fact, not really reacting in any notable way at all because that's Ray's characterization, um, is in itself weird. Like to act, to behave like that is weird. And so I think Digi completely misses the point of that scene in that it's video. Um, as for the Phantom World thing, is it really subversive? Well, things can be subverted on multiple levels, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to completely change the meaning of a trope in order to subvert it, in a sense. You just use, it's just a language game, it just depends what, 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 how you personally intend the word subversion, you know, when you say it. Um, it's not particularly subversive, no, I don't think it was trying to be, but it is, um, I think it's mainly just supposed to be kind of comedic, right? Uh, I think it's just a, I mean, again, I haven't seen the show, I'm just guessing, but I think it's probably just supposed to be a play on expectations in order to have a comedic um, beat, right? Which, I don't know how funny that actually is, but I think that's the intention of the scene, just from, from guessing. So, really, those two scenes aren't very comparable, because uh, while they both rely on the audience having an idea of what the trope is supposed to be, in Phantom World, the main character is actively trying to avoid participating in the trope, but because he's in an anime, he can't. God forces him to be in a trope, right? The anime gods force him to be in a trope. That's kind of an interesting way to go about it. But in the Ava one, the point is, the trope is the normal thing that's supposed to happen in-universe. It would be expected that you would freak out if a random person groped you. But Rey doesn't do that because she's a fucking weirdo. Um, you know, either... In either case, you know, there is a play on the trope, and it's not just, you know, it's not just letting the trope play out as it normally would without any commentary. There is some commentary, and therefore, and it's not playing out as usual. Therefore, something is being subverted there, in both examples. Um, but if I had to pick, I would say the, the Ava one is really um, just trying to character... It's not really subverting the meta of the trope, it's specifically trying to characterize Rey by appealing to how she's not normal, right? How she's not reacting to normal. And, uh, but she doesn't know what an anime is, right? She doesn't know what, she doesn't know what anime is. Whereas in Phantom World, as far as I can tell, having not watched the show, the main character knows what is going on and actively wants to avoid doing the anime thing. So one of them is a lot more meta than the other one. Um, but they're not really, I mean, the Phantom World one is more trying to criticize, or not necessarily criticize, in fact, it's definitely not criticizing. One of them is, the Phantom World one is more trying to notion at the meta of anime, whereas the, the Ava one is more trying to notion at one particular character's, you know, personality. So, you know, I think they're both okay. I don't have a problem with either one. Okay, so I just watched Omanga Sensei, and it's OVA. I'd seen the show before, but I had not seen the OVA. Um, and I pretty much got all my thoughts about the show out already, on anything interesting. I mean, it's Aromanga Sensei, it's been talked about to death. I'm obviously a bit of a bit of a defender. I'm an Aromanga Sensei defender. Um, but, like, it's Aromanga Sensei. I mean, you know what it is. If you know what it is, you know what it is. There's not that much that could be said about it. But the OVA is interesting, because the OVA is two episodes, and it's kind of like different routes, right? Like, the first episode is like the Elf Sensei route, and then the second episode is like the Tsagiri route slash True End. And the first episode, probably the worst episode of the show, like, yeah, it's got some fan service in it, as you would expect from an OVA of a show of this type. But, I mean, the show already has a bunch of fan service, so it's like, you know, what more can you really do? Um, the answer is not much. And then it tries to also simultaneously be like a really serious and dramatic plot-focused episode. It's probably the, the, the OVA is much more plot-focused than the actual show, which is more slice-of-life, you know, comedy for. Uh, and it's not very good. <laughs> it's not very good. But it, it's very odd in that it then, like, it's so cliché. But then it transforms into a musical halfway through, like literally transforms into a musical. Like the character just starts singing out of nowhere and will join it. It's very odd about things relevant to the plot. And it, it makes no sense. It's rushed because it's like trying to do this serious storyline that would normally have made sense, like spread between maybe three episodes or two episodes and cram it into the second half of one episode. So that storyline feels like, I mean, it feels like it comes out of nowhere and then instantly vanishes after one musical number, which is literally what happens. <laughs> it feels like that because that is what happens. 
So that episode is not very good. Unless you're huge, unless you're big into the character of Yamada Elf, if she was your favorite character in the show, you might like this because there's there's more you know romantic beats between her and the main character. Uh, but yeah, that's the only reason. But the second episode I thought was like arguably the best episode of the show because this is the episode in which Sagadi gets character development, which doesn't happen in the rest of the show, and it's actually really good. Like there's a bunch of really moe moments. The plot of the episode, it's a very bog-standard plot of, like, the main character gets sick and Sagadi has to take care of him. Uh, but, you know, it, it works. It's, it's a bog-standard for a reason. It's a solid plot device. Um, I liked it. I thought it was very... They had lots of very cute moments, character moments. Uh, it had, uh, you know, actual character development for Sagadi. Um, it has the, ca- the canonical scene. The, the ED of the show features Sagadi dancing while doing laundry, right? Um, and it features that scene, like that happens in the episode. Sagadi does the ED dance. Like that's, they're implying that that's when it happened, which I thought was pretty funny. Um, and yeah, I thought it was a good episode. You should watch it, honestly. If you like if you like the show, don't don't watch it if you hate Eromanga Sensei. You will not like it if you hate Eromanga Sensei. Okay, I'm about to die in Team Fortress 2. I died in Team Fortress 2. Yeah, I don't really have that much else to say other than, like, I, I think the... I think Eromanga Sensei is un, unfairly maligned. I will say, however, that if you want a show that is hickey, neat, cute, moe, lolly girl, um, otaku girl, learns to overcome her anxieties, or, like, not necessarily learns, but, like, tries to overcome her anxieties uh, while being a little sister, with lots of fan service beats and moe element, uh, you should probably watch Onimai. Onimai is better. It's definitely a better show in every way. Like the characterization is stronger. Every pretty much everything other than the OP is better in Onimai than it is in Eromanga Sensei for a similar type of show. Um, but you know, you can both both can exist. You can like both. Uh, yeah, I I can't like the only shows I can think of. I mean, I guess there's, like, Konata from Lucky Star, but she, like, has friends. I mean, I guess that's fine. No one said you weren't allowed to have friends. But if you want specifically, like, hiki-neat character, I mean, maybe, like, Recovery of an MMO Junkie. Oh, Oreimo. Oreimo is also better than El Manga Sensei. Uh, But then Oreimo Season 2 exists, which whenever I'm thinking of Oreimo, I can't forget the fact that Oreimo Season 2 exists and is terrible, so it kind of ruins the show a bit. I don't know if I'd say ruin it, but, it, you know, it's always hanging over a black. But yeah, Ore- Oreimo is probably an example. Um, what else? Mahimoto chat, I haven't seen that. Imaru chat, I haven't seen it, because everyone keeps telling me that it's terrible and not to watch it, but maybe I should just ignore them, because they say the same about a bunch of shows I like. Uh, what else? I'm pretty sure there's others. There must be. There's definitely others, I think. Oh, um, Watamote. Watamote is also better than... It's also a better show. But that's kind of a different vibe. Watamote is kind of a different vibe. Also, the manga of Watamote is, is better than the anime. Although that may be the case for everything. Like, maybe the maybe the, the light novel of um, this is better. In fact, it probably is. Because they actually fuck in the light novel. So yeah, there's a bunch of other similar shows that are better. But but that's fine, because I also like those ones, and I like this one. These are my opinions, okay? I think if you want something that I think is, like, the closest to this in terms of tone, Onimai is probably your best bet. If you want a good version of Eromanga Sin, it's on Ochan wa Oshimai. Although that also has the gender bender element that this show obviously doesn't have. Um, and Onimai isn't... Like, if you're interested in the romance, I guess, it's kind of a different thing. Like, Onimai isn't really a romance anime. Like, ro- romance doesn't really play into whereas that's obviously a big part of the among us. So, somewhere between Onimai and, er- and Odaimo, that's, you know, you watch both of them and combine them in your brain, and then you get... I don't, okay, I'll stop talking about this. So, one of the interesting things about Eromanga Sensei is that they directly reference other visual novels like most anime they when they reference some other property they make a very obvious copyright safe version of the name or whatever right um and so it's it's all it's somewhat notable when they directly re- uh, reference a real thing 
Right? This is where the whack Donalds comes from and whatever. It's funny because I've watched two back to back that have done this because uh, Isekai Oji directly references real life Sega games by name and element, you know, like they must have gotten some license from Sega to do all of that. And uh, an Omanga Sensei references other visual, I mean, other light novels, which I'm assuming are licensed by the same publisher. Uh, but one of the ones they reference is Mahoka. The Irregular Magic High School. Now, at some point, I watched this. You know what? I can look this up. Hold on. Um, okay. I watched this in 2020. I watched six episodes and dropped it, and I gave it a two. I gave it a two. I dropped it after six episodes. Now, here's what I remember about the show, right? I remember not much. I remember the main guy is light novel protagonist. He's the strongest and coolest guy. And then I remember, but everyone thinks he's weak because he has some power that isn't judged by whatever system. And the gimmick of the show is that there's like a two-tiered system of discrimination in the magic high school where there's like the the higher ranked students are like discriminating against the lower ranked students. And I remember a scene where it's sort of a POV shot shot reverse shot type situation where the main character is walking down a hallway in the school and explaining in mono, internal monologue the system. So that doesn't exist in the anime. My brain just made that up, which is pretty interesting. Unless it happens after I'm four episodes in to my rewatch attempt. Uh, and yeah, unless that doesn't happen. I mean, it might... Uh, sorry, I mean, unless that happens later, which wouldn't make any sense because I've already explained it. So that's the first thing. And then I remember, like, really quickly, like... Pretty much immediately, right off the bat, the fast of the start of the show, terrorists invade the school, and the terrorists are like coded to be like I don't know lefties. <laughs> like they seem to have a perfectly good point. This is what I remember. I remember they're terrorists, and their point is like, hey, um, like the world outside of the school is fucked. We're all poor and starving, and we can't afford to eat. Meanwhile, you guys in the magic high school have these, like, perfect lives with, like, luxury. Maybe, maybe, like, that's, that's a bit unreasonable as a way to organize society. Now, yeah, maybe they shouldn't be terrorists about it, but, like, that seems like a good point to me, (laughs) you know? And then I remember the show framing, framing them as, as bad guys for that. And, uh, I thought that this was a really garbled political metaphor at the time. And um, that was part of the reason why I dropped it. I also just thought the show wasn't very good, which I understand. I mean, looking back, looking at it now, I can see why I didn't like it. But also, I thought that I dropped it like two or three episodes in. It turns out I dropped it six episodes in because I remember the terrorist plot happening like almost immediately after the show started like there's there's a little bit of introduction and lore and world building and they go right into terrorists and i thought like it, i don't know that's how i remembered it happening but apparently that's not the case because you know i'm on episode four and there's not even a hint of that yet um i don't know i'm too early in the show to give a new thoughts it's too soon for me to give any real fleshed out opinions so far um but i guess i'll watch it i've been meaning to give this show another chance for like Basically, since I dropped it, because it has a little sister character in it. It has it has Insta, which is base. Um, but also, it's kind of up my street in terms of what it is, which is like, you know, a twenty early 2010s um, light novel adaptation in a magic high school setting, which is kind of my jam, um, with like overly complicated magic systems. I mean, you know, I like these sorts of shows normally. Uh, so it's kind of weird that I didn't like Mahoka. So, um, yeah, I'm giving it another shot. I've been meaning to give it another shot for years, and I'm finally getting around to it. All right, I've now watched Mahoka up to episode 7, so I'm past where I dropped it last time. And uh, I pretty much was... I was close to correct in my analyses um, of the the show's garbled political metaphor. Um, But it's even worse than that. Because it, once it gets, like, it ultimately gets revealed that, like, the the politics never mattered. It was basically just a guy who was evil. And he was just, like, brainwashing people. Also, yeah, no one actually believed any of the things he was saying. He was just brain... It's a very odd 
It, this feels like uh, I'm not, I'm, I know that I'm not someone who would typically complain about the politics of a show. I'm not going to do that after this segment because it, it doesn't really matter that. Um, <clears throat> but it really feels like someone who's just gotten in, like a libertarian guy got into a bunch of arguments on the internet and like tried to make a straw man of all the commies he hates because first they have a completely incoherent ideology it's based on something that makes a lot of sense but the main character just dismisses it without doing anything to really counter it right like there's a big speech the main character gives about how like they claim to want equality but in reality equality something like equality could never possibly exist because they don't realize that magicians actually work really hard just because magicians have a higher median income they literally use the word median income like just because magicians have a higher median income than the rest of the population they don't realize that actually being a skilled magician it takes an entire lifetime of hard work they just want free stuff for not having to work at all or, or anything something like this right and the the problem with this speech is that it's not really clear what's going on at all like it's not clear if that's actually the case if that's or if it's just what the main character thinks it's also not clear how true that is in the universe like are people in this world just magic by birth or is everyone magic and only some people like have the hard you know have the determination to practice magic to be good um i can't tell yeah, i'm sure i'm sh i'm thinking maybe that'll be expanded upon in later parts of the show right but as for right now that world building hasn't happened <laughs> yeah <laughs> soup on my finger that i accidentally cut this morning oh dear and the soup couldn't be that's that's unfortunate um but yeah, it seems like the other thing to point out is how this doesn't translate to like it's almost border like the author's the author's ideology or at least the the character's ideology. It feels like borderline feudalist, <laughs> even like a weird combination of like libertarianism, but also your family line really matters, and like which which high high prestige family you're from is very important. Um, which is a little odd. It doesn't really make any sense, like, combining those two ideologies, right? Because one of them is uh, liberty is good and meritocracy is good. And the other one is, but some people are just born special. It's a bit odd. So that whole metaphor is garbled. But then none of it matters because when they actually, you know, talk to the bad guy terrorist guys... They don't even really have any sort of coherent ideology. They just sort of give big speeches and then main character just instantly kills them all. Because this is the real fucking problem with the show. Main character guy is too damn strong. Now, I like overpowered main characters, okay? I've enjoyed many shows with overpowered main characters. But normally, the good shows with OP protagonists, they, they do something with it, right? Like, it's not just Kirito. It's not just main guy is really strong and because he's so strong, he beats everyone. Because that's a really boring story. You have, like, Slime Isekai, where the main character is really strong, but what's interesting is how she uses those powers to help her friends and the adventures of the weaker characters around her. <clears throat> or, you know, it might be, like, No Game No Life, where the main characters are really strong, but you get to see the ways in which they're strong, right? Because they're just very good at, at video games. <laughs> And you get to see their strategy and stuff. In Mahoka, they, they sort of attempt that by just making up really long techno babble that, like, doesn't make any sense and is internally inconsistent. Like, listen, I love a good, overly complicated light novel magic, okay? That's, there's nothing wrong with that. I, I mean, it, it, I like Horizon in the Middle of Nowhere. That, that, that's a fine thing to happen, right? I, I, it's cool to me when characters talk about in depth about the magic system with a bunch of techno babble words um i would like it to be a bit better explained because they just sort of gloss over a lot of stuff about how magic works but maybe that'll be again i'm still relatively early in the show so i don't want to draw too many conclusions but practically the main character is too good at things he is like ridiculously too good at like unbelievably stronger than literally everyone else in the universe nothing ever poses any challenge to like no game, no life. You know, blank are the strongest, and they never lose, at, right? You, but you get to see them try. They have to try. This is the, and that's interesting. 
right? It's cool to watch characters try. The main guy in Mahoka never has to try because he's just the strongest guy by far. And his power, it, it's exactly the same as um, certain magical index, but but worse. Because in index, it's, it's basically the same plot where there's a world with magic and uh, the main character, everyone thinks that he's weak because his magic isn't, like, his particular brand of magic isn't judged by the system very well, right? Which is, like, self-insert for Japanese students who don't do well on tests but still think they're very smart, right? Like, it's the same thing. Um, which is also, I should mention, very odd to put in a show where the first arc is about how, um, you know, inequality is actually good or whatever or deserved. But to also be like, but the main premise of the show, or at least one big thrust of the show, is that how we're judging this meritocracy is actually biased against certain types of people. And this is like an objective fact in the world of the show that like, you know, the the, the testing systems, how people are judged in the world on their merit is, is biased, is, is not actually accurate to the level of their uh, real life value. Um but if you complain about that, that's bad. You're not allowed to complain about that. That's weird. That's a weird thing to put in an anime. I'm sorry. I, I don't think it's immoral. It just doesn't make any sense. Like, it's just it's just, it, it's just bad storytelling. <laughs> you know, it's like a plot hole, almost. Um, <clears throat> but the main guy, just like in in Rail, Railgun and Index, Raildex, main guy's power is that he has the power to negate all other powers, which obviously makes him the strongest guy. It's the same here. Main guy also just can negate any other magic, right? But then in addition to that, he also has the strongest magic, just, just on a separate level. And not only that, he's the world's best martial artist in ninjutsu. Um, it, it's like, they just put Every, they just put everything on him. And he's also, you know, ridiculously handsome and everyone instantly falls in love with him. But it doesn't matter because he wants to fuck his sister. And in that way, he's based, obviously, extremely. Um, but on all other levels, he's lame. He's too strong. Maybe this is just... I'm hoping, right? Uh, I've been told that the show gets better after the first arc. So I'm hoping that as the show goes on, you know, that was just sort of an introductory chapter... And then we're going to see a more fleshed out version of his character as the show goes on. That's what I'm hoping for. I'm judging this show relatively harshly because it is quite well liked, especially in Japan. It is very successful and well liked. Uh, Like this isn't a 6 out of 10 isekai random that you forget after the season. This is like a pretty well known, well liked show. Um, A a, a very popular, well known, well liked show. So... Uh, yeah, I'm judging it uh, with a, a, a harsher lens. I will say, in terms of things the show does well, it has a great color palette, it has great character designs, so the voice acting is on point. Um, I like the techno babble stuff, that's just a matter of taste. Um, and uh, yeah, those are some of the things I like. The visual design in general, the show looks good. I didn't even mention the actual biggest problem with this show. The biggest problem is that it's it's fucking boring. It's so boring. It's fucking boring. All of the stuff that I mentioned as a problem leads to it being boring. Like, that's the actual end result. It's also boring just in general. It's boring. It's a very boring show. I'll keep watching it for the meantime, but I don't know if I'm going to finish it because it's still boring. I've watched like two more episodes since I recorded that previous segment, and it's those two episodes were also boring. You know what? I'm not missing anything by just dropping this fucking show, okay? I've already given this one chance more than I would give any other show, just because I know it's a popular light novel in Japan. Um, and I'm like, sometimes they get things right. But this is not one of those times, okay? This show is just boring. It's just boring. There's plenty of other magical high school light novel adaptation shows that, while they may not be amazing, are still better. Even the bad ones. Like, Akashic Records, right? Akashic Records starts off pretty good, in my opinion. The first, like, three or four episodes of Akashic Records, really good. It goes to shit towards the end. But, like... At least it's never boring. Or, for example, Chivalry of Held Knight. That's actually a good show. Index is a similar kind of vibe. Good show. This show, boring. Boring ass show. Full of boring things happening. I just can't even be bothered to watch it. It's just fucking boring. 
But if we're giving shows second chances, here's another show I should give a second chance, which I also thought was boring. I don't want to watch something boring. You know what's a random pet peeve that I have? This is an extremely lame thing to care about, and I acknowledge that this is an extremely lame thing to care about. And it's also a very weeb, it's a very weeaboo thing to care about as well. But... I must, I've, I, since I found out about this, like, I don't know, when I was a teenager or whatever, it's always been in the back of my mind. I never want to be the one to point it out because it makes you look like a nerd to point this out. But you know what? I'm going to point it out. Seeing people say anything with a 575 syllable pattern is a haiku is annoying because that is not what a haiku is, okay? A haiku does not i know when we were in fucking english class they were like there were other forms of poetry other than fucking sonnets or whatever like a haiku for example a haiku is when you write things down that have a 575 pattern but there are actually other rules specifically a haiku has to have a a, a reference to one of the four seasons in it it has to reference the seasons you can't write a haiku, if you, if you write a haiku and it doesn't refer- this reference uh, some aspect of the seasons, it is not a haiku. It doesn't meet the definition of a haiku. And secondly, that one's relatively easy to explain, but then it's really hard to explain this next thing to native English speakers. I don't particularly understand it either. There's a particular type of word called a kireji, which also has to be in a haiku. And it serves as sort of like a a punctuation in the haiku. It sets the meter, the rhythm of the haiku. Um, And it's like, it's one of the sentences in the haiku has to end in a kireji. But kireji doesn't have any direct match in English. Like it only makes sense in the Japanese language because that's the language that haiku form was constructed for. You can emulate it by just like putting a comma or a punctuation of some kind at the end of one of the lines. It's but it's not really the same thing because in Japanese it's a word, so it's not just a punctuation, but it has meaning. It's a suffix type of situation. Uh, you can look up the, the the Wikipedia page for kireji if you want to know more specifics. I don't really care, but that is that is the case. It is not just five seven five. It also has to have a seasonal reference, and it has to have a kireji. Otherwise, it's not a haiku. That's what a haiku is. You can't just say, oh, but blah, blah, blah. That's stupid. You can say that's stupid. You can just write a poem that has a syllable pattern and just not call it a haiku, because it's simply not a haiku. If, you know, it's just a different type of poem. You just wrote another poem, and poems are, that's fine. You can write a different type of poem, that's haiku inspired, but it's it's not a haiku. A haiku has to have those elements in it. There you go. This is my this is my lame ass fucking thing to point out. And now you too can be annoying by knowing this fact about Japanese poetry. I briefly mentioned this on an aborted vlog that I was recording, but I don't know if I've mentioned this on the podcast, Slice of Life podcast. Hey, it's another one of these. Man, I'm fucking dying because I'm very hungry and there is no food. Um, but. There's a dog here in Estonia. There's a dog. Uh, I'm looking at him right now. And he needs to be walked two times a day. Now, I've never had a dog before, and this is a new experience to me. It's honestly a little inconvenient. I don't like going outside. This is like a major part of me, (laughs) my brand. You guys know this. I don't like going outside. But the dog has to be walked, or he will shit himself in the floor, which is not good. So uh, that has to happen. And... Fortunately, I brought these wireless headphones with me to Estonia, so I can listen to podcasts and whatever while I'm walking. And originally I was listening to The Pill Pod, which is a philosophy and critical theory podcast hosted by a few guys, one of whom is from the YouTube channel Plastic Pills, but then I ran out of interesting stuff to listen to from that. And so I was looking for stuff to listen to, and I eventually ran out of... I couldn't think of anything, so I was just like, what if I watch old Digi videos? Now, if you don't know who the fuck a Digi video is, like, consider yourself lucky, okay? Consider yourself lucky, but this next segment is just not going to make any sense to you, but that's fine. So I've just been listening to old Digi After Dark stuff, and, like, it's crazy to me that I thought this person had insight at one point in my life. You know, I'm listening to 
fucking the Gecko Estate Four, every thing is Devil Man, and they're just going on a big rant about like, bro, you know, like if you want to make a fucking, if you're the new Hayao Miyazaki, all you have to do is spend three years putting maximum effort into something, and drawing it and animating it, and then you'll make the best film ever. Because to Miyazaki, it doesn't make any sense to make anything that isn't the best film ever. Uh, that's the reason, and it's crazy to me that this guy doesn't think of like the most obvious thing ever, which is like, hmm, okay. So how are you supposed to eat during those three years? <laughs> how are you supposed to pay rent during those three years that you're just working on your uh, fucking anime project? Oh, oh, someone's supposed to hire you to do that. Who's gonna do that? Who's going to do that in, in Japan's current economy? Maybe, maybe there was some difference between when Hayao Miyazaki came up in the anime industry and now in the modern anime industry as to which projects get funded because of what sort of money is floating around. Hmm, I wonder if... Is it going to be... Here's my question to you, okay? Did you from, like, five years ago or whatever. Is it going to be easier to convince a production committee... To fund you, some random no-name auteur director, to create your avant-garde, you know, art house film for three years, all hand animated in the highest possible quality, which means you're going to have to hire a bunch of really good animators who aren't going to be able to work on anything else, and those people are all going to need to get paid for three years in order to make a movie, so that means you are running, you are just losing money for three years on the bet that your art house auteur masterpiece film will somehow make all of that money back at the end of it and more, are you going to run that bet? Do you think a producer is going to take that bet, three years of losing money, uh, for the chance of, of a possible re... Or are they going to say, there's this other TV anime that wants uh, two months of budget to shittily animate something that will appeal to a niche of otaku who will buy the Blu-rays and that will recoup its money because it didn't cost very much money in the first place. Which which fucking deal do you think is more likely to get funding? Which one do you think is more likely to get funding? I'm just wondering. Do you think the problem is that there are no talented animators and directors? Or do you think, possibly, that in an economy that is booming, people are more willing to take financial risks on artistic projects? Because even if they lose a bunch of money... It doesn't really matter because everyone's rich anyway. Or, uh, you know, versus today in a... Uh, let's remember that Japan... I mean, this wasn't the case when Digi recorded the video. But let's remember that right now Japan is the most indebted nation in the world. Uh, they were the only country that did not cut any spending during COVID. Okay, so they are massively in debt. And probably about to hit a extremely high period of inflation that hasn't happened in Japan for, like, a really long time. Uh, but, okay, let's go back. Like, even then, you know, the classic aging aging workforce, aging population, no one's having kids in Japan, it's not exactly the post-war economic miracle anymore, right? Like, w do you think people who are actually really afraid of all of these producers who can't afford to lose money on a project are going to spend money on a big, risky movie that's going to mean... I mean, they don't physically have the money to fund it for three years. They'd have to borrow all that money to fund it for three years. What bank is going to loan them that money? No one. It's not going to happen. Like, what do you think? It's just not going to happen. It's got nothing to do with some guy, director, deciding to do it. It's, it's just no one wants to fund it. I don't know how, that, how I ever fucking listened to this guy as if they had anything serious to say. I don't want games with dialogue choices that actually matter. Although I play visual novels, if you put dialogue choices that actually matter in your game, I'm looking up a fucking guide for that shit, motherfucker. Yeah. You think I'm gonna sit here and make a decision based on my own personal preferences? Yeah. Fuck no. Because I've done that before, and I'm like, oh, I didn't want to go down this route. I'm looking up a fucking guide every time. There's... You know, there's a part of, of being in, in the, the otaku culture, fandom culture, anything, just going to cons, which is an experience that I don't understand. And I think it's because, somehow, despite living in literally the biggest city in Europe, there are, there are cons, and they all suck. <laughs> At least the ones I've been to. 
which is mainly the big MCM Comic Con. And you might be like, well, of course Comic Con has nothing to do with anime. What do you mean? Why would you go to Comic Con and think you're going to find otaku things there? Everyone seems to believe that Comic Con is for otaku. Because you look at, I mean, I'm telling you, look it up. Look up L- London Comic Con on YouTube. 80% of the cosplayers are cosplaying some weeb shit. Okay, I just looked this up because I was like, I wonder if I missed something here. I saw fucking, you know, bitches from My Hero Academia. I saw a couple of Asukas. I saw a Madoka cosplay. I saw Ram and Ram. You know, most of the cosplay is anime related. The majority. And I'm not even saying I would guess. Like, it's clear. You can just see in any footage of people walking around the, the floor. It's most people are uh, in anime-related cosplay. There's, uh, you know, the occasional video game character. There's no comics. <laughs> no one's there to do anything about comics. But then the actual stalls that are at Comic-Con also just have nothing to do with anything. They're just like random Instagram artists selling bullshit. It, it's all a scam. Like, there's clearly, they're trying to be everything. They're trying to be everything. They want to be the anime con, they want to be like, they call themselves comic con, but they're trying to be just like, le nerd culture convention. Um, I've been here once before, I could only ever find the most normy anime posters. And looking now, even though, you know, from the cosplayers, there's a diversity of anime fans that attend this con, there's nothing for them. No one is willing to give them anything to buy that would be related to their hobby. And this is the biggest Comic-Con, or the biggest convention, like, nerd convention in London. There is another convention, which is called the Anime and Gaming Convention. Now, this one I have not been to, because I'm pretty sure it's a more recent development. But it happens in February, and I'm probably going to try and go. Uh, But I'm going to look up footage of last year's Anime and Gaming Convention. Because this one is more anime-centric, right? But, like, I don't know why anyone would ever go to a Comic-Con. Like, the point that has always eluded me, because you just buy things, right? Like, that's, isn't that the point? You go with your friends, or you meet people? No one meets people. I don't see people striking out conversations with random-ass people, right? Um, so I don't really understand. Like, if, you, if it was, like, BronyCon, that would make sense. BronyCon makes sense to me, because, because everyone's a brony. The only merch on sale there is Brody shed. Every, you know, like, it's a very tight-knit community, so it makes sense, all centered around one thing. But, like, having Comic-Con just be anything that is related to, like, whatever passes as nerd culture, which is, like, by the way, you know, Mar- everything from, like, Dungeons & Dragons, Marvel movies, which is, I don't know how that counts, um, Funko Pops... Random, like, shit you would see at a Ren fair. Um, and then just Instagram artists that, that have nothing to do with anything. Uh, and then people who cosplay just to walk around in cosplay. Like, what's the point of that? I don't understand. And then YouTubers? There's always YouTubers there? I don't know. It's a fucking weird-ass thing. So, but I might sound retarded here, because I'm, you know, you're saying, why? well, of course, Comic-Con is not going to be the anime convention. You should go to the anime convention. What I'm trying to get across to you is, I understand that now, but I'm not alone, because clearly everyone seems to think that Comic-Con is the anime convention, because everyone's cosplaying anime characters. This is what I'm trying to tell you. It's like, this isn't just like, I don't know why this assumption exists, but it clearly does, because everyone's doing it. Um, and they 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 try and like pay some lip service to to the existence of anime at at this comic con, right? Like they have they have like the the sort of cool Japan shops. Oh, we sell Japanese sweets, and and you know you can buy Pokari sweat here and or whatever, right? Like they try and paste some lip. You can pay you know ten times the normal price for some fucking uh, takoyaki. Or something, right? So there's clearly some understanding that there's something going on here, but no one wants to just 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 make it. So yeah, the other the, there's this other like anime and gaming convention, um, and and this one I think would seem better 
So I'm gonna, I guess I'm gonna try and go to this, but I want to see footage of it. Uh, hold on. So fortunately, there's a video on YouTube of someone going through every single stall at the previous London Anime and Gaming Con 2022. And uh, firstly, it's way smaller than Comic Con. It is tiny as far as conventions go, which I suppose is why I'd never heard of it before. And secondly, if you are a massive fan of My Hero Academia, Dragon Ball, and Demon Slayer, there is infinite merch for you. If you like any other show, you will not find anything. I think I, like, I think I saw nothing. He went through every, I mean, this video goes through every single stall. I can see everything for sale on every single stall. I did, I don't think I saw a single thing that I would buy. There was, like, a fucking body pillow. Uh, okay, here's the only, here's the only things that, that looked like maybe. There was, there was a, a stall selling body pillows. And they had, listen, they have balls, okay? Because they were selling a canna from fucking Dragon Maid body pillow, Daki Makura. It wasn't a very lewd design, but still, doing that in London at a, at a fucking anime con... Is, it's relatively ballsy. Um, they also had Nezuko from from Demon Slayer, so I don't know. I don't know. I I, I commend the balls on that. Neither of them were particular. You know, they were very safe designs. But uh, sure, I would never buy them. Firstly, because I don't really need one. But secondly, because they uh, they look. I've seen enough body pillows in my time to know when one looks like it's terrible fucking quality. And they looked like they were very terrible quality. There's also a stall selling figures, which they seem to have quite a lot of figures. And the video quality is too low for me to really see all of them. So it's possible that there's some good figures being sold at this one stall. Let me just reiterate that. There is one stall that sells actual figures. There was a Funko Pop stall as well, but that doesn't count. Um, I mean, I see... Anything interesting? I mean, the video is like fucking 360p. Oh, it, wait. Why am I in such low quality? It's in 1080. It's in 4K. I could I could get it up to 4K. Okay, hold on. Now let's take a look at this, these figures. Now that I can actually make them out. Um, Gurren Lagan. That that's kind of cool. Maybe. Uh, is that Bonnie Girl Senpai? Wait, is is that Sakura from Card Cap? I would buy a Card Cap to Sakura figure. That's kind of cool. If that is, I can't really tell because it's small in the background. But it kind of looks like Kinamoto Sakura from Card Captor Sakura. Um, Black Butler. I can't really tell what that is. Um, there's a bunch of stuff in the back that I can't really see either. Um, uh, it's it's hard to tell what these are because the, they're kind of in the distance. Gintoki. I can't tell. Well, maybe there would be, like, a figure I'd be interested in buying. I don't know. I don't really have anywhere to put figures. Uh, but that's the other possibility, is that there might be, like, one overpriced figure that I'd be interested in buying. I mean, remember that these... Let's make this clear. Nothing... It's not like you would go to a con to get a cheaper deal on something. Like, anything you could buy at a con, you could definitely buy online for cheaper. Um, so I don't really know why anyone does it. I'm trying to think of, like, what even theoretically would be at a con that I would buy. Because these cons, they're too small, and the general anime-going public is too normy to... Or I don't know what it is. The people who are willing to set up shop at cons are too normy to sell any merch for something that isn't, you know, one of the most popular anime. Because they're like, why would I do that? It wouldn't sell. Uh, which is a strange way to go about things, because I know that in America they have anime conventions where they sell actual anime merch instead of just merch for four shows and Pokemon. There's also a bunch of booths that just have nothing to do with anime or gaming, by the way. I'm, I'm not going to go through and list every single booth in the video, but a bunch of them are just, like, random jewelry that has nothing to do with anything or, you know, just stuff. I don't know, just stuff. And a bunch of the, the Artist Alley people, I mean, are just bad. Just just sub-fucking-par. Uh, but yeah, there's there's nothing... This this shit does not look good. This is what I'm trying to tell you, right? Is why 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 is this the case? Why can't there just be like I know for a fact that you go to a fucking anime convention in a real country, and they have you know even some of the more popular shows that I like, 
right? Like like No Game No Life or Evangelion or or I don't know Lane these days is popular or um, I don't know. I like some shows. Like Log Horizon, that's a good show. That's popular. I think it was popular at one point. Um, is it, is it fucking Steins Gate. Steins Gate's a good show. That's po- that's like one of the most popular anime. I like Steins Gate. No Steins Gate much. <sighs> There's this. It's so disappointing. It's so disappointing because you hear about this being a thing when you're when you're listening to. Americans talk about it, or Japanese people. I mean, do I just have to go to Comicat? <laughs> Is this my only option? Do I just have to go to Comicat? That doesn't sound fun. It sounds honestly, this. I think I'm too autistic to go to Comicat. There are just too many fucking people. It sounds like hell. Uh, I mean, I guess it's technically possible to do. I'll th- I, that'll be a life goal of mine. To go to Comic Cat one day, but you know what? What do they sell at Comic Cat? They sell fucking doujins, right? Do you think Customs is gonna get me back into the UK with any of the doujins I want? No, they're not gonna let me do that. So I don't know what the fuck I'm. Yeah, I just watched a uh, a ContraPoints Patreon video. Don't worry, I do not Patreon ContraPoints. There are ways to S- surprise. It is possible to pirate content on the internet. Um, not that I, not that there's anything wrong with patroning ContraPoints, it's just I don't patron people, because why would I give money to people? That's stupid. Um, now look, I think the video is good, it's fine, it is what it is. I, no one, none of you have watched it, because none of you are going to bother to seek out some random ContraPoints Patreon video. But, the video is like a pretty standard and accurate recap of Gaming 8. It comments on something which I've thought about, and I also haven't seen anyone mention, so I'm really glad that ContraPoints also points this out, which is that all the techniques um, that were sort of first popularized and developed in Gamergate for online harassment have gone on to become the normalized weaponry of so-called cancel culture. Like, cancel culture originated with Gamergate. The first big online harassment campaign was Gamergate, and all of those techniques that were developed for Gamergate, I mean, yeah. So that's something I think that's worth pointing out. Uh, and I'm glad that Contra points that out, because uh, most people seem to not talk about that. But I will give, I think it's generally a well-rounded uh, understanding of the topic, but I will give one final thing, which she almost touches on, but then, like, doesn't quite go that far. Um, you know, she says, for example, that uh, there's there's a lot of, like, male fear about, like, people invading your spaces or, or some sort of historical, almost trauma response to, you, you know, mom taking your video games away, which I think is accurate. Um, like, oh, you know, I have this space, I don't want people to come in, I don't want, I don't want invaders to come in and change my space. Like, I think this is an accurate, like, yeah. But she, she, she couches, she says this is like a male thing. Uh, Which is, you know, maybe, you know, whatever, but I think it misses something. And then she also says, like, bear in mind a lot of these people are, like, teenagers at the time and they're stupid, which is also true. But let's be very concrete here, okay? Most of the 4chan users who were super invested in Gamergate were literally autistic children, okay? (laughs) Like, the it's, it's not just that they were male, it's that they were autistic, right? They don't, they have something they like and they don't want it to change. That is the fundamental thing. And they don't understand, they're teenagers with no understandings of, you know, economic pressures or, you know, how industries develop or anything like this. So they see this fear that the thing they like, video games, is not going to stay the same forever, right? Which is true. I mean, to be honest, there's a part of Gamergate that was correct, which is that uh, the fear that games were going to be shit is true. Games became shit. Triple A single player games in the West became shit in the you know in the years following Gamergate. Uh, at least that's the, how I see it. I'm not you know I don't play those sorts of games very much, but it seems like every time a new Triple A single player game that's not Japanese comes out, everyone shits on it, uh, right? Like all the big companies, they either stopped making games like like because they they just have like some cash cow that they can endlessly milk. Or they switch to making cash grab loot box multiplayer games. Uh, or they, you know, just make the same game over and over again. But slightly worse each time with slightly better graphics. And consoles, you know, have sort of had hit the diminishing returns on, you know, advances in graphics technology and so on. So, like, yeah. And But most importantly, right, as games have become... As expectations for what a AAA game means and technology have developed... 
like it's expected that a new AAA game will be the technological peak of what the hardware can handle. But uh, the amount of labor hours required to create that game has not decreased, right? It's still just as difficult to make that many textures and models and la lines of dialogue and big space, you know, environments and all of this stuff, right? It's just as difficult to create that stuff as it was in the 90s. Mm. But now gamers expect that there will be a super ambitious, you know, everything has to be massive. And so staffs on these games have ballooned, you know, budgets are insane and every game has to, like, there's just so much financial pressure riding on each game that no one wants to take any risks. It's the same sort of thing that happens in Hollywood. I mean, this is just what happens when industries are worth a lot of money and create products with, uh, you know, high development costs and, and so on. Uh, it's really a matter of economics. It doesn't have anything to do with feminism. Uh, but yeah, like in some sense, the, the autistic 4chan children saw this happening, right? They saw the beginnings of, like, hold on, the games industry is changing. Like, it's no longer the case. I mean, you have to remember, right, that the, the 2D games on, like, the NES and whatever were made by, like, five-person teams. And then you get to the early 3D games, they're very small studios that would currently be considered, like, small for an indie developer, Right? Like, even some of the best games ever, like, it's not irresponsible to say, for example, that, like, basically two people made Doom, right? Like, yeah, a lot of other people worked on it, but basically two people made Doom, right? Like, it's it's not that dif that difficult to say that. Whereas, you know, you take modern games, and there's literally thousands of people that work on these things. Um, so, you know, there's an essence of, like, authorial intent and oversight, and, I mean, the industry changes. Like, it, 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 it massively changed. And that period was a time when these changes became very noticeable, right? Because because these games had to become more ambitious, they also had to start branching out in terms of marketing. Like, you can't sustain an industry that needs to make that much money by just appealing to a niche of hardcore gamer fan base, right? And so... The, the industry branched out and started marketing towards a broader public, which meant making games for different niches, for different demographics, and so on, um, and broader appeal games and all of these things, which was like, hold on a minute, this thing that used to be just for us is now for a bunch of other people because the industry is trying to become bigger because we keep demanding games with bit better graphics and whatever. And as much as, you know, gamers have always been gamers' worst enemies, because every game that's terrible always gets pre-ordered by a million billion people and makes a million billion dollars, and no one really understands who's doing this. Uh, but it happens. Uh, I don't know why. Um, I just keep playing fucking Team Fortress 2, so I don't know, it doesn't worry me. Although that game, I mean, hey, that's another example of a game being mistreated by its developer. So, you know, the, 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 the real heart of the issue is, for most people, like, some industry they like changing might be, like, sad, but it's not that much of a big deal. But if you're an autistic child who's never had to deal with this sort of thing before, uh, this is, like, the biggest deal ever. Your hyperfixation is literally being taken away from you. Like, the thing that you're specifically fixated on is changing and you have no power over it. And so, of course you're going to fucking lash out because, you know, that's something like the, 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 the fixations are something more than just hobbies, right? Like it's something, it becomes sort of more of a defining part of your, your personality or identity or something like this. And Contra does mention this, but I think the autism is a big angle here. The autism and the, 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 the fact that there are teenagers, like the fact that it's all autistic teenagers, like as as an uh, autist, right? Like I don't want, I don't like it when things change. I like, I also like it when things stay the same, right? Things staying the same, that's good because I already like the thing. I'm fine if things I don't like change because then they might change to become more like things I like. But if something I like, I just wanted to say stay how it is. You know, if it if something I like starts changing, I'm like, what are you doing? It was already good. Stop changing. Stop changing. Um, and so that you know, the, to me, it's very understandable how. A bunch of people would see the thing they like start to change, right? They could, even if they couldn't articulate it, they could sense that the industry, the gaming industry, was changing, again because of economic factors, not because of ideological factors. Um, and they could also, and part of that change meant, you know, trying to diversify the uh, 
demographic groups that games were appealing to, and they, you know, got the causality backwards and were like, it's those demographic groups that are ruining games, rather than it's the fucking, you know, it's capitalism. <laughs> it's not really capitalism, though, because games are not, like, this idea that games were ruined is fucking nonsense, right? There are more better games coming out right now than there ever have been. It's just that they're mostly indie games uh, or smaller you know, games. Like, there's this, the meme of, of like, uh, oh, I, I want shorter games with worth graphics made by fewer people who are paid less to work, paid more to work less, and I'm, and I'm not joking. You know that meme? Right? Which is, it's obviously a meme because these people don't actually believe this, right? Because every time a new Pokemon game comes out for the Nintendo Switch, it is exactly what they're asking for. It's a game made by a bunch of people who were paid way too much to make a dog shit game, uh, you know, on the quick, for no money, the graphics suck, the gameplay sucks, and it's too short. They never celebrate those games, right? What they want is fucking, you know, artistic, uh, they, they, they just want to play, uh, what's, what's the boomer shooter one that everyone likes called? Yeah, they just want to play Ultra Kill, and that's fine, Ultra Kill's probably a good game. You can, you can enjoy Ultra Kill, there's nothing wrong with Ultra Kill. Uh, they just want to play, they just want to play Ultra Kill and Celeste, like, over and over again. They want every game to be Ultra Kill and Celeste. Which is fine, like, those, there's nothing wrong with those games. I don't personally like Celeste. I haven't played Ultra Kill, um, but I'd probably like it. Um, and then, that's fine. There, there didn't used to be games like Ultra Kill and Celeste. They are a new thing. Like, the boomer shooter in, in terms of, like, how people think of it in modern times isn't actually, like, what Hexen or Doom or Quake uh, you know, were like. You know, it's actually, you know, I've played all those games, and they're not, like, they're not, some of them, there are some modern boomer shooters that try hard to, to really emulate the game design of those older games, and honestly, they're worse for it, because a lot of that game design stuff is, like, you've played Doom, everyone's played Doom, right, you've played Doom, you know that you play Doom, and then you kill all the enemies in the level, and then you spend ten minutes wandering around, like, where the fuck do I go, I've got the blue key card. where's the fucking blue door, that is not fun, like, that sucks, I don't like, that's the worst part of those games, and sometimes there are boomer shooters on Steam that you can find that are otherwise great, you know, have great gunplay and, and all of this stuff, and look great, and sound great, and everything, but they, re- they recreate that part of the game, and I don't like that part of the game. I don't think anyone likes that part of the game. Uh, I mean, I've heard some people defend it, and they're like, oh, you get this moment of quiet contemplation. It's not quiet contemplation, it's frustration. I'm like, I just want, at that point, I just want to fucking, you know, get teleported out of the level, because I already beat it. I already killed everyone. There's nothing else to do in the game. You know, I'd like the, oh, what do I do, where do I go part is always the worst thing. This is why games have, like, these stupid mini-maps where they just put an icon, because no one wants to get, like, that's the worst part of a game is when you just get lost and wander around. And all the old boomer shooters are fucking full of that shit, uh, which is a good thing that modern-style boom, modern style boomer shooters don't, don't do that. They're, they're better designed. They have a more linear level design, which is, you know, a, a, even though it's aesthetically worse, is better for gameplay. That's just my personal opinion. But yeah, there's more and better games coming out now than there ever have been. There's actually way too many good games. It's actually a problem. There are so many unique games made by like really small teams or even single people coming out on Steam uh, and itch, itch.io that they just get lost and no one ever plays them. And it's actually quite sad because uh, people will pour you know, months and months or years of their lives into making some project and there's just so many games that just gets drowned out. Uh, and it's, you know... Once in a while, some indie game, you know, manages to, to, to become viral and stand out among the crowd. But for every single one that got noticed, there's like five that were equally good and that just no one ever played. Or that, that were like, there's a, there was a screenshot going around of like a Reddit post where some, some indie dev, he spent, or, or they, they spent like three years making this game, but then on release, it had a few bugs. And so it instantly got downvoted and like bad reviews because, you know... It had, ba- it had pretty significant bugs on release. The developer, you know, very quickly patched those bugs, but it was too late. You, the release had already been downvoted, and so it didn't, no one's, you know, it's too late. You, you only get one first impression. Um, like, this is the thing that happens when you don't have the money to pay for a QA team. You know, like, there's, that stuff's going to happen. And it's like, okay, that game is just dead now. Now, I looked up the game, and it didn't look very good. But, uh, you know, that's the sort of thing that can happen, and that is sad. I've kind of gone off of a, off of off fucking track here. I wasn't supposed to be talking about this. I was supposed to be talking about ethics in games journalism. <laughs> anyway, that's what I'm trying to point out, right? It's about autism. You can't talk about any fucking 4chan event 
without mentioning the fact that everyone on 4chan is fucking autistic. What's the deal with the Norman urge to turn every anime character into a floating signifier? What is what is with that urge? I don't understand it. They see a character... I think it's because... Listen, okay, this is my theory. I think that this is a phenomenon from Tumblr. Because when you're a fandom on Tumblr or in fandom culture, a lot of it is about, like, fix. And, like, taking the characters out of the work they're from and just mangling them to the point where they barely have any resemblance to the thing they originally started as. I'm not saying that that's necessarily bad, it's just a different way of going about things. But, like, a lot of fandom culture, particularly the type of thing that is popular on Tumblr, everything from Supernatural and BBC Sherlock to Steven Universe, they take, you know, some character, and after a while, the show... Like, it's it's about being, you know, you're in the show's fandom, right? It doesn't really matter that, like, I mean, I don't know anything about Steven Universe, but, like, it doesn't really matter that, like, X character from Steven Universe isn't, like, in a lesbian relationship with other X character from Steven Universe. You just convince yourself that it's true, because the show's not very good, and that makes it more entertaining for you. Because when you're in a fandom... You're not really in the fandom for the work itself. You're, the fandom becomes its own thing, which is why it's always bad when shows acknowledge and become driven by their own fandoms, like BBC Sherlock or parts of MLP, for example. Um, you know, and I'm not so. You know, sometimes you've got such. I don't know. That's kind of beyond the scope of this. But like, there's. I, I think that this is a, a, a real phenomenon, right? Where after a while, like after a few seasons of some TV show that everyone's in a fandom or, you know, your your friend group is all in a fandom of, not just fans of, in a fandom of, the fandom starts to realize the TV show was never that good and doesn't really care and just starts doing its own sort of thing and thereby, you know, re- removing all of the bad aspects from the show, replacing them with whatever they like, and just keeping whatever random thing that they particularly personally liked, right? Like, for example, I've heard a lot of these... Actually, I don't, I don't know if that's necessarily relevant. But y- do you understand where I'm coming from here? Like, part of this particular brand of fandom culture is about this turning a character into... Like, from a character in a piece of work that exists only inside of the story into just a signifier for whatever the fandom has decided they're a signifier for, right? Like, I'm trying to think of an example, but I'm not really familiar enough with anything popular and fandom-y to know anything. Uh, A lot of it, it turns into sex stuff, right? Like, this character's a lesbian, this character's gay, this character's in a relationship with this character. A lot of it's stuff like that, right? Like, it becomes fan, like, such strong canon within the fandom that the show itself stops really mattering. I think this generally happens with fandoms that revolve around one particular show, not people who revolve around, like, a particular hobby or genre, like other sort of nerdy culture groups, right? Like, mystery novel fans or something like this don't do that, or anime fans don't do that, or, um, you know, gaming fans... They don't normally do that, right? Like, it's it's when you're a fan of, like, one particular fandom work. Because, yeah, this sort of thing happens. And um, I think that it's people who have come from that culture and then discovered things like Lane. Because I've seen Toho fans do similar things, right? Like, the characters in Toho games are barely characterized, right? Like, Toho's story to the extent that it even has one, is like a few lines of dialogue in every game, right? It has a very bare-bones characterization, very bare-bones story. But there are so many fan works that canonize, you know, the elements of these characters or the world in ways that the games don't really do because that's just kind of necessary to, to be in the Toho fandom. And I think Tohos are subject to this process where they just sort of become, like... Like, seeing a fucking, you know, Fumo of, of a, 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 a some Toho character 
it doesn't really matter about the game. Fumos are their own meme, right? But I think that starts to become weird when they apply it to anime stuff that I actually know about and like or understand the culture of. Because anime and otaku culture doesn't have this really to the same extent, right? Like otaku aren't super into... I mean, there's doujins, right? Like obviously doujin culture is a, is a massive thing. But I think that's that's kind of a different. I think that's a different. It's, it, I, I don't know how to explain it. It feels very different to me. Like like fan doujins of some anime or work or whatever, even though they bear a lot of similarities and resemblance to Western fanfic culture. To me, the difference is no one pretends that doujins are real, whereas everyone seems to pretend that fanfics create pseudo canon which is an odd phenomenon to me but like it's strange when i see characters stripped of all of their identity and sort of flanderized is maybe one way to put it but it's not even flanderization again they just become floating signifiers the 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 classic example of this which i think i mentioned earlier in this episode of the slice of life podcast now available on the back with no thank you channel and also no thank you to neocities.org is uh, the 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 lane bimbo pilled image right there's this image um, the Im- image of, of of lane I mean it comes from Tumblr it has a link to a Tumblr blog um, yeah it's basically the uh, like I've seen Tumblr people reject this there's a, there's been a backlash to this recently on Tumblr in the fr- in the form of the phrase uh, they would not fucking say that. That is the form of the phrase that has, that has come to, to symbolize this rejection, where, where things just get turned into floating signifiers and purely aesthetics, purely images, separated from their narrative context or their personalities. Right? Like, Lane no longer means anything regarding Lane. Lane is just like a, a floating signifier that can really be applied to, attached to anything you want to attach it to. You know, for many people, Lane is a symbol of like, I mean, it, it could be anything, right? Like, like a lot of, a lot of people signify Lane as, as sort of something similar to a messy girl archetype, right? Like someone who drinks and smokes and uh, takes too many Xanax and, uh, you know, this sort of thing, which is in fact the opposite of what Lane is in the show. Lane is absolutely not like that in the show, um, <clears throat> which is just strange. But I've seen this happen with a few characters. I think it's happened sort of with Ayuma Kasuga from um, Azamanga Dayo, um, where she, she's just sort of brought up as an image that vaguely references anime nostalgia rather than as her character in the show. But there's also some aspect by which her character is stays around as being you know a knucklehead as they call it in the show it's uh, slow and spacey um but i've also seen this happen to a few bocce the rock characters and that's weird because bocce the rock is like just came out <laughs> basically like bocce the rock is a very recent show it's strange that the bocce the rock characters are already undergoing this transformation so quickly um i don't know what that's about uh yeah i don't see it I mean, I guess it kind of happened... So the thing is, sometimes anime creators do this sort of thing with their own works, but it kind of pogs when that happens. I'm talking about when... Basically, when when works get slice-of-life spin-offs, right? Like, the Fate... All of the stuff that's happened with Fate. Like, I, I don't know shit about Fate. I've never watched a Fate anime other than... Well, I mean, I have watched quite a lot of Fate anime, but that's actually relevant. I've never read the visual novel, and I've never watched any of the mainline Fate anime, but I have watched most of Prisma Ilya, uh, mainly because I think it's really funny to have only watched most of Prisma Ilya rather than all of the Fate stuff. Prisma Ilya is not good, by the way. This is my opinion. There are some parts of Prisma Ilya which are okay, like the first three episodes of the first season are, are like, okay. They're kind of good. When it's slightly more lighthearted and comedy-focused, then it just sort of turns into a really bad melodrama. And then I think there's like a, a couple of OVAs that I thought were okay. But Fate, the Prismaly is not that good. But the thing is, Prismaly is not related to Fate in any real way other than sharing characters who aren't even really themselves. I don't know. Like, this sort of thing happens, is what I'm trying to say. It's like Isekai Quartet 
or um, I don't know any show that has a, a chibi comedy spin-off OVA thing or like I don't know I don't really know what I'm talking about anymore I've kind of gone lost in my own source a lot of these things are both true and untrue I never liked those things personally but then there's the phenomenon of the anime reaction image, which is also an interesting thing that this requires further study. So I've been watching this anime called Vivid Red Operation, um, and honestly, it's good. I, I, I was going to record a laying around watching while watching it, but then I started to feel really bad, so I didn't really have anything to say. This might be my favorite A1 Pictures show. Uh... I'm trying to think. What other A1 Pictures show do I like that's actually good? I don't think I like any of them. I'm looking through. Oh, Botoko is okay. It's not great. Um, oh, Aramanga Sensei is probably better. I probably like Aramanga Sensei more. Uh, what else is, did A1 make? Working. Oh, Demi Chan wa Katade Tai. That's it. That's it. It's a pretty good show. I like that show. Um, fucking. Shelter sucks, okay. I don't know why everyone likes Shelter, the music video. Bad song, bad video. I'm still looking. I still haven't seen Soro no Oto. A lot of people say Soro no Oto is good. Denpa Kyoshi is, Denpa Kyoshi is, is pretty good. It's 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 okay. Also, the Idol Master is supposed to be good. I I think um, Artificial Night Sky is a big I, I Idol Master fan. So that makes me kind of want to watch Idol Master because they have good taste, generally speaking. Uh, I'm still looking. I still don't see shit. I mean, there's a couple of good shows, but I haven't seen I haven't seen some of them. Right. The reason I haven't watched Idol Master is because I don't really like Idol music. Like, wait, they made Vivid. A1 made Nanoha Vivid. I guess it does look like an A1 show. Nanoha Vivid's pretty good. Uh, I'm still looking. They've made so much fucking anime. Holy shit. They pump out like six shows every season. Or at least they used to. Okay, now we're reaching the bottom of the barrel. This is the stuff that no one's ever seen. Fucking... Oh, didn't they make Slow Start? Oh, no, that was Silverlink, right? They made some... They did some Slow Start, like, weird net OVA type thing. Chibi type spinoff. Anyway, kind of got distracted there. But anyway, I like this show, okay? I like this show quite a lot, at least so far. I'm, I'm on episode 7. If it ends in some stupid, dumb way, then it, then that will ruin it. But this show, Vivid Red Operation, I've been meaning to watch it for, for a while. Because, as you know, if you've been paying attention to the last few episodes of the Slice of Life podcast, um, I tried to watch every Strike Witches anime. And succeeded, by the way. All of the real ones. I didn't, I didn't watch Luminous Witches. I dropped it because it was just so god-awful. <laughs> I couldn't bring myself to watch Luminous Witches. Like, I, I got to, like, episode two, and it was just so bad. It had so much, like, unearned pathos, and just, like... Like, it's not even just that. Like, it's not even just the pathos was unearned, right? Like, that that's a common problem in anime, is when... I used to call it p- pointless melodrama, right? Like, they just can't think of anything to do, so they just take... Comes out of nowhere... It doesn't mean anything. It happens to characters you don't care about, and it, it's, it happens way too early in the story, and it, it doesn't really have any consequences other than just, like, as a, a thing to try and, like, vaguely push the plot forward. This is what I call pointless melodrama, but it's probably a better word is unearned pathos. But that's, like, the normal version of it. Luminous Witches is particularly bad because it's also, like, just bad melodrama like it's it, the melodrama just doesn't it doesn't even make any real sense and it's executed very badly to the point where it's almost comedic but it's mostly just extremely boring the show is just really fucking boring anyway i've watched all of the other mainline world witches series so every season of strike witches all of the movies brave witches and the ovas but i haven't seen all of the uh there are a few seasons that are like short episode, half length episodes, and I haven't seen those. So, uh, but other than that, I'm yeah, you know, pretty well educated in the Strike Witches department. And when I was researching Strike Witches, there's two other shows that came up, right? Like as it, as being related or similar. One of them is Sky Girls because it was made by the same creator of Strike Witches, but before Strike Witches, and it's pretty. Uh, much considered to be like a proto strike which is anime which I'm probably going to watch at some point and the other one is Vivid Red Operation which is often claimed to be quite similar to Strike Witches so I've 
gotten around to watching it because my friend told me to watch it. And it's actually, I'm going to go ahead and say it. I think this is literally better than Strike Witches, at least the first season. I think Vivid Red Operation so far is better than the first season of Strike Witches. The second season of Strike Witches is, is really good, but I know I'm liking this a lot. It has a really low rating on Mal. It has a 6.44 on Mal, but Mal retards don't fucking know anything. Okay, I would give this like a strong 7, at least so far. Strong 7 to light 8. Almost even a light 8. Light 8 might be pushing it, but we're talking like a, a very strong like 7.8, 7.9 type of territory for me. I'm, I'm a big fan of this show. I like it a lot so far. But really, it, although the comparison to Strike Witches is obvious, it's more like Nanoha meets Strike Witches, because this show is much more influenced by Mao Shoujo than Strike Witches, right? Like, Strike Witches falls squarely in the Mecha Musume genre, whereas I would call Vivid Red Operation more of a military Maho Shoujo anime than a Mecha Musume anime. Um, and I, I like my, some, some Maho Shoujo stuff, you know, I, I haven't seen enough of it, but I, I like some of the I like some of the Maho Shoujo songs. Uh, songs? <laughs> I think I was referencing I like some of the Gaga songs. Um, yeah, I like some of the Maho Shoujo anime. I like uh, fucking Sakura and Fun Fun Pharmacy, Fushigi Maho Fun Fun Pharmacy, and probably some other things. I don't know. I don't like a lot of it, though. I'm not as Maho Shoujo pilled as a lot of people. Uh, mostly because the shows are just way too fucking long and episodic. Like, this is why I like the otaku-oriented Maho Shoujo's, because they tend to be one core anime, maybe two core anime, whereas the, the, the real Maho Shoujo... They're always, like, you know, 50 fucking episodes long, and half the episodes are just the same episode over and over again. And it's fine to have an episodic show. Like, there's nothing wrong with that. But uh, it just is, makes it kind of a slog to get through. Because they also do have overarching plots. It's just that the overarching plots take so fucking long to happen. Because each episode is just, like, you know, the same Monster of the Week type thing. And then you get, like... T- like the first, the first like fifty episodes of any Mao Shoujo is just the same monster of the week thing, and then episode fifty, you get like uh, suddenly a hint at a bigger storyline, and then that goes nowhere for another fifty episodes, right? And then you get, a, a, but every like three episodes, they'll just remind you that this exists, like that character that was important will show up in the background making a menacing face or something like this, and then you get a hundred episodes in, and then the show just completely changes into like now we don't care about the monster of the week thing or that's completed we're now actually focusing on our uh like overarching plot and concluding it and that's just a bit of a slog it's just kind of annoying to get through i don't want to have to watch a hundred episodes of a show just to get through the plot um well something like nanoha like the first season of nanoha is not great right but even though it's very repetitive it's only 24 episodes i think I think it's 24. Um, yeah. No, it's only 13 anime. 13 episodes. It's only 13 episodes, right? So even though, like, you know, at least seven, I think, if I remember correctly, seven of those 13 episodes are just, like, the Monster of the Week stuff, you get, and they're very, they're very repetitive. The, the, the first few and the last few episodes are, like, really good plot-driven stuff. Or well, not really good, actually, that's... That's too strong of a phrase. Things happen in them. <laughs> um, but A's is obviously the best part of Nanoha, if you don't count Vivid Strike. Uh, but yeah, Vivid Red Operation reminds me a lot of Nanoha, uh, because it has this, the same sort of magical girl swag, Maho Shoujo swag. It has the same Maho Shoujo swag as Nanoha does. It's weird that Nanoha has a 7.4... This is season 1 of Nanoha. 7.41 of Mal, and Vivid Red, 6.44. It's almost a whole point lower which is insane because to me vivid red is much better or at least somewhat better um a is having a higher score i understand but the first season of nanoha having had such a high score i don't know people do really like nanoha um honestly i need to get i I need to give another shot of like getting through all of nanoha because i gave up i was trying to watch all of nanoha at one point and i gave up at Strikers, I got two episodes into Strikers, and it, I I thought it was sucked. It had the same unearned pathos thing that I was talking about just now. Like I thought, I thought Strikers kind of fucking blew, and then I never watched Vivid. But then I did watch Vivid Strike, and I really liked Vivid Strike a lot. Um, 
although for some reason I only gave it a five. <laughs> I'm, this is the thing about anime, right? Is that sometimes after I finish watching a show, I'm like, yeah, that was okay. And then I realize that it's very meaningful to me like ages later because I always think about Vivid Strike. Like, I, I'm i constantly thinking about it. The, the fucking bully, bully comeuppance scene in Vivid Strike is, like, one of the best things in any anime ever. Like, it goes crazy fucking hard. Or, like, some of the fight scenes and the fight choreography in, in Vivid Strike is fucking great. So, I gave it a 5 when I watched it, but, like, th- in terms of how much... It, this happens all the time. The same thing happened with Kamichu. Like, after I finished Kamichu, I was like, that was a good show, but it's a bit too tonally inconsistent for me to really give a high score. And so... And some of the episodes are a bit, you know, too wacky for me. So, I gave it, like, a 7 when I first finished watching it. But then, over, like, a year after finishing it, I realized that I was constantly fucking thinking about that show, because it has so much unique charm and, like intrigue to it or not not intrigue but like uh there's there's so much in in kamichu that you just can't find in any other anime uh and it's executed so well even though it's like kind of amateurish in certain points that kind of adds to the charm in my opinion like the first episode i think it's the first episode of kamichu where where there's this storm coming and the storm just has Yurie's fucking face on it, like, poorly drawn. I looks. I, I remember watching it and being like, that looks terrible. This is like, they didn't even try. But looking back on it, you know, I'm like, that is fucking crazy that they did that. That's really cool. Like, you never, that's something that you've never seen in other anime. Like, rather than, it just looks stylized to me, you know, thinking back on it. So I ended up raising Kamichu's score, you know, po- posthumously, uh... It, to to be like one of my favorite anime of all time, I think Vivid Strike is a similar situation, right? Like when I finished it, obviously Vivid Strike has a bunch of narrative problems, uh, but you know, it, and it's it gets a little boring at times. Like I'm not here to say it's a fucking ten out of ten show, but I I don't know I think I'm gonna raise the score to like a, a fucking maybe I should rewatch it before I consider raising the score. But it's like, I think that raising it to a 6 is probably good enough, right? Like, there's some good-ass shit in that show. It doesn't deserve a 5. Yeah. I don't know, man. I need to... Nanoha, I need another... I need to give Nanoha another fucking shot. Because I I know, like, a lot of stuff about Nanoha I really like. The only problem with it is that the show gets in the way of me liking it. (laughs) Like, the movies are fucking amazing. I love the movies. Anyway, Vivid Red Operation. Honestly... All of the characters, like, the first five episodes are just, like, spent basically getting the gang together, right? Like, you know in a heist movie how, like, the first half of the movie is, like, I'm assembling a team, you know? (laughs) It's kind of like that. The first five episodes each is dedicated to introducing a new character. But then when they get to the fifth character, it's like, oh, actually, this is the plot moment. Like, actually something special is going on with this particular character. And they're sort of slowly building intrigue with it. I mean, you get a pretty good idea of what's going on, but you don't know the specifics. I and mean, again, I'm seven episodes in, so I still don't know all of the specifics with this one particular character. Uh, but, her, I mean, she seems very sympathetic to me. Like, I know it's like a lot of the, the stuff they're doing in the show is very basic screenwriting type stuff. I mean, the main character literally has uh, a save the cat moment in the first episode where she saves a baby bird from a tree. Like, it, they're doing... Which, again, is comparable to Strike Witches, because every first episode of a Strike Witches season starts with the same thing, where the main character saves some small animal or child from a dangerous situation, uh, risk themselves. Like, it's the same exact setup. But, frankly, it works. Like, there's a reason Save the Cat is a trope. It works. It works for me, at least. Like, a lot of the stuff... It's not particularly subtle. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that this show. I, if I were to, I wouldn't say the word subtle can be applied to this show in any way. Right? The, the, this show has never heard of subtlety, but that's fine. I'm autistic, right? Like, I like it to be quite apparent what the fuck is going on. Like, this isn't a human drama. <laughs> you know, this is a this is a fucking deep otaku cut. This is for otaku only. Otaku pilled users only. Um, like, this is, it's a very, it it is very much an otaku-centric show, right? Like, this is the sort of thing that would, like, if you try and watch it, it almost feels like a kid's show, because it's based off of the Maho Shoujo lineage, but then it also is very obviously not a kid's show, so it's kind of reminds me of, like, the West has only just cottoned onto this fact, right? 
that there can be adult fan bases of kids shows and then you can just make a show that appeals to them so like uh i think this has only just started happening with like fiona and cake getting its own spin-off that's aimed at adults um or adventure time fans but i think there's a bit of a difference there which is that like specifically well firstly the otaku centric like mouse shoujo anime it's more like like adult fans of of mao shoujo adult male fans of mao shoujo are closer to bronies than adult male fans of like adventure time or or something like that right because mao shoujo is aimed at little girls whereas adventure time is aimed at like everyone it's a it's a and don't get me wrong listen i fucking love adventure time okay it's a great show but like you could just as easily have be perfectly respected in the world if you're a stoner the college student who watches Adventure Time all the time versus, you know, a little kid, right? Because it's perfectly targeted at, like, those demographics. And listen, I at one point, I was a stoner guy who watched Adventure Time all the time. It was great, okay? It's a perfectly crafted show for that that audience. But making a direct spin-off that is targeted at adults is is quite different. It has quite different connotations than, like... I mean, honestly... I'm, I'm trying to think. There really is no Western equivalent to this this kind of thing. Like, yeah, it just doesn't really exist. I'm not entirely sure why. Like, most of the time, in the West, you get, like, a show like MLP or Steven's Universe, where the writers have big fandoms about the show that are adults, and then they just start, like, steering the show in a direction to cater to the f- the fandom a little more. I mean, that definitely happened with NLP. I don't know enough about... I don't know enough about Steven Universe to tell you whether that's true or not. But, <clears throat> the, like, that that sort of thing does happen, right? Whereas this is different. Right? This is like if you created a show, it, it there's no equivalent, right? It, it would be like... Because cause this, this type of thing would never get funding in the West. Because you couldn't, you couldn't afford to make it, and you couldn't... No one would air it, Right? No one, no one would air it because there's no, there's no space for like adult cartoons that aren't like fucking Rick and Morty or uh, what's that other show called? Fuck, the one with the with the horse. What's the show? BoJack Horseman. You know, like or oh, we're gonna be a serious drama. It's gonna have serious things. Or it's like a raunchy comedy. It's a raunchy comedy with references. Guys, it's a raunchy comedy with references. Or guys, it's actually a serious drama. But it's cartoons. Whoa. Those are the only two things you can make in the West. There's no room for like... It feels like a kid's show, but it isn't a kid's show. That doesn't exist. There's no room for that. Or to the extent that it does exist, they just actually are kid's shows. They just take... The people who want to make stuff like that... They just end up making actual children's cartoons and then making the cartoons worse for kids because they're trying to simultaneously appeal to an adult fan base that will actually spend money on the goods, right? It's a bit silly. It's a little bit silly. It's a bit of a... Well, I mean, actually, it makes much more sense. The Japanese, the weird... Like, there's a reason there aren't actually that many otaku-oriented magical girl shows or, like these sorts of things like there's there's quite a lot it, it was a, a relatively big industry for a while but the genre died right like no one makes them anymore um or at least not in this style right like the the modern ones fall much closer to the western cartoon style there were there were actually three there are three kinds i i understood this when i made my video about attack or into magical girl there are three kinds of of uh, magical girl anime targeted at, at adults not at children the first kind the oldest kind is the raunchy comedy kind which again same thing that happens in the west but what if a show that was looked like it was for kids but they, they had sex in it what that's crazy that's the first kind sometimes these are good right like uh puni puni poemi that's a great show um but that uh, even maho shoujo nante moi is is a this kind of show to some extent. Then the second kind, which is the more modern incarnation, is what if Magical Girls but Grimdark, right? This, and saying Madoka falls into this is a little bit of a, 
I don't know. I'm not the biggest Madoka fan. I'm not the biggest Obuchi Gen fan. I'm not the biggest Madoka fan. But Madoka's okay. Like, I don't have any super big problem with Madoka. It's, it's not my favorite show, but yeah. But Madoka obviously kind of buffed it. I mean, you got Mao Shoujo Sight, Magical Girl Raising Project, these sorts of things. The Grimdark Magical Girl shows. And, and n- neither of those is what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is your Nanohers, your Vivid Dread Operations, <laughs> um, and there's honestly that, not that many more, right? Like, there's 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 surprisingly few uh, fucking otaku-oriented magical girl shows. Um, I'm, I'm trying to trying to see. Uh, obviously, Nanoho was a pretty big franchise. I guess Nanatsuru Drops it fits into that. Magical Canon fits into that. Sinfo Gear fits into that, actually, which I still need to give another shot to. Um, mm, I don't know if there's an... Oh, the, the, the Nurse Witch Kamugi-chan fits into that. Oh, P- Prisma Elia, of course, fits into that. Um, maybe Princess Tutu at a stretch, although that's not really otaku. I wouldn't really call that otaku-oriented. Uh, yeah, I I don't know that there really are any others that super fit into that. Oh, oh Moetan? Moetan, probably. Hokagu no Pleiades. I haven't seen that one yet. Uh, Yuki Yuna is more in the dark side of things, the grim dark side of things. Uh, but yeah. And, and then it kind of died. Like, they don't really make any these anymore. They're all kind of stopped around, like, 2015. Like, I don't think they've, they've, they've just kind of stopped making them. Because everyone's putting all the money into fucking Isekai. You know what? Maybe these people were right. Maybe Isekai is ruining the anime industry. Maybe Isekai is ruining the anime industry. You know what? We haven't considered this possibility. What if Isekai really is ruining the anime industry? Hmm. It's a good question, really. Because no one, no one makes the, the, there's, there's, I don't know, man. I feel like I'm right about this. Like, this particular kind of otaku show has just been subsumed. Oh, I guess they did make Maho Shoujo Magical Destroyers, like, two seasons ago. Or, like, one, I don't remember when that aired. But, I guess they did do that. Hmm. I don't know. Are there any, like, I'm trying to look, because I would, what the thing is, right, like, if there was... I'm acting as if I don't know, but the fact is that if a show like this existed, if an otaku-oriented show like this existed, I would have watched it, because I pay attention to those. Like, there isn't an isekai, and I don't think it exists, right? Like, I would have noticed. Maybe Temple from this season? <coughs> Do you think it is Temple? Tempuru? Is that a thing? Maybe. I haven't actually seen it. I haven't watched every episode, every first season first episode no, 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 I haven't watched every first episode from this season or last season or well, I did try and make an effort for that oh I actually did watch a lot of last season what am I talking about but I'm fucking it doesn't make any sense what I'm doing but yeah like the last few seasons last few years these things don't get made anymore these things just don't get made anymore because all of the money goes to isekai instead and listen I guess maybe onimai kind of fits that maybe onimai it's that you know what we're gonna we're gonna say onimai or maybe ayakashi ayakashi triangle this looks appropriately bad i never watched it though but it looks from the thumbnail and the the description ayakashi triangle might be more of like a something similar i don't really know uh yeah anime shit now i think we i think we can confirm it anime is dead anime is dead because everyone just wants to make isekai this is what everyone eventually concludes when are they gonna stop this is my question. When are the, when can we move on? Because listen, I like I like a lot of the. I I mean I made I made my point. Right, I made that video. There's a lot of isekai that I think is good. Even the bad ones that most people don't think are good, I think is good. Right, like I like smartphone isekai. No one else likes that. I I like fucking vending machine isekai quite a lot actually. Right, like there's a I like these things. Most people don't like these things, but fucking fantasy settings are getting boring to me like i've i've never been particularly interested in fantasy settings i just watch it because there's nothing else like give me something give me give me my sci-fi back okay bring back my fucking magical schools bring back my magical high schools bring back my fucking sci-fi worlds okay bring back my light novel adaptations from before they were all isekai okay i'm talking i don't know what i'm talking I'm talking about all sorts of things, <laughs> you know, fucking, uh, the ones that are all about stupid shit with too much 
meta lore and humor. I don't know. Okay, we're done talking about this now. So the thing about um, TF2. I was thinking about TF2. I was thinking about how crazy of a game it is. I think about how crazy of a game TF2 is because like it would take you, you know, a lifetime just to master one class. Like there is so much to the game. I was thinking about like just the the skill required to master one weapon in TF2 is insane. Like I feel like as demo not on this setup that I had that the on Dotsmite's computer, but I feel like on my setup at home, I'm pretty good at hitting pipes. I'm not terrible here, but like you know, small mouse pad and whatever, um, which is fine. You you know, I like to play pyro when I'm here anyway, so it's fine. Don't need to aim. Stop eating tissues. Why are you so obsessed with eating tissue? Sorry, dog. Um, I, I feel like I'm pretty decent at hitting pipes. Um, and I was thinking about the loose cannon, right? What I'm saying is, I feel like I'm kind of, kind of fucking losing my train of thought here, right? Like, I'm trying to watch, like, I'm trying to understand how good actually am I at adding pipes, right? Compared to good players, how good am I? Like, how difficult actually is it? And this, you know, was something that surprised me, or didn't surprise me, but it, it was a positive, a good, a pleasant surprise earlier on in my TF2 gaming career <laughs> was when I when I started watching like high level players and realized not being able to like kill scouts is normal like you're not even if you're a really good player like no demo is going to be able to consistently take out scouts in a in a 1v1 with 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 pipes right like I thought I was just dog shit for sucking because I was like Scouts are so low health, it only takes, you know, one and a half pipes to kill them. Uh, how how am I so bad? But that, you know, they move fast. They move fast and unpredictably, so of course it's hard to hit them. And it, and pipes are the hardest projectile to use in the game. Because with, with rockets, you know, firstly, they don't have an arc to them. But secondly, with rockets, you don't have to aim directly at the person, right? You don't have to hit direct hits unless you're using the direct hit. You can just... Aim at the aim at their feet, and so and the splash damage is very powerful. Whereas with pipes, you know, as much as pipes on the ground do, especially the iron bomber, they they stick around and explode, and that's very helpful. It doesn't do instantaneous damage, and a good player can, you know, realize where the pipes are and stay away from them if they're on the ground. You basically it's kind of luck dependent, right? Um, so pipes are are very hard. But the thing is, you can't really compare... Like, if you're looking to see, like, how good are the best demos, you can't actually look at the best demos in competitive, in six. Because the best demo in sixes is probably a guy called Habib, right? Any TF2 player knows this, I think. He's probably the best demo in the world. And although he's insane at hitting pipes, like, I'm obviously not denying that, most of what it takes to be a good sixes player is is, is the... Uh, the sticky bomb launcher, not the iron bomber or the you know, grenade launcher, the stickies. Stickies are the big thing in, in uh, competitive TF2. Uh, like if you if you look at, for example, Banny did a, if you don't know, Banny is considered to be the, the, the goat of TF2, the best, the best TF2 player of all time. I don't know about that, but he's definitely very good. I mean, he's pro- it's a, it's you know, it's, it's deserved, it's a deserved label. He's definitely one of the best. Um, <clears throat> like he did uh, a tier list where he ranked like every TF2 weapon and any of the shields he just dismisses right he's like he's, it's not the mobility or the crit damage is not worth giving up stickies stickies are just too important but he put the Alibaba's wee booties and the uh, the other one that's the same thing I forgot what it's called what's it fucking called the one that's a leg hey Dolzmite do you remember what the, that one's called I'll, I'm gonna look it up because I'm fucking. Hold on. Uh, it's, it's got a fucking be here somewhere. Uh, bootlegger. The bootlegger. I think is what it's called. Yes, the bootlegger. They do the same thing. They just reskin. So it's just a reskin. But he said that was viable. He put that as like an underrated viable item. Now, for the non-TF2 players, right, you have three item slots in TF2. You've got your primary, secondary, and melee, standard gaming affair. And demo has a, you know, grenade launcher, primary, 
sticky bombs, secondary, and then a melee. So the shields, they replace your secondary. They, <coughs> they replace the, sick, the, the stickies. Um, but, but the booty, the boot, booties or the, the bootlegger, they replace your primary. They replace um, the grenade launcher. And, you know, Banny said they give you 50 more health and faster movement speed. And, and Banny was like, that's viable. Like, it is actually worth getting rid of your primary weapon in order to have a tankier, you know, to be tankier. Because the stickies are just so good. And so if you watch, like, Habib play, you know, as much as he does hit insane pipes, most of what makes him an insanely crack demo is, well, firstly, strategy, which is something that doesn't exist in casual. Uh, but secondly, um, you know, stickies. He's, he's really good with stickies, setting traps and, and so on. So you can't, and that is what it takes to be a really good sixes demo, man. You have to, it's mainly about how well you, you use sticky, um, which is a skill I'm still working on, but I'm getting better. I started doing this thing that Banny said to do, right, which is, I never considered, because I always thought the bootlegger and the, uh, the wee booties, that they were really only usable as a full demo knight, that you, you have those plus a shield and a sword and go full demo knight, and that's the only reason to use them. I never imagined, I never thought about using them with stickies. So after I saw that Banny video, I was like, hold on, I should try that. This is a, and by the way, if you want to get better with stickies, this is a really good way to train. Because you get rid of your primary, you have to rely entirely on your sticky bomb launcher. It means you're fucked in close range. If, if someone closes the distance on you, you are basically completely fucked. Uh, but it's a, it forces you to get good with stickies, and I did. I wouldn't say I got good, but I got way better really fast within a day of just using that that loadout. Because you have the 50 extra health, it means you're tankier, so you can afford to fuck up while you're learning, right? You can afford to make mistakes, which is what you need when you're learning. You have the extra survivability to mean that you get more time actually playing the game and actually practicing, um, rather than waiting to respawn or playing more cautiously, right? You can afford to. And obviously you have to use the stickies, you don't have any other weapon. So it... Yeah, that really improved my ability to actually... Because my problem had always been when playing stock was that I could get damage with stickies, but I could never get kills. Like, I could always do some damage, but I could never finish anyone off. And that's the, you know, thing I learned was how to actually, you know, time multiple stickies at the same time and or sync them, as people say, I think. And, uh, you know use them, exploding them in the air, the, all, all this sort of thing. How to, you know, put them on the ground in front of you as you're retreating and predict people's movement a bit better, you know, this sort of thing. That definitely made me a bit better. Anyway, like, just like, getting really good at stock demos loadout or demo with Iron Bomber and the Grenade Launcher or Sticky, sticky Launcher, like, that's going to take you, you know, thousands of hours to get good at. But then, like, you look at a weapon like the loose cannon, and I know, like, statistically, right, you look at the weapon, and it has the capacity to be ridiculously powerful. I mean, firstly, extremely important is you can use it to deny Uber very effectively, right? That's already an extremely massive advantage for the weapon. But secondly, you know, with double donks, you can do pretty insane damage. I mean, you can one-shot scouts with it, which is always a good thing. The problem is it's really hard to use, but it's such a fascinating weapon. And, you know, I think if if I really put the time in, like, I've tried to get better with it, but it's really hard. To, I mean, yeah, it's just really hard to use. It requires, like, kind of a change in mindset. I don't know. But I think, like, you know, I've seen YouTube videos of people who are really good with the the, the loose cannon and it, that shit is insane they just delete people and i've played in like sometimes i come across someone who's cracked it, and it's really annoying like the, it's a really good weapon because you're just getting fucking juggled in the air and you really can't do anything about it but in order to get that good i mean it's just super difficult to learn um yeah but what i was originally going to say is you can't really look at like pros to realize or like pro matches to know like how good you're supposed to be with the the iron bomber but the the thing that really made me think or like realize you know my the skill level that i should be aiming for like what's actually a, a reasonable level of reliably hitting pipes 
was watching this guy called Vorobe on YouTube. Like, that guy's fucking good at Team Fortress 2, man. He is good at the game. Um, his videos are pretty funny, too. But yeah, he, he just hits fucking pipes. This guy hits pipes. The, his pipes are just magnetically attract to people. It's insane. He doesn't play demo that much on YouTube. Even though I'm pretty sure he mains demo in sixes. I, he doesn't, like, play... He, I mean, he does it, but, it, it, like, not super often. If In his, like, casual video. Which, uh... Yeah, but when you look through and find him... Yeah, this guy's insane. <sighs> So that's good. That's how I need to get. I need to get good like that. I need to get good like that. My pyro skill level has improved significantly. Like, my reflect... I mean, I could still be way better at combos than I am. But my reflect timing, which is, again, like, well, that's, like, the really important thing is pyro is reflect and air blast. My reflect timing is, like, much more consistent than it used to be way more consistent and it feels good to do just to fucking mind read someone and hit a crazy reflect or a huntsman sniper or something that is getting huntsman reflect kills is like probably the most satisfying it's one of the most satisfying things in the game because you you don't have any there's no you can't react to anything if you're like in you know close-ish range you don't have time to react to anything it's pure fucking mind reading it's you know, and that's that's sick. And also, you have to aim it relatively precisely to get a headshot. It's pure mind reading, and that's 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 cool. I like that. I'm like, that's right. You just got fucking soul red, huntsman bitch. <clears throat> yeah. Anyway, I'm just thinking about how much time you can fucking put into this game and still not have mastered everything. There's so much. There's there's so much to learn. There's so many items to learn. And then there's also the fucking like. Honestly, it would be really useful to get good. So Demo has four primaries. Demo has the stock grenade launcher, which almost no one uses, although it does have some use, uh, right? It, like, it, it, it can be used. It has some advantages over the Iron Bomber. It depends on your playstyle, but it doesn't really suit my playstyle. Uh, so stock, the Iron Bomber, which is generally considered, like, the most popular one, um, and then the loose cannon and the lock and load. Not counting, you know, things that you can put in your primary slot that aren't prime, that aren't weapons. Four grenade launchers, I should say. Right. So the loose cannon is a unique weapon, right? Yeah, it has its own kind of unique mechanics. But the lock and load is closer to stock or the iron bomber. But the difference with the lock and load is you only get three shots instead of four, which is a pretty big nerf. And the grenades explode when they land on the ground. So it's kind of like the direct hit for demo. Or they they don't explode when uh, when they're on the ground, right? Like, you have to get a direct hit or it doesn't do anything. It's actually worse than a direct hit that, in that case. Because the direct hit at least does some splash damage, even though it's much smaller than stock. But the, the, the lock and load does nothing. Also, the direct hit still gets four rockets. The lock and load only gets three. And it originally only had two. But it used to do more damage than it does now. Um... But yeah, so you can't afford to miss with the lock and load. But then the lock and load also, just to make sure that you are unable to use it, has a completely different arc and projectile speed than stock or the iron bomber. So you have to learn a completely different trajectory if you want to use it effectively. And there's no reason to, because it's worse for most situations. Except for the fact that just like the direct hit, it does extra damage to buildings. So it's one of the best ways to counter a sentry in the game. Um, I, I actually don't... I know it used to do more, more damage to players. I don't know if it still does more damage to players. Um, does it just do 100, 100 damage? Wait, 25% faster than stock g grenades? Um, and they inflict 20% 20, 20 more damage than the grenade launcher to buildings. But that's it. So it's pretty much fucking pointless. And it's very pointless to run without the stickies. But if you have stickies, you don't need to be able to destroy buildings faster. So it's a pretty pointless weapon. I'm pretty sure it's the least used demo man primary. But because the projectiles are faster, like theoretically, if you got really good with this weapon, you'd be able to hit shots more reliably. But 
right like like with the direct hit right you'd be able to hit air shots and difficult shots on fast moving targets more reliably because your projectile is faster so you don't have to lead your shots as much which means you don't have to guess as much where the enemy player is going to be by the time your projectile reaches them you also would get further range although people talk as if that's a big deal with this weapon uh because it, the the fucking things don't stick around it doesn't matter if you hit, like having further range is pretty useless because you're not going to be able to hit anything because it's too far away to aim at like to project, predict anyway um but yeah getting good with this weapon will be an interesting thing to do it'd be difficult and pointless but it would be cool but yeah like you could spend you know thousands of hours just playing demo to master all of these weapons right and that's just one class out of nine like isn't that insane that's just, and I'm only talking about the fucking primaries here, right? Like, not to mention, you know, the Scottish Resistance or the Quickie Bomb Launcher, or, I mean, I'm pretty good with the, the fucking Sticky Jumper, but that took me a while to figure out, and I'm definitely not as good as some people are with it. You know, there are some insane movement gods, uh, but I'm pretty pretty good with the Sticky, sticky Jumper. But, you know, the Sticky Jumper... The Scottish Resistance, the Quickie Bomb Launcher. There's other ones, right? Hold on, I need to fucking let me let me look up every every secondary weapon. Oh well, there's also the the shields, but that doesn't really count. Oh wait, that's it. There's just the Quickie Bombs and the Scottish Resistance. I thought there was another grenade launcher. I guess I just imagined that. But yeah, those are also things to fucking you know figure out. And then the the shields, you know, mastering the shields, trimping is a whole fucking movement tech that takes ages to get good at. I mean, it took me at least 100 hours to get decent at trimping with the Tide Turner, and I still suck with the other two shields, even with the booties, you know? Like, there's there's so much to this, to this fucking class. There's so much. And that's just one class. Like, let alone, you know, my secondary class of pyro, right? Like, the four main pyro playstyles... Defensive pyro, what is it? Defensive pyro, flank pyro, offensive pyro, and combo pyro, I think would be the four. Four different playstyles. But even within those playstyles, right, like, combo pyro is its own fucking skill. And even within that, you have, like, multiple different combos, right? You could be doing flare punching, you could be doing sketch X style, uh detonator jump extinguisher combos uh which is my favorite you could be doing you know uh fucking what's that what's that the the shotgun called i forgot hold on but you could be doing shotgun based combos you know with the 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 reserve shooter for example or the panic attack uh or just the stock shotgun right so that's already and there's even a combo you can do with the gas pass although that is not really viable so, so, and that's just one play style. There's already a bunch of weapons that you could use for it. Not to mention, you know, flank power with the back burner, a whole different play style that is really fun. Um, or, you know, playing flank power with a different weapon, less viable. And then there's also flog, which, you know, doesn't really take any skill, but it's definitely a thing. And then, you know, of course, the Dragon's Fury, which just completely changes the class fundamentally completely changes how you even play so like those are all weapons that take different amounts of skill to master or different play styles that take different they, they require completely different skills and again that's just one other class like what else is there that i have like let's say i mean if you're a soldier you know soldiers have their own although there's only as far as i can think there's only really one soldier play style which is you play soldier, I mean, unless you count soldier, uh, or like airstrike with the fucking uh, base jumper. So I guess there's some meme styles, but um, those, yeah, those are really memes. Well, I guess you know, there's weapons that do completely like the the fucking airstrike. There's a bunch of crazy movement you can do with the airstrike, and then obviously the beggar's bazooka is like insane changing how the class works and the camp the cow mangler as well is kind of a different thing but you know the bison isn't that a secondary though uh, wait 
I was just talking about, right now I was just talking about primaries. Yeah, the but bison, bison song. Bison <laughs> what if you rocket jump a bison? That would be fucked. You, I don't think you're capable of getting a kill by doing that. Maybe. <sighs> you know what actually isn't fair? You know a weapon needs enough? The fucking disciplinary action. It's It should not have such a large melee range. It's just insane. Like, they were like, okay, Demo Man, we're going to give you an entire melee subclass. And the entire reason your melee subclass works is because your melee weapons, swords, are going to have a longer melee range than your opponents, which is going to give you an advantage in fights. Okay, sick. Oh, by the way, so, the longest melee range in the game. It should be a sword, right? It should be a Demo Man sword, right? No, it's a fucking whip. It's a fucking whip that the soldier has. Why? Yeah, but random crits exist. It sh it would be fine if it didn't do any damage. It would be fine. But you get fucking random critted with it and die in one hit. Yeah, well, if you're... Uh, yeah, I mean, it does triple damage, right? But hold on, let me see how much damage... I don't actually know how much damage the whip does. I don't play soldier. The disciplinary action does... Oh, it shouldn't kill you with damage. It does 146 on crit, so it shouldn't kill you in one hit if you're full health. But if you got hit by one splash damage rocket, you're dead in one hit. Because 175 health on a demo. Yeah, I mean, that's just not fucking fair. <laughs> okay, random crits are really the problem there, though. Okay, I'm going to talk about anime in a second, because I have things to say about Vivid Red Operation. Um, but first I want to fucking shit talk programmers. Because I've, I've always been just molding. As someone who can't program, is physically incapable of learning to code, um, I'm just going to pretend that, that I have, I'm allowed to have opinions on this. So, the software industry is terrible. It's the worst thing ever. <laughs> it's so bad. Right. The hardware industry works so incredibly hard and has some absolute genius fucking people working their asses off to to produce these insane feats of human engineering only for the software side of development to just do fuck it just to fuck it every time and then to blame all their problems on the hardware side right like fucking programmers refuse to write good code they're incapable of doing it they can't write efficient small minimal proper good <laughs> code that actually makes use of the hardware and previously this was just an annoyance to consumers because it meant that you know every time uh some you know new device comes out that has a more powerful uh, chip in it or, or something like this right actually nothing much changes for the consumer because instead of being like okay i can take this opportunity to make something new programmers say now i have more leeway to write inefficient code this is what happens every fucking time. And this is why technology doesn't fucking get any better. Because the hardware industry makes these insane developments. Like, the, the, <laughs> we're running up against quantum physics here, people, okay? It's insane. And the programming industry is like, oh, great. Now I have more headroom to write bad code and the user won't notice because, the, the, you know, we can have more clock cycles or whatever, right? Yeah. And this was really annoying to be a consumer. And it's still really fucking annoying, right? Like, the fact that uh, games, you know, this has become a, 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 a meme. The game developers, you know, are, are making their games just, just fucking massive. And they don't need to be. They don't need to be as big as they are. Because the idea of programming within constraints has just gone out of the fucking window. Okay, you look at, go on YouTube and look up Kay's Emanuel. I think that's how you spell his name. Is it, I think it's pronounced K's, not Kaze. Um, let me double check this. K's Emmanuel. Yeah. Go, go ahead and look at this guy, okay? This guy has rewritten, I mean, you, you may, you may have seen this, right? Some of these videos got pretty popular. This guy's rewritten the entire code of Super Mario 64 in order to make it like 20 times more efficient. And if you look at the levels, the custom ROM hack levels he makes, for his version of Mario 64. It's insane. They look like GameCube games, right? They, they have a whole generation ahead of the original Mario 64. And they're running on, you know, an actual N64, N64 hardware. It's crazy. It's actually crazy, right? That just by making the programming more efficient, it, it's 
he almost jumped an entire console generation. Like, I'm serious. I mean, aside from the resolution, these things, they run at 60 FPS and they look like fucking early GameCube games. But they're running on official N64 hardware, right? Not not some emulator with tricks or whatever. This is just purely by being a good programmer and actually programming within restrictions. But these days, programmers don't acknowledge the fact that restrictions still exist because hardware, they're no longer programming for an N64 or an NES or, you know, some fucking 8-bit or 16-bit computer, right? They, they've got the, they just assume that every, every gamer is going to have the newest graphics card and if you can't play the game, that's your fault. You need to upgrade your hardware or whatever, right? Even though the actual capabilities of games, you know, Sure, graphics-wise, graphics-wise, things have changed, things have improved, we've got new technology, we've got ray tracing, whatever, real-time ray tracing, okay, maybe some, some, some crazy, uh, you know, that's, that's mainly, mainly it, to be honest, but pretty much, we can render more polygons, and we have, like, some stupid lighting tech that doesn't even matter, okay, real-time ray tracing is retarded, this is my opinion, this is my official stance, but fucking real-time ray tracing is unnecessary, we have so many other tricks to get good lighting, that you just don't need it. You just don't need, like, the the improvement that fucking ray tracing gives you is not worth the cost of, you know, the extra processing power that it takes compared to all of the other tricks that developers have created for increasing uh, the, the lighting fidelity in their games without the cheating, cheating about it, right? Real-time ray tracing is brute forcing it. It's saying, like, we're not going to cheat, we're going to do it the way light actually works. And yeah, you get some improvements from that because it's obviously very real, uh, very, very realistic, right, as to how, how the system actually works in reality. But you don't, like, video games are like movies. They're, they're a trick. They're a magic trick. You don't need to do it for real. You don't need to do That's the whole point. Doing it for real is too resource intensive, so people generally avoid it. Right? Like, if you see a, a really good water sim in, a, in like, Sea of Thieves or something, right, or... or, or even going back to Wind Waker, you know, they're not doing it by actually simulating water. They're not literally doing a physics sim on the water. They're using uh, really clever maths and, and noise patterns, you know, like, to create something that gives you the illusion of how water looks without being as, you know, processor intensive. This is the whole genius behind programming, is to be able to do stuff like this, right? But no one programs within limits anymore. No one no one does this because they're all fucking, you know, retards who want their job to be as easy as possible. And they don't even do their job. They just get ChatGPT to do it for them these days. <laughs> okay, none of these people... These people could stand to, to go play TAS 100 or something like this. <laughs> learn some assembly. Program for a fucking 6502. Learn, learn, learn to program with, within limitations and then come back and make your program. Right. And this is why, right, so the hardware industry takes all the blame for this, right? It's like, oh, you fucking, you know, I can't program well, I, I haven't made good use of the hardware, because, you know, when when chips were, you know, less good, when I was programming for a PS1 or an N64 or, you know, an older computer, right, it I had to pay attention, because otherwise it was really bad. But now, chips are so fast that even if I fuck up, it doesn't matter. Right, it, it doesn't really matter, and we've managed to dupe the consumer into thinking that this is actually their fault for not buying more expensive hardware. The fact that these old devices are uh, become like so unusable after not even enough, you know, not even that many years. It, you know, I mean, there's a classic phrase about this: if your if your new software doesn't run on old hardware, then it's worse than the old software. Okay, so I've ranted about this before, but let me get this clear. Okay, this used to be just that problem. It just used to be annoying for the consumer. It just used to be annoying for the consumer and annoying for, you know, the hardware industry. But now it's caused a fucking global trade war because everyone's obsessed with these four nanometer chips, right? That only TSMC and uh, fucking the Korean one, what are they called? Samsung. Only those two companies can produce these four nanometer chips. And everyone's having a, you know, oh, China and America freaking out trying to manage to produce these, these chips as if it's the most important thing in the world. When they could just be writing better software <laughs> for free. You don't have to spend billions of dollars on, create, on trying to, you know, fucking onshore the manufacturing, create these fabs and train people and so on. You don't need to be doing that. You can just write better code. 
to make you better. Like, who needs all of this fucking bullshit? But, so, okay, the the big news this week is that Huawei um, created a new phone. They made a new phone, and that phone has a Chinese-made seven nanometer chip. Okay, which is which is supposed to be a big deal. Uh, the problem is, or, or, or the thing is, right, that, that people are like, oh, well, it doesn't matter, because 7 nanometers is like a bottleneck. It's it's really hard to get to get smaller to, to than 7 nanometers. So we don't have to worry that much. Like, just because they can make that, anyone, anyone could do that, right, like, with enough money. But getting below that is the real challenge. And it's like, this Huawei phone is like, you know... As powerful as anyone could ever want a fucking phone to be. Why would anyone ever need a phone that is more powerful than this? Okay, let me let me look at this. Let me look at this f- fucking phone. What are you doing? Chinese made seven. Okay, what's the phone called? There's a five G enabled chips in Huawei's latest phone. What is it called though? No, no, Huawei Mate Pro 60. Okay, the Huawei Mate Pro 60. Okay, we're talking fucking water and dust resistance OLED fucking screen 120 hertz screen literally faster than the monitor that we have here okay uh fucking some sort of CPU that I don't even understand what this means but this looks fast I mean I'm assuming it's very fast uh 4k video at, at what is this 960 fps what the fuck <laughs> <laughs> fucking I'm telling you this is insane like no one needs all of this no one fucking needs all of this you don't need a phone to be able to do any of this stuff you know I watched a fucking I, I was randomly served some sort of video that's like Mr. Who's the Boss and he's like this new Red Magic phone it has, it has all these specs it has 16 gigs of RAM Motherfucker, get that out of a phone. You could be doing way more important shit with that, that, those materials. Why are you putting 16 gigs of RAM in a fucking phone? What are you doing? So yeah, there's my rant. Okay. The, they started a global trade war over fucking chips instead of just making better use of the hardware they already have, which they could easily be doing if they just programmed better. If they just remember the limitations exist and program around them and be smart, use clever maths. But they won't fucking do that because they don't even do it. They just fucking get chat GPT and Stack Overflow to write everything for them instead of being good at programming. Okay, let me talk about fucking anime. Let me talk about Vivid Dread Operation. Okay, so let me talk about Vivid Dread Operation. I really liked this. I really liked this show. I thought it was a great show. I gave it an 8 out of 10 in the end. I thought it was great. Comparing it to Strike Witches is kind of missing the forest for the trees. It is aesthetically similar to Strike Witches, but it's not really that similar in content to Strike Witches. It's much closer to Nanoha, which I already mentioned, so I won't bang on about it. But it's also got a lot of... It's got a lot of Ava. It's got a lot of Evangelion, especially in the later episodes. Uh, the final boss battle is fucking sick, okay? The design of the final guy is like like a biblically accurate angel, which, listen, I know it's an overdone meme at this point, but that show came out in 2013, and I don't really give a shit, okay? I like the biblically accurate angel thing, okay? They look fucking sick. They look cool. I don't give a shit, okay? I don't care if it's overdone. I don't care. I think it looks cool. Fuck you. It looks... They got a lot of... They go with the Christian symbolism, hence Evangelion. There's more Ava to it than just Christian symbolism, but... Yeah. And everything's defeated by the power of... I mean, literally, this is what happens in the end of the show, okay? Big spoilers. So, they kill God. (laughs) It's an anime. What do you expect, okay? They kill God. So, God shows up, basically. The most powerful creature in the universe who calls themselves the supreme being... Um, is like, yes, I'm the most powerful being, and I'm the supreme being. And then the power of friendship is just way stronger. That's literally what happens in the text. It's not implied. That is literally what happens. It's literally the power of friendship is stronger than... They use the power of friendship to kill God, and it's fucking based, okay? That's good. That is good storytelling. I don't give a fuck. That's cool. The power of lesbianism is stronger than God. And this is something that's very true. I've always believed this. 
Um, yeah, honestly, I think it was a good show. The animation was solid throughout. Some of the voice acting's a little scuffed at certain points, especially the main girl. Um, but unlike Strike Witches, like this is my biggest, well, one of my biggest problems with Strike Witches is that the Neuroi are a boring fucking enemy in Strike Witches because in the first season they they they're boring and they start to do something interesting with them, right? They have a Neuroi that is like like a guy and it's trying to communicate, and then after the first season they decided they actually didn't want to do that plot line. And so everyone just pretends that never happened. And that's, like, the most annoying fucking thing about Strike Witches. Uh, it's really annoying. Because it's like, oh, they're about to do something interesting with the plot. And then they just decided that that never happened. That's that's really fucking annoying. And the Neuroi, they never have very interesting... Sometimes the designs are kind of cool. Like, I'm not saying they're terrible, but they often are pretty repetitive and boring. Um, Vivid Dread Operation has way more interesting battles, in my opinion. Um, but also, it's less battle-focused than Strike Witches is. Like, Strike Witches is very much, we're in a war, right? Like, the entire anime is war. Whereas this is not really we're in a war, it's just sort of like being a magical girl. It's more like Magical Girl, where it's just like, there's a monster of the week and we have to kill it. Um, which is a very different tone. It's a very different tone. So the battles aren't really the focus, it's more so the interpersonal relationships of the characters and the world that are the focus. Which to me is way more interesting. Especially because, although it's, it's again, it's not exactly subtle. There's not much subtlety in this show. I think that it's solid. Like, there's a lot of times when the directing is just, just shows... Like, everything about this show has solid fundamentals. Which, to most people, should be, like, you know... A foregone conclusion, but you would be surprised how many anime fuck this up, right? Like, the, here's an example. So in one episode, a character loses a hairpin that's important to her, right? She loses a hairpin, and the way that they use inserts to show where the hairpin's gone is like film school 101. This is how you use inserts, right? Like, so many anime would fuck this up. I'm telling you, they like. It's such a basic thing, but, like, they make it... They do a good job. They do a good job. You're never confused spatially as to where characters are or where ob important objects are. Like, the directing is overall not very flashy, but very solid. And actually, it gets pretty flashy towards the end. Like, it gets way more abstract and stylized in the final two episodes. And I think a lot of those visuals are really impressive and very cool. And I'm, su I mean, I'm surprised this show has such a low rating. I don't know why people don't like, like, what's not to like about this show. Yeah, there's some melodrama, uh, which normally I wouldn't like, but, but I thought, you know, firstly, I've become a little more soft on, on melodrama. You know, I used to just hate it always. I've started to, although I don't like it that much, I've started to, like, just having melodrama in your show is not enough to turn me off. <coughs> I mean, I think this started around the time when I watched, uh, Oh, fuck, I don't remember the name of this, the show. There's a show... What's it called? I don't remember the name of the show, so I'm not going to... I guess I can't talk about this story. Uh, but anyway, you know, I think I've become a little more soft on it. Visual novels also change my opinion on this a little bit. Not fully, you know, I'm still less... Like, like the, the abject... Or abject is not the fucking word. The, the melodrama that gets pulled out of your ass the Japanese people seem to love, the sort of thing you'll find in, like, key anime. Uh, I can't really speak for the visual novels, but, like, you know, clan ad. It still doesn't really do much for me. Uh, I know I have friends who fucking love this shit, uh, but it doesn't really do much for me. But, you know, I, th I thought it, it, it worked pretty well. I, I felt sympathy for the characters I was supposed to feel sympathetic for, and I, I was rooting for all the characters I was supposed to root for. Like, there's nothing, you know, mind-blowing in terms of story or characterization. Like, nothing particularly deep or complex or, um, <clears throat> you know, even, like, super novel. Again, like, I mean, the main antagonist of the show is basically Fate Testarossa, right? Like, she's, she's the main magical girl antagonist, but she's actually a good person who's being forced to do bad things against her will. Um, or th and she actually has a dark, fucked up backstory, although it's not as good as Fate. Fate's backstory, it's still pretty cool. Uh, yeah, I don't know, I personally like this show quite a lot. I don't really have that much else to say about it. I could probably talk more about some of the characters, but... 
Exactly. Yeah. I'll tell you the one thing. I thought that the big final climactic battle, because the, the one of the gimmicks of the show is that <clears throat> the girls, there's there's four main magical girls, right? And when they're fighting, they they com they two two magical girls can combine into one magical girl, right? This is how it goes. This is how this is how the story goes. So they can combine and form a more powerful magical girl with bigger boobs. That's the that's the plot of the show, right? And that's that's their finishing move. They do a Super Saiyan fucking fusion dance, and they combine through the power of lesbianism and become a, a girl with bigger boobs and more power. Uh, and I thought, because it's always two combining, I thought that the big final climactic battle would was, would have all four of them combine. Because it was shown, like, oh, this, this character's too powerful, even for your, your, like, I mean, it's God. So, you you know, all four of them are going to combine into one gigantic boobed, super powerful magic. That didn't happen, which is cool. The way they did it in the show, like, the, the way they actually ended up doing it was very cool. So I'm not complaining about the way they did it, but I just wasn't expecting it. <clears throat> I thought it was going in a different direction. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Can I recommend this show? Honestly, I think it's worth giving a shot. I think it's worth giving a shot if you're interested in, like, the more otaku side of things. You know, if you're a Norman anime watcher, you're not going to like this fucking show. You're not, there's nothing in it for you. Like, if you, if you're, you're, you're just not going to like it. Because, yeah, yeah. But if you, if you like the, you know, the shows I've been mentioning up until this point that I'm comparing it to, you might get something out of it. Even a bit of Madoka. If you like Madoka, you might even be worth giving the show a chance. I don't know. Uh, yeah. But anyway, this has made me, because it reminded me a lot of Nanoha, <coughs> This has made me want to give Nanoha another chance. I've given, like, I've tried twice to watch the first season of Nanoha, and I've dropped it both times, because it, it gets so boring and repetitive. But I, I, I don't know, maybe I should fucking give it one more chance. And also A's, right? Because I also, like, I feel like I would really like A's, because I really fucking love the movie of A's, right? The, if you don't know, Nanoha has, like, two movies, each movie is a retelling of the first and second seasons, and then there's a third movie that's its own thing. It's kind of like Madoka. Uh, but yeah, like, the, the... And also, it those movies exist in-universe. Like, in-universe, those are supposed to be movie versions of the actual events that happened, which is kind of a funny lore thing. Uh, but the movies are great, right? And especially their Nanoha A's movie. I, I really... I think that's, like, arguably my favorite part of the Nanoha franchise. Uh, so, you know, that makes me want to think that, like, I could really like A's. And... When I dropped it originally, it was mainly again. It wasn't that it was like anything egregious. It was just kind of boring. But maybe if I just like give myself powers, I can <laughs> sit through it, uh, and maybe I'll enjoy it if I actually stick to it. Because I know that there's some stuff that happens later in the show that I've never gotten to that I would probably like. Uh, so yeah. And another thing. Here's an on an unrelated note, but kind of related. <clears throat> I'm going to read out a message I posted in my Discord server, link in the description, by the way, uh, if I remember to do that. Uh, I said, I need to be filled with the power to read visual novels. If an anime interests me for databasing reasons, that's like a commitment of four hours I can just blast through it. I've become used to this. But then a VN interests me for databasing reasons, and it's like a 90-hour commitment of pure reading. And I'm frustrated because I don't think I can complete that commitment. Even the good visual novels, when they're too long, I just start to get bored around 30 hours in or whatever and don't finish it. See Magikoi. To which Horolove replied, stimulants. Uh, yeah, this is a problem that I fucking have, man. You know, I, like, I was, I was, I realized <clears throat> yesterday, I, I, I suddenly realized, which I, I somehow hadn't realized before, that rewrite is... The scenario writer for Rewrite is the same guy that wrote... F I mean, like, Rewrite has a bunch of fucking famous guys working on it, okay? The main... the main, Like, a, a bunch of the scenario was written by Tanaka Romeo, who also fucking wrote Cross Channel, which is, like, one of the best visual novels of all time. Cross Channel is amazing. And then another route in Rewrite was literally written by Ryukushi 07. Okay, the, obviously the guy who wrote Higurashi and Umineko. Um, and then the other scenario writer, I, I don't know, he just wrote on a bunch of other key visual art stuff. Uh, but Rewrite, you know, after learning that, I'm like, okay, I would probably actually really like, like, 
if there's any key visual novel that I'm likely to enjoy, it's probably the one that the guy from Cross Channel worked on. Uh, but the problem is, the rewrite is a million billion hours long, okay? It is just ridiculously fucking long. Uh, it's not as long as, as Uri Neko, but it is really fucking long, uh, okay? So, so like, VNDB says it's 75 hours long, but normally I find that the VNDB ratings, they underestimate how long visual novels are. Normal, like, I don't know if it's just me, or my theory is that people set, people mark their completion time, and they're just guessing, and they're underestimating it, or they are, like, saying they completed it, but they only, they're, you know, a lot of people, they only play the routes that they're interested in, they don't complete every route, so maybe, you know, if you, if you finished, like, two routes that you were interested in, out of four, then obviously it's going to take you a lot less time to finish it. So they're marking that as their completion time, which I think, like, <clears throat> you know, brings brings the average down. But in reality, every visual novel has always taken me longer than the NDB tells me it should. Uh, not by that much, but by some amount. Uh, so uh, if it says 75 hours, I'm guessing this is going to take me, like, 90 hours to read. And frankly... I just don't think I have the power to read th- that much. I like I I wish I could say something different, but without some sort of uh, chemical intervention, if I, if I don't have like you know a, an endless supply of Ritalin or something like this uh, of methylphenidate, which I don't, I'm probably not going to be able to fucking read this visual novel, <laughs> which is really annoying. Like the fact that I mean it's kind of like Magikoi, right? Like Magikoi, I have nothing against Magikoi. There's nothing, like, I, if you ask me to critique Magikoi, I can't really do it. I don't personally like the art style that much, but that's, you know, not super important. In terms of the story and characters, Magikoi is, like, fascinating and unique and really cool and funny. The problem is, I'm just not dedicated enough to do the same thing for, you know, 50 hours, 60 hours, 70 hours, however long Magikoi is. Like, I can't, you know, unless something is outstandingly good, like Subahibi. Uh, it's just really hot. And even Subahibi is not that long. And because I was so fucking engrossed in it, I just did nothing but read Subahibi for like five days straight. Literally, I woke up and I would just read all day because it's so engrossing. And Cross Channel was the same way for me. Uh, so maybe Rewrite would be the same way. I don't know. But yeah, Rewrite. And also, I need to give... Like, this is a... a here's another example. Shadow no Kuni, Himawari no Shoujo. Um... That's a, that's another fucking visual novel that I tried to read, and I just gave up at a certain point. But I didn't give up thinking I would drop it. I just stopped reading it because I got distracted by other things in my life, and I put it on hold, right? It, if you go to my VNDB, which I don't link publicly so you can't, <laughs> but if you were to go to my VNDB, you'd find it as on hold, right? But the thing is, I never fucking... I lost my save. I don't know where I was. I, 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 my save was on a, a different computer, that, uh, you know, I, I don't I don't think I... Maybe I still have the save. Actually, you know what? Maybe it's on an external hard drive I have somewhere. I should check when I get back to London. Um, there's a possibility that I kept my save, in which case it's fine. But also, the version I was playing was a not very good translation. Like, Shadow no Kuni, it has a, it has a new translation uh, that, that just came out. Um, but I don't, I don't even know if you can... Like, I don't know where you find it. I don't know where you find the new translation. It seems like it's only available for pre-order right now. Uh, <clears throat> I need to see if I can fucking. I don't. I don't know what they're doing. I need to hold on. I need to look this up because I haven't. I haven't. I haven't checked. Uh, yeah, it got kickstarted. It got kickstarted. I think. Um, let me see. Duh, 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 duh. Yeah, I I read. So I read a bunch of it, but yeah, I just stopped reading it at some point. But anyway, this is the problem, right? Is there's a new translation that's supposed to be better. Um, so I don't know if I should, like, start from the beginning, or, like, try and find my save, or try and figure out where I left off. I don't know. That's another, that's a whole other fucking deal. Um, it's a good visual novel, but at least from what I read, I enjoyed it. It's cool, it's the first ever piece of otaku media I've seen where the main character is canonically a stoner. Like, uh, you, you basically never see that, ever, in Japanese media. Um, but that's cool. <coughs> Um, yeah, I need to read more, uh, like, here's another thing. Okay, so at a certain point, about a year ago, I lost interest in just reading stories about how depressed people are. That used to be my favorite thing, 
was just like to to read stories about and the main everyone's just really depressed and 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 fucked up and then about a year ago i was just like i don't want to read i don't want to i don't want to know i just want to read comfy things and and stuff like that right which i think is a weird thing to it's a weird shift to happen to me but yeah i just i just like that sort of story stopped i don't want to read a story about just people being miserable and that's why i ended up um not really reading you may meet a kusuri Right, because again, I should be reading every Tanaka Romeo uh, visual novel, because Cross Channel is like the best thing ever made, and there's a bunch of other stuff that's really interesting that he wrote, like I.O., like You May Be Kusuri, and like Rewrite. Um, you know, uh, these are all interesting things. I.O. is probably, you know, really good. I, I think it's kind of a tuny gay. I don't know much about it, but I know it has, I'm pretty sure it has the Denpa tag on VMDB, right? Uh, it has a maybe no am I thinking of something else I must be thinking of something else uh, but yeah IO is probably really good I should read that <laughs> it's on my list and you may meet a Kusuri I mean so I started I never even marked it as started because I didn't I didn't know if I was ever going to finish it which of course I didn't I, st- I didn't get that far into you may meet a Kusuri I, I didn't get that far but it's just like so far all that happened is a bunch of people just are, are, are they just fucked up as guys and they just have f- horrible fucked up sex all the time that is all that happens in you may it is it is almost literally edogoro nonsense and i would have lo- this would have been my favorite thing like like two years ago um but at the time i was like i don't i just don't want to read about miserable people having miserable sex all the time like i just don't want to fucking read that right now and i haven't had the urge to do so ever since so i don't know what's going on with me i don't know what's going on with me but anyway there's my boring ass rant about visual novels i'm gonna go have some breakfast so an interesting crossover happened zizek wrote an article about nick land now this article is paywalled and i haven't been able to fit i'm not giving fucking money to compact okay it's not happening i refuse so i haven't been i've only been able to see the bit that's before the paywall and then like screenshots i've seen on twitter and shit so my critique of his critique is probably not very good but listen listen to me okay listen juja gives kind of a bog standard takedown on land's like fundamental delusian take right which is land confuses the deterritorializing force which creates techno capital with techno capital itself he doesn't realize that deterritorialization is always followed by reterritorialization or he just like willingly ignores this fact um so you know he can imagine that there's this like ultimate deterritorializing force that will just sort of permanently which is not the case right um this is like the bog standard critique of landian accelerationism uh so he kind of goes in that direction but then the reason i think he hasn't really understood land is because you can't really and to me he doesn't draw a clear enough distinction between like Frank Numina versus Dark Enlightenment stuff like there's a lot of years in between those things right like there's a, there's it's very clear that I mean like you wouldn't try and talk about Wittgenstein by like combining early and later Wittgenstein into one philosophy I mean maybe you could do that as some sort of weird project but it's very clear that they don't they can't be said to they contradict each other, right? And I think it's pretty obvious that later land, you know, with dark enlightenment and then whatever the fuck he's doing these days, is quite contrary to early land, right? Like early land is actually relatively anti-capitalist. Um, although how much he can be said to be anti-capitalist is kind of questionable, right? Because he he doesn't necessarily see you know, humanity, he's, he's very anti-anthropocentrism, but, um, you know, there's some, to some extent, he's still trying to achieve the leftist project of going beyond capitalism, right, and then he sort of gave up on that later on, or decided that that was, not just gave up on it, but completely turned head and said, like, rather than, you know, humans going beyond capitalism, capitalism needs to go beyond humans, um, using a bunch of sci-fi stuff that really, as time goes on, just appeals to me less and less. Uh, seems less and less uh, interesting. Um, but yeah, you can't really... Like, to me, there's a pretty clear delineation between, like, Thirst for Annihilation, Fang Numina, 
CCIU Nick Land versus Dark Enlightenment fucking Moldbug fanboy Nick Land. Although he's not, you know, he kind of stopped being a Moldbug fanboy, but you know what I mean. And Zizek doesn't make that distinction, which I think kind of shows that he misses the point. And then the third thing I want to say, it doesn't show that he misses the point. At least I haven't seen Zizek make that distinction. Again, I haven't read the full article because I can't fucking find it. Um, but yeah, the third thing is, it seems like he wrote, like Zizek, I don't know if he read Fang Numino or just had it explained to him or what, but like, he doesn't really mention any of the specifics in Fang Numina, you know? Like, he seems to have had Land's philosophy broadly outlined to him, but he doesn't, at least what I've seen, reference... And I think he probably read The Dark Enlightenment, or at least had it explained to him. But, like, Fang, Dark Enlightenment is, like, a, a, a long-ass blog post, right? It's a long-ass blog post, but it's one blog post. Whereas Fang Numina is a fucking book. Okay, it has, and it's not just a book, it's a book of collected writings, right? It has like a, every chapter is not a chapter, it's a different sort of essay that Land has written. It's a, it's a com- compendium, right? So, the, even like trying to, it's, it's not like, you know, reading, I don't know, some sort of normal philosophy book, which is all building off of each other. Like, let's say you're reading, I don't know, something very sensible, like a a David Graeber book, like, he'll, he'll go through very standard, like, you know, here's the history in chronological order, here's some misconceptions, here's some predictions, this kind of thing, all building towards, like, a theory. But because Fang Numina isn't that, it's a compendium of writings, you know, each individual chapter is making its own point, um, and they sometimes build into each other, and they sometimes don't. So, you, like, sometimes they don't even really make much sense placed next to each other, to be honest. Um, so that makes me think he hasn't really read Fang Numina, which is fine. Who would? <laughs> uh, I'm sure he's busy. He's just a fucking huge that guy. He's busy doing talks with Destiny and writing for fucking compact of all people. Uh... And complaining about wokeness. I saw this, right? Like, in in Zizek's response, he literally, he still finds a way to complain about wokeness somehow. A fucking Zizek, man. What happened to this guy? Look, I'm a, I'm a bit of a Zizek defender, okay? I, I don't think he's that bad. I even think some of his more recent writings have some reasonable points. But... And I'm going to also, to, to, to be transparent here, I've never read Lacan. I don't know shit about Lacan. I've never read Hegel. I definitely don't know shit about Hegel. Okay, Hegel is completely fucking incomprehensible to me. Um, as I, you know, assume it is to almost everybody. Yeah, I don't even claim to have any fucking idea what Hegel is about. So, the two main sources of, you know, fucking Zizek's power, (laughs) I just have no understanding of. Um, like, I know a tiny bit of Lacanian stuff, but, like, very, very little. Uh... So, you know, I'm not the best guy to critique Zizek. Uh, Of course, I'm not the best guy to critique anyone. I don't know anything. But, you know, so some of the stuff he writes, I think, is, like, still semi-decent. Like, he recently, I think I talked about this in a previous episode, he recently wrote an article which is called, like, The Left Should Embrace Law and Order. And I actually thought that that was a pretty decent article. I didn't think it was, I think it has some problems. Like, I I would quote back, basically, um... Zizek's own response to fucking Jordan Peterson, of all things, right? Like, remember when he was debating Jordan Peterson and he was like, Sniff, what if uh, you can't get your house in order because society is preventing you from doing it? And then the crowd fucking cheered because it was a terrible event. Uh, I would basically say the same thing to, to Zizek about that article. Like, I think it's not a bad idea, but what if you can't support law and order because you're prevented from doing so? You know, like, like, what if your existence, the contingency of your existence, which you required to to support law and order, or your 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 freed existence is being, um, you know what I mean? Like, I don't think it's a bad thing to say, like, or I think there's a couple of things going on, right? It's like on the one hand, there's this idea on the left that like liberalism, or or like neoliberal capitalism, whatever you want to call it, is like really 
just an early stage of fascism. And it will always, like, eventually collapse into fascism unless it's, like, constantly fought against. I think that's, like, not entirely inaccurate, but there's also something, you know, there's there's also just a very simple fact, which is that fascism doesn't work, and most intelligent people understand this. As, and most politicians understand this, most business owners understand this. Like, if you're running a business, it's better for you to be in a laissez-faire capitalist liberal society than to be in a, you know, fascist society. And so even a lot of powerful people and elites uh, don't want fascism because it would, it would be bad for the, the capitalist system, the liberal system. I mean, there's a lot of people who are, like, on the extreme ends of the far right who call you know, capitalism, a Jewish-controlled system, and they, they're they against capitalism itself. They want, you know, a monarchy type of situation. Um, right, so, like, I, I don't necessarily agree that, like, all of the tendencies of neoliberal economics push people towards fascism. I think some of them do, but at the same time, there's a drive away from it. There is a, a self-sustaining drive. Uh, you know, if businesses want to do what's most profitable and always continue themselves existing, they always want to further their own existence. You know, it's kind of like the the economics. This is actually a rare thing on the left, right? Because because econ like the traditional economics, there's a there's a, a phrase which is uh, I think rational idiots. Uh, that like a lot of traditional economic modeling relies on people being rational idiots i.e. they're rational enough to act in what seems like a perfectly rational way but too stupid to understand that they're acting against their long-term self-interest right so like for example I guess this comes up in like game theory uh this sort of thing i can't i can't actually think of an example off the top of my head but i'm sure you can imagine the sort of thing i'm talking about right where like Capitalists, or, or, or sorry, these sorts of eco- economists. This is like very outdated eco- economics, right? This this stuff doesn't really get taught anymore. So I'm not, you know, just some retard who's saying, oh, all economics is stupid. Um, but like some of this outdated economics modeling, you know, it sort of relies on people being like saying everyone is a rational actor who will act perfectly, you know, in their own self-interest, um, just to model the world. No, nope, most economists don't actually think people are that but they just say like it's surprising how effective models that base based on that are um which is true it is surprising how effective those are um so i, I don't know i can't necessarily think of an example right now but uh you know what? i'll just google it um doo, doo, doo. No, i can't fucking find it okay well whatever um, I think it's kind of a similar thing that, that the left does with this, like, everything always tends toward fascism, which is that, like, actually, it relies on this idea that businesses are smart enough to, you know, always give themselves a profit, but too stupid to understand, like, they're perfectly rational in the fact of, like, oh, they're always, you know, taking these extremely rational capitalistic, uh, you know, choices to maximize profit in the long and short term um but they're too stupid to realize that what they're doing will actually result in you know their business no longer being able to exist in the future right like take take climate change this is a good example right like i i think that it's not very easy to solve the climate change under capitalism but there are a lot of leftists who sort of imagine that there are zero pressures zero pressures on businesses to you know be environmentally sustainable um However, like every oil company right now also owns a bunch of green energy stuff, right? Every oil company has massively invested in green energy stuff because they know they're not going to exist. They know that the resource they extract is finite and they're not stupid, right? So they firstly, they know that like oil and gas and coal and whatever are finite resources and will eventually run out and they know what's going to replace them, nuclear and renewables. So they've all massively invested in those sectors um and secondly they know there's a lot of public pressure to switch to renewables so they've guaranteed themselves a win-win which is the smart thing to do as a capitalist they're not stupid they're not sitting there you know just being like oh we're the evil company who's just gonna stick to oil because we love oil so much and we don't care if it runs out oh we, it ran out how could we have possibly seen this coming also saying it ran out is a bit of an oversimplification right but at some point oil becomes there's diminishing rates of return on how expensive it becomes to drill for uh, ever more difficult to reach pockets of oil right so 
eventually it's not that oil it's not that we'll literally run out of oil it's that we'll run out of like cheap and easily accessible oil there's a lot of oil but most of the oil is really hard to get at and um it eventually you know as you as you run out of the easy to reach pockets of oil you have to go dig deeper you have to dig in you know you have to find oil that isn't like as as easy to extract and those processes are more expensive and so the oil becomes more expensive as a result of that right you have to recoup your 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 costs for the resource extraction so they have to charge more for the oil and you know that's just going to go up and up essentially and so and eventually it's going to get to the point where it's cheaper to just use renewables than to use fossil fuels they know this they've known this at least since the 80s probably longer um and they've been planning for it the whole time, right? They're not rational idiots. They're not just being like, well, this makes us the perfect amount of profit now, so it always will. Right? And I think this is a similar situation with, like, fascism. I mean, you can see right now DeSantis, who I would call, like, you know, the closest thing America has to a fascist, or except, like, Vivek, but Vivek isn't in charge, Ramaswamy. Um, but, like, DeSantis is extremely far right, and uh, he's currently, you know... Uh, you know, having a bunch of problems with giant corporations who don't like Florida under his governance, right? Because capitalism isn't economically sustainable. I mean, sorry, fascism isn't economically sustainable, right? I mean, famously Disney, uh, right? Like the, the, this system that he's promoting isn't actually profitable, and so they don't want they don't want it. And this is why I'm a little skeptical when Zizek is like, or, or maybe I'm not skeptical. Maybe this is more like what he's saying is that actually because fascism is economically unsustainable i mean that's just one of that's one of many problems with it um, right that actually the left can sort of team up with the capitalists and become just liberals right and i you know i i don't or like his point is basically like like now the best we can hope for right now is just to like not slide into fascism right because there's like that's honestly we need to lower our expectation right like we can't be out here talking about pie in the sky ideas, right? Right now, we need to form a coalition with everyone who doesn't want to be fascist in order to crush the fascists. We can't just be sitting here, you know, not doing that. And I think that's a reasonable. I don't. I don't think that's particularly unreasonable. And I kind of got off topic, but that's because I haven't read the fucking article I was trying to critique because it's not accessible. Someone on the internet, give me it. So, Twitter. Which, I don't know why I still use Twitter. I mean, I, I actually... Oh, here's the thing that happened to me. Um, I managed to get my hands on a Blue Sky account. Um, so I finally have one. It's no thank you dot Blue Sky. You know, just no thank you. You can find it. No thank you dot Bsky dot social. Um, I don't know any good accounts to follow. So, like, I'm just kind of waiting until I see people post their Blue Sky accounts on Twitter so I can follow them. But so far, it's uh, relatively boring. I mean, even if I look on the, the Discover tab, like, it's pe- I'm not saying it's people that I, I dislike, right? Like, it's a, it's has a very strong lefty swing, mainly because those are going to be, the, obviously, the people that leave Twitter most readily since Twitter, you know, has taken more of a right-wing swing. But, like... I checked, I actually went through everyone I follow, because I keep getting these, like, right-wing accounts, like, fucking, you know, on my For You page, which the reason I don't use my following page is that my following page is, like, half in Japanese, because I just follow, like, you know, Japanese artists or whatever, but, um, maybe I should just unfollow them and then just use, but anyway, on my fucking, uh, For You page, you know, I get a, a, a weird amount of, like, right-wing tweets, and so I always assumed I must be following, like, some right-wing people, but I never checked, and I checked, literally the only person I follow who could be considered right-wing, at least that I'm aware of, is Nick Land. Like, I just follow, like, let me be clear here, okay? Firstly, most of the people I follow are musicians, um, most of whom are left-wing. Uh, and then aside from that, you know, I'm following, like, a bunch, like, fucking Jacob Geller, fucking, uh, the Green Party, I'm following fucking, 
I mean, for God's sake, J- Jonas Sieka, I mean, Yanis Varoufakis, and Jeremy Corbyn. I literally follow Jeremy Corbyn, right? Like, and then the only right-wing account that I follow is Nick Land. And yet I constantly see fucking right-wing posts, and I, I mean, it's annoying. I like to have a good balance. This is my contention, or my preference. I like to have a good balance of views I agree with and views I disagree with on my social media. I don't think 50-50. I would rather have more people I agree with. Um, but I don't want to have no people I disagree with. That beca- that just makes it really boring to me. Like, I don't want rage bait, right? I want people earnestly expressing opinions that I disagree with. That's, I don't know, that's interesting to me. Because I like, I don't know, that's just what I like. And, yeah, fucking Blue Sky is like 90% just people making very, at least from what I can see, it's like very milk toast lefty opinions, right? Like everyone is posting about how great unions are. Everyone's like support trans rights. Everyone's like, here's a thing that, that DeSantis is doing in Florida and it sucks. And I'm like, you know, this just gets boring after a while. It's like, I agree with all of those things, but I don't just want to see the same for, you know, attic, uh, slogans every, which is a kind of annoying thing about Blue Sky. But anyway, I, it's my fault for not following interesting people. <clears throat> not what I wanted to talk about. Went on a big fucking rant. Not even what I wanted to talk about. What I want to talk about was, so Twitter, they made the thing where you can make money on it. And everyone has agreed that this is terrible. Because you see a bunch of these blue check accounts and they post these obvious interaction bait, uh, you know, posts, right? They, 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 they make these posts that are right. They're Facebook boomer tier interaction bait. And everyone has, like, collectively agreed that this is cringe and embarrassing for them and, like, a terrible decision for the website, right? But what's what I'm going to, you know, make myself be the special guy here, which is, like, why don't you apply this same attitude to, like, every other website that does the same fucking thing? It's like when when you watch a YouTube video, the same thing is happening. YouTube videos by bigger channels are all interaction bait or, you know, watch bait, right? Like, when I watch a video... You know, half of the time, I click on a fucking stupid video, and it has, like, you know, 10 seconds of loud-ass noises of, like, preview of what's going to be in the video before the video even starts, and then it's like, this video is sponsored by blah, like, they're dog shit. But no one's like, oh, YouTube monetization was a mistake. Why? Like, what videos do you watch that, that actually require the budget or time? I mean, there's some. Listen, there is some. But most of the good ones are actually funded by Patreon, right? Like, like, like people like Tim Rogers or people like, you know, some of these people who make really high-effort long videos, they're mostly funded by Patreon, not YouTube. Like, the videos, the, the YouTubers that actually make their money on YouTube are the fucking worst. I, don't, I mean, I can't even name any of them because I don't, I don't watch any of them. Uh, I mean, it's also the same on Twitch. It's the same everywhere. All of these people, but money ruins it. This is one of these things, you know, I actually think that most people don't want to contend with this fact. Like, we have this conception in our culture for music only, that, like, music gets ruined when it becomes corporatized, right? No one wants to listen to music, or, like, music is bad when the, the bands make too much money somehow, right? And I agree with this, actually, at least to some extent, but we never apply this to, like, anything else. In fact, we do the opposite. Um, and I, I don't know. I think there's a lot of, like, weird attitudes to this sort of thing, to artists. Like, I don't know, man. A lot of people make some weird statements with regards to some stuff like this that I don't think really hold up. Anyway, I'm kind of ranting about nothing now. You remember I was talking about this, um, this thing about uh, software people not making good use of hardware and how you know, the hardware industry pulls off all of these incredible feats and then programmers are just too bad at programming and so they, you know, waste all of the resources. They just take new technological advance. They, like, they've forgotten that programming is supposed to be within limitations. That That's like, you know, whatever. I, I, I want to make very clear, like, the sort of thing I'm talking about 
like how powerful these chips that we consider to like okay let me let me give you an example right so there's this guy called randy linden um and if you don't know about this guy probably one of like the greatest programmers to ever live like this guy is an absolute fucking genius okay uh so he ported doom to the snes right and then like that's already crazy impressive like i mean he's a master of doing these impossible ports he he created the first playstation emulator on pc i believe um but the thing that i find that he's done that is most impressive and like honestly i i mean i've watched a video i watched this there's a, a video by modern vintage gamer where he like explains some of the tech behind it and i watched another video about it and like it goes i'm um, like let's it, it, it's it's like deep fucking knowledge assembly language bare metal programming stuff that is just way beyond me um but this guy ported quake to the fucking Game Boy Advance. And it's not like a cucked, shitty version of Quake. Like, a lot of times, you know, people... There's 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 a meme, right? Oh, can it run Doom? Or, or sort of, Doom can run on anything uh, meme, right? But a lot of times, when people, like, say they've ported Doom to something... Like, sometimes they've actually ported Doom. But a lot of times, they just made a Raycast... You know, a very basic sort of Raycast FPS... Um, probably closer to Wolfenstein. Like, uh, for example, there was a, a bit of hullabaloo a while ago about someone who supposedly ported Doom to a pregnancy test, but it wasn't, they didn't actually do that, right? Like, it, it's just a really basic Raycaster, which is still impressive, don't get me wrong. Like, you know, Raycasters are cool, but it's not Doom. No, this guy did not make some cucked version of Quake. It, he, he made his own engine from scratch, but it is Quake. Like, it has everything that Quake has in it. Uh, it doesn't have all the levels, uh, because he never finished the project. But, like, it could, theoretically, have what... He can import Quake levels into his engine that runs on the fucking Game Boy Advance. Like, let me... Like, Quake is not a Raycast game. Quake is real 3D. I don't know if he's using some raycasting magic. I don't think he is. I think he's using proper 3D in his port. Now, there are a couple of 3D uh, official Game Boy Advance games. Um, uh, let me let me, let me me look this up. Okay, Wolfenstein 3D does not fucking count. But I've seen... I looked this up at one point. Um, like, there, there are a couple, and they're very impressive, right? Uh... But but porting Quake to the Game Boy Advance, like if you look at videos of it, you look at footage of it, it looks not super playable as you'd expect. But the reason it's not super playable is because of the screen resolution and the uh, controls. Like you 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 can't look up and down uh, very well because you don't have the same inputs you would have on a PC. And the, you know, the resolution is super low because the GBA screen is super low. But, you know, ignoring, like, that stuff is just limitations of, of the, the I.O., right? On the chip, on the, what's actually running, is Quake. Like, no non-cucked Quake. Which blow, I mean, it's fucking insane. It's absolutely insane that this stuff is possible. I mean, the stuff that people are homebrewing for these retro consoles these days is just insane. I brought up Kaze's version of Mario 64 when I was talking about this. Since then, like, I found someone's porting Portal to the N64. Like, actually Portal on real N64 hardware. It doesn't look like Portal. It looks like a low-poly version of Portal. But it's Portal. It's got the same fucking game mechanics as Portal. That's crazy. Uh, and then, someone's figured out how to do, uh, like, super high-res textures with LOD on the N64. Uh, using the same technique as id Tech's mega textures, although they're not really mega textures because they're they're just normal size textures. But for the N64, that is insane because there's fucking like zero RAM. <laughs> I mean, you can look this up. Let me, let me see if I can. Mega textures. I think it's just called like mega textures N64. Hold on, mega textures N64. Um, and the way it works is it's just like an LOD kind of situation, right? Uh. Like, the, the further you are from the texture, uses a lower-res version and swaps them out so seamlessly as you get closer. Although it's not, like, that seamless. But it's pretty fucking... I mean, you 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 don't see textures this high-res on a, on a Nintendo 64. 
you like it's actually crazy watching this video like it looks like one of those texture pack mods that people use in an emulator i mean it doesn't even look like an like if you, it doesn't look like n64 footage it doesn't look like footage from an n64 but it is and these textures are like crazy it's crazy how is this possible people like this is the problem if we just stopped if we just paused hardware at n64 levels people would be making incredible amazing shit right now they are but it's only like a few groups of hobbyists with no funding and and you know nothing and they're still making this insane shit like this is what i'm trying to say if we don't need all of these crazy hardware developments people can like if 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 just like a very niche small group of hobbyists can make, get this insane performance out of retro games consoles, do like I don't I, I don't know it's so mind blowing to me that someone got Quake to run on a fucking Game Boy Advance like because I grew up with the Game Boy Advance like that was my first console and I would have killed to play Quake on that it's insane like and then it's not just in terms of graphics but yeah, another figure I could bring up here would be Tim Follin, who's pretty famous these days as, like, a god of uh, chip music. I did, like, you listen to this guy's songs, and he's using all sorts of crazy trickery to make the sound chips do incredible stuff. And, I mean, you, you, people, a lot of people listen to his, you know, like, SNES soundtracks and NES soundtracks, but he was making music for, like, old 8-bit PCs, that were well, one bit and this stuff is like let me see if i can find some of this guy's one bit music like you don't understand how fucking crazy it is I and mean, it sounds a bit bad but this is on one channel you hear how it sounds like there's two channels there's not <laughs> I mean, this is just insane. I don't think you can really, like... This is so insane. Like, I don't even know what to say. It, like this stuff people can do people can do crazy stuff people can do people can do crazy stuff with 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 hardware <sighs> now you're probably thinking no thank you you're you're a little bitch complaining about programmers when you can't even program yeah i fucking can't i'm too stupid for that shit i readily admit this okay i've tried to learn i've tried to learn some assembly stuff some fourth stuff and it's 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 too hard for me. I would I'm gonna keep very slowly bashing my head against it until maybe one day I learn something. But like I don't know, it's pretty much beyond my my level. I'm not good enough at being smart to do that. But but here's the important thing: is, is I I don't go around calling myself a fucking programmer. Okay, <laughs> I know I can't program, and so I stay away from that shit. Right? These motherfuckers, everyone else. They, they learn a little bit of fucking JavaScript, and they go around calling themselves programmers. You, you, come on now. Like, this is the thing. If you can port Quake to the GBA, you're like a one step away from being able to port Half-Life to the GBA. And if you can port Half-Life to the GBA, you're like a one step away from being able to port Counter-Strike to the GBA, right? And if you, like, I mean, obviously the Game Boy doesn't have, like, online capabilities, but, like, you know, ignoring actually the form factor of the Game Boy and the I.O. and stuff, like, the chipset of the Game Boy, if you can port, if you could play Half-Life on a fucking Game Boy, <laughs> you could play Counter-Strike on a game, you can be Gordon Freeman inside of a Game Boy. That is insane. That is wild. A lot of people... They think the Valve, because they're good at game design, are good at programming. Any this is anyone who doesn't play Team Fortress 2 
thinks that Valve are good at programming. That's the difference, right? This is the big, the the major distinction between TF2 players and other players of Valve games. Back when I played Counter Strike, I was like, Valve is so good at programming. Valve are actually really bad at programming. <laughs> they like, they do not make clean or efficient code, optimized code. Their their code is a buggy mess, right? They just like, I don't know. That's kind of a side tangent, but that's a funny thing. Anyway, I'm waiting to be able to play fucking Counter-Strike on a... I'm going to play Counter-Strike on a fucking Atari Jaguar. So, a while ago, a good while ago... Let me see if I can actually find out exactly when. Um, That would be approximately nine months ago. Nine months ago... Patricia Taxon on her second channel released a video called David W. Skinner's Microban is among the best, quote, games, brackets, question mark, brackets, ever designed. Um, and I watched this video and I was like, that's cool. Uh, it's about a series of uh, soccer burn levels, right, designed by this guy called David W. Skinner. It's just soccer burn, but they're very minimal efficient, elegant soccer barn puzzles. If you don't know what soccer barn is, you probably have, like, played similar things to soccer barn. It's like a 2D puzzle type of format where you push things around. You have to push them into the right place, and you only have limited space to do so, so, like, it's difficult to figure it out. That's the puzzle. And anyway, I watched this video, and I was like, that's cool. So I went to go and play Micro Barn, and when I went to do it, I got completely fucking stuck on, like, the third level. And, like, the first level, she shows how to do in the video. So, like, that's fine. The second level is trivially easy. And the third level, I got completely stuck on. And so I gave up. Then, a few months later, I tried it again. And this time with Dotes Might's help. And we both got completely stuck on the third level again. And I think we managed to do it, and then got... I think, like, after ages, after, like, half an hour of trying it, like, basically through pure trial and error, I think we got it, and then got completely stuck on the fourth level and gave up. Anyway, out of nowhere, for some reason, I had the urge to try again. And this time, I don't know what it is, but something just clicked, and the puzzles are now, like, none of... I just fucking breezed through it. Like, I I didn't remember the solution to any of the puzzles. It just suddenly clicked with me. And I figured out, I don't know what it is, but it's crazy. Like, I don't even really... It's really confusing to me how I ever struggled. <laughs> like, it's... <laughs> I'm not saying all the puzzles are easy, right? I mean, they're, they're challenging in a really fun way. But the early ones, like the ones I was getting stuck on, are not particular. They're not that difficult in the scheme of, like, the difficult puzzles in Microburn. Like, some of them are much more complicated and require you to think more steps ahead and, and so on. Not those, like, first four levels. The first four levels are, like, very easy. <laughs> I don't know how the fuck I got stuck doing that. Like, it's really confusing to me. Like, no, I have nothing about me has changed <laughs> since I haven't practiced or done anything that I feel like would contribute to me getting better at spatial reasoning. So I'm, I'm very confused. I'm very confused as to how I ever got stuck. Like, something about the way that these puzzles were lined out, I didn't have some connection in my brain, and then since then, somehow, this connection in my brain exists, and it is now impossible for me to ever go back to a state where I couldn't comprehend the puzzles. Like, there are still difficult ones that I struggle with. It's a puzzle game, of course there are. But they're not difficult in the same way where I'm just completely stuck with no idea what to do. Like, the patterns are, like, relatively... It's not obvious, but I can see them. Like, that, obviously, the point is to figure out the pattern. And there are certain patterns of, like, level design where you're like, okay, so I... If I get the box in that corner, I'm not going to be able to get it out. Like, that's a kind of situation. Or like, okay, well, clearly you're supposed to use this section for the player to go around, not for the box to go around, right? So stuff like this becomes very obvious. Like, I don't know. I don't know how I ever 
got stuck on the first few levels of this. It's good, by the way. You should play it. It's you can you can find it on the internet for free. Like you can just play it in a browser or any other soccer ban engine. Um, and it, it, they're fun. They're really fun. Uh, but yeah, I'm just. It's a really weird experience. Like I don't. I can't understand. Like. It's not like I just struggled to figure out the levels. That would be different. That would be normal. It's not just that. I got stuck completely, and I think we only beat level three through just like trial and error until we randomly got the correct thing. That is uncomp. That is doesn't make any sense to me. Like, what do you mean you got stuck? <laughs> you just do. You just have to figure it out. <laughs> How could you not see the the thing right? If I, I don't know, man. It, fucking weird weird experience i also had a weird ass fucking dream last night that is too incomprehensible to explain to anyone but it was fucking crazy and like super immersive vivid dream maybe that had something to do with it i don't know but uh yeah that's fucking weird you know i remember when i was first learning how to google like like when i was like seven years old or whatever and i was first like looking stuff up for school projects and stuff like i remember how you learned how to google was you you would you would use keywords like you wouldn't type in naturalistic language because a web search is like a search engine is a it scrapes a bunch of websites right for keywords so if you want to find something like let me let me think of a uh, an example like i guess some things are like they're close to natural language like it's not like you're literally putting you know, arbitrary words. Sometimes you could do that, um, but like the you're not looking for something. You're not asking it a question, <laughs> right? It's not a person. Like like if you wanted to look up recipes for for blueberry pie, you would you would type in something like uh, blueberry pie recipe, something like that, right? Uh, but but then the, you could see the difference between like you know young people and boomers. Boomers would go to Google and they'd type in, how do I make a blueberry pie, question mark, right? Something like this. Or uh, they would talk to it like it was a person. And this was always quite funny. Uh, I, this was a bad example because blueberry pie recipes is like relatively natural language. But, you know, you, you, that is also not something... If you wanted to go up to a person, you wouldn't just say to them blueberry pie recipes. But now, what I'm saying is now, it's gone the opposite way. Because, like, now, Zoomers are the ones that talk to Google like it's a person for some reason. And and then, like, the millennials, they still search with keywords. Uh, because Zoomers, this is, like, the difference in tech literacy, right? Is the millennials had to learn about how computers worked just a little bit, just a little bit in order to use them, whereas Zoomers don't need to learn anything. Like, they don't even, they don't even understand. I mean, there's, a, there's an article that is, like, fucking lodged in my brain permanently about this computer science professor who's just talking about how, like, the Zoomers, they don't even know, they don't understand file systems in, like, a very basic way. Like, like when you or I, I'm assuming, go to look for, like, they don't use computers, right? They, they don't have, they don't use computers, and if they need a file, they just search for it. Like, they don't, they don't navigate file systems. So it's like, 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 you or I, we think of our computers as, like, uh, you know, trees. At least this is kind of how I think about it. Or filing cabinets, right? Where it's like you have folders nested inside folders and you go, you know, from the... If it's a Unix-based... I don't really know how Windows works, but like Unix-based operating system, Mac OS, Linux, BSD, all of these, right? You know, you start from the root directory and then, you know, user home, downloads, pictures, porn, and then you find your thing, right? But Zoomers, they don't know about this, right? They just... In this article, this professor was like... He asked his class like to give a a metaphor to describe how how a computer stores files and they all just described it kind of like a bucket like everything's just thrown in there and you just have to search to find it like they don't organize their file system because they don't even know that file systems really exist right like this is the level of tech illiteracy that the younger generation has and look it's not their fault it's the fault of big tech companies uh particularly apple um I mean, Microsoft also does this, right? Like, Microsoft, instead of just designing a good operating system, 
just like hides it all behind a layer of like quote unquote accessibility except that they're so bad at programming that the accessibility layer constantly breaks and then you just have no idea how to fix it because they didn't make a good operating system in the first place at the very least apple is working off of a good base of a unix like system which you know is, is fundamentally uh the best type of system uh at least that i'm aware of um but obviously they still lock you out they lock you out of stuff even more and this is not to talk about fucking mobile operating systems which are just disgusting frankly mobile operating systems are disgusting um so yeah zoomers they don't know they don't know that google isn't just a, a some sort of guy that talks back to you but the thing is that google realized right like like if you imagine like i think what happened was that that google realized that people tend to talk to the 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 search box as if it's a guy more naturalistically and tuned their search around that and then websites you know optimized their search engine results by also tuning around that so you know maybe there's an argument to be made that the best way to use google nowadays is to use it the way most other people use it rather than using it in the way that makes the most sense for google's system because Google sucks, right? But like everyone agrees, I'm pretty sure on this, that like Google is terrible, but it's the best search engine, even because the other ones are even worse. Um, which I think is true. I mean, I've experimented with a bunch of different search engines, and I still find myself coming back to Google at the end of the day, even though it steals your data. Like Bing, Bing is actually the second best. This is my my take, right? Most people they really shit on Bing because it's funny and it's Microsoft, so it's you know. But Bing is they've done a lot of work on Bing. The main problem with Bing is that it has all of this feature creep. It has a bunch of shit that you don't need. Like you go on Bing. I'm gonna do right now. I'm gonna go on Bing. Bing.com. I'm gonna search for blueberry pie recipes. Blueberry pie recipe. And it comes up, you know, d- d- fucking. D- 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 I mean, I can't. How do I describe? This is a this is a, a radio show. So instead of showing me just a list of results, it's shown me. It it comes up with. First, there's a big search bar that says search chat with a logo next to it that fucks up the, like, the logo is too big, so it fucks up the position of the, some of the UI elements. Uh, then shopping, images, videos, maps, news, right, that's normal. The Google does similar things except without the broken UI. Then it tells me how many results, that's also from Google. Then, bold text, like H1, <laughs> the HTML tag, recipes, and then a bunch of buttons, top rated, quick, low cal, low cal, like a bunch of suggestions f- for for like more specificity. And then this is the big thing, right? Taking up, I would say about a third of the screen, maybe like a little more, is this big, like I don't know how to describe this. It's like a a bunch of cards with pictures of blueberry pies, but they like half of them seem to be videos. And these all, I assume, are recipes for blueberry pies. Um, and, and a lot of them are videos from, from and they list how many calories they have. Like they list a bunch of random facts. Like this is just too much. And by the way, and then it says including results for blueberry pie recipes because I spelt recipes wrong. And then there's a see more button so you can see even more of these. Like, you can just see infinite of these cards, right? Okay, so let me... I pressed see more, so now that broke the, the page. Okay, so, I'm, like, this takes up the entire page. If you want to actually see the list of results, you have to scroll down. Like, you cannot actually see the results, <laughs> like, in a normal hyperlinked list like you would expect from a, a search engine. You have to scroll down to get there. Then you scroll down. When you actually scroll down to the top result, a little pop-up comes on the the left-hand side, which just says recipe directions ingredients. I guess this, and then it it's somehow scanning the article and like pulling out the like when you when you mouse over this weird tab, it's telling you in this stupid UI, frankly, just terrible with with weird ass colors on it. And it has a bunch of icons. I don't know what any of these icons mean. There's so many icons. Like, it's just ridiculous. 
it's so fucking ridiculous. And not to mention, then on the right hand side, taking up another third of the screen, is a big thing that's like the Bing chat. I found some recipes for blueberry pie recipes for you. Blah, 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 blah. It's just more links. Why are there? Why is there another tab that just shows me a different version of the same? Like this is so stupid. And then below that, the Wikipedia entry for 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 like it's so fucking noisy and messy and bloated with all of these features that are completely needless like it's actually comedic i recommend searching for something simple on bing and just looking at how fucking much of a bloated mess it's become it's it's actually insane however if you were to ignore everything except the search results i think it's fine like like as a search engine it does its job. It's just that it's also trying to like shoehorn in all of these other features because they're trying to compete with Google, not realizing that that's that's the worst way. To, this is a very Microsoft way to go about things. This is an incredible, incredibly Microsoft way to go about things. Okay, so DuckDuckGo is probably the other big, big popular search engine. Um, you know, I've tried DuckDuckGo for like I used it for like two years, honestly. It's just not, like not that good at giving me relevant results a lot of the time. Um, that's that's really the, the the problem. Like fundamentally, it's worse than Google and Bing at giving me relevant results. Like a lot of the time, it's fine, right? A lot of the time, it's it's usable, if not amazing, but it's usable. It's just that like once in a while, it'll be annoying, and that's enough for me to just be like, okay, I'm using Google instead because Google is like slightly better in terms of just relevancy. Um. Yeah, those those are like the main three, I guess. Uh, there's also like Brave Search, which just fucking sucks ass. The Show Lion, and uh, then there's some more like uh, like you know, there's some other stuff. But those are the main ones. And frankly, Google is the best one, even though it sucks. At least you can just append Reddit at the end of your search query and always get a Reddit result from a real person. In which case, you should search with naturalistic language because you're trying to find someone asking the same question as you. Or you you don't have to you can I mean actually maybe keywords are still better in this scenario but anyway what I'm saying is right the reason Zoomers have all of this shitty tech literacy and it's not just Zoomers it's everyone is because all these companies I mean a lot of them uh, they have an attitude that is I think epitomized by the CEO of the company that makes my phone so I use the Nothing Phone one which I think is a decent phone it, it's mainly good for the price like i wouldn't say it's a good phone but it's really good for the price because they this is their first phone so they they don't make any money off of it right because that's how tech companies work they just break even so they so they can break into the market and i'm taking it you better bet i am not buying your next phone you have not got any brand nothing you've not got any brand loyalty from me okay i'm just in while you're cheap and as soon as you're not cheap i'm out that's that's the uh that's the the fucking transaction we have going on here listen i'm fucking bored of this i'm just gonna just gonna put my my thought out there okay once in a while this this thing goes does the rounds on the internet right which is like how come if we're on our phone all the time never phone in a dream what uh what the if we're always on our phone why there no phone in the dream it's because there's technology doesn't really work very well in dreams anyway like there's a bunch of different stuff going on here the first thing is you don't remember your dreams very well like at most you probably remember like five minutes before you woke up you you don't remember it's very easy to convince people something happened in their dream and they'll just sort of manufacture a memory and be like oh it was like that even though it never actually happened like that you don't remember your dreams very well so the chances are there probably was a cell phone in your dreams at some point you just don't remember it because that's how dreams work the second thing is that most of the time uh, the part of the dreams that you have any chance of remembering is the the REM sleep parts but you're dreaming the whole time right I mean it's very common uh, so th- like the deep sleep type dreams you generally dream about stuff that's very mundane stuff that you do all the time strengthening already existing connections in your brain so a lot of people dream about driving and this is the sort of time when you would dream about uh, you know being on your on your damn phone like a zoomer always on their phone but you, normally you this is like in deep sleep you don't remember that um and it's the same thing with uh like i don't know if you've ever noticed this if this sort of thing has ever happened to you whenever i personally dream about playing a video game it's always like i'm in the game right 
And I think the same thing happens. Like, if you ever dream about, like, being online, like, watching a YouTube video, you just become the YouTube video. And then the fact that you were ever watching a video stops existing. But you don't recognize it because, like, games, they're very recognizable, right? Like, like if I have a dream where I'm in TF2, even if a lot of the mechanics don't make any sense, like, I'm still in TF2. Like, there are, very, there are various aspects that make it very obvious. Whereas if you're in, like, a YouTube video or an Instagram post or something... Uh, oh, here's actually a bigger thing, right? A lot of the time when you're looking at your phone, you're reading text, right? And text doesn't show up in dreams. Like, you pretty much never see written text in dreams that actually makes sense. Like, you'll notice if you look at, at some words, written words in dreams... Your brain just sort of assumes what they mean, but if you really would, this is actually such a reliable thing that people use it to detect if they're dreaming so they can lucid dream. If you actually try and read something in a dream and like really try and focus, it will just be gibberish. It won't make any sense. Uh, So that's another big thing is that most of what we do on our phones is look at text and text doesn't work well in dreams. Technology doesn't work well in dreams. That's just how dreams work. Like, I don't know what you want me to tell you. You also don't really dream about watching TV. You probably don't dream about, like, you dream about doing weird shit. Most of the time when you dream, weird shit's happening. Because your dreams are like your brain being like, what if this crazy thing happened? I have to be prepared. That's basically what dreams are like. Anyway, that's that's my rant about that. Can I just say something real quick? I haven't played CS2. I haven't checked even if I have beta access. I'm, I, for some reason, I've got it in my head that I'm just going to wait until it's officially released to play it. So I hadn't played CS2. But I obviously see a bunch of news about it. And uh, the current ongoing thing for the past like week, or longer actually, since pretty much since it, since it was the beta came out, is uh, that it, oh, it feels terrible. Sub tick is terrible, right? It, the 128 tick good, 64 tick bad. You know, all of these memes. And I just want to say, okay, this shit is nonsense a lot of the time. I'm not saying it's 100% nonsense. I think people have identified something correct. But to be honest, like, it wouldn't surprise... This is like, people don't know, and I'm people. I am including myself in people in this. People don't know what makes a game feel good or bad. Like, it, the game feel is extremely complicated and uh, you have to be a really good game designer to you know know what works and what doesn't so you know while a lot of people complaining are talking about the net code you know it could just as easily be something like the animations that feel that make it feel off right that has an equally good or, or um you know the the sound design or something like this right there are there are a ton of different things that could make the shooting feel off in the game that aren't netcode. Because I keep seeing videos where people are like, look how bad this is, you can't even hold an angle. And like sometimes it's really egregious. Sometimes it's like, you know, some, some interpolation stuff that doesn't make any sense, some lag compensation stuff that is that is busted. But also a lot of the time, it's just people missing. <laughs> it's just people missing their shots. It's I, like very strange. And maybe... Maybe they're thinking, like, this doesn't feel like it should have missed. But I've played many games, you know, Counter-Strike included, uh, fucking TF2 as well, where sometimes you shoot and it doesn't feel like you should have missed, right? In fact, when I was recording, if you go on my channel and you go back to to my channel, right, and you look at the, uh, the killed by his own sentry TF2 video, oh, I just, I have a bunch of comments. Damn. Uh... Shit, I'm gonna do some comment responses then, I guess. <clears throat> uh, but yeah, if you look look at that 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 killed by his own century TF2 video, like there's a section where I'm in spawn, I'm in blue spawn on Badwater, trying to practice with the the scatter gun, and I'm like, look, this isn't that bad. And then when I reviewed the footage, I I like pause every time I shoot, so you can see that I was actually missing every time I was missing my shots. But when I was playing it 100% felt like I was on target. Like, I legitimately thought that, like, all of these shots were were, were center mass. It really felt like that to me. I, I don't know how to explain it, but, like, I think that's a lot of the things that are going... Like, I clearly missed in the video, but while I was playing, it didn't feel at all like I missed. And I've had 
I, I think there was even a, there was a segment in the video that I never I didn't end up leaving in because I, I cut it for time. But there was another segment where again the same thing happened. Where I was like I I felt like I shot this medic center mass, but I only did five damage. And I was like, how is this possible? But then again, when I reviewed the footage, my crosshair was nowhere near the fucking guy. You know, it's a miracle I did five damage at all. But it, I remember really thinking clearly that I had hit that guy like square in the center mass. Sometimes this is just how games are. Sometimes you just feel wrong. Like you're, you're sometimes you're just wrong about your shooting if you're not used to the weapon. I think that's just the case with CS2 in some aspects. Again, not everything, but some aspects. Another thing is right. They're like, let's just get some shit clear about stuff that we actually factually know about Counter Strike. Firstly, someone ran a test where they had like a thousand people on a server and the server would randomly change between 64 and 128 tick and they had to choose you know every time it like do you feel like you're playing on 64 or 128 right now and most people did no better than randomly guessing people had no fucking idea what tick rate they were playing on people can't tell they would sometimes be really confident and wrong okay people can't tell what tick rate they're on reliably at least according to the one study that has been done on this you know, maybe there is some proportion of extremely high-level professionals who feel like, you know, who are very experienced at the game, and they can tell the difference. But I guarantee you the vast majority of players would have no fucking idea. If, if Valve had just said the servers are 128 tick right now, and somehow made it spoof that in all the code or something, you know, just set the uh, alias for the number 64 to be 128, um... <clears throat> You know, everyone would b believe it. No one would. No one would know any different. So that's the first thing: is the players they have no idea. We know that they don't know. Okay, we we have factual proof. At least the best that the, the factual proof that you can get on a situation like this that most people have no fucking idea um, what what um, tick rate they're playing on. And then the second thing is that. Uh, <clears throat> Again, we can see an example of people having no fucking idea because here's what happened over like last weekend. Someone on Reddit was who I'm assuming is a TF2 player because this is a thing that exists in TF2. Very, this is like an important thing in TF2. That it actually does make a difference. Is someone on Reddit was like, "Aha! The reason CS2 feels bad is because the default CL underscore interp uh, value is too high, and so if you change your CL underscore interp value uh, lower." then you'll, the game will feel better for you. Now, again, this does do something in TF2. Um, and a lot of... In fact, it probably shouldn't, because if you, you can abuse it if you're a spy. You can you can abuse the CL interp value so that it basically acts as if you're time-traveling behind the rest of the server, and so you can get backstabs on people who aren't facing you. And, like, as far as they're concerned, they're facing you or they're too far away, but the server is lag compensating, and so it thinks that anyway. It's it's fucking confusing, like weird weird stuff. But anyway, so uh, I saw Reddit threads about this on r slash csgo, right? And a bunch of people in these threads were like, "Aha! We found it. We found the solution." And you could look at the comments, and it, people were having in depth fucking discussions about this. Like, hmm, yes, I found that this was the best value for me. Uh, when I changed it to this, it felt terrible. But when I changed it to this value, I experimented a bit, and when I found that I set it to this, oh, suddenly the game felt so much better. And then people were like, "I agree." Oh, oh, thanks, thanks, kind redditor, for for sharing this information with me. Now I changed it, and the game feels infinitely better. Thank you. And people were seriously having like so many discussions about this, where they earnestly were talking about it. If you don't know where this is going, this is going to be very funny when you find out, because then <laughs> Valve released an update where they were like, uh, "Yeah, that, those commands never did anything. We removed that. That that never." <laughs> <laughs> the CL interp never did anything in CS2. We removed it because people were getting confused. Uh, but no, didn't do it. You, you you were just completely delusional the entire time. Like they 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 did they just didn't do anything. They just they never have they never have done anything. Everyone who was talking about that was just hallucinating. So I think from those two events, right, the fact that we have a study which shows. That you know, it's not the biggest study in the world, right? But a study that shows that most CS players have no idea what tick rate they're playing on, and 
a very clear example of a, a bunch of people mass hallucinating that some command that did nothing would improve their experience. I have a third example actually. In Counter Strike 1.6, um, a bunch of there's there's a you know what I can find the clip. Hold on, I because I retweeted this at some point. Um, excuse me while I look for this. Um, yeah, here it is. That we got a lot of feedback. Every time we release a new version, our players would complain about uh, things that we didn't even change. So, like one of the big things that they would complain about was this new version is 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 more like it has more lag than the last version. What did you guys do? And we'd be like, we didn't touch anything. What the heck are you talking about? Because, uh, like, we, we no matter how much we explain to them, uh, they would always complain. Every version, like, this is worse than the last version. Change it, change it back, please. And then we'd be like, you know, one one time I just got so fed up that the next version we released, I would just artificially re- subtract people's pings like by by negative fifty. So. <laughs> So, so if like their actual ping was 100, I just say okay, 50. Just say it's 50, and then, and then a lot of the players are like, oh my god, what did you do? This is incredible. And like <laughs> another thing. That was uh, Min Lee, who's one of the creators of Counter Strike, talking about developing Counter Strike 1.6. Okay, so it's not the first time this has happened, right? Like the actual, like I highly doubt that much has changed about the netcode of Counter Strike between Source One and Source Two. Because Source 2 is modular, right? Like, it's not... It was designed from the ground up to have things be ported from Source 1 into it, right? So, and it's it's a, a whole bunch of modules, but it's very back-compatible with Source 1. So, to, to me, you know, it would be really weird if they wrote an entirely new netcode from scratch when, instead of just porting these... Like, you know what I mean? Like, I'm almost certain... <coughs> excuse me. Excuse me, sorry about that. Like, I would guarantee you that they've barely changed anything. If stuff has changed, it's probably a bug. <clears throat> because something in my throat. If stuff has changed about the netcode, it's probably a bug, if it exists at all. Because um, they've changed it, and people say it's better, but it might just be placebo. I have no idea. Neither do they, as confident as they might be. Valve doesn't even know, probably. Um, but yeah, all the netcode stuff, I would imagine, is probably really, really similar to CSGO. Because... All of that stuff can just be ported over, and why would they why would they bother changing it when they already have something that works perfectly fine? I mean, they obviously adjusted to this subtick system, but again, like I think so many people don't understand even like I'm not a fucking network engineer, okay? I don't know much about networking, but subtick is not a difficult concept to understand. All it means is that it sends a timestamp along with the packet of whatever information. Like that's literally it. <clears throat> this is like a really common thing. In fact, like pretty much every modern game does this on a local level, something very similar, so that you can run a game and the frame rate doesn't fuck with you, right? So like, <clears throat> when you have a game that has like walking speed, um, you know, assuming it's not tied to the clock speed of the computer directly, you can what you can do basically, well, you can use the clock speed of the computer to see how long it took you to render a frame. And that that's basically it, like compensate for it, right? So, if you want to learn more about this, you can watch Matt Casey's video about fixing Lego Island's biggest bug, or it's called something like that. Um, <clears throat> because you know, in Lego Island, the original one, the turning speed is tied to the frame rate, and to unhook it from the frame rate, what you have to do is you have to, you know, check how long it took you to render a frame and include that timestamp in the information so that you can, you know account for it. That's basically what it's doing per tick in CS2. Uh, seems not very complicated to me. It doesn't seem very complicated. The only thing that's strange is Valve, you know, locking people out of 128 tick. I think, you know, they're gonna 100% commit to this. I think, as far as they're concerned, <clears throat> like, sub tick should mathematically not be differentiable from 128 tick. I don't know. They know more about this stuff than me, so I don't know about that's that's what they think. Okay, responding to some comments. Um, actually, most of, none of these comments are on. Uh, I guess some things. Oh, okay, we got we got something from someone with a with BLKA free. 
I don't know what this is. In. Did I already respond to this? Okay, this is in response to this. To most people, like the, those will seem to be the thing. It turned out not to really be. The thing. Um, and so lefties are just sort of left wondering, like, well, hold on. According to my worldview, the world just is what you make it. But it, you're right. Okay, the this is me talking about the fall of the USSR David David and not, quote, the I failure think. of other supposedly communist countries, like China. Um, <clears throat> this person with a Sakura Kinamoto profile picture, based by the way, says, Did I already respond to this? I feel like I must have already responded to this. The dissolution of the USSR cemented the belief that there is no other viable alternative to capitalism. It's also from the disposition that whatever economic and political project the USSR undertook became synonymous to communism, as neoliberals frame it. I think that's why leftists nowadays happen to be less thrilled with the prospect of a revolution and why we see the emergence of alternative ideologies. Yeah. I mean, but it's also correct. I mean, th- th- I I think you're bung- bungling two different things together, right? First, the idea that there's no viable alternative to capitalism, that's one thing, right? Where, you know, previously there was this two competing multipolar ideologies on the world stage, and then there was only one which was just a ca- the capitalist one. That's one thing. But then there's the other thing, which is, you know... The USSR was not ideal for a multitude of reasons. I don't know, even, I feel like even tankies can admit this fact, right? Like, there was a lot of problems with the USSR. And, um, you know, the USSR was following, not only was it following a playbook, but it created the playbook, which a lot of communists outside of Russia were trying to follow. And so when the USSR, you know, turned out to be a failure, it was sort of like, okay, well, this playbook doesn't work very well. Let's, you know, go back and rethink things. I think that's different. And also, I should say, it's not just the fall of the USSR, but also May 68 in Paris was also another big thing, right? Like, there was, there was, that was a moment when it was like, you know, capitalism has changed, the, the nature of the world has changed, you can't just follow the, the playbook anymore. But that's not necessarily saying there's no alternative to capitalism, although neoliberals will frame it like that. It's more so saying, like, we need to think about different ways of getting to an alternative to capitalism. Anyway, then we got D4MF4K, who says, too short, uh, reasonable. Unfortunately, I can't upload anything longer. And then Alice Quintanilla3718 says... The only step between being furry adjacent itch ish and being furry pilled is being in a social situation where it's normalized enough that you don't think about it. I mean, here's here's a couple of reasons why I'm not like like a full blown furry. Because uh, like I have nothing against furry media. Right? Like I've enjoyed a few pieces of furry furry media, whether it's just like art on Twitter that I think looks cool, that's furry art, or you know. I, there's a there's a visual novel called Purgatory that's a furry visual novel. I quite liked that. I thought that was good. You know, there's 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 a few others, right? That I've enjoyed some furry stuff. I even watched the 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 furry awakening cartoon as a kid. I I watched the Robin Hood cartoon and enjoyed it. But it never made me into a furry. There's just like frankly, although I'm neutral on furries and I think they can be cool. I I appreciate the furry culture. I don't have a categorical attraction to anthropomorphic character like it's just it's not something that's instant like anime characters i have a categorical attraction to and always have right like i was drawing shitty anime art before i'd even like watched an anime when i'd read a couple of manga when i was like eight years old right i was already interested in anime just as an aesthetic whereas i never had any urge to draw anthro characters or like any sort of particular you know attraction towards anthro characters as an aesthetic um so that's like the main thing it's not like it's a turn-off for me it, it, it's not like i'm gonna be like oh this has got furries in it they look bad or they gross me out or something like that and i'm gonna you know it's fine like it's just neutral it's just it is what it is um right so that's the first thing and then the second thing is that like i'm just simply not gay enough <laughs> right like the straight furry art is always fucking lame we all know this right and like I can handle the femboys, right? That's all chill for me. But once it gets to, like, the 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 big burly men fairy art, that's where I'm just, like... I mean, look, I'm, I'm, I appreciate this its existence, but it's not it's not for me. I'm, I'm not interested in that sort of thing. And there's a lot of that. Like, like, Echo, for example, 
right? Like, probably a really good visual novel. But frankly, I'm not that interested in just, like, I don't know. I might read it one day. I have so many other visual novels on my backlog that who knows how I'll ever get around to it. But, like, it's not super high priority because it's all about just, a, you know, a bunch of dudes fucking each other. <laughs> <laughs> there's nothing but look it's fine but it's just you know not particularly interesting to me it's not, it's not something i'm very invested in and a lot of furry stuff is like that i mean there's the other what's the other one that's by the same guy that made echo is it ad, ad astra is that what it's called like that's just, that's the same thing it, it it's a gay furry smart and you look, look purgatory is also gay furry smart but it's 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 more it's got a much more feminine aesthetic that is closer to my tastes Whereas those ones, they're they're much more, you know, big burly men type of aesthetic, and that's a bit beyond um, my attraction. And a lot of furry stuff is that, which just yeah. So anyway, those those are two things. And wait, I didn't I? I also said I could never be a furry because fur is overstimulating to me. That's another thing. Okay, I have a bunch of other comments on a bunch of other videos that I got right. Like, um, someone's been making their way through the sacred cow. Uh, depart at 43 minutes not knowing what your viable brand is and not feeling like you belong anywhere is very relatable. That's on the egg. This is way better than Horseshoe Finale. He should have read Deleuze. The thing is, when I made the sacred cow, I was completely posing. I had absolutely not read Deleuze. And I still haven't read Deleuze, really. Like, I've made an attempt, but I haven't read much to lose. Um, and then this one's on the, a comment on, oh, look, it's another 12-hour podcast, where um, Lazich36 says, maybe I'm just unperceptive, but I didn't even realize half of the stuff you mentioned about Half-Life was even going on, and I've played it through, like, four times. Maybe this means I should delve into the lore, because what you've described with Gordon Freeman being injected with meth and all the body horror stuff that I didn't even notice it sounds absolutely sick. It does, right? This is why I need to make my fucking Half-Life video. But I keep procrastinating on writing it. I'm not just procrastinating. I just don't know where to start. I've, like, collected some footage. I don't know. It's gonna happen. I'm gonna make my Half-Life video so you can all see the game how I see it. Um, but in the meantime, Leadhead has, has, has some videos. You should watch Leadhead's Half-Life 1 videos, and you should watch the Examined Life of Gaming's video, Half-Life 2 is a bad sequel. Because those are the two closest people people to getting it in the way I, I at least to getting towards the way I understand the game. I've been replaying Half-Life 1 lately, um, sort of, uh, and honestly, it's it's not as good as I remember it being, <laughs> to be honest, it's, the gunplay is much worse than I remember. Maybe it's just because I'm playing, I'm, the reason I'm replaying it is because I'm playing through the 1.1.1 the version, because I've only ever played the Steam version. Um, and I'm playing through the one point, the, the like first patch basically. Uh, not the day one release because the day one release is like too buggy to play, as I understand it. Like it's too uh, crashes a lot and stuff. But like this is the first stable release that I've been able to find. That people actually people generally recommend this one. And I gotta say, there's a lot of really cool stuff about it. I don't know if they tweaked the gunplay between this version and the Steam version, but like. I don't really like it at all. I don't like the feel of a lot of the... I mean, the shotgun feels great, but most of... The, and the the, tow, the gauze gun feels good, but m most of the other guns... And I, I've played, you know, maybe 10 hours of Half-Life Deathmatch. So, like, I feel like I should be familiar... I don't know, man. I don't know. Half-Life 1, the combat, not as good as I remember it being. Just to, gonna be real with you. But uh, the other aspects of the game are very good. I'm seeing more and more people jump onto the idea that we should have japan style public privacy laws and i want to say i'm 100 percent in support of this i've always been in support of this okay phones should be forced to have a loud ass shutter sound when you take a picture a hundred fucking percent okay and also you should be able to fucking sue people filming them in public it's retarded that you can't I don't want to get fucking filmed randomly, man. You look at videos in Japan, half the shit is blurred out. Good. Everything should be blurred out. Blur my fucking face if I'm in the background of your shot. I don't give a fuck. Listen, you guys you guys don't want to hear this, okay? You guys don't want to hear this. This may come across as sexist. And the reason that this is going to come across as sexist is because it's definitely sexist. But look, if you can show me a counterexample 
put it in the comments, show me a counterexample. I will 100%, you know, admit that I was wrong. I mean, I don't want to be right about this. I'm just going off of the evidence that I've seen, okay? So if you guys have a counterexample, I will happily, you know, disavow what I'm about to say, okay? If you find a new musician or band, new musical artist that you're interested in, what you can do is you can you can just go check before you ever heard their music. Go look at a concert video. Go go look at search their name and then live. Go look at a concert video. If you look in the audience and it's all women or it's like vast majority women, then the music is probably trash. Or it just sounds like Mitski, in which case you'd be better listening to Mitski. Hey, listen, I know this is a terrible thing to say, but I'm just being honest. This is what I see every time I click in the concert. It's if the concert, if the audience is all is all women, it's either dog shit or it just sounds like Mitski. And there's nothing wrong with with sounding like Mitski, but you're not as good as Mitski. You should just listen to Mitski instead of listening to that person that sounds like Mitski. Uh, you know, I'm just being real here. But, uh, hey, you know, maybe there's some. Maybe, uh, what, Joanna U- U- Newsom? Is that what... I-, I don't personally like her music that much, but I know a lot of people do. Maybe she she seems like the sort of artist that would have a lot of uh, female audience. But to be honest, there's not many. Like, like I'm just being real with you here. Something... Okay, we're going to get a little abstract here. I, I saw this, like, two days ago. I saw someone... This stupid-ass Twitter argument. I don't even know how I saw this. I didn't think these people still existed. But I saw someone, you know, clowning on a on an Anne Prim on Twitter, which is which is a reasonable thing to do, right? Lots of things to lots of things to clown on Anne Prims for, um, and it was basically an Anne Prim who I read through the thread, right? And there was this Anne Prim who was, I mean, probably like a fourteen year old who was talking about some, you know, stuff about diabetes, and people were like, actually, I like my diabetes medicine, and they were like. Uh, actually, people with diabetes were definitely treated better before uh, civilization, which is obviously not true. Um, and, um, you know, so then I don't remember the, the situation, but the thing I saw was uh, they, they, they used an anarchy flag of, uh, like, smiling sunglasses anarchy ball of, uh, of the Anprim flag, which was uh, with the, the text that said, like, people with diabetes should die or something like that. Um a pretty standard own of an anthem, right? But I want to point out something in a very, very, very lukewarm defense of this person. Because they mentioned this in the thread and then just, like, ignored it. They meant, like, this the, the anthem person, they, they, they briefly brought up this point, which I think is, like, a good point. And then forgot about it and never, and never mentioned it again. Which I think is, like, the strongest... It requires a little bit of mental gymnastics, but I think it's still the strongest argument in favor of, like, green anarchism. And not primitivism, I don't like anything that calls itself that, but something closer to, like, a, uh, you know, I I don't know what you want to call it. Um, just green, post-civ type stuff, right, anti-civ type stuff, which is the idea that, like, Civilization has already failed. It's already collapsed, basically. Like, we're just sort of not really aware of it. I think, actually, the 100 Rabbits guys have a a thing about this. Um, I wonder if I can find it. Uh, That's not it, I don't think. Is this it? Um, No, I don't think so. Is this it? This could be it? I don't think so. Hold on. This could be it. No, maybe... We're close. We're close. We're we're getting in. We're in the right general area of the wiki. Um, <laughs> hold on. Oh, I've gotten fucking lost now. Fuck. Ah oh, shit. Where the fuck were we? I've I've completely gone lost now. Okay. Whatever. This wiki. You know, as much as I like the information on the XXIIVV wiki, the navigation could use some work. Is there a site map somewhere that I'm just not aware of? I don't know. Anyway. There's a there's a, a article on here which starts with a phrase that's like the first thing to realize is that civilization has already collapsed basically and I think like it, again it requires some mental gymnastics with regards to the philosophy of time but like it's also you you can actually get an interesting discussion out of it about like how much you know the 
do, does the average person actually reap the benefits of civilization firstly which I think is the weaker point but secondly like hold on I need to put pasta in water right it's, essentially it comes down to the idea that or it's not even the idea look, the, 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 the fact that like we're not living in the 70s or 80s anymore when the sort of ecological movement was first starting when there was time time to change anything right like it's not like we can avert climate catastrophe anymore it, it's it's too late to avert like that's not to say that we can't do anything to mitigate it but it's too late to stop it from happening and there is a real possibility like this isn't this is the part that's interesting to discuss because i'm not saying it's a certainty but there's a real possibility that you know it, global capitalism doesn't survive climate catastrophe um which means you know no more gadgets <laughs> no no more no more no more iPhones um and so like arguing about like whether or not you know the diabetics had better uh, the the the, the anthem stuff is retarded because it's about the past which it makes it inherently a conservative movement right but making our you know talking about like okay well how do we deal with this fact right like if if civilization in some sense is collapsing in real time you know how do we best make use of the of, of what's left and how do we move forward from there uh and does this present an opportunity to dismantle certain existing power structures that's the interesting conversation to have right it, it also notice please notice i did not mention technology once right i the, the, the building better technology would be you know what sort of technologies can we scavenge this is the 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 interesting part right salvage computing how can we best make use of you know in a in a after a, a society collapses the groups who do best are the ones who are most able to to salvage and scavenge the leftovers from from what remains right so there's there's a whole bunch of of computers that are just in the trash you know that that's we have enough resources to last a long ass time even with through through salvage and, and reuse uh even if civilization collapses even if there's no ability supply chains to produce more right even with planned obsolescence and so on if you're if you're um you know creative enough there's a lot of room to make new use of old resources that already exist rather than mining the earth for resources we can be mining our own dump dumping grounds um you know which i think is a good stuff to talk about because you know although again i don't think this is like a certainty i think it's a possibility and uh you know in a society that is doesn't have stuff like complex supply chains and is more reliant on you know stuff like seasonality more more dependent on stuff like seasonality than we are now right because right now you can get any food at any time uh, through complex supply chains and shipping and 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 technological farming and stuff but you know in a world where there's no okay so the supply chains to produce nitrogen fertilizers don't exist anymore right like how are you or not or pesticides right nitrogen fertilizers aren't too hard to make i can see it being possible although maybe undesirable for a few reasons right the topsoil is so like I, i will go on about topsoil depletion forever right this is the biggest issue in the world like regenerative farming becomes not just like a cool technique that's more ecologically for it becomes necessity like you have to do it if you want to eat and you know that puts certain limitations on you there's a lot of stuff to think about here in my opinion and that's really interesting and possibly essential you know in a in a in a scenario that most people don't want to think about um but so this is the the argument to make it's not to sit around and be like uh blah blah, blah you know we need to return to the monkey the argument to make is like look this this whole civilization thing all of these supply chains and and tech, technological you know luxuries that we've become used to are fundamentally unsustainable and we all know that right even in a pretty good scenario something's got to go wrong something's going to go deeply wrong for us you know it's not going to we're not going to be able to sustain our lifestyles this is actually something i kind of get annoyed with because a lot of leftists they're like did you know well never talk about changing your lifestyle to, to because uh Oh, 100 companies are responsible for 71% of carbon emissions. Apparently, I just never finished this thought. 
when I was doing, when I was recording this, I was making pasta and I like recorded that line and then I like heard the sauce sizzling in a way that was unusual. So I got up and I had almost burnt the sauce, but thankfully I got up at that moment and fixed the sauce and ate it and it was delicious, but it was right on the edge of burning. It's now like two days later. <laughs> I'm drinking coffee. I just woke up. Um, and I'm gonna try and continue my thought from before, which was something about uh, how actually, uh, if uh, we were to live in a future that was sustainable ecologically, it would require significant change in everyone's lifestyle, not just a few companies. Um, because a lot of the stuff that produces carbon emissions is simply consumer goods. Like the idea that consumer goods. Is, uh, I mean, there's a the the people from Hundred Rabbits. They have a good image they use like everywhere, which is something like we've we've been taught that gadgets for everyone rain out of the sky. It's simply not the case, you know. You like it's not just that the Apple has to make their fucking factories carbon neutral because that's fucking nonsense, okay? Do you know how Apple makes their factories carbon neutral? They buy a bunch of carbon credits from, from other people. And this carbon credit industry is a complete fucking scam, okay? It's not a scam to companies, it's a scam for us. It is it is made up. Um, so the, the way it works, right, is that, that Apple, they track how much carbon, roughly, they release, right, in the process of manufacturing iPhones, and that they convert that into some metric called carbon credits, which which no one really understands how that works. And as I understand it, there's no, like, standard, but anyway. And then they see how, how over they are, right, how many carbon credits they owe. And then whatever amount that is, they purchase those credits from some other company whose job is to have a surplus of carbon credits. Now, how do these other companies have a surplus of carbon credits? Who is, you know, who is uh, overseeing and regulating the the carbon credit industry? Well, the answer is obviously no one. Uh, it's made up. The carbon they get these carbon credits by sometimes planting new trees, which is better than nothing. You know, I'm not saying it's but it's. But it's, but it's the, they 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 have been caught before vastly overestimating the amount of carbon they're capturing by planting trees. Um, and another way, and this is the worst one, is by just owning land and saying we're protecting a nature reserve that we're not going to allow anyone to cut down. Except that most of the time, no one was ever fucking planning to cut that bit of forest down anyway which is why they can afford to buy it for cheap. They just make fucking bank by pretending that they're protecting this bit of forest from being cut down. But even then, it's nonsense, because they're not even sequestering any carbon from the atmosphere. Or any, they're not planting any new trees. And also, the, there's also the... the, the they, they might be paying, like, all of these stupid startups to, like, do the fake carbon removal by machines thing that isn't real and has never been real. Um... But most of the time, it's companies that, that their job is to plant trees. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can look into this yourself. The whole carbon credit industry is, is fucking nonsense. So no, it will never be sustainable to have iPhones. It's just not because also, and here, this is like such an obvious thing. I don't know why I have to mention it. Carbon emissions aren't the extent of environmental issues. Okay, I, have, I think I've said this before. I would put them like fifth. In a, in a list of top five environmental issues, okay? Number one would be topsoil depletion, uh, which has, you know, no one fucking cares about, because, I don't know, I, don't, I honestly don't know. Everyone only focuses on CO2, and it is incredibly frustrating to me. Topsoil depletion, like, CO2, okay, so, the global warming, CO2, greenhouse effect, the, the earth warms up, it's bad, it's not ideal, it's pretty bad, right? More extreme weather events, ocean acidification, um, and sea level rise. These things are bad, right? It, if, especially if you live in the global south, you know, or on an island nation, these things are going to suck. However, if the topsoil stops working, no one has any food and everyone starves to death. Okay, that is much worse. That is really fucking... It doesn't get worse than that. That is pretty much as bad as things can get. That is That is a much bigger issue, in my opinion, okay? So, 
top soil depletion will be number one. Um, and the solution to that is to it's also relatively simple it's just boring you just have to get like the u.s to change some of their agricultural policies um it's a bit complicated but like if you know you get some of these countries make major economies major food producers to change some of their agricultural policies stop subsidizing you know it's sort of instead of subsidizing like like say the, the u.s right the u.s does massive subsidies for beef and corn right but monocrops, okay, so here's the, here's the thing, right? Mono, having having a monocrop, right? A monocrop is when you have one field that grows one crop. Big, 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 big field, and it just has corn on it, or it just has wheat on it. Okay, so as far as, um, like, every other creature on Earth is concerned, that is a desert, because, like, you can't survive. Nothing can live there, right? I mean, they use pesticides and herbicides to kill any other plant except the one plant that they want to grow, and... That one plant, you know, they don't nothing nothing can eat it because we don't want them to eat it. That's our farm, right? It's it's a it's a fucking desert. There's nothing to pollinate, you know. Just like uh, uh, everyone, like it's so obvious why the bees are dying. It's because of the, this monocrop farming. Like everyone knows this, but everyone's afraid to say it for some reason. I don't know why, but yeah, they, the 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 soil is effectively sand, and they just pour nitrogen onto it until little stuff grows um and you know they're growing all of these non-native plants they're killing everything and it's just a big field of one crop it's effectively a desert as far as everyone else is concerned who isn't you know growing that crop and so yeah of course that's bad the solution is um to, to use more regenerative farming techniques it's 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 actually relatively well understood these days um you know, it's 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 not just about organic. It's not just about organic. Organic has some problems, but uh, you know, I'd like to see some changes to our entire food system, where things are grown more locally. I mean, obviously that's good. Um, things are, and and there's more of a focus on native plants, which would be nice. Uh, but but generally speaking, I mean, it's you, you need you need biodiversity. You need significantly fewer if not zero chemical fertilizers pesticides and herbicides and um you know use a use 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 many don't just plant one crop don't just plant one fucking crop okay many crops many crops in the same place the reason that the soil gets depleted is because there's just one guy growing there and that guy needs the same shit right he always takes the same shit he's he's got the same diet but plants are very different from each other and so you can set up a situation where uh, one plant sequesters like nitrogen from the soil and then you can plant legumes which will put nitrogen into the soil stuff like that um let's have a biodiverse you know permaculture type of situation and it manages itself so that's one thing i would suggest and of course a lot of these crops right a lot of these crops aren't even grown to feed humans they're grown to feed animals especially cattle in america and that's bad because the thing about cows is they can fucking eat grass. They don't need to be eat, eat corn. You don't need to grow corn to feed them. They can already eat grass with grows for free. What are you doing? So that's retarded. A uh, much better way would be to stop doing that. <laughs> to stop, to stop fucking doing that. That's a waste of money uh, and t- space and time is a bad idea. And turn all those big cow fields into biodiverse meadows. You know, the cows they can eat all the native grasses. That's great prevents wildfires if the native grasses get too big they start you know drying out in the summer and then wildfires start so these are my discord pings by the way um you know that's good that's good to to get some ruminant grazing animals keep your native grasses relatively short because obviously they grew in that environment where there would be bison and similar native american ruminants keeping them uh keeping them, them short uh you know, and then have it just be biodiverse, and you can even do a little bit of a, you know, agroforestry. That's another thing. You can you can plant trees in these places. I have some trees around. It's enrichment for the animals. It's enrichment, and it's, it's better for the soil. It's significantly better for the soil. You know, trees are incredibly important, of course. Okay, so that's my topsoil rant. I'd say number two issue is probably resource scarcity. Um, so like. You know, before probably before the Earth warms to a point where um, 
it's actually uninhabitable for humans. I'm not saying before it gets harder to be a human, I'm saying before it gets uninhabitable. Uh, before the Earth warms to a point where it becomes uninhabitable for humans, uh, we will run out of all of the resources that we need. We're going to run out of oil, we're going to run out of coal, we're going to run out of natural gas. And when I say that, I don't mean we're going to actually run out. I mean it's going to get to the point where it's prohibitively expensive for the average person because we're going to run out of the easy deposits. And so we're going to have to spend more and more extracting that those fossil fuels from, from not just fossil fuels but also stuff like lithium and cobalt and all of these sort of metals we're gonna exhaust all of the easy to access supplies which is bad and it's worse than carbon emissions for the following reason you can solve carbon emissions by switching to nuclear or renewables but those renewables you know putting saying nuclear aside for a second um these renewables are not a drag and drop replacement for fossil fuels because you can't just make more electricity whenever you want. You are at the whims of, you know, the sun or the wind or whatever. And so you don't get to decide when you have a surplus. And so the idea is to always have a surplus by storing all of that energy in a battery somewhere. And uh, those batteries require lithium, and the lithium won't last forever. And those batteries don't last forever, right? You have to replace them. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna stop talking about this. This is fucking boring. I feel like I've ranted about this like 50 times already. Oh man, well, how did I get onto this topic? Oh yeah, well, basically, what I'm saying is basically, what I'm saying is, right? They're like, in an actually ecologically sustainable future, things about your life are gonna have to change. You're not gonna be able to purchase off season vegetables in a store for cheap prices. That is just not a sustainable way of existing in the world. Um, you're not going to be able to purchase, you know, high performance uh, Apple products, right? Because creating the process of creating those things is just too resource expensive to justify their existence, too energy expensive. It just requires way too much energy to run and build a, a Mac like the one I'm using right now when, you know, there's no reason to have one. There simply isn't. No one needs it. Um, they're never. It's not like they're ever going to contribute. It's not. It's not like you know the, the the resources required to create the laptop ever get offset, right? That's just that's just just gone. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's bad. Like, why waste lithium on laptop batteries when you can be using that to for much more important things? It's pretty stupid. Um, yeah, in a in a sustainable world, most people probably wouldn't even own a computer. And definitely not a, a smartphone. And if they did own a computer, it'd probably be much more um, basic, much more, you know, closer to to a, a computer from the the 90s, you know, and probably scavenged. This is the thing, right? Is that the talking about this, like in a sustainable future, this 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 is not what I'm what I'm saying is more accurately not like if humanity got its shit together and started enacting laws to do like i'm not even saying that I, like this is this is a, a case of like you know when the climate apocalypse happens and we have no choice <laughs> that's pretty much what i'm saying like do you know how to make do you know how to manufacture semiconductors chips i don't know do you know how to do that i fucking don't i don't even know what the right word is i don't know i don't know i don't fucking know how to do that at all i know some people i know i know like one guy has like got a DIY semiconductor manufacturing plant in his garage, but he has a bunch of like equipment and shit. But no, we're gonna be reusing shit. We're gonna be hunting through the dumps and pulling out chips from old phones and shit. You know, and the, the, that that's fine. It is what it is. I need to be hunting through the dumps. That's my thing, right? You know, I've heard a lot of people they talk about these electronic dumps. You can go there, get free electronics. Where? Tell me where to go. I would fucking love to go to some electronics recycling place. That is my notification. If I could go to some electronics recycling place and pick up a bunch of broken shit and just harvest their chips, I would hella fucking do this. I don't know where to go. I need to figure this out. I need to figure this out. So I've done something kind of... I don't know if it's out of character or... I, don't, I can't tell if it's shockingly out of character or shockingly in character. You have to be the ones to decide for me in the comments. But I, I've decided to start watching Bluey. Uh, if you don't know what Bluey is, it's a uh, it's an Australian kids cartoon uh, about little dogs <laughs> who are guys, dogs who are kids, 
and dogs who are those kids' parents. Just doing things, basically. Mainly playing around and having having a good time. Sometimes learning some life lessons, you know? And uh, as I posted on, on Blue Sky, which is apparently something I do now, as I posted on Blue Sky, I'm afraid to tell you... So, the thing about Bluey, right? Here's the, 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 the thing about Bluey. Is that, that like, Bluey has a fan base of, of adults. Um, but, like, unlike most other cartoons that have a fan base of adults... Like, if you think about the cartoons that have a fan base of adults, right? You know, it's stuff like Steven Universe. Um, you know, The Owl House. These sorts of things that are, like, programs aimed at, you know, older children. Whereas Bluey is aimed at, like, very young children. Like, it's quite different. It's it's more like a... You know, it's aim, aimed at younger children than most of the shows that you would expect to have an adult fan base. And the, the general consensus about Bluey is that it's a show that is as much about being a parent as it is about being a child. And that's why it's really interesting or good. And I think I, I, I agree with this, right? Like, the parents... Louis' parents are a big focus of the show. And, um... It's very... I don't know. They have an interesting relationship. They, they're, they're interesting characters. For, you know... Clearly, there's a reason it's popular. The producers have put thought into, you know, the characters' relationship. In an interesting way. The parents are... It's... I, I've seen it described, and I don't agree with this, but... I've seen it described as a show that looks like it's about being a kid... But it's actually about how to be a good parent. Like, a lot of parents treat it like a guidebook on how to be a good parent. And I think that's good. Like, it's a good guidebook. Um, yeah. So that's interesting. So, obviously, it gained popularity, not like, you know, a lot of the Cartoon Network shows or Gravity Falls. You know what I mean? Like, those gain popularity sort of through teenagers watching it who then post about it on the internet and then, you know, 20-somethings watch it. Uh, you know, teenage stoners watch it. It's not the same thing. Bluey gained popularity because, like, 30-something parents were watching it with their young kids and found out they liked it. Um, but, but here's... So Bluey's good. This is the thing. What I said on Blue Sky is, unfortunately, I have to tell you that the weirdos who think Bluey's good are right. Bluey is actually good. It's, it looks amazing. <laughs> this is the first thing. Like, it's rare to find Western animated shows. I guess Australia... Does Australia count as the West? But, you know what I mean. No, Non-Japanese. <laughs> Non-Japanese animated shows that actually look good. They don't really happen very often. Um, but Bluey does. You know, if you look at other shows in a similar demographic, like like Peppa Pig, for example. Peppa Pig, look, it's very block, solid colors. Doesn't really have much detailed backgrounds or uh, expressive animation in the characters. Bluey's not like that. Bluey does have, in my opinion, great character designs. Really nice background art. Just a really nice art style in general. And the animation is, like... Pretty impressive, in my opinion. Um, oh, another fun fact about Bluey is that it's all in colors that dogs can see, and all the characters are dogs. And the dog that lives here thinks they're dogs, <laughs> and so he like gets very confused every time I'm watching the show because he doesn't understand the concept of a screen because he's a dog. Um, hold on, I need to taste this pasta sauce to see it needs more salt. So yeah, it looks great. It's actually funny. And it's not just me that thinks this. Like, there's good jokes. There's genuinely good jokes in Bluey. Um, the the characters are very relatable. Both the child characters, you know, I remember being that way when I was that age. And the the parent characters, you know, although they're older than me, I think are very... This is every, they're good. They're just great. They're, they're just genuinely endearing characters. And, and the plots of each episode... You know, they, they go a little, in my opinion, maybe a little further than most kids' shows. Um, a little more nuanced to the, the sort of moral lessons. But, you know, whether or not that's true, I think even the ones that are basic are just well executed, which is good enough for me. Um, but here's the reason I'm bringing this up, right? Is because there's an obsession on the internet in the, 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 the Bluey fandom where a lot of people, and I see this with a lot of other cards as well, are really into the idea of saying, oh, it's, don't worry, it looks like a kid's show, but it's actually for adults, right? Or like, bro, it's, it's really for the parents who are watching it with the kids. And I see this with all sorts of shows, especially cartoons. Like, oh, no, it's not really a kid's show. 
it's really for adults. And I'm like, this is a, this is how the normie brain functions. This is actually how the Norman brain perceives the world. Is that they need to be, they're like vampires. You know how vampires, they can't enter a building unless they're invited in? Like, if they're watching a show that doesn't explicitly tell them, this is made for you, then they, they can't watch it. I think, you know, hopefully this doesn't come off as like, I don't know, offensive or in any way. But I think this is, this is something to do with the obsession with representation in media. I'm not saying it isn't important, but I think it's, uh, you know, the, the importance of the issue, in my opinion, is a little overstated. But because, like, you know, I've never found it difficult to relate to media that doesn't have anyone who looks like me. Case in point, I mostly watch slice of life anime about, you know, fucking Japanese teenage girls. Okay, it's not hard for me to relate to that. Um, but I think that the reason is that the normie brain, they need to be very explicitly told this is for you before they are allowed to watch it. And so if they see someone that looks like them in the show, then it's like an indicator of like, hey, this show is made for people like you. Which I think is, this isn't like me being necessarily rude. Like, if you're a normie, that's just how your brain works. Then of course it's going to feel bad if you don't see any people, you know, if you're, you're a, a black lesbian and you don't see any of them in, in your media, you're going to be like, I feel like none of this is made for me. And for some reason that's important to you, you know. But I, I, I don't understand this concept of like, something has to be made for me and my demographic in order for me to be allowed to enjoy it. That's a strange, that's an alien concept to me, you know? Like, I, like, also, like, when I watch Bluey, it's clearly made for, like, seven-year-olds. <laughs> or younger. It's made for, like, five-year-olds. I don't know. It's clearly made for five-year-olds. It's also made for the parents to watch with the kids. But it's primarily made for five-year-olds, right? That doesn't make it a bad thing. That's not a problem. You can use your brain to imagine what it would be like to be five years old. That's, like, a very easy thing to do, for me at least. Maybe these people, maybe these people don't share my, my high IQ. <laughs> um, but, you know, you watch a show for, like, a demographic that isn't your demographic. What does it matter? What does it matter? You just enjoy it anyway if it's good, and if it's shit, you don't enjoy it. That's how it works. I, I don't know, I don't need to, I don't need someone to tell me this show is made for white men in their early 20s <laughs> and if you don't l like you know if you're not that then get out of here i don't need someone to tell me that that's that's a weird thing that's but in fact a lot of the shows that are for that i don't like i don't like them okay here's what you're saying right now oh oh but no thank you but no thank you those slice of life anime are made for adult male otaku and you're an adult male otaku so really you are just caught in this same loop of watching stuff targeted at your demographic. Okay, first of all, what about instead? What if I, I said shows about, you know, fucking Japanese schoolgirls? What if I said Cardcaptor Sakura instead? Okay, Cardcaptor Sakura, probably the best magical girl anime. Probably the best magical anime. At least out of the ones I've seen, Cardcaptor Sakura is the best one. It's a fucking amazing show. And while it does have an otaku fan base, I don't think you can make the argument that it was made for otaku, okay? At least as the primary demographic. I don't think you can make that argument. There you go, case in point. Boom. Oh, that's only one show. There are others, motherfucker, okay? There are many others, okay, motherfucker? But secondly, there's a difference. There's a difference. Because if, you know, one, otaku is not some intrinsic identity that you're just born with. It's, uh, uh fucking... <laughs> Here, to, to paraphrase um, whoever said this, one is not born, but rather becomes an otaku, okay? <laughs> it's different from just, like, you know, the stuff that, that, that nature has given you, right? I, you have to make an active effort to be an otaku. Same way you have to make an active effort to, to do any of these other things, right? But it's different from just, like, oh, I'm only watching stuff for the category that I was assigned by nature, Right, I am a 34-year-old uh, white man, so I will only watch the anime that are for 34-year-old white men. Or not anime, the, the TV shows and movies and stuff. That's fucking stupid. That's fucking stupid. Watch other shit. You don't have to, but the thing is, that when they, they, when they like something else, they do watch other shit. But every time they do it, they have to pretend, don't worry, it was secretly made for me. I've been invited in. Secretly. This show that looks like it's for kids, secretly, it's for the adults. No fucking isn't, motherfucker. It's not for the adults. What are you talking about? It's just a good kid show. Why can't you just admit that you enjoy it? What's wrong with you? 
that's the that's the Norman brain. That's the Norman brain in action. That's how the Norman brain functions. That's what I'm telling you. Holy shit. I just watched the worst medic misplay in history. Actually, I was a part of the worst medic misplay in history. So there we are. Barn Blitz last on blue. The game is ending. The cart is like inside the building, but like halfway to the actual point, to the, to the actual ending, right? It's like halfway there. It's like one small push away from being held down by one sentry. It's counting down, it's getting close. We destroy the sentry, but, to, but, but at the same time, time runs out. I'm respawning at this time, because I died. Or actually, I'm running back to the front line, pretty much. Over time, I, I'm running back to the front line. I managed to get back into the building. It's chaos in there, there's, there's spies, everything. But the sentry, the level three is down. If we can pull off one last pub push, we might be able to do this, especially because our team is just respawning. I think it's possible. But a demo, spamming on the cart, killing a bunch of people until, and meanwhile, I can't quite get to the cart, right? I'm pushing through the crowds trying to get to the cart. The timer's counting down, the overtime timer on the bottom. You know, none of us have been on the cart. Five, four, three. I'm just about to get to the cart, okay? I'm literally just about to come within range of the cart. And then, just as I'm, I'm like, okay, I'm walking this way, but I'm turned sideways because I know there's a guy to the side. There's a soldier spamming rockets down onto the cart. So I'm turned to look at the soldier, but I'm walking towards the cart. I know I'm, I'm just about to enter the cart's range. As the number hits fucking two, two seconds left, I'm literally just about to touch the cart, which resets, if you don't play TF2, resets the overtime timer. It might just be enough to give my team time to respawn. But everyone else is dead. It's just me and this medic. And then I'm just about to touch the cart and he uses Uber on me. He uses Uber on me. It's just us two. And there's two seconds left. And then he uses Uber on me. Which, if you don't know, you can't push the cart when you're Ubered. So he uses Uber on me, losing us the fucking game. The worst, there is literally, like, clinically not a, a, you can't think of a worse time to use Uber. Like, I'm sure the guy just panicked and didn't realize everyone else was dead. But that was the only chance we had, was if I or this medic had touched the cart to reset the timer and then hopefully just managed to push the cart just a tiny bit and hopefully our team manages to respawn and we get there and it's all good. That's the only chance we had. But the fucking medic used on me so I couldn't even push the fucking cart and he killed us all. He made us lose. That, there you go. That is the worst medic misplay of all time. Last two on the cart, just before I touch the cart to reset the overtime countdown, he uses Uber. The biggest misplay in TF2 history. Okay, there we go. You know, in real time, in my world, we're 10 minutes away from hitting the 12 hour mark. But in your world, we're about to truncate these damn silences. So we're gonna get another like two hours or something. I don't know, but I just made myself mad. I just made myself mad thinking about fucking Skyrim. I, that fucking game, man. This, the, the worst, I think this is the single worst game design thing to ever exist. Is an uh, open world RPG, right? Already a sketchy. Already, yeah, yeah, you better be careful, right? But open world RPG, make the enemies scale with your level. Kill yourself. It's so bad. I hate it because it doesn't feel like you're getting any stronger. You, you, you fucking spend the whole game leveling up, and you still have the same hard time beating the the early monsters as you you know it's stupid it's so stupid it's the worst thing ever like okay there's two ways to do enemy scaling in an open world game right either you just have some places where you can't go as a beginner you know or as an early player because the enemies are too strong or you scale the enemies with with your level give me the first fucking option (laughs) every fucking time every time give me the first option i because otherwise if you don't, if you make the enemies scale with your level, what's the point of having a leveling system? What are you gaining? Nothing. The number's going up, but it's not doing anything. I mean, obviously, everyone knows at this point that Skyrim is. I mean, I was gonna say Skyrim is broken. Skyrim is broken in a number of ways, <laughs> but Skyrim is famously broken in that there's there's certain systems that don't 
enemy damage doesn't scale with, or enemies don't scale with some systems, so you can become like ridiculously OP. Uh, I f it's potions, right, or something like that. I forgot. Potions and like enchanting weapons. I, it's been so fucking long since I played Skyrim, I don't even remember. <clears throat> but yeah, that's the classic trick of how to become super overpowered in Skyrim. But that's not on, I don't think that's on purpose. I think Bethesda just fucked up. Uh, and the, the, the normal, I mean, combat sucks in Skyrim already, but it extra sucks because leveling doesn't do anything. It makes me so mad. Any game that does this, it makes me so fucking mad. Just have, you know, enemies that are too strong in some places. And then when you go there, an NPC is going to come up to you and be like, be careful, there's really strong guys over there. You might want to level up before you go over there. You know, I don't care how you do it. You can have a bit of dialogue pop up, like a text box pop up that tells you, uh, warning, you're going into an area with strong enemies. You might want to level up first. I don't even give a shit. Okay, I do not give a fuck how you do it. Even that is better than just throwing the idea of levels completely out. I mean, it's f if you want to get rid of the idea of leveling your character, then do that. <laughs> Don't pretend that levels do something. Oh, mate, it makes me so fucking mad. Welcome to the section of the podcast where the silences are no longer truncated. We hit the 12 hour mark, but thankfully I can compress 12 hours into less than 12 hours through the magic of audacity. Here's something I've been wanting to say on the internet for like two years now, and just not had a place to say it. This is a good place to say things like that. Fashion shows. Auto couture. That's what it's called, right? Auto couture. High fashion. It's funny. It's a funny thing to laugh at. It's stupid. I agree. I agree with you that it that it is silly. It is extremely silly. I don't want to play defense for the fashion industry. I will much rather play defense for like modern art in terms of like museum art than you know high fashion culture. I would much, even though they're they're sometimes ridiculous in similar ways and are both tied up with the upper classes in similar ways, I would much rather defend museum art than f high fashion. However, it seems like a lot of people don't even really understand the point of these fashion shows. Uh, they, they, the, the point is that the clothes are silly. Uh, people say, well, who would ever wear that? This type of thing. Now, I recommend, if you've never done it, to go and, like, watch a fashion show. They're always on YouTube. Um, Balenciaga is probably a good one to go, go with. Because they have, a, they have a very specific vibe. Um, so here's how the fashion shows work here's the point of them the point isn't that anyone is expected to wear most of the clothes sometimes they will you know open up with a bunch of the really ridiculous stuff and then you know somewhere towards the end the second half they start to show their normal clothes. And they normally have, like, their actual lines in there, right? Like, here's the... Essentially, the ridiculous stuff is supposed to set a vibe. And it's not just the clothes, but everything, the music, and the, the way the runway is decorated, and, and even the facial expressions and walking styles of the models is carefully curated by someone who is paid far too much in order to create a vibe. And the point is that these people are paid exorbitant amounts of money to try and be essentially saying, here's the vibe for the next two years, okay? Here, we're going to try and give you an impression of a vibe, and then a year from now, all of the fashion-conscious people will be on this vibe, and then two years from now... This is going to be the general vibe of, like, fashion that you see normal people wearing. 
That is what they are paid the big bucks to do, is to imagine in two years from now what is going to be trendy and how do I give people the impression of that in a vibe, even if you don't know exactly, you know, what style of clothes is going to be trendy. And it's a simultaneous job of setting the culture, but also predicting, you know, where culture is going to go outside of what you set as a trend. That is the that is why they get paid a bunch of money, because that is, I assume, actually, I'm, you know, I'm sure you can imagine as well. That is a, probably a pretty hard job. And I think they often succeed. So if you go back and you watch these, like, fashion shows from, like, two years ago, you'll, at least in my opinion, notice that, like, they are on a vibe that people are on now. What the fuck? I'm getting an ad on YouTube? What the hell is this? I'm getting an ad? Wait, they, 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 they broke uBlock. They broke uBlock. No, I refreshed the page and didn't get an ad. Hold on. That's scary. Let me go, let me watch a random video and see if I get an ad. No ad on this. Any ads? Any ads on these things? No ads? No ads? Why did I get an ad? What the fuck was that? This. I'm not getting any ads anymore. How did I get... Hold on, let me let me refresh, refresh the page. This is scary. We're having scary moments now. Okay. It's April 21st. No ads. No ads. Okay. I don't know what the fuck happened there. But we no longer have any ads. That was a spooky moment. But that was this was a tangent. You know, if you go back and you watch some of these older fashion shows, I'm looking at this and I'm like, yeah, this kind of is the vibe from last year. You know, two years ago, they had the vibe from last year. And it's almost the vibe from this year in many aspects, you know? I feel like they get, they're, good at, they're kind of good at it. This is a vibe. I see people dressed like this. And maybe not like that. But you know what I'm trying to say. I don't know. I don't think they're that good at it. Like, listen. I'm just saying that's what they're trying to do, okay? Let me actually soften my statement. <laughs> let me let me go back and soften my statement significantly because I think I was a little too optimistic in my memory of of these things. I think that's what they're trying to do. I'm not saying they get it right. <laughs> okay, I just think that they're trying to to do this thing where they predict the vibe like two years from from when they make the thing. Okay, that's my fashion. You'll never hear me talk about fashion again. You know, it's possible that someone could be listening to this podcast who has no idea who I am. Here's the things I care about. I'm a simple man, okay? I'm very simple as a man. Here's the thing. So I'm no thank you. I make music. I make music. Things I care about. Making music, number one. Number two, Valve's smash hit 2007 video game, Team Fortress 2. My favorite class is the Demo Man. Okay, these are two things. Next, I'm an otaku, which means I like anime and adjacent media. But specifically, I would consider myself to be a moe otaku. The concept of moe is famously hard to explain, and it's kind of an outdated term these days. But uh, you can imagine I like anime and related media that is less on the sort of action, cool side of the spectrum, 
and more on the relaxing, cute side of the spectrum. Um, big into that stuff. Uh, I also have um, other interests. Uh, one of which is 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 some some technology. A uh, little bit of Linux, a little bit of Linux and BSD. Bit of a, a hobbyist in that regard. Although I do not know how to program. I have tried to learn a few times, and I plan to continue trying to learn a few times more. But I do not consider myself to know how to program. I mean, I know how to use HTML and CSS, but that doesn't count. Those aren't really programming languages. Uh, that being interested in computers is somewhat related to, to uh, some parts of my uh, I suppose you could call them political opinions or ideological opinions so I'm I'm not a big fan of copyright and intellectual property I think that that system is, is fundamentally broken from its conception you know even from a there, there's so many I don't want to get into it be, I could rant about this for too long I have like a bunch of videos about this but there, there are many problems with, with copyright as a system which which lead to to lack of, of availability of information to people who want it and a stifling of creative freedom uh, and many other problems which uh which I see as 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 a big deal. It's a, very annoying to me, and this leads me towards uh, free software, free and open source software, which uh, kind of goes hand in hand with being into Linux. Uh, that's that's cool. I like that. I I prefer the less permissive licenses. So so there are two kinds of types, generally speaking, when it comes to Libre licenses, whether it be a a Creative Commons thing for for art or a software license, they often come in two flavors. Some of them are like you can just do whatever you want with this, and some of them are like you can do whatever you want with this as long as you also let people do whatever they want with whatever you make with this. And I like the second type more because the first type is very ripe for misuse. I believe. I think there are historical examples of this too. Uh, like, if you if you use the, the, the that type, the, the overly permissive type, like the BSD license, for example, um, or, or Creative Commons Zero, for example, uh, it's very easy for some big company to come and snatch up your project for free and then put a price tag on it and then not let anyone do anything with it. Like, you know, it's annoying. So you want to you wanna have a situation where, you know, normal everyday people can do cool stuff with your stuff and then more people can do cool stuff with their stuff and it spreads and it's really cool. Uh, so yeah, I like that. Big fan of that. Not a big fan of copyright and intellectual property law. Um, another thing that is also kind of related to Linux and technology is uh, and politics is is ecological matters. Now, you know, a lot of people who are concerned about ecology are very... Well, I, I feel like I have quite a different attitude. Like, they're very empathetic, I feel like. They're coming from a, a very empathetic standpoint where they sort of feel an innate you know, pain uh, when when they see uh, TF2 music is playing in the background now when they see a, a sort of nature being destroyed or animals getting hurt or or whatever. See, I, I don't have any of that, right? Like, I, I'm a, a guy that's more of a shut-in. I don't like to leave my room very often. I'm not the big you know, I can appreciate some nature from time to time. I like going on a nice walk in nature once in a while. But not often, you know, it's it's not that great of a place. <laughs> and I don't really care that much about animals. Uh, you know, I eat meat and I will continue to eat meat. 
Um, you know, it's not, I mean, it's not like I hate animals. There's a dog right here who is very nice and cute, and I, I love him. Uh, but, you know, I don't have, like, a particularly strong empathy towards animals. Like, like a lot of environmentally-minded folks. I am more coming from a practical standpoint. Where I just see these behaviors that humanity is engaging in as fundamentally unsustainable, you know, like, sustainability, I, I know it's kind of a buzzword, but if you think about what the word actually means, I think it's very important, right? Like, it's physically impossible for us to keep doing the stuff we're doing. Like, we're going to run out of resources to do this stuff. That's a, that's a, I mean, and that's only one problem. There are many problems, and it, it's just Im impossible for us to keep doing the stuff we're doing. And I am coming from that sort of position, not from a position of like, uh, you know, oh, the the animals are dying. Don't you feel bad about the polar bears dying? I don't really give two shits about the polar bears dying for their own sake. They can die. I don't care. You know, uh, I'm not saying this from a humanist perspective. I'm not saying, oh, it only matters once humans start dying. And I don't know, really. I'm just sort of saying from a sustainability perspective from a like we can't really keep doing this it's not practical which of course is a matter of technology in in, a, in in essence and writing better technology to do more stuff with with less power do do more with less that's always cool so those are some of my stuffs um and then what else am I into? I'm into the internet. I like that place. I like I like a bunch of play, like like a, some anonymous image boards. I like some anonymous image boards, and I like privacy and security on my computer. It's all linked to Linux stuff, I guess. These things all kind of go hand in hand. Um. And, uh, do I have any other hobbies or anything? I'm not much of a gamer, to be honest. I, I play a lot of, like, Team Fortress 2, and I used to play a lot of Counter-Strike Global Offensive. But of, outside of those, you know, I, I might pick up a game once in a while, but I'm not much of a gamer. Uh, let me see. I got a, I definitely have another hobby, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of am into philosophy, but but I'm not, like, that deep into it. I think about it a lot, but, like, a lot of it goes over my head. Um, yeah, you know, I, I think about... I like, I like some philosophers. I like... Uh, who do I like? I like late Wittgenstein. I, I like I like the, the the philosophical investigations. I like uh, maybe maybe a little bit of uh, Foucault, a little bit of Deleuze. Although I don't really understand it, I like what I do understand. Um, I used to be big into this accelerationism, Nick Land thing. And these days, I'm kind of uh, as time goes on, less and less into this accelerationism Nick Land thing um, more and more seeing the flaws in it as I you know the more I understand about it the more I understand the flaws in it uh, but I used to be pretty big into that more so than I am now um, what other philosophers do I like I don't know. I used to be a lot more into like a, a, some some of the hard end of philosophical pessimism, like a little bit of Thomas Ligotti, um, a little bit of Thomas Moynihan, spinal catastrophism, not X risk. X risk is retarded. Spinal catastrophism is good though. Uh, I like David Graeber, although he's not a philosopher; he's an anthropologist. But David Graeber is good. I like a bit of the the politics, you know, a little bit of the 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 kind of lefty politics. But David Graeber, bit of a, right, I'm just gonna fucking name a bunch of people off. That'd be boring. Not just naming them off. 
But yeah. Oh, excuse me. And mainly I'm just sleepy. I'm I'm EP. That's where I'm at, I'm at right now, as I'm being EP. You know, you know, the internet, you never heard of the internet, you never know of the internet, <laughs> you never know of the internet, on the internet, you know, back in my day, the internet used to be like forums and shit, but now, it's all about Twitter and YouTube and shit. You know, not about the internet. <laughs> Listen, what I'm trying to tell you is, used to be all these different places. People's all in these different places. Now they all's in one's a place together. It's fucked up. It's fucked up situation. Used to be, you go to a place, and if you don't like it. It's just not for you. It's the internet. There are loads of places. You can just go somewhere else. It's fine. It's completely fine. Didn't bother you back in the day. Never bothered you. You'd go to a forum. You'd check it out for a week, whatever. An evening even. You'd see the posting. You'd be like, this ain't for me. Or maybe you get told to fuck off. And then you'd fuck her off, you know? You hear me? You hear me? You'd fuck her off. But now, then they done fucked up. They don't put everyone in the same goddamn place. Why'd they fucking do that? Some, some reason. I don't know. Seems like a bad idea to me. And the thing is, and the thing, the gosh darn thing is, excuse my French, pardon my French. The gosh darn thing is, they know where they fucked up too, because they don't even do that no more. You might be sitting there thinking, fuck you talking about they don't do that no more. They definitely do that. Now listen, they don't do that no more. Because they figured out how fucked up it is. They figured out it don't fucking work. Right? They figured that out, like, a few years ago. Now, everyone think they're in the same place, but they all separated off into their own little bubbles. Motherfuckers be calling them filter bubbles. Stupid name. But whatever, I can't think of a better one. They all put into their little filter bubbles. And they think they're in the same place with everyone else. And everyone happens to agree with them. And the only people that don't agree with them are, are rage-inducingly stupid. Because that's what they designed to be. Everyone thinks that. And everyone sees that. Everyone thinks they get used to the idea they belong everywhere. And that anyone who ain't them is the ones that get ridiculed. But everyone sees the same thing. But it used to not be a problem because you were seeing this and you would be like, yeah, I was just in my forum with my people. Of course, you know, we, we weird out here. We our own people. But there's just like, you know, 50 of us, 100 of us. But now, everyone thinks that everyone they see everyone out there. They think they interacting with everyone. That's the problem. They think they're in they everyone in the they same place, but everyone ain't in they same place. Everyone in they different places, but they just see the same shit in terms of like the same five memes, and they ain't even memes no more. That's the thing about it. They ain't even memes. They just viral TikTok videos. Stupidest shit I ever heard of, if you ask me. But I don't know nothing about that now, now, now about that. <laughs> <laughs> That's the problem with the internet. They don't fucked it up. They don't fucked it up. You wanna know something about the internet? Let me tell you about the internet, okay? The total word count of the W3C specification catalog is 114 million words. Okay? If you added the combined word counts, of the C11, C17, UEFI, USB 3.2, and POSIX specifications, all 8,754 published RFCs and the combined word counts of everything on Wikipedia's list of longest novels, 
you would be 12 million words short of the W3C specifications. I conclude that it is impossible to build a new web browser. The complexity of the web is obscene. The creation of a new web browser will be a comparable in effort to the Apollo program or the Manhattan Project. It is impossible to implement the web correctly. It is impossible to implement the web securely. And it is impossible to implement the web at all. Okay? That's all I want to say. They fucked up the internet. They fucked it up. They fucked it up in terms of everything. It's too damn complicated. Which is why I propose we all get the fuck off of this place, man. Not the internet. The internet's fine. Off the goddamn web. And listen, the web got some cool things in it, but it's what. It's way too fucked up these days, man. We gotta make our own cool kids club over on fucking Gemini or some shit, you know? Fucking gotta dip over to, to Gopher and Gemini and all these weird ass places. But we gotta be making good shit over there because ain't no one making no good shit over there, man. That's the goddamn problem with these fucking places. Every Gemini fucking capsule, every gopher hole, just talk about Gemini itself or gopher itself. They don't even talk about the fucking anything interesting. And it's all boring. It's all fucking boring. We need to be getting in there. And we need to be fucking making some good shit. If you don't know what the fuck I'm talking about, because you're 10 hours in... To a 12 hour long fucking video of some asshole talking to himself and suddenly he's doing the worst southern accent you ever heard with no explanation I'll tell you fuck you buddy <laughs> fuck you buddy hey I don't need to explain myself to nobody but I will explain this in case you don't know so the internet <laughs> That's the whole, the whole, all of it, right? That's the whole, all of it. But, but some, there are different ways to be on the internet. They call them protocols. Now, you probably know one protocol called the hypertext transfer protocol or the secure hypertext transfer protocol, HTTP or HTTPS, right? That's most of what you talk to in a web browser. But you probably know some other internet protocols that you might not even consider, like, for example, uh, BitTorrent protocol. That's not got nothing to do with HTTP. Or, for example, IRC protocol. Or uh, even possibly, perhaps, email protocol, right? Those are some that you might interact with on, on a semi-regular basis, semi-regular basis. Um... And they're all different protocols to interact with the internet, to, right? To, to, but they, they specialize in doing different things, right? IRC for spending instant messages, chatting in real time. Uh, the BitTorrent protocols for file sharing, P2P file sharing. And the, the goddamn emails for sending mail. <laughs> and what's HTTP for? AKA the World Wide Web? That's for. Fucking serving documents. It's for serving documents with hypertext in them. It's got the, the name in the name. Hypertext transfer protocol. You transfer documents with hypertext in them. For the Zoomers listening, hypertext is a, a link in a page. Little blue letters. They don't have to be blue no more, but links, that's hypertext. Anyway... Uh, you might have noticed that, that this whole thing's fucked, right? We got all this JavaScript and, and, and all this fucking nonsense going on in it, right? It's, it's got various problems in terms of privacy and security because it was never built to scale up to the scale that it's scaled to, right? It's, it's, it's So they've had to keep adding shit and adding shit, and they never pay no mind to security and privacy of the end user when they was doing so. So you end up with a bunch of, uh, you know, opportunities for companies to track you, breach your privacy and web pages can just become bloated and bloated and they no longer run on old browsers they no longer run on slow hardware or slow connections you know they they take too much energy and, and it's stupid right we don't like none of that uh but fortunately you know there's other similar document serving protocols out there 
two of the ones I personally like are Gopher and Gemini. Now, Gopher is is a very old protocol. It's, it's as old, pretty much, not quite as old, but almost as old as the web. And for a time, they were competing with each other, right? They There was actually a time when nobody really knew whether Gopher would be more popular or whether the web would be more popular back in the 90s. Obviously, the web won that war, but the, some of the early browsers, like Netscape, had inbuilt Gopher capabilities because because you would expect to see some gophos and some websites at the same time but gopher lost out however unlike the web gopher has pretty much stayed in its very minimal 90s uh capabilities this whole time and it pretty much just serves documents it doesn't really do nothing more than that I don't even think it can do do images inline images you know it's very very simple protocol and because it was a standard at one time, there's still, you know, some people who are very passionate about maintaining Gopher. And in fact, it's made somewhat of a, a, a comeback. Uh, it's much more lightweight than the web. It doesn't allow for anything that could even constitute something like tracking or cookies or fingerprinting or anything because it's just too simple. It's just too basic. It, it only All I can do is put text and links. That's it. Can't do nothing more complicated than that. Uh, and then... Uh, Gemini is a, a more recently invented protocol, which is supposed to be a midpoint between Gopher and the web, where Gopher is very, very simple, pretty much just do plain text with some links and that's it, and the web is very complicated. Gopher, I mean, Gemini is supposed to be a little heavier than Gopher and lighter than the web. I think personally it hits a sweet spot of like exactly what you want. Um, it has some problems like force TLS, but generally speaking, I like Gopher. I mean, I like Gemini. I also like Gopher. Um, so those are two two different things. Um, and you can look them up on on the internet and find out more about them. Just your browser probably doesn't have any capabilities to display go to render it doesn't know how to read i'm gonna stop talking like that now it's getting stupid it doesn't doesn't know how to read it doesn't know how to read like you have a if you go on a website right and you, you click you know view page source you see a bunch of H, html right you see a bunch of html and so your browser all it's doing is 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 a program that knows how to render this at least theoretically what a browser should be is it knows how to read this type of document, an HTML document, and and render it on a screen correctly according to the standards, right? Um, but it only knows how to speak HTML and CSS and JavaScript and uh, stuff like that. It doesn't know how to read the language of of Gopher or Gemini. So you need a different browser that is specifically for browsing Gemini or browsing Gopher. And I mean, there are uh, portals, so you can use a a normal web browser, and you can just like there's 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 people have made websites that will basically translate Gopher or Gemini pages into HTML, but they kind of suck. Like they they. They you you lose a lot of the point. I would recommend looking into getting a browser that is cap like a separate browser other than whatever stupid Chromium or Firefox browser you use uh, for browsing Go for and or Gemini. And because it's they're so simple as protocols, you can browse them in a terminal interface and not really lose much, right? Because they're they're so basic, they're almost all text. Like compare HTML. Right, like go look up so that the 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 language that you um, excuse me right so when when you when you talk to uh, fucking you know HTML HTML is annoying right HTML it's not annoying it's fine but but web HTML right Gemini that the equivalent is called gem text right it's a hypertext format um, <clears throat> now the HTML fucking you know documentation is is very complicated. Okay, you can you can look at the fucking gem text 
like how to write gem text, it's literally it takes two seconds. Like there's, it's it's the simplest. I like it's it's so simple. It's so ridiculous. You can literally, you don't even have to learn it. Saying learning it is even too. It's literally like four lines. <laughs> like there's there's like five options of things you can do, um, and it's everything you would need. You can make a heading. If you want to write text, you know how you write text? You just write the fucking text. You don't have to write a fucking tag. Because it's just text. It expects you to be writing text. So when you write text, it just comes out as fucking text. You can make a list. You can do a paragraph. You know how you do a paragraph? You don't have to do P tags. You don't have to do BR tags. You don't have to do none of that. You just fucking do a paragraph. You just do a paragraph and it just does that. Uh, right? You want to do a link? You just put a little a little symbol and it does a link. You just put little equals and then, what is that, greater than, like an arrow, right? Equals greater than and then the link. Yes, that means links have to be on a new line every time, but that's fine. That's just how it looks. It makes the protocol way simpler. It makes it, it, makes it, it, makes it way simpler to do it like that, so I'm okay with it. It's fine. And some of the fancier... You might be like, how do you do images or like audio or anything like this? Um, well, you don't. It's not built in. Uh, instead, but some of the, the fancier browsers, like Lagrange, for example, they will just automatically, like if you have a link to a video file, it will just display it as a video when like in the in the page when you click on it. Or if you have a link to a picture, it will just display it as a picture. When you click on it, um, but in a more minimal Gemini browser, it would just take you to your image viewer that you have installed or your video player that you have installed on your computer. Because that's not what a web browser does. It doesn't like a web browser should just display a web page. It right like maybe it's a more seamless experience to do it the other way around. But you know what I'm saying. Okay, I kind of got off on a fucking tangent here. For some reason. I've decided to watch the Harry Potter films. I hope to keep this short and sweet. So I've watched the first two and I'm halfway through the third one. Uh, the first two movies I watched on a second monitor while playing on a 24 hour Dust Bowl server because they're shit. Which is the reason I've never done this before. Especially the first one. The first Harry Potter movie it was pretty much garbage. Like, there's some stuff about it that's okay. Some stuff's even cool in terms of, like, some of the visuals. But they're not... They don't become good. Like, the ideas are there, and they're so much expanded on and improved later on. Especially in this third one. The Prisoner of Azkaban. That, uh... You know, it kind of doesn't matter. Anyway, the, they're shit. They're shit. The child acting in the first two is just garbage. Um, they're, they're, I, they're not even really worth watching. Um, as movies. As Harry Potter films... Look. I, as did many others, was obsessed with Harry Potter as a kid. It was probably the first media thing that I was ever really into. Um, I remember, you know, my mum, asking my mum to draw a scar on my forehead before I went to school, because, because Harry Potter is cool. Uh, um, so yeah, that's, I was very into, I read all the books, I watched all the movies, but that's not particularly special, since so did literally every other child at that time. Um... I don't, like, I don't, I don't really know if I was particular, the thing is, no one around me, until later, like, none of the kids around me were particularly into Harry Potter at the time I was super into it as a kid, but then, a little later, everyone was into it, so it was, it was like, I had, like, a year's head start, because I read the books, and I, I was ahead of the movies, by the time it got to some of the later ones. But, uh, yeah. Most... I read a lot of books as a kid. Anyway, this is stupid. 
<laughs> so, as with everyone, I have a history of, with Harry Potter, but th- this is not special, right? Like, oftentimes, talking about your history with something is, like, interesting. In this case, I have pretty much the same history with this thing as literally every single other person who is around my age. There's also, obviously, the stuff that's been talked about to death, you know, going back and looking at Harry Potter with the new lens of J.K. Rowling's conservative beliefs. Um, and yes, it's pretty uh, egregious in certain places, and it's like, how did we not see this? Uh, you know, it's definitely enlightening. Uh, but there's also a lot of stuff in the Harry Potter movies that, you know, are like, don't make any sense. Like, you could quotes from uh, whatever it's, it's stupid he, whatever who cares the thing is the movies the first two movies are dog shit okay the first movie especially is garbage the second movie halfway through it starts to pick up and it's like it has some cool scenes you know i think the tone for the movies starts to get set like in in the chamber of secrets in harry potter and the chamber of secrets like once they're actually in the chamber of secrets um, there's finally some actually tonal stuff that I like. Kind of. But then, it's the third movie. I don't know, I haven't watched any fucking, like, Harry Potter retrospectives or anything. So I don't know much about, like, what people consider. But I would imagine, generally speaking, the third movie is probably considered to be the best one. Because it's directed by Alfonso Cuaron, who is a great director... And fucking directing a Harry Potter film is absolutely beneath him. And instantly, like, the the fucking stylistic gap between watching the first two movies, which are just visual, you know, porridge. (laughs) They're visual porridge. And then you get to this third one, and it looks, like, to be honest, it looks great. Like, it really has its own unique visual language that's... Obviously, it, it reminds me... I, the only other Alfonso Cuaron movie I've seen is Children of Men. So I'm, I'm sorry if I'm uneducated on his other films. Um, at least I think. What else did he direct? Let me check. Filmography. Where is he? Oh, nope, that's the wrong Wikipedia. Alfonso Cuaron. Filmography. Yeah, the only one I've seen... Oh, I've seen Gravity. Gravity was a fun movie, but that's kind of... It doesn't have the same... I I see the link between Harry Potter and Children of Men. Gravity is cool, I guess. It's fine. Uh, actually, I liked Gravity. It was an edge-of-your-seat thriller. You know? Um, Sandra Bullock was annoying, but that's because it's Sandra Bullock, and she's annoying. I never watched Roma, even though it's probably amazing. I know uh, it won a bunch of awards, and uh, YMS really liked it. But I haven't seen it, unfortunately. Anyway, Alfonso Cuaron has a, a, vis, a kind of a, a visual style, but it, I think it works super well with this the fantasy setting and makes it feel very gothic. And uh, but simultaneously, like it's much more down to earth. This movie, like the other, the first two, are much more. They feel like like very classical children's books in the style of like Enid Blyton type of thing and you guys probably have no idea what the fuck Enid Blyton is unless you're based lit cells but you know as a British child I read Enid Blyton growing up uh you know very traditional maybe some C.S. Lewis stuff uh but this feels a bit more I mean it's good it's good look I like I'm not saying it's a good script the script, especially in the first two films, holy shit, they have some bad dialogue. And I know that's carried over from the books, also having terrible dialogue. But man, when you put bad dialogue in front of terrible child actors, it's just, like, impossible to watch. Which is why I watched it on a second. This is why... So I've, I've, I've obviously, as with any other childhood franchise, you know, I've gone back and pretty much revisited all of them. The ones I was really into as a kid. Like, The Mummy... Like, the Nicolas Cage films I liked as a kid. Um, like Star Wars, I liked as a kid. Indiana Jones. Um, you know, it's a lot of stuff like that. The, the movies I liked as a kid. Um, <coughs> but I've never gone back to 
the Harry Potter because I've never been able to get past the first fucking movie because it's so bad. <laughs> it's so boring and terrible. <laughs> like I've just never I've I've tried to watch Harry Potter twice. The first one was like five years ago, and I again gave up on the like halfway through the first movie because it's garbage. I don't even think I got halfway through it. I think like a third of the way through the first movie because it's garbage. And the second time was like earlier, or maybe like last year, late last year, where, again, I gave up like halfway through the first movie because it's garbage. Um, So I had to, I knew that I would have to do something to distract me while getting through these first two garbage movies. Anyway, I don't want to talk about them because they're fucking trash. I want to talk about this one, which is way better in every way. Like, it's crazy how if you hire an actual director, the movie turns out good. It's actually crazy how that happens. You hire an actual director and the movie's good. What the fuck? How did they do that? Which is sad, because, like, I remember as a kid, Goblet of Fire was my favorite one. But that's not this one. That's the next one. You know? And, uh... I'm I'm not looking forward to that. (laughs) Not looking forward to that one. Uh... Well, I am, but I want to know. I want to know how well it. I want to know how well it. Did, did, how well it turns out. I, I don't know. I'm. I'm interested. I don't know. I thought I'd have more to say about this, other than damn, this movie actually captures a really interesting aesthetic that I really like. Um. That's about it. I really. I genuinely really like the way this film looks. Okay, that's it. Okay, I finished Prisoner of Azkaban. It, it's look the directing is good and honestly out of at his, I mean at least out of the ones so far and if my memory serves correctly out of all of the films I think it has the best gimmicks the best plot points right the time travel plot is could have been more interesting it's kind of rushed like I don't know, I I wish there were more attention paid to it. You can do a lot more interesting stuff with time travel. As far as time travel goes, it's like the least interesting stuff you can possibly do. It's very basic and boring. But, like, it still works. It's neat, I guess. Werewolves are cool. Peter Pettigrew being a rat the whole time is cool. The Marauder's Map is cool. Sneaking around is cool. It's always cool when they're sneaking around. Buckbeak is cool. You know, it's got the most, like, kind of neat stuff. Uh, neat little magic concepts and stuff like that. Um, I will say one thing, which, which, I know this has been pointed out to death, but, like, this is something that is just so apparent in the movies that I don't understand how, how... this wasn't the only thing anyone talked about during the Harry Potter craze, which is just how stupid of a game Quidditch is. Like, the fact that none of the rest of the game matters, only catching the snitch matters, is so stupid. It would be the worst game ever. (laughs) And it's so obviously stupid that it's like, how did J.K. Rowling not think about how stupid it was? Like, obviously... So, Hogwarts is supposed to be Eton, right? It's, like, modeled after Eton. And in Eton, they have their own weird, stupid games, right? Like, uh, Eton Fives is actually the least stupid of them all. But they have a bunch of... of there's, like, like, three or four sports that are only played at Eton College, you know, which is... At the school that the real life school that the Hogwarts is modeled off of, um, and they're really in, I mean, they're fascinatingly weird <laughs> fucking games. Uh, like the the wall one, the fucking wall one, not not fives. Right, fives is the only one that's like good enough that it's made it out of Eton. That like sometimes, occasionally, normal people play it. Uh, that's that's uh it's basically I know in America they have the you know wall ball this exists in America it's a it's a similar kind of deal you hit a ball against the wall with your hands um uh, but there's 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 I fucking the, I think it's literally called the Eaton Wall game and it's like 
this insane thing. I mean, you should just look this up, okay? I can't really explain it. You should look up footage of this. It's, like, f- fucking insane. And then they also have, like, a, an Eaton exclusive version of, like, like football, I believe, which is called the field game. Um, like, there's the, there's the wall game, and there's the field, field game. And they're both fucking weird, man. They're fucking weird. Um, it's like a mixture of rugby and football. Anyway. Weird place. Weird fucking thing to exist, Eaton. Uh, so that's what they're trying to emulate, like, right? Like, there's already the concept of weird British sports, I guess. And then within that, there's weird Eton sports. And I guess Quidditch is supposed to be the version of that. Um, yeah, I don't know, man. It's it's so distractingly stupid. That's the thing. It's not just, like, here's a movie detail, plop, plop, whole thing. It's, like, very distractingly stupid. Like, there's a surprising amount of these movies that's dedicated to Quidditch. Um, and that game is distractingly distractingly stupid. Anyway, the movie's alright. If that's the best, if that's the best it gets, then... Uh, you know, I'm not looking forward to the rest of these. But, you know, I'm gonna blast through them. I'm having a good time, somehow. I'm gonna record my bit about Harry Potter. I watched all the Harry Potter movies... Frankly, it wasn't a great idea. The third one was the only half decent one, and even that was mainly just good because I liked, I enjoyed the directing. But no, the other, all the other movies are garbage, man. The first two are like absolute garbage in a way of like they're actively bad. Like I like the set design. You know, let me actually give credit to people who work on movies. Okay, the, the set design is incredible. The costume design across the whole series is really good. The, a lot of the effects are really good, uh, both practical and, you know, in the there's not that many practical effects in the movies, but they're good. All the props, great. Everything that's like world building. And this is like the typical, like this is the thing. There's nothing new to say about fucking. Harry Potter, because it's Harry Potter, but all I can say is, like, if you're considering this, don't do it. If you're sitting here like, oh, I haven't watched those movies since I was a kid, then you're not going to discover anything new about them. The only thing you're going to realize, like, it's not even like, you know, I do this all, I've done this for many things, right? Go back and watch something that you liked when you were a kid, see, so you can, like, uncover something new about it, make some new... Like, oh, I didn't realize it was like that. Or like, oh, I, that's, so that's what that meant. Or like, oh, now that I'm... You know, this happens all the time. You go back and rewatch Thomas as an adult. I, I learn a bunch of, you know, new stuff about the show. Think about it in an entirely new light. Go back and rewatch, uh, you know, all sorts of things I liked as a kid. And normally it's, it's enlightening in some way. Either like, oh, this show was fucking garbage. Why do they ever like this? Or it's like... Uh, you know, something you missed as a kid, or, or something like that, right? Because you're, you're a little baby, you don't understand how plots work. But, no, there's nothing to Harry Potter, there's just nothing to it. Um, I mean, there's stuff that's, like... Like, it's mainly forgettable. It's mainly, like, especially the later movie. Like, after, I feel like it can be split into... There's, there's three different sections to the Harry Potter franchise. There's the first two movies, which are, like, the baby movies. This is the baby, the baby parts where it's for babies. Um, and they're bad. They're actively bad. The child acting is actively terrible. The directing is incredibly flat and and, and boring, and I really don't like it. Um, but some people they really like these films because they like supposedly have some sort of sense of childlike wonder in them. I don't see this personally. Um, the bad guys are also the most boring in these movies. Like the the the. the 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 things that the main guys have to overcome is the most boring in the first three movies. The least int- the least innovative, you know. That's just my opinion. Although the second movie, I will say, the ending of the second movie is 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 starts to get kind of good. I like the ending sequence of the of the Chamber of Secrets. Um, then there's so that's the first section. Then there's 
Prisoner of Azkaban. I think this is a pretty decent standalone movie. I don't think it's amazing, but it's well directed. It's the acting is great. I should mention, you know, obviously there's a bunch of good actors involved in the franchise. Shame none of them are playing the main characters. <laughs> Um, and there's some bad actors as well. But generally speaking, pretty, you know, there's some good performances all around. We all know this. But yeah, third movie, and it's like it starts to get darker, or it starts to get darker. And then after that, they turn into just like really kind of generic fantasy action movies that are pretty boring. Pretty forgettable, I would say. Like, at least the first two, they have an aesthetic. After that, it just kind of becomes mush. It just kind of becomes visual mush. All of the wand fights just turn into... There's only two types of wand fights. There's there's the standard wand fight, which is just a gun fight. Like, they're just just, just a, a gun shootout with no nothing particularly interesting about it, except some fantasy effects. And then there's the, like, big climactic wand fight. Normally involves Voldemort. Like, the Dumbledore versus Voldemort fight in the Ministry of Magic. That's actually good. I like that scene. That's a good scene. And, you know, there's stuff... That, that stuff's okay, right? It's not great. It's not terrible. It's, it's, it's perfectly mid. But there's a, like, there's a bunch of stuff about these movies that's just, like, fucking bad from a writing perspective. Like, the books... Like, from, from other books from a J.K. Rowling is bad at writing perspective. Where it's, like, something that sounds like a really good idea that's just completely wasted potential. All of the character drama is so bad. Throughout all of the movies, characters are just acting like absolute idiots, and it's just annoying and stupid. Um, like, the, the here's a big thing, right? In one of the last movies, they have to they have to steal something from Gringotts Bank, right? Now, this should be a really interesting thing, right? Like, ma- I like heist movies. You know, everyone likes a good heist movie. I like heist movies. Magical heist, always a great premise. You gotta steal a thing from the strongest, the most secure magical bank. That's a great premise. I would watch a movie about that, right? That's cool. Of course, they do it in the most boring fucking way possible. So, look, maybe I missed something, right? But in the first or second movie, when they first introduce Polyjuice potions and they can like transform and they can change their faces and bodies to and someone else's. It's established that this is a really complicated potion, right? That it takes like weeks to brew and you need to get a strand of the person's hair to do it. But by the time you get to the last movie, they're just brewing up Polyjuice potions like it's fucking nothing. Like, again, first move, like the, the, in the Chamber of Secrets, when they have to drink the Polyjuice potion to turn into crab and goil, they have to chug an entire glass of it and it is like presented as like the most disgusting thing ever. And then, by the end of it, and, and, you know, it's a whole big arc of, like, oh, we gotta, like, actually brew this thing, and it's crazy. By the the time you're at the last movie, you know, they don't even bother showing how they get the, like, how they brew it. They just have infinite access to this stuff, right? Which is crazy, because... And what's weird is, it's like no one else in the wizarding world even acknowledges the existence of these potions, even though they must be super commonplace. Because by the end of the... Look, the only explanation would be, well, they're kids who don't know how to do potion brewing at the beginning. By the end of it, they have access to much more resources and they're much more experienced. So brewing a polyjuice potion isn't that complicated for them anymore. Even though I don't see how that would speed up the time required to make it... Uh, you know, how did they get there? It's just simply not explained. It's a plot hole. How did they have the time to brew polyjuice potions? Like, where, when and where, unless they already... It doesn't make any sense. But, like, a heist movie is all about how the heist happens, right? The heist stuff is cool because it's like, okay, it's like a puzzle box, you know? Here's this complicated puzzle box. How are the main guy is going to outsmart the the bank vault or whatever in order to get get a, the thing from the vault to do the heist right that's always interesting how are they going to defeat all the security measures this is what's good about a heist movie so in in these this fucking harry potter movie they just don't like they just walk in dressed or like you know polyjuiced into the other guys and then immediately it doesn't matter because the Jew at the bank, the Jewish caricature at the bank is like, can I see your like wand or your ID? 
which is weird because they had Bellatrix Lestrange's wand at some point, but she doesn't give it over. That's confusing to me. Maybe I just missed something, but that's weird. I don't know why she didn't just give that over. But instead, she's just like, magicaboo, and then suddenly the elf goblin Jewish caricature guy just gets high and just takes him down to the vault voluntarily. Like, there's no... There's no, it's not hard. <laughs> they never have to do anything difficult. They never have to... There's nothing interesting about it. There's no interesting... It's nothing. It's absolutely nothing. It's a nothing scene. It's like they have an interesting idea and then do the most boring possible version of it. And that's just the whole movie. So it's just all of them. It's honest. It's not worth rewatching. There's nothing to them. There's nothing to these movies. Okay. That's that's all I have to say on that matter, and I will never talk about Harry Potter again in my fucking life. You know, I want to go back on something that I've said in the past a bunch about trick getting trick stabbed. When I was like, oh, how does anyone ever get trick stabbed in TF2? I was just not paying attention, and well, the first thing is that I wasn't paying attention, and the second thing is that I didn't know enough about trick stabbing to know that I was even getting trick stabbed. Like I thought spies were just getting lucky. I know like I know about like, you know, stair stabs, matadors, corner stabs and whatever. But I was I didn't know like a lot of the time stuff like you're fighting a spy and you flick over to them and then you get face stabbed. But really you didn't actually. You, they actually got sidestabbed because they they would use they were like circle strafing basically. Like that. Now that I've watched that circle strafing video and tried to pay attention to it and stuff, I still won't have a place by. But yeah, so you know, trick stabbing does actually work even on good players because it just like I was thinking about the trick type of trick stab that takes advantage of psychology, right? Like like corner stabbing. Or, you know, these sorts of things. Where it's like, oh, you don't realize he's going to do this. But there's a second type of trick stabbing which takes advantage of, like, the limitations of how you can possibly input on a mouse. Right? Like, like when you when a spy is really close to you and you're trying to swing around to hit them, you can only swing around so fast and react, like, humanly so fast. And a good spy knows how to take advantage of that. Anyway, the second thing is, well, okay, you know, these days I don't play much on Uncle Topia. I used to be Uncle Topia exclusively, but now I mainly play on Valve Casual. Um, I'm not sure why. I mean, there's a couple of reasons. I am. Um, I, I actually do know why. The, the, the here's why I don't play on Uncle Topia these days. Firstly, um, Uncle Topia servers are generally either full or empty, and when they're full, um, like the, it's rare that there's a, there's a server that has like that's half full, right? Sometimes there is, and then it's chill and you just join. Most of the time they're full and you have to join and wait wait a long time to get in, which is kind of annoying. But the second thing is, the, well, this is not the second, this is the second point, the second section of my first thing, which is like, my sleep cycle is all over the place. And so, there are times of day when no one is in the European Uncle Topia servers, it's just me. Like, I've been many times when I've just been on Uncle Topia as everyone slowly left and then everyone just leaves and it's just me and then there's no European servers that are still that have anyone playing on them um so yeah that's a that's a big reason is that there's like a solid four or five hours every night when no one plays on Uncle Topia so that's that's reason number one is play play account either being too full or too empty and then the second thing is um, the maps. That, like, I realized once I stopped playing Aquatopia and was like, you know, now I get to pick which maps I queue for, I realized I actually quite dislike most King of the Hill maps. 
The King of the Hill is just not a very fun game mode for me, except for playing Demo Knight on Harvest. That's pretty much it. I mean, Viaduct is okay. Like, uh, it's possible to have fun on Viaduct, but that's about it. Like, uh, generally speaking, when given the opportunity, I'm not queuing for King of the Hill maps. Um, and then, when I end up actually playing on them, I realize I've actually been disliking this the entire time. Like, I have not been enjoying King of the Hill this entire time. It's partly... It's just sort of the way the... The way the meta centralizes around, like, level 3 sentries, overlooking the point, being very annoying. Um... Yeah, I don't, I don't like that. The maps are too small, you can't jump around in cool ways most of the time, except on Harvest. It's a bit too chaotic, too frantic. There's no variety in gameplay. You just sort of throw yourself at the point over and over again until you win. Like, it's kind of boring, in my opinion. Um, like, I'm sure if you're with a coordinated team... You know, like, it's probably much more fun to play King of the Hill on sixes, where you're, like, coordinating uber pushes and stuff. Uh, but it's not very fun in a casual setting. Like, 12, 12v12 on such a small map is just kind of not fun, in my opinion. And also, it's like... I don't know. I don't know how to explain it. There's just a lot of stuff about particular... King of the Hill maps that are just poorly designed in my opinion. Like, let me let me get up all of the maps. Badlands sucks. Okay, I don't like Badlands. Brazil is arguably the worst map in the game. Cascade is in, it sucks. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know what to say other than it sucks. It sucks. It's fucking boring to play on. The point is terrible. There's the stupid underground section that no one uses. The buildings, snipers can be way too powerful. There's the, the flank routes on either side of the point, which are, like, annoying to deal with. It sucks. I hate that map. Uh, Bagel should be in the game, but it isn't. Um... Harvest is is uh, not a good map to play competitively, but very fun to play Demo Knight on. High Pass, I used to think was good, and now I hate it. Um, I don't really know how to explain why. I just hate it. I just hate fight that the. I hate fighting over the point. I just don't enjoy it. It's not fun to pl like. The, the geometry of the level is not fun to play around. There's too many, like, super tight corridors that are really awkward. I feel like I always get owned by scouts on High Pass for some reason. Um, Cough King is a terrible map. I think we all agree that it's a bad map. It looks cool, and the fun thing to do on King is to, uh, like... Sticky Jumper and then Kaber all the way to the enemy spawn. That's fun. But other than that, the map is bad. Uh, Lakeside is one of the less bad ones, but it's still pretty bad. Uh, the, the 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 weird lopsidedness of the map is, is, is awkward. Half the map seems to go unused. Snipers are too strong. Um, Lazarus is a bad map. Uh, I don't even, never even heard of this one. Never heard of these. Must be like Scream Fortress ones. Nucleus is just sniper hell, of course. Uh, I mean, it, it's kind of neat, I guess, but it's also s sniper hell. Uh, Rotunda. I I think I, I Rotunda is one of the best maps that was added in the the recent thing. I kind of like Rotunda. Like, it's not amazing, but it's, it's as far as a Koth map goes, it's one of the better ones. Sawmill is one of the worst maps in the game. Shark Bay is, like, extremely mid. A pretty boring kill box type of thing. Uh, and Sweden is fucking Sweden. It, it's simultaneously too big and too small. Like, the map is way too big, but then also all of the actual areas where you're going to be fighting over people is, like, way too narrow and boxed in. 
like all of the cho- all of the places where players are actually going to be like it's a really big map but most of that map is just unused space between pathways when where like very few people ever are and if you get caught out there you're basically instantly dead so no one would ever go there because they're just wide open spaces it's a it's a it, i mean it's a stupid map and then viaduct is a pretty good map but i product is is much better and should be in the game instead of viaduct but yeah I mean, yeah, Koth is just bad, and Uncle Topia people liked Koth. They like to play Koth a lot. So that's the reason why I don't like Uncle Topia, is you don't get to choose what maps happen, and they they constantly pick King of the Hill maps, which is really fucking annoying. They also just pick a lot of bad maps that I don't want to play. Like CP Steel. Or CP Stores. Fuck, I fucking hate CP Steel. Although I haven't played it. I, you know, I hate CP Steel so much that I haven't even checked out the new update. Because I don't care. I, I mean, it's not going to get me to like the map. <clears throat> um, yeah, I don't know. Excuse me. Uh, I, yeah, I, I don't like the fact that I don't get to decide what maps I want to queue for. On Uncle Topia. That it's just very annoying. They never want to play Harvest. They never want to play Harvest. I want to play Harvest a lot of the time. Harvest's a good map. They never want to play it. Uh, uh. And every time Dust Bowl finally comes up after 10 years, like once every 10 years when, when Dust Bowl finally comes up, immediately everyone's just complaining, oh, Dust Bowl, fucking Dust Everyone hates Dust Bowl in Uncletopia. It's like 50-50 people who like Dust Bowl and hate, hate it, which I understand is just how the community is. But those people who hate Dust Bowl shouldn't be forced to play on it, right? I mean, not that they really are forced to play on it, but, you know... Like, they clearly don't want to be playing Dust Bowl, and I clearly do want to be playing Dust Bowl every goddamn day of my life. So, you know, it just creates a weird dynamic. I just feel like the player skill levels... I don't know. Like, yeah, Uncle Topia players are better than, like, normal casual players, but it's not, like, that crazy. I don't know. It's still... It's not that crazy. Like, to me, the thing that's so great about TF2 is that you can, like, try hard for the first half of a match or something, um, and then halfway through decide, actually, you know what, I'm gonna equip... Like, I, I can be playing stock demo uh, and, like, try harding, right? And then halfway through the match, I'm just like, actually, you know what, I want to equip the sticky jumper and the caver and just suicide bomb some snipers. Or, like, you know, I'm just gonna uh, play fucking Flog Pyro or something like that, right? Like, you can just completely switch to a meme playstyle and take it take it chill. And n- no one's, like, th- th- that's, not, that's just how the game is, you know? That's, like, the game's designed for that, which is very good. I think this is a reason why competitive TF2 has never really taken off, is that that's, like, a key part of the game's design philosophy, is the fact that there's, like... That you can, you don't have to play competitively all the time, but you can. Like, the option's there, and it, when you do, it's great. It is a shame that TF2 competitive never took off as as much as it should have, but, I mean, there's an obvious reason for that, and the obvious reason is that all the popular formats suck. The Sixes is a terrible format, um, at least in the way that it's played most of the time. And it's not a bad format for people who like sixes. It's a bad format f- compared to, to TF2, the game. <laughs> like, the casual TF2, the game that people play. Like, sixes is just a completely different game. It's like, it's like imagine if competitive CSGO was just, like, 1v1 arenas. Or if competitive CSGO was surf maps or something. It's just such a different game that, like, liking casual and being good at casual doesn't translate that much to to sixes at all like it's so you have to relearn everything from scratch pretty much it's got it's so different and obviously the fact that it's uh, you know the obvious meme every every interesting weapon is banned 
um, and only like fucking four classes are viable. That's annoying, terrible. Uh, and then Highlander also sucks because the game clearly isn't designed to be played like that. Uh, it's just like it seems like a dumb idea someone would have when they were like 12. Like, what if you'd played one of every class? And it's like, it sounds like a funny idea, but then the fact that, that people took it so seriously that it became the second most popular competitive game mode is insane. Because half the classes have nothing to do. Like, what are you going to do as a pyro in Highlander? You you just, like, go on YouTube and look at, like, pyro Highlander footage. They just spend the whole game spy checking. And the fact that you have one medic for a whole night, like, it's just, it's just, it's crazy. It's a, it's a really dumb format. <laughs> it's such a stupid format. Like, clearly, I think, at least in, in my eyes as a non-competitive player, right, it seems really obvious to me that, like, No Restriction 6s and Pro Lander are the obvious formats that TF2 should be played in, uh, right? And maybe you could have some restrictions, right, on clearly broken weapons, like the Wrangler, for example, um, or, or the Vaccinator. Like, playing against the Vaccinator is just not fun. Uh, so, like, I understand if you want to ban the Vaccinator, that's, that's reasonable, in my opinion. Um... If you want to ban the Wrangler, that's reasonable. If you want to have class limits, you know, so they don't just stack engineers on last, that's reasonable. Uh, like, th th this stuff's fine. But, yeah, the restrictions in Sixes as it exists right now is just way too fucking ridiculous. And Sixes as a format is just bad. Like, why Six? Give me Sevens. Sevens is better. TF2 is not Quake. Right, Quake... And other arena shooters like it are better the fewer players that are on the server, which is why Quake is the best 1v1 first person shooter. Like, competitive Quake is generally played in a 1v1 format. Um, smaller teams are better in those sorts of games. But TF2 is not like that. TF2 is better with larger player numbers. The maps are much, like, the good maps are really big and really open designed to have a lot of players on them. Um, the weapons synergize well with a lot of with more players. I simply think that sixes is, is just too few players. And and obviously Highlander is just too restrictive in terms of class composition. That like a lot of classes have nothing to do. And there's also but you can't just translate casual direct like you can't just make casual competitive. Because casual is broken, right? If you made casual competitive without any changes, it would just be wrangled sentries stacked on last. You'd just be playing against six wrangled sentries and, you know, the and a bunch of demos, big sticky stamina was spamming the cart, a bunch of wrangled sentries and a bunch of medics. It would be horrible to play with, play against. And then the other meta would just be... Uh, Pyro, the flog pyros with the scorch shot, and uh, and pocket medics the entire time, which I believe is what happened when Face It tried to run the TF2. That every game is just flog pyros with pocket medics because it, it's what works the best. They, they optimize the fun out of the game because a lot of what's fun about TF2 is playing suboptimally. In fact, this is what's fun. This is what no one understands. This is a lot of what's fun about competitive games in general. Is playing suboptimally. This is why when Axe or AMSA won Super Majors in Melee, it was big fucking news, and everyone loves them. Like, every single person in the, who knows anything about Melee, and I, I don't even play Melee, like, I'm not in the Melee community, but everyone loves AMSA. Everyone loves AMSA, because he won, like, three Super Majors in a row with a fucking Yoshi. Okay, that's sick. It's the fact that, like, you know, the equivalent in TF2, like, let's say, uh, you know, Solar Light will never, he'll never win, he'll never be on a pro team with Hybrid Demonite. Like, he just never will. The closest we have is that one guy who plays with the Beggar's Bazooka, 
and that one team that that ran a, uh, an engineer full time. More people are running engineer. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, the the sixes matter is so fuck. And here's my, you know what? Here's my proposition. Okay, you know, you know Bernie Sanders. You know Bernie Sanders. He's like, big tech has is too monopolistic. We need to break up big tech. Here's my proposition. TF2. We need to break up Froyo Tech. Okay, we need to break up Froyo Tech. Froyo Tech is too dominant. Those players just shouldn't be allowed on the same team as each other. You can't just have one team with all the good players. It's not fun to watch. They just win every fucking match. It's stupid. And because all the other all the other decent players in TF2 moved over to Overwatch, and I guess now they're homeless or whatever because Overwatch doesn't exist anymore. Right, so all the good TF2 players just ended up on Froyo Tech. We need to stop talking about breaking up big tech and start talking about breaking up Froyo Tech. Okay, this is my proposition to make competitive TF2 good. But I think it's just too late. I think it's just too late for for compet. Like I don't know. You can. I also think like I wanna I wanna like I'm talking about this as if it's like a tragedy, but it's not really a tragedy. Well, like I, I don't think it's a problem that that TF2 isn't got a competitive league in the same way as other games do, because you can always improve in ways that aren't like, you know, winning tournaments. You can always master new loadouts. You can always master new classes that you're not familiar with. Like, there's so much depth to this game. It, it's just insane. It's, and, and that depth goes way beyond just what's competitive. Right? Like, you can always find something, like, new to do that is just funny rather than, you know, effective. Or, you know, if you're already good with, it, like, one loadout, change to something that is objectively worse, stats-wise, and requires a change in playstyle, and then, you know, get good with that. And that's impressive. Every, like everyone respects a cracked trollger, for example. Like no, if you're if you're actually getting owned by a trollger, you're like holy shit, that guy's good, you know. And that's really impressive. Like when you come across a really good trollger, which is rare because it's really hard. But when you come across a really good trollger, it's very impressive. You know, this is the, and that's that's another form of the same thing that you get joy out of from doing a, playing a game competitively. You know, mastering game mechanics to become cracked. Uh, there's all sorts of different ways to go about that, other than just, you know, fucking whatever. Playing playing competitively in a traditional. Yo. What? Summoning Sokka and you, Mike Tyson will trigger. Oh, Paul. I just, I just saw this like it happened a month ago. Oh, he de- he does this all the time. He's he's got he's like in in summoning Sokka is like the best player by far. I thought right, like he just keeps he beating his own world far. records. No, he was inactive for ages. No, I thought I thought I read on Twitter that he was just like the best punch out speedrunner, and he keep he he's like the. Oh, there was a while where he wasn't doing any runs. Oh, I see. Days. But it seems like a year ago he got like back into it, and he's just been beating his own world records. Over, uh, yeah. That's what I heard. He's dominant. Yeah. But he wasn't doing it until. Oh, I see. Yeah. He is cracked. You gotta respect him. I mean, I guess when your job is just to make the same video over and over again, you have a bunch of time to practice punch out. <laughs> <laughs> Shouts out to somebody, song though. Shouts out to him. Like, I got pretty confident playing Demo Knight on Harvest. Like, if you load me into a Harvest game and I'm warmed up and I'm playing Demo Knight and the teams are balanced, I know this is a lot of, this is a lot of conditions, but I think that's, that's a reasonable stuff to expect, right? You load me into a relatively balanced Harvest game and I'm playing, you know, Iron Bomber, Tide Turner, Claydemore, I'm gonna be in like the top four on the scoreboard pretty much every time. Uh, like I'm pretty consistent on that map. Uh, and so 
there was like obviously I could be better like I could be top top one every time but what I'm saying is like that's just that's like 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 a thousand hours and I'm like close to getting good <laughs> because top four on the scoreboard isn't even that impressive right like that makes me close to getting good at one loadout on one map because it's not the case on other maps right and it, so in that case in that situation right where I've mastered one particular loadout on one particular map it's like what do you do now well okay now let's say I get really <sighs> All I'm saying is, you can always change up your loadout. Like, and there's so much variety in playstyle for a lot of the classes. Not necessarily like heavy or scout, maybe. But like, demo has probably the most variety of playstyle of anyone, right? Like, you could try playing stock. You could try playing with the loose cannon. You could try playing with the lock and load, right? Those are entirely new weapons to learn, and they take so much time and skill to master especially the loose cannon right that that like mastering the loose cannon would take at least like getting good with the loose cannon is at least a thousand hour investment in my opinion um and then like beyond that there's like what about playing full demo night okay uh so and then like what about playing with a different uh, st stickies like what about can you, is it possible to get good with the Scottish Resistance or what if you play with the Quiggy Bomb Launcher and maybe the Wee Booties in your primary like you're using the Quiggy Bomb Launcher like a, like a primary I think that's a weapon that I've thought of that's a loadout that I've thought about running recently because I feel like that would be something fun to master but first I want to get good with like stock stickies um, which I am getting better at like today and yesterday I've actually been doing pretty well with stock which is like finally after like a week of grinding I'm finally starting to see results like I've been grinding stock so hard that I literally dream like every night I dream about fucking sticky spamming <laughs> every night literally every night for the past three days at some point i've dreamed about sticky spamming sticky spamming is my life i also hit my first mr beast combo today like a double air shot combo on a, on a rocket jumping soldier it was s sick but it wasn't that impressive like he wasn't that far away so it wasn't the hardest air shots in the world but it was still sick um, but yeah, there's so much stuff to, that you can do, and then maybe you know there's there's stuff there's always movement stuff that you can learn. Like you can jump on sticky jumping maps and learn all of the nuances behind that, which is a whole crazy you know skill expression that I I feel like I'm pretty good at sticky jumping for an average player, but not compared to people who are like really good at it. Uh, not that that's really useful in games, but, you know, uh, there's just so much stuff, there's just so, and that's just one class, all of that stuff would take thousands and thousands of hours, and it's like, okay, now you want to hop on soldier, like, just rocket jumping, just, just mastering rocket jumping, it takes so much skill, or, like, you know, actually being the guy who, like, this is the, the real thing that TF2 lacks, is actually being the guy who wants to get good at medic. Like, there is, there's always, there's always a severe lack of medic mains. Um, being the guy who actually gets good at medic would be crazy. Like, if I, that would be, the feeling of power of just being a cracked medic must be so insane. Because, because you're the best class in the game, and, like, you just, you just win, right? Surely. Surely, if, like, I don't know, I, I don't know this, because I'm not a cracked medic, and I've never come across a crack. I mean, I've played with good medics, and the difference they make is night and day compared to a bad medic. Having a good medic on your team is so nice. It's the nicest thing ever. Uh, 
but having a cracked medic, like if you if you are the cracked medic, surely you just win every game, right? Like, what what can you even do if someone's Uber is like if someone just always has Uber, never dies, always has Uber, always or always has crits, always has overheal. You can never kill any players because there's always overheal, you know. And then there's like classes that I don't even understand. Right, like not to mention like spy, which I really don't understand, like as in mechanically. But like I don't understand how you can even be good at engineer. Like engineer is kind of a base. I like playing engineer. Okay, he's my third favorite, mo- third most played class. Uh, like I like playing engineer, but I don't understand. Like I've played against really good engineers who just always seem to have a level three up. Like you destroy the level three, and then two seconds later they have one up again. Like two, you know, two meters down the track, the payload track, they have another. And I'm like, how are they even doing it? How do they build so fast and always in the right place? And it's crazy. I don't even. And there's so much nuance to that that I don't understand. Like I, I, I try and do that sort of thing, and like, yeah, I've done some, I had some pretty good engineer games, but like, I don't know, that stuff is crazy. Not to mention Battle NG. I've never played against... I don't think I've ever seen a good Battle Engineer in my life. In my whole time playing TF2. I've died to them. Like, don't get me wrong. But, like, a really good Battle Engineer is such a rare type of first player to come across. Like, imagine being... Like, you could put a thousand hours into that. Easy. And become, you know, probably pretty insane. Because no one... Who knows how to deal with that? No one knows how to deal with that. Absolutely no one knows how to deal with that. You can just shut down flanks. You can just take area control of any way you want. There's so much. There's so much to this game. And it's fucked up that I only got into it, like, as it's dying. I could have been into this... It's, like, incredibly popular right now. Yeah, the How is it gonna shut down profitable servers? No, but they're not. But they won't fix it. Like, like the botting issue is only gonna get worse. I mean, it's gotten better. No, it's worse again. It's, okay, they did get better at one point. Yeah, but that's just you can't just rely on individual because there's like there's literally five people making the entire game unplayable for a lot of people. Like, you can't just rely... The reason it got better is because one of the major bot hosts just got bored and stopped stopped hosting bots. I see. Yeah. Uh, like, unless Valve does something about that, it's just going to be... It's just so annoying. Like, it, it's just such a simple thing. Like, you don't have to... You literally don't have to do anything complicated. Like, there's that Shonik video... She's like, oh, here's why it's actually quite difficult to deal with. It's like, firstly, Shonik misses the entire point, which is you don't have to eliminate the possibility of bots ever existing in your game. You just have to make it less convenient. You just have to make it consistently inconvenient to host bots. Like, the less and less convenient it is, because right now, there's no downsides. (laughs) It's not inconvenient in any way. It's so easy that there's no reason not to do it. The, the the more and more bar- every little barrier you put in front is going to discourage more and more people like it's not the the idea isn't to completely eliminate bots from the game they're always going to exist you, like cheaters are always going to exist but just to make it like hard enough that you discourage people from doing it you just want to make it easier and easier for average players to deal with bots in some way or for harder and harder for people to set up bots and consistently use them like Honestly, I like. I think Valve could solve this instantly. They could solve this so easily and in a way that would make them money, which is just do what they did for CSGO. Just charge money for the game. Right? In CSGO, they have prime matchmaking. You can just implement prime casual matchmaking in TF2. And it would massively alleviate the bot problem because the reason bots work is because there's so many of them if you had to pay for all of that no bot maker would like who's gonna do that who's gonna pay 
for hundreds of TF2 accounts, if they even if they cost like two dollars each, enough that the average person's not going to see it as any sort of problem. Two dollars to play TF2. I would fuck. I, I think anyone would shell that out. There's not even that. This so worth it, right? But if you're running a hundred bots, that's two hundred dollars. Are you really going to play that? And then if you start banning the bots on top of that, which you should also do. Right, you start implementing actual, like, better bot banning features, then it's like, okay, not only do I have to pay $200 to keep my my existing bots running, but they're going to continually have turnover. So I'm going to keep having to pay money every, you know, week on week, month on month, just to keep this up. Is this really worth it? You know? And I think that the answer is no, it's not really worth it. And a lot of people, you know, it might not eliminate the problem entirely, but it's such an obvious fucking solution. Like, it's not even difficult. There's, you just have to do, do something that bans bots even occasionally and charge for the game. That's it. It's so dumb that they won't do this. Like, it would take... It, I don't know. Well, CS2 is supposedly coming out tomorrow. Uh, I don't even know if I'm going to play it. But uh, apparently CS2 is coming out tomorrow. Like, after that... Well, it's going to be broken, because it's CS2. But, like, once they get CS2 up and running and working to a decent state, like, surely just just a couple of people need to go over to the TF2 team and just, just try and work on this bot problem. I don't know, man. It's so annoying. Valve, what can we do? Like, I don't understand what what do what do they want us to do? Like, why would they do this? This is what frustrates me is that that nine years of development time went into TF2 before it launched, and then you know a decade of TF2 being around, and all of that went into specifically thoughtfully designing a game that will be timeless. Right, this is actually the the like the the one of the genius things about TF2. Right is that it's a timeless game. It builds off of the aesthetics and... Well, not just aesthetics, but, like, you know, the practices of arena shooters, the classics, Quake, and so on. Uh, but it builds off of them in a, a way that, that transcends that genre into its own thing, right? It has a self-driven player economy that Valve doesn't have to interact with if they don't want to. It has community, you know, everything community-driven, right? And then it has an art style that's timeless. It has, a, you know, unique balance that's timeless. Like, it's all built to create a game that, that is timeless, that doesn't age, doesn't have to age. The only thing that it requires is, like, a basic level of upkeep from Valve. Why put all the work you put into the game to make it timeless let it go to waste by just not dealing with, with the, the big obvious problem. That you know it's a problem, you're ignoring it for some reason. It's very strange. Like, God knows what goes on at Valve, man. Who fucking knows what they're smoking over there? It's so strange. It's such strange decision making. Like, to not even try is the crazy thing. Like, to not even try is the crazy... Like, I would understand if they were, like, trying and the problem was difficult to solve. I would be like, look, guys, they're trying at least. But to not even try is so insane. It's so... Like, it doesn't even make any logical sense to me. Oh, I, whatever. Okay, I'm going to end this podcast by talking about CS2 for 15 minutes because it came out today, earlier today, while I was asleep. Um, so I downloaded CS2 and I've completely flipped sides from a Valve Defender to a Valve Offender. Okay, I have this whole podcast, I've been defending it. I've been like, oh, every time there's something new, the community freaks out. There's no way it's that bad. Blah, blah, blah. Now that I've actually played the game, I've completely switched sides. <laughs> I probably should have held my tongue the entire time having not played the game. Um, it's just that I've seen people freak out in this Counter-Strike community about this stuff constantly, so I've learned not to believe them. But, no, CS2 actually does bad. It actually does, does is bad. 
Um, <clears throat> first, biggest, most egregious fucking issue that is unbelievable that this is a problem. No audio on Linux. Are you kidding me? Valve is supposed to be the Linux guys. Like, if, if, you, if I'm supposed to trust any game dev to test their product on Linux, it would be Valve. The, every Linux user, and I think Mac OS users as well, are having audio problems. Most of them just have zero audio at all and have to find weird-ass workarounds. I haven't been able to get any of the workarounds to work, but I also don't haven't tried that much. Um, you know, the workarounds aren't consistent, right? Like, some people have some workarounds that work, and some people don't, depending on, you know, ALSA versus uh, Pipewire, or Pulse Audio versus Pipewire, you know, it's different stuff. Um, <clears throat> so that's the first thing. That's fucking insane that they can release a game that just doesn't have audio. I mean, yeah, the game will get patched, but... This wasn't a problem when you could still just play CSGO. Not that I w- w- was playing CSGO, but it wasn't a problem when, when you could still just do that. The fact that... I mean, I understand that Valve doesn't want to split the community, and that's fine. I don't think it's fine, actually. I mean, it's business-wise, it's a good idea, but the fact that they shut down all the CSGO servers, you physically can't play Counter-Strike Global Offensive anymore. I mean, just to, uh, from a game preservation standpoint, that's bad. Like, why would you do that? Why would you do that? It's just mean. I just see that as mean. I mean, I I know why they did would do that. It's it's bad for the, com- you know, it's bad in a number of ways if the community is split. But that makes me kind of sad. Um, and the fact that the game is fucking broken uh, and you can't just play the one that works sucks. Uh, <clears throat> so that's the first issue. The biggest issue, no audio. I mean, the game is literally unplayable without audio. Second issue, performance. Oh my god, how is it so bad? How did they fuck up? Like, I mean, I'm assuming that, I don't know, I don't play modern games, so I don't know how they're supposed to run, but CSGO was famously lightweight. How are all of these Russian children with a laptop from 2005 supposed to play the game now, right? Like, if... (laughs) I know it's a cliche for me to say this, but if your new software doesn't run on old hardware, then it's worse than the old software. Like, I'm at Dotesmite's place still. Dotes has a pretty good computer. It's only slightly worse than my desktop. You know, it's like pretty, pretty good mid-range computer. And it, it runs, like, the game just feels terrible. Like, I don't know how to describe it. Even when I'm getting, like... Obviously, on higher settings, I'm not getting above, like, 60 FPS, which is insane. You know, CSGO, I could crank up to fucking ultra maximum and still get, like, 200. Or at least over 100. When I lower this to... Well, when I when I play CS2 on high settings, you know, I'm getting, like, less than 60 FPS. And then playing it <coughs> with with lower settings, the game looks so bad. It's this, this fucking, like, FSR thing they have going on and whatever anti-aliasing algorithms they have they just straight up don't work like the aliasing is insane um and like not only that but like the lag makes the game the lag is really inconsistent like it's not like there are some games where it's laggy but it's just consistently laggy so it's okay but every time you move the mouse the amount of lag changes like every time every like the amount of lag is constantly changing which makes the game feel like shit even when the like lower bound is like 60 which is still unacceptable for csgo but like jumping between 60 and 150 fps is it makes the game feel terrible it makes the game feel so fucking bad um <clears throat> and the shooting does feel worse maybe it's just because there's no audio but something about the shooting just feels bad to me i don't know how to explain it and the movement feels wrong everyone was everything everyone was saying was right it, the movement feels what feels i mean people aren't complaining so much about the movement anymore and it might it, you know what i'm willing to chalk that up to bad performance plus i haven't played in a while and my movement is bad now but it feels mushy i actually think this is although you know what i actually think that's not to do with cs2 i think that's just you know it being laggy and also i haven't played the game in like a year so i'm you know i'm used to cs2 which has much cleaner movement i mean i'm used to tf2 which has much cleaner movement much faster acceleration and stuff um yeah, I don't know, man. This is, <laughs> it's mainly those two issues. No audio and massive performance problems. Like, that's insane. How can... I don't understand. Maybe I, it's just a... 
Like, this is a normal mid-range computer. There's no way that you should be getting FPS that low, I feel like. It's 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 kind of ridiculous. <clears throat> and yes, my con- criterion for low FPS is, like, just barely 100. Because, you know, I used to be playing CSGO at 300 FPS or so. And it's just, just way better. Um, hold on. What's happening? Okay, I don't know if anything's happening there. Oh, that's a shame. Simple Flips is ending his stream. That's what's happening. I was watching Simple Flips stream, but uh, yeah. Okay, well that's that's I don't know. That's kind of sad. I don't know how to put it other than that. It's just, <clears throat> it's yeah. It's it's just the, the the performance. Like I don't know how to put it. There's no, like, just buy a newer PC. I mean, it's not going to happen, because I don't care about Counter-Strike anymore. But, like, yeah, man. What a fucking mess. How did they fuck up so bad? <clears throat> it's crazy. that I guess their internal playtesting just didn't show any of these issues. And then... It's so weird that, like, Valve is not normally one to rush at launch. You know? Like, Valve is known for doing extensive playtesting and releasing stuff on their own schedule. So, like, why they would rush, like, why they would rush CS2 to launch, despite it being clearly not ready, is just very strange. It's very odd. Um, yeah, I don't really understand it. But that's Valve. They're mysterious people. Valve works in mysterious ways. You know, I was was hoping for a TF3 (laughs) Source 2. Um, but now I'm not. I don't like Source 2. Give me, let me just play CF2 forever. Let me just play my, my game from 2007 forever. Uh, there's no reason to play anything else in my eyes. <clears throat> anyway, that was the podcast. I'm probably not going to release this for a while because I feel like I released my previous one too recently. Let me go back and check. Oh, I also want to, uh, I'll do comment responses in the next podcast. Um... Yeah, I feel like I released my previous one, like, not that long ago. Uh, I guess it was, like, a a while ago, like, a month ago. I guess it was a month ago. Is it bad to release another one a month later? I don't know. Um, Maybe I'll just send it. I don't know. We'll see. I kind of feel bad putting podcasts out without another normal video in between them. That's that's my main thing. Like, I feel like there has to be a normal video between the podcasts. Which is weird that I haven't been making videos, but I think it's just because I'm not at my place. <sighs> okay, well, I guess I'll see you whenever I see you. And uh, don't forget to like comments. Okay, I'm done. this is stupid. I'm just trying to make the video closer to 12 hours long at this point. I'm just talking until it gets to 12 hours. Like, for some reason, I feel like CSGO in low settings looked better than CS2 at low settings does. Like, the amount of... I'm pretty sure it's this FSR stuff. Like, the amount of aliasing is just insane. I don't know how... Like, it's crazy. It's like I'm playing a Lego game. Okay, that's close enough. Goodbye.